Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton. from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Of course, most of you homemakers listening in know how deliciously good margarine can be today. But some of you may not have used margarine as a spread for bread for a good many years. Well, if that's the case, you're going to be pleasantly surprised when you taste parquet margarine, the margarine that's made by Kraft. That's because parquet margarine is really different from the margarines of a few years back. First, parquet's flavor is pretty certain to please. It's so delicate and wholesome, so deliciously good. You'll be delighted with parquet as a spread for bread or rolls, yes? And for baking and pan frying, too. Second, unlike old-time margarines, parquet margarine is a reliable, year-round source of vitamin A because every pound contains 9,000 units of this important vitamin. And besides, parquet is an excellent energy food. So try economical parquet margarine in your household and find out how extra good it is yourself. Just ask your food dealer for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now on to Summerfield and the Great Gildersleeve. Saturday afternoon finds him in a flurry of preparation for the expected visit of his old friends, Fibber McGee and Molly. For hours, he's been running up and down stairs, issuing orders and countermanding them, and now he pauses to light a well-earned cigar and snatch a moment's respite from the labor of supervising Bertie. Well, Bertie, how do we stand? Has that roast of beef turned up yet? No, sir. I phoned the market, and they said the boy left with about a half hour ago. Maybe he's been hijacked. Yeah. Well, we'll give him a few more minutes. How about the sleeping arrangements? I did like Miss Marjorie said. I'm giving Miss McGee your room. That's right. And Mr. McGee gets the den. I hope he'll be comfortable. He doesn't have to be comfortable. That guy can sleep standing up. <laughs> what about me? Where do I go? <laughs> well, uh, you thought to get the sewing room, Mr. Gilsley. I knew at the sewing room I'll be on pins and needles all night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, sir. I got you all fixed up snug <clears throat> on Leroy's folding camp cot. Yeah, the last time I camped on that cot, it folded all right. <laughs> You remember? Well, I got it fixed up now, Miss Gilsleeve. I got it tied up with some string. Oh, fine. I'll sleep like a baby. Yes, sir. I'll bet I'll be asleep before my head hits the floor. <laughs> oh, Marjorie, is that you? It's me, Uncle. Huh? Marjorie's coming. She's outside talking to some guy that brought her home from the plant. How was the movie? Uh, Bertie, take this book upstairs with you when you go, will you? Yes, sir. I saw a white cargo. It's about this guy. Oh, good. Uh, put that book on the table next to the bed, Bertie. Mrs. McGee might want to read before she goes to sleep. It's about this guy who goes to Africa, and he runs into Hetty Lamar down there, mooching around the jungle. Yep. So if the heat begins to get him, only yep. I forgot to tell you, Walter Pigeon is there. He's running the camp. That's Mr. Miniver, only in this picture his name is Whitzel. Oh, hello, my dear. Hello, are they here yet? So, uh, so, so Whitzel says to this new guy... Not yet. Their train's due in about a half an hour. So Whitzel says to this guy... Whitzel, that's Walter Pigeon. Leroy, I haven't got time to listen to all that now. Well, you asked me how was the movie. I'll be more careful next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're early, Marjorie. I got a ride, so I didn't have to wait for the bus. We picked up Leroy just as he was coming out of the theater. Yeah, tell him who picked you up. Marjorie's got a new fella. Yeah. Nobody picked me up. Now, have not. That's no way to talk about your sister, young man. One of the men from the plant very kindly offered to drive me home, that's all. Who's on his way? Yeah. Mike, she calls him. That just happens to be his name. She's only been there working there a week, and already it's Mike. Hiya, Mike. Hiya, baby. Come <laughs> on, now, don't you listen to him. <laughs> very nice, though, really. He works in the drafting department. Oh, well, that's fine. He's a draftsman, all right. If you ask me, he's got designs on our nail. <laughs> Leroy, you mind your own business. I've got something to say to both of you. Yes, Uncle Mort? When Mr. McGee arrives this afternoon, there are two things I want you to be careful not to do. In the first place, I don't want you to make any reference to Fibber's size. What about it? Well, he's a little runt, and like all little runts, <laughs> he's sort of sensitive about it. That's why he's so pugnacious. Oh, I wouldn't say anything, Uncle Mort. Well, I know you wouldn't, my dear, but I'm not so sure about Leroy. <laughs> Did I say anything about him being a runt? You're the one who brought it up. Well, just don't, that's all. 
Actually, he's not so small anyway. It's just that he's not as big as he thinks he is. <laughs> he has the mind of a small man, that's all. <laughs> Always carrying a chip on his shoulder. Oh, we'll be careful, Uncle Morris. And another thing, and this applies to both of you. I'd rather you didn't say anything about my engagement to Mrs. Ransom. Oh, but the McGee's are your friends, Uncle Morris. They'll be offended. We're not announcing the engagement just yet, my dear. We're uh, keeping it a secret. Mrs. Ransom isn't. I heard her talking to Mrs. Pettibone down at the grocery. We're not announcing it to McGee, and that's fine, Leroy. Because if I know McGee, he'll start making cracks. (laughs) If he makes any cracks about Lita, I'll punch him in the nose. And if I do that, Molly will be upset, and if she's upset, it'll spoil the whole weekend. That's what you get for inviting McGee anyway. He hasn't had a chance to open his mouth. I know, McGee. His mouth is open right this minute. (laughs) You'll see. He'll arrive here in the middle of a sentence. (laughs) Nobody will be able to get a word in all weekend. If he ever finds out about me and Leela, he'll be like a Scotty with a bone. Oh, Uncle Mort, you're being silly. Well, he isn't going to come in here as my guest and bandy so-called witticisms at my expense. I'm not going to give him the satisfaction. But just keep the whole thing dark, if you don't mind. Come on, it's time to go get him. Can I go, Uncle? Uh, No, Leroy. There's something else I want you to do. What's that? I want you, in the interest of peace, to go out in the garage, get the lawnmower, and hide it. Well, this is it, folks. It's no palace, but it's home to me. What do you think of it, Molly? Oh, it's a lovely place, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, a nice hunk of property you got here, Gildy. A hundred foot front by 175 deep. Well, that ought to give you room to spread out. (laughs) (laughs) And I can see that you have. (laughs) What was that, little chum? McGee, watch it. Hmm. Hey, Crocky, uh, who lives next door there? Next door? Oh, some woman. I uh, forget her name. Uh, Mrs. Ransom. Oh, yes. Is that it? She's a widow. Oh, so? Uh, widow woman, eh? Give you much trouble? Oh, uh, no, no. As a matter of fact... Marjorie, uh, suppose you run in and ask Leroy to come out and help with the bags. Uh, that's a good girl. You know, I think nice neighbors make all the difference in the world. So do bad ones. <laughs> we had one once who borrowed our lawnmower and kept it so long he finally had to leave town. <laughs> and he took the lawnmower with him. <laughs> McGee, if you come all the way to Summerfield to open up old wounds... You want me out? Oh, yes. Come here, my boy. Well, well, this must be little Leroy. Yes. Leroy, I want you to meet Mrs. McGee, a very dear friend of mine. How do you do? My, he's a fine-looking lad, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, and this is Mr. McGee. Hi, bud. Gosh, I had no idea you were such a big kid. Gosh, I had no idea you were so big either. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, you're not such a little runt. I'm told me... Leroy! <laughs> I'm just building him up, huh? Well, cut it out. Never mind him, Leroy. You eat your oatmeal and cod liver oil regularly, someday you may be as big and fat as your uncle. Are you kidding? None of your impudence, young man. Out, Gildersleeve. The boy meant no harm. He's plainly the victim of an unfortunate environment, that's all. Well, let's go inside, shall we, where the environment is warmer. Oh, yes, by all means. Uh, Leroy, you go get the bags out of the car. Why, George, I tell you folks, it's wonderful to have you here. This is just like old times. Oh, it's good to be here, Mr. Gibbsley. Yeah. Let me take your coat, Mrs. McGee. Oh, thank you. Where will I put mine, Crocky? Well, I'll take it. Just hang it up here in the hall closet. McGee. What, Molly? You see that closet? That's what I mean. Sure, anybody can keep a closet clean if they don't use it. Mr. McGee, if you'd like to come upstairs, I'll show the room you're to have. Oh, thank you, dearie. I would like to freshen up a little before dinner. Uh, dinner's in about a half an hour, everybody. Hey, where do these bags go? Uh, Mr. McGee's bag goes in the den, and Mrs. McGee's goes up in my room. Here, I'll take it up to her. Uh, hey, Sonny, is there any place around here where a fellow could buy a toothbrush? I came off without one, as usual. Well, sure, there's a drugstore right down the street about three blocks. Good, I may run down there a little later. 
Well, what have you been doing with yourself all day? I went to the movies this afternoon. Uh-huh. White Cargo, have you seen it? No, that's one I missed. Well, this guy goes to Africa and he can't stand the heat. Uh-huh. So he and Walter Pigeon get mad at each other and Walter Pigeon says, you'll quit. And he says, I will not. Uh-huh. So he goes off by himself and plays the phonograph and then he... Well, uh, look, uh, on second thought, maybe I better go right now and get that toothbrush. <laughs> Wait on. I'm just getting to where Hedy Lamar comes in. Oh, well, I'll wait for that. Well, he's playing his phonograph there, yeah. and it's getting all dark and spooky. And he looks out the door, and all of a sudden, what does he see? Eddie Lamar. Yeah, only you'd never know her. Huh? She's got a sort of a sing around her. And she comes in like this. Uh, look, you're Walter Pigeon, and I'm Hedy Lamar. Well, if you're Hedy Lamar, I guess I can pass for Walter Pigeon. <laughs> Shoot the plot to me, Todd. Well, she slides around the edge of the door like this, uh-huh. and she says, I am Tondaleo. <laughs> well, look, Roundaleo, I've got to run down to the corner and get a toothbrush. Hey, wait! I'll be right back. Well, this is the best part. Whistle comes in, I catch her door. <laughs> Good night. Now, what can I do for you, sir? I'd like to buy a toothbrush. A toothbrush? Mm -hmm. Uh, Did you have any particular kind of toothbrush in mind? (laughs) Yes, uh, something I could brush my teeth with. (laughs) As a matter of fact, I don't really need a toothbrush. I've got one at home, but I came away without it. Oh, yeah. None of it's perfect. (laughs) You say you're a stranger in town? Oh, I didn't say so, but I am. McGee's my name. I'm staying up the street here. Oh, well, pleased to make your acquaintance, Mr. McGee. My name is Peavy. Any time I can be of service, only too glad. Oh, thanks. I'd like to buy a toothbrush. Uh, <laughs> any particular kind? Co- oh, I asked you that, didn't I? <laughs> yes. Well, I have a number of varieties. I have them in red, green, white, small, medium, large. Now, give me a red one. And uh, then they come in the nylon bristle, the exton bristle, the proton bristle, and uh, the just plain bristle. Look, bud, I just want a toothbrush. I want to brush my teeth. Well, here's a nice brush. I'll take that one. Well, I don't want you to feel I'm high-pressuring you. I, it's just Wrap a, it up. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, will there be anything else? No, that's... Oh, wait a minute. Seems to me Molly did mention something. Oh, I know. We're spending the weekend with a fellow up the street here, and I'd like to get a little something for him as a gift. Yeah, what type of gentleman is he? Oh, he's a big, fat blowhard. <laughs> Doesn't do much of anything but eat, sleep, and brag. <laughs> I've got something here that I think uh, Mr. Gildersleeve would like. <laughs> You know him. Oh, yes. He's in here almost every day. Oh. And I think if you really <laughs> want to surprise him, a nice package of bubble bath would do the trick. Gilder <laughs> sleeve in a bubble bath? Boy, he'd look like a blimp coming out of a cloud. <laughs> well, of course, it wouldn't make much of a wedding gift if that's what you have in mind. Wedding gift? For Gilder sleeve? Well, haven't you heard? He's engaged to marry his next door neighbor, Mrs. Ransom. Rocky, engaged? Yeah. Oh, tell me more. Tell me more. <laughs> What'd you say her name was? Uh, Mrs. Ransom. Leela <laughs> Ransom. Widow. Oh, the widow next door. Uh-huh. <clears throat> the one he said he never met. Didn't even know her name. The big fake. What's she like? Well, she's a southern lady. Uh, very well preserved. <laughs> Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Let me at him. Here, what do I owe you? Uh-uh, that'll be 77 cents. Uh, cheapest toothbrush I ever bought. Well, so long, bud, and many thanks. <laughs> Just then, Walter Pigeon comes in from the jungle and catches Hetty slipping in the poison. Heavenly day. Leroy, that'll be quite enough now. Oh, now, don't <laughs> discourage the boy, Mr. Gildersleeve. Discourage him? I only wish I knew how. Hi, <laughs> folks. McGee, where on earth have you been? Oh, just down the corner. (laughs) Say, you look like the cat that swallowed the canary. Do you know that you've kept dinner waiting 15 minutes? Oh, that's perfectly all right. Leroy, run out and tell Bertie she can serve at any time now, will you? McGee, have you washed? (laughs) McGee, what's got into you? Yes, what are you looking at? 
<laughs> Hi, Rocky. <laughs> Hello. How's every little thing? How are you feeling? Uh, I feel all right. Why? Everything under control? Certainly. What do you hear from Lulu? <laughs> Lulu? Who's Lulu? McGee, what on earth are you talking? When are we going to meet her, Rocky? Meet who? The Queen of Sheba. Scarlett O'Hara. That widow you're going to marry. Oh! <laughs> Mary? Mr. Gildersleeve? Leroy? Oh, my son, I didn't say a thing. Marjorie? Now, peep, Uncle Mort, I swear. If you knew Lulu like I know Lulu. <laughs> Her name is not Lulu. Oh. No, it's Leela. Leela. Lee is saying, leave her out of this, and la is in lots of people get a punch in the nose. <laughs> That's just what you're going to get if you ever so much as... Why, you big bumbling balloon. Come over here, and I'll let the air out. You must have found me. Dinner! Saved by the bell. <laughs> Fred Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. You know, especially in times like these, it's smart to be economical. But when it comes to food buying, it's important to be wisely economical. To be sure that the economy foods you buy fulfill the requirements of good nutrition. Now, one food that's both economical and highly nutritious is wholesome parquet margarine, the delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. Parquet margarine, you know, is one of the kinds of foods recommended in our government's nutrition food rules. That's because parquet is so nourishing, having both food energy and important vitamin A. And what's more, parquet helps provide these essential food elements in so many ways. It's a delicious spread for bread or toast or rolls. It's a tasty seasoning for hot vegetables. It's a real flavor shortening for baking. And it's grand for pan frying, too. Yes, in all these ways, parquet margarine adds delicious nourishment to meals. So tomorrow, ask your food dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. And now, what of the great Gildersleeve? Well, it's Sunday morning, and the great man has come down to enjoy his usual outsize Sunday breakfast. He walks into the dining room, sniffing the air like a bird dog in a hot scent. Uh, uh, that's funny. The stuff must be here, but I can't smell it. Birdie? Yes, Where's breakfast? Why, well, Mr. Gilbert, Miss Marjorie told me y'all would wait until Miss and Miss McGee came down. I never heard of such a thing. Marjorie! Hey, for goodness sake, Uncle Morton, now be quiet. Think of our guests. I am thinking of them. I'm thinking, why don't they get up? Oh, the idea. Anyone would think you hadn't eaten for a month. That's exactly the way I feel. When I think of that little termite McGee, probably lying up there in bed right now, just on purpose to keep me for my breakfast. Who's that? I'll go. Judge. Oh, Hooker, come right in. I'm glad to see you. I can't stay, but I've heard the news from Leela Ransom, and as your ex-rival, I simply wish to tender my congratulations. Oh, thank you, Judge. After thinking it over, Throckmorton, I feel sure that Leela's heart has guided her to the right choice. Oh, you think so, eh? Well, I hope so. Uh, by the way, I'm giving a little party for Leela this afternoon. I hope you can come, Horace. I'd love to. I hope you'll make Leela very happy, Gildy. Well, I'll try. Fine. Uh, Throckmorton, have yes. you, um... Uh, have you given Leela any kind of uh, token? Uh, token? Well, as a symbol of your plighted troth. It's customary, you know, to give the lady... Hooker, a... are you trying to peddle a second-hand engagement ring? No, certainly not. Then what are you talking about? It's not second-hand. <laughs> Leela's never even seen it. This ring has never encircled a human finger. And why don't you take it back to the jeweler? Well, for sentimental reasons, I wanted you to have it. Uh... Besides, I had Leela's name put on it. Oh, well, what'd you pay for it? Seventy-five dollars. I'll give you fifty. It's robbery, but I'll take it. Well, I want to see it first. Well, here it is. Oh, that's quite a flash. Wait a minute, what's this inside of it, this inscription? Oh, yes. To Leela from Cuddles. No, I, thought, I forgot to mention that. Hooker, did Leela Ransom ever call you Cuddles? No, Gildy, but I just hope she'd learn to. Uh, well, obviously the ring is of no use to me, but I'll give you $25 for it. $25? $25, Judge, take it or leave it. I'll take it. But what are you going to do about the inscription? Well, if I play my cards right, she might learn to call me Cuddles. <laughs> <laughs> Yoo-hoo, anybody around? Hey, don't tell me I'm the first one up. First one up, your clavicle. 
I've been up for three hours. I waited breakfast for you till 10 o'clock. I'll tell Bertie you're ready. Oh, I've had breakfast, if that's what you mean. You've, you've had it? Yeah, had breakfast in bed. You? I tell you, it was quite a treat. Things ain't like that around Whistful Vista. Things ain't like that around here, either. <laughs> Bertie! Yes, yes? Why don't I ever get breakfast in bed? Because breakfast is the only thing that gets you out of bed, Mr. Gilsley. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe when you're mad, Mr. Gilsley, things will be different. Yeah. You'll have to toe the mark then, Trocky. By the way, uh, when are we going to meet Lulu? The name is Leela. Oh, Leela. Excuse me. Uh, when are we going to get a gander at her? What's the matter? You're not ashamed of her, are you? Look here, McGee. You're not even boys, fit to... Boys, boys. So early in the morning? Oh, good morning, Mrs. McGee. I'm just telling my little chum here I can't wait to have you meet Leela. Well, we can't wait either, Mr. Gildersleeve. That's no lie. Yeah. <laughs> She's coming over this afternoon for tea, and I'm having one or two others in. Uh, Judge Hooker. Oh, how are you and the judge getting along these days? Well, we have our ups and downs. Some days I think he's our purest little jurist, and... Others, I think he's a stench to the bench. <laughs> you know, I'm very anxious to meet him, too. He sounds like such fun. Yeah, more fun than a goat. Yeah. McGee, what do you say to a little constitutional before lunch? A little what? A little constitutional, a little walk. On foot? Why, sure. I'd like to take you out and show you the reservoir. Go on, McGee, to do you good. How far is it? Oh, only about four miles. Are you kidding? <laughs> McGee, I want you to keep away from Leroy for the rest of the morning. <laughs> Uh, well, this is quite an occasion, yeah. quite an occasion. Everybody here now is a guest of honor. Where's Leela, Gildy? Uh, Leela, oh, she'll be along any minute, Judge. You know, Judge, I've heard a lot about you from our friend Gildersleeve here. Have you? Uh, I've heard a lot about you, too, Mr. McGee. Well, I'll tell you what he said about you if you'll tell me what he said about me. <laughs> McGee, you're a guest here. I've never said anything behind your back, little chum, that I haven't said to your face. Oh, so that's the way you talk about me behind my back. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, folks. That must be Leela. I'll go on. Hey, never mind, Leroy. I'll open it. Don't bother her. Leroy, you hurt me. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, I can't wait to meet her. Just think, McGee. Mr. Gildersleeve in love. Yeah. Staggers the imagination. <laughs> Boy, they're taking long enough. <laughs> I wonder what's going on out there. McGee, you stay right here. No, I just thought maybe he needed some help. He doesn't need any help. <laughs> okay. Quiet, here they come. Hey, looks like Gildy done all right for himself. I wonder what he used for bait. <laughs> uh, Leela, darling, you know most of these people. Oh, yeah. Good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon, Leela. Oh, Marjorie, honey, I love your dress. Thank you. Hello, Leroy. Hello, Mrs. Ransom. <laughs> Leroy, uh, my dear, I want you to meet some old, old friends of mine. We're not that old. <laughs> uh, Mr. and Mrs. McGee from Whistle Vista. This is Leela. Oh, I'm just thrilled to meet y'all. Drock Martin's told me so much about you. I reckon you must think I'm just terrible carrying him off like this. Dearie, I think it's the finest thing that ever happened to him. And I want to be the first to congratulate oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, isn't that nice? Well, McGee, aren't you going to congratulate Leela? Why should I congratulate her? It's Gildersleeve that ought to be congratulated. <laughs> Oh, you're just sweet-talking me now, Mr. McGee. Oh, shucks, sis. Just call me Fibber. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gilfrey, excuse me. Could you come out in the kitchen for a minute? Oh, certainly, Bertie. Will you excuse me, folks? Go right on talking. What's wrong now, Bertie? You know, I just can't get over Mr. Gildersleeve after all the years we've known him falling in love. Uh, tell us, dearie, now that it's all over, how did he propose to you? Yeah, did he get down on his knees? And if he did, who helped him up? McGee. <laughs> now, this is just between us women. Well, it was terribly romantic and all. It was in the evening, and he came with a beautiful bunch of roses. Oh, sure. You hear that, dearie? Roses he brought her. What's the matter? I bought you some roses a couple of anniversaries ago. <laughs> well, I just wanted you to make a note of it. Oh. Go on, dear. Well, I, I remember I just happened to be wearing a gown that he particularly liked. <coughs> a, a flowered chiffon, very tight through here with a long flowing skirt. I've been planning to spend the evening with a good book. Go on, you'll get plenty of time for that later. <laughs> 
Uh, we were standing there together arranging the flowers, and all of a sudden, right out of the blue, he said, well, I don't know that he'd like me telling you, but he said, what would you do if I was to steal a little kiss? Oh, my God. <laughs> Is that corny? <laughs> Keep out of this, McGee. You don't understand. And then what? Well, naturally, I tried my utmost to discourage him, but it seemed like he just refused to take no for an answer. Oh, oh not only that, he started to chase me around the room. <laughs> Throckmorton, I couldn't understand it. Uh, look, Leela, uh, when did you first begin to suspect that uh, something was cooking? <laughs> When he sang to me, just a little love, a little kiss. Just a little love. <laughs> just a little Is everybody happy? What's going on, folks? Hey, what's the big joke? Nothing, Mr. Gildersleeve. Nothing at all. McGee, go on outside till you can control yourself. Come on, get out of here. I don't hear any more of us. Leroy, show me where you're at. Leela, what's wrong with McGee? I don't know, Throckmorton. I was just telling them about our engagement and how you proposed to me, and uh, all of a sudden something seemed to strike him funny. Leela, is nothing sacred to you? <laughs> now, Mr. Gildersleeve, don't be blaming her. Is our romance nothing but a farce to be torn to tatters for the amusement of the mob? Oh, no, Throckmorton. Am I nothing to you but a laughing stock? Oh. Well, that's the impression I seem to get. Now, listen, don't be blaming it on her, Mr. Gildersleeve. Blame it on McGee. Huh? And now, listen, remember, every proposal is sweet to the woman who hears it. Mm, isn't that a fact? Uh, tell me, Mrs. McGee, how did Mr. McGee propose to you? McGee? <laughs> <laughs> McGee proposed in a leaky canoe. Yeah. <laughs> yes? <laughs> Which he had to paddle with his mandolin because he lost the paddle. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. And the song he sang to me was Pretty Red Wing. Yeah, Pretty Red Wing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this Summerfield water tastes a little funny, doesn't it, Gildy? It does not. You can say what you want to about me, McGee, but Summerfield has the finest water in the country. McGee, stop picking fights. You've made enough trouble already. Who's uh, picking fights? I just made a simple observation, that's all. Well, you're a bad boy. Come over here. Go on. I want you to apologize to Mr. Gildersleeve. Go on. Tell him you're sorry you hurt his feelings. Okay. Throcky, old chum, I'm sorry. Uh, well, that's all right, McGee. I know you're sensitive, and it's only natural. And I want to take this opportunity to say that where you're concerned, old chum... There's only one thing in this world I want. Oh, uh, what's that? Just a little love, a little <laughs> All right, McGee. All the moon shines tonight on hey. three red <laughs> Well, it's certainly being, been nice having you folks here, Mrs. McGee. <laughs> well, it's, it's been nice being here, Mr. Gildersleeve, and meeting Marjorie and little Leroy and Leela and all. I think Leela's going to make you very happy. Yeah, Throcky, she seems like a mighty nice gal. Well, I'm glad you both liked her. Well, goodbye, old chum. Thanks for the use of the den. Oh, yes, I hope you were very comfortable there. Oh, it was fine, but there's just one thing I'd suggest, Throcky. Huh? If you go to take a shower there, be careful. Why? You might cut your feet on my lawnmower. Oh! <laughs> Leroy! Good night. <laughs> Good night, all. Good night. Yeah. Several McGee and Molly appeared on this program to the courtesy of the makers of Johnson's Wax. Original music was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the makers of Kraft Cheese and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Six o'clock, Mother's late. That means the family will have to wait for dinner. But they won't wait long if Mother's smart and knows the seven-minute way to make macaroni and cheese. The trick is performed with a product called Kraft Dinner. Yes, folks, that amazing food product called Kraft Dinner gives you delicious macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. A package of Kraft Dinner contains a special kind of macaroni that cooks up fluffy and tender extra fast. And the Kraft Dinner package also holds some Kraft Grated. 
This craft grated, sprinkled through and through the macaroni, gives it good cheese flavor in a twinkling. No time used up preparing a cheese sauce or baking the macaroni either. Keep craft dinner handy for luncheon or dinner emergencies. And folks, you can help your dealer with this problem of keeping in stock by ordering craft dinner early in the week. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> yeah. The Kraft Seas Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. As you homemakers surely know, keeping a family well-fed these days is no snap job, especially if you have a tight budget to contend with. But there are highly nutritious foods that are economical, too. And one of these foods certainly is wholesome parquet margarine, the delicious, nourishing spread for bread made by Kraft. You see, parquet margarine is an economical source of important food elements. It's one of the best energy foods you can serve. And besides, it's a reliable year-round source of vitamin A because... Summer and winter, every pound contains 9,000 units of this important vitamin. Now, parquet margarine is no ordinary margarine. Parquet margarine is made by Kraft to the same high standards as all of Kraft's fine foods. You'll find parquet's quality is reflected in its delicate appetizing flavor. So for flavor, good nutrition, and economy, start serving parquet margarine tomorrow. Yes, ask your food dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine... Made by Kraft. Now let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve, whom we find approaching a milestone in his career. As water commissioner, he's been invited to make his first public address before a meeting of the Summerfield Women's Club. With the occasion only a few hours off and not a word of the speech written, time is getting a little short, and so is the great man's temper. Come on, come on. Where's breakfast? Where's my coffee? It's coming, Uncle Mort. Well, hurry it up. I need my coffee. You've got to have my wits about me today. What's the rush, Unc? It's only 7.30. I've got to get down to the office. I've got a million things to do. Got to get a haircut. Got to write a speech. Uh, by the way, Marge, would you send my cutaway out to be pressed? Did you want to press? Oh, my goodness. But you didn't say you were planning to wear your cutaway. Well, I'm certainly not planning to address the women's club in my shorts. Oh. Well, all right. Keep the shirt on. I'll have Bertie send your cutaway out this morning. Oh, and see that she gets it back. I've got to have it back here for this evening. I know. I don't know what comes over, women. They make you, they want you to make a speech and they don't let you know the day afterwards. Uh, maybe they were hoping they'd get somebody else. Oh, thank you, Leroy. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's no way to talk. Well, I don't see what you're so steamed up about anyway, huh? After all, it's just a bunch of dames. Not dames, young man, ladies. Besides, this is my first speech. It may be very important to me. Why, it's likely to be written up in the newspaper. Yeah, the indicator. Who reads that? Hasn't even got skeezics in it. Skeezics. Well, there's no telling what this speech may lead to, young man. After all, it's no small honor to be singled out of all the prominent people in this town to address the women's club, is it, my dear? I think it's wonderful, and Leroy should be very proud. There. Bertie! Oh, where is that woman? She's trying to hurry, Uncle Moore. Always remember, young man... I may be only water commissioner of this town now, but William McKinley was a water commissioner once, and he ended up in the White House. Remember that. You want something, Mr. Gillespie? The coffee. Where is it, Bertie? I've got just half an hour to get to the White House. I mean the office. Coffee's on the fire, Mr. Gillespie, but it seems like the water just don't want to boil this morning. Must be something wrong. Yeah, something wrong with your alarm clock, Bertie. Well, I've got to go. Won't be for a minute, Mr. Gillespie, as soon as the water boils. I haven't got time to sit around here waiting for water to boil. Who am I? James Watt? No, William McKinley. Yes. Very amusing, Leroy. Very amusing. Perhaps it would amuse you further to go down and clean out the furnace. I didn't get time to do that this morning. Uh, where's my briefcase? But Uncle Mort, you can't go off without breakfast. No time. I've got a speech to make. Well, here's your briefcase. Button up your coat. Uh, thanks. I've got to hurry. Uh, have I got everything? Uh, where's my hat? On your head. Oh. Uh, pretty late. I guess I'd better drive down. Shall I back to car? Shall I? Yes, do that. No. Don't ask me that again. But I can do it, Unc. I told you what you can do. Clean out the furnace. Oh, about the car, Uncle Mort. Yes? What about the car? I had to drive it to the plant yesterday. I missed the bus. 
You may find it a little low on gas. How low? Well, I couldn't start it last night. (laughs) This is a fine time to tell me. Oh, that's women for you. Get up in the morning, no coffee, have to make a speech, no cutaway, start to work, no gas. I can see there's only one way I'm going to get anywhere today. What's that? No women. Well, I was going down to the office to write my speech for tonight. You uh, heard about my speech. Oh, yes, and I just know it's going to be wonderful, Throckmorton. Think of me being engaged to such an important man. (laughs) (laughs) But but what I ran over for, have you seen the paper? Uh, Paper? No, I haven't had time. Well, I won't keep you but a minute, but there's something in it I think will interest you. Don't tell me they printed my picture. No, no, this is in the ads of Throckmorton. I know we weren't planning to get married for a while, but Hogan brought this is having a sale of dining room suites. Oh, well, that's fine. Maybe we ought to look into that some other time. Oh, my goodness, we ought to be going now, Leela. Well, I know you're terribly busy and all, but I thought if we just went down there this morning and looked, we wouldn't have to buy anything. I'd love to, Leela, but i got to get at this speech. Well, of course, if an old speech means more to you than I do. Oh, now, don't say that. I'm just trying to make a home for you, but if you care more for the women's club... I'll do it, Leela. I'll tell you what, I'll do it the first thing tomorrow. Oh, I wouldn't think of asking you to do it now, Throckmorton. I guess I can find others. Others? But Leela... No, no, you had your chance. Now just run along. You have more important things to do. Go on and do them. But if you just listen... Goodbye, Throckmorton. Oh, uh, goodbye. <laughs> What's a fellow going to do? First thing... Throckmorton? What? Are you going to run off without even kissing me goodbye? Huh? Oh. Uh, goodbye, Leela. <laughs> Goodbye, honey. Good, goodbye, Throckmorton. Write a nice speech. If I can ever get at it. Well, what can I do for you today, Mr. Commissioner? Oh, just a haircut, Floyd. Uh, make it a good one. That's the only kind we sell. Uh, I'm addressing the women's club this evening, so I'd like to look my best. Don't you worry. By the time you leave here, you look like Rudolph Valentino. Yeah. How have you been? Well, Floyd, did you ever have one of those days when women just seem to get in your hair? Uh, did I? Now, you take this morning. I got this up... This morning? Take last night. I come home tired from work, and what do I find? No dinner. Wife got in just ahead of me, been out playing bridge all afternoon. Well, it was dearie this and dearie that, and you sit down and I'll warm you up some nice supper. By the way, I knew she'd lost. Dollar fifteen, to be exact. Well, it wasn't a dollar fifteen. The idea, you know. Guy comes home tired from work, what does he find? No dinner. Wife's been out playing bridge all afternoon. Is that any kind of a life for a man, I ask you? Well, in my own case, it's a little different. Sure, it's the same with all of us. Man comes home at night, all he wants a little peace and quiet. What does he get? No dinner and a lot of talk, 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 talk. Uh, I don't know what it is about women. Now, you take me. I'm not exactly the silent type. I'll pass the time of day with anybody. Never too busy to say hello. But there's times when I just like to sit and think, you know? This wouldn't be one of the times, would it? <laughs> After all, it wasn't the dollar fifteen. I told her, I said, it's not the dollar fifteen. It's the idea of a guy comes home at night. What does he get? No dinner. De- oh, hello, Judge. Morning, Floyd. Getting a haircut, Gildy? No, an autobiography. Make it snappy, will you, Floyd? I've got to get down to the office. Right with you, Judge. Got to get Mr. Gildersleeve in the pink. He's addressing the women's club tonight. Oh, are you, Gildy? So am I. They didn't tell me you were speaking, Judge. Well, they didn't tell me you were. As a matter of fact, they were planning to have Tim Abernathy, but he dropped out. Uh, I guess they put you in the last minute. Oh, is that so? But don't let it worry you, though. Ever made a speech before, Gildy? Uh, no. Well, nothing to it. Only thing to remember is don't get nervous. Who's nervous? There's one other thing you have to remember. What's that? The speech. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Haven't even written it yet. Now, what's worrying you? Have you got a topic? Certainly I've got a topic. Water in the war. What's worrying me is how to begin it. Once I get on water, I'm on solid ground. (laughs) Well, there's one simple rule. It works like a charm. What's that? Always start your speech off with a good story. Do that and you'll have the meeting out of your hand. Well, thanks for the tip, Horace. Never fails. 
I've seen it work in my own courtroom. Why, some of my verdicts have been greeted with actual applause. The judge has got the right idea. Send them up with a smile. (laughs) (laughs) Well, all I need now is a joke. Anybody know jokes? Oh, sure. A fella came in here just the other day, told me a nifty. Maybe you heard it. It's about this guy went down to his draft board and... uh, Oh, but you couldn't use that at the women's club. (laughs) Yeah, you have to be sure your joke is one that women will understand. Oh, they'd understand this one, all right. (laughs) I'll tell you what you do, Gildy. Go to the library and get out Comerford's Compendium of Wit and Wisdom. It's got a story to fit every occasion. Uh, Comerford's Compendium? That's right. Horace, you're a lifesaver. To tell you the truth, I am a little nervous. Why, you're not going to let yourself be flustered by a few women, are you? Oh, speaking of women, I was telling Mr. Gildersleeve, I come home last night from work, what do I find? Oh, Oh, my goodness, I've got to go. Let me out of here, Floyd. You don't want any tonic? I haven't got time. Here's your money. Uh, Don't let me interrupt your story, though. Tell the judge about last night, Floyd. Don't miss this judge. You'll love it. Anybody named Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. <laughs> this must be it, though. It says water department on the door. It's locked. Shh. Maybe this is him coming. Uh, oh, uh, well, good morning. Hello, good morning. Uh, you young ladies waiting to get in here? I think so. Are you Mr. Gildersleeve? Yeah, that's right. Did you advertise for a secretary? Yes. Oh, my goodness, yes. I forgot all about that. Uh, all three of you? Yes. Mm-hmm. I have a letter. Uh, oh, fine. <laughs> uh, come in the office, won't you? Oh, <laughs> the door's locked. Of course, silly of me. I locked it myself. <laughs> See if I can find the key here now. Uh, uh, sorry to keep you waiting out here. As a matter of fact, I've been over at the library. We usually open here promptly at night. Oh, there we are. Hey, go ahead. After you. Thank you. Uh, uh, sit down, won't you? Uh, all of you. Well, uh, I can see this is going to be a difficult choice. Uh, If you're all as talented and efficient as you are, uh, uh, let's get down to business. (laughs) I suppose I ought to ask you some questions, but I'd like to try something on you first. Uh, Incidentally, this may give me some idea of whether you have a sense of humor or not, because I think a sense of humor is very important in a secretary, don't you? Oh, yes. Yes. That's one thing my mother always says. She says to me, Bessie, don't you care what they say? At least you've got a sense of humor. Oh, good. (laughs) Well, I've been working on a speech here. A man in my position has got to make a lot of speeches, you know, and I have rather an amusing story that I tell at the beginning of my speech. If you don't mind, I'll read it to you. See if you think it's funny. I'd like to get a woman's reaction. I love stories. Oh, that's fine. (laughs) I say, if Madam President, ladies, fellow speakers, I know that I have been scheduled to speak this evening on the topic, Water and the War. (laughs) That's not the joke yet. (laughs) Uh, Speaking of water, I am reminded of a seafaring man who, while traveling in the West Indies, purchased an expensive parrot as a present for his wife. (laughs) Not yet. (laughs) When he returned from his voyage, he inquired, Well, dear, how is the bird I sent you? To which he replied, It was the toughest bird I ever ate. My goodness, exclaimed the sailor. Don't tell me you ate that bird. He was a very intelligent parrot. He could speak in 17 languages. Well, replied the wife, Why didn't he say something? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Hello, Leela. Just telling a little story. (laughs) I hope I'm not intruding. Intruding? Oh, not at all. Come in. Uh, uh, These young ladies were very kindly helping me with my speech. How nice. Honest, they were. (laughs) Well? Aren't you going to introduce us? It's, it's, oh, well, I don't really know their names, as a matter of fact. I just found them here when I arrived this morning. I mean, they were waiting for me. Uh, uh, weren't you, girls? Yes, my name's Irene. Mine is Ethel. 
My name's Bessie. Oh, oh yes. I, Ethel, Irene, and Bessie. Yes, how do you do? My real name's Elizabeth, but my friends call me Bessie. Yeah. Her real name's Elizabeth, but her friends call her Bessie. Uh, uh, look, girls, I wonder if I could ask you to come back a little later, after lunch. Sure, be glad to. Oh, gracious, don't let me stand in the way of your taking them to lunch, Rockmore. Uh, now, Leela, don't you misunderstand. Please, girls, after lunch. See you later, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, uh, Leela? Yes, Rockmore? If Leela say something... Don't just stand there and look at me like that. I can explain, Leela. It's not what it looks like. I was just trying to hire a secretary. Well, don't you believe me? Oh, yes. I believe you. Then what are you crying about? Because I'm such a problem to you, Throckmorton. I don't want to be, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not a problem at all, darling. You're sweet. No, you're not. Uh, you're not a bit awful. Yes, I am. I'll come down here when you've got this big, long speech to write and everything. And all I do is interrupt you and ask you to go to Hogan's with me and look at furniture. Yeah, now, now. You don't want to feel that way about it. It's all right. I don't mind. Don't you? No. You mean you'll do it? Do what? Go to Hogan's with me and look at furniture. Oh, all right. Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. You know, I take my hat off to you homemakers who have the knack of taking simple, everyday foods and making something pretty special out of them. That's an important knack to have these days, too. Well, here's a tip. You can add extra flavor to all kinds of foods with wholesome, economical parquet margarine, the delicious, nourishing spread for bread made by Kraft. You see, the delicate, appetizing flavor that makes parquet margarine such a delicious spread for bread makes it grand for cooking, too. Yes, let parquet melt over hot vegetables to make them extra tasty. Use parquet as a flavor shortening when you bake cookies or cakes and pie crusts. And use parquet for pan frying. It makes pan fried foods taste better because it tastes so good itself. And besides, parquet margarine adds nourishment to meals. It's an excellent energy food that helps provide important vitamin A. So get acquainted with delicious economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. After a tour of Hogan's furniture department and an afternoon spent interviewing secretaries, he's finally completed his speech and now can't wait to try it on somebody. And what better guinea pig than his old friend, the druggist? Oh. Hello, PB. And how can I best serve you this afternoon? Yeah. <laughs> PB, come here. Uh, do you enjoy hearing a good story? Oh, I should say I do, Mr. Gildersleeve. Now, don't get excited. <laughs> I just want to know if you enjoy a humorous anecdote. Oh, well, I do like a nice quiet chuckle now and then. A quiet chuckle is not what I'm after. I've got to address the Summerfield Women's Club tonight, and I'm going to start off with a funny story. You are? Yes. Well, Mrs. Peavy will be there to hear you. Oh, good. She enjoys a humor story, too, although you might not expect it of her. Her laughter is of the silent variety. Yeah. <laughs> tell her to sit near the back, will you? <laughs> what I came in here for, Peavy, was to tell you my opening anecdote. I think you'll like it. Oh, I'd like to hear it. Uh, all right. It goes like this. I am reminded of the seafaring man who, while traveling in the West Indies, purchased an expensive parrot and sent it home to his wife as a present. When he returned from his voyage, he inquired, How is that bird I sent you? His wife replied, It was the toughest bird I ever ate. My goodness, exclaimed the sailor, Don't tell me you ate that bird. He was a very intelligent parrot and could speak 17 languages. Well, replied the wife, Why didn't he say something? Well, replied the wife, Why didn't he say something? Well... Well, why didn't he say something? <laughs> PB telling a joke to you is like hollering it down a rain barrel. You have no sense of humor. 
Well, now, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I heard an amusing little thing just the other day. <laughs> By George, I'd like to hear it. What was it? Well, I don't know whether it was what the fellow said or the way he said it, but it certainly tickled my funny bone. <laughs> It must have been uproarious. Well, no, I wouldn't say it was uproarious. You, you might not think it was funny at all. Funny or not, Peavy, I can't wait all night for it. What was it? Well, <laughs> the fellow was in here talking about a certain judge in Summerfield. Yes. Yeah. Hooker? Well, I wouldn't want to say, Mr. Gildersleeve, professional ethics. Yes. But <laughs> this fellow asked why Judge Hooker got two hats. Yeah. And I said, why? And he said... One is to wear, and the other is to talk through. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, Peavy. It's all well, right. Thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. I thought it was pretty good myself. It's not that good, but I'm politer than you are. Goodbye. <laughs> Is it tied? Perfect. Now, let me look at you. Oh, you look very distinguished. I think the women's club is going to be crazy about you. You're going to be crazy about the women's club, too, Unc. Why? What do you know about the women's club? I sold ice cream at their picnic last summer. What a bunch of harpies. Yes. <laughs> Boy, you're just making Uncle Mort nervous. And that Mrs. Pettibone that runs it. Wait till he gets a load of her. She'd make anybody nervous. Leroy, would you mind going someplace else? I'm just trying to tell you what you're up against, Unc. Well, don't. I don't want to know. I just want to get it over with. My stomach's upside down as it is. Now, don't you worry, Uncle Mort. I'll be sitting right beside you. And if you forget your speech, well, I'll prompt you. Well, I'll forget my speech, all right. Maybe you ought to run through it once more before dinner, huh? Yes, why don't you? I've got to go upstairs and dress, though. Maybe you could get Leroy to hear you. Uh, Leroy, do you think you could sit still long enough? Oh, sure. I'd like to hear it. All right. Uh, you hold the speech. Uh, there. Now, let me see. How does it go? Uh, first, Mrs. Pettibone introduces me. She says so and so and so and so and so and so. Mr. Gildersleeve. Wait a minute now. You've thrown me off, Leroy. Keep quiet, will you? Okay. Uh, after the applause dies down, I say, uh, uh, what do I say? How do I know? It, it's on the paper there, Stoop. Read it. Oh. Uh, you say, uh, Madam President, ladies. Oh, yes. Uh, Madam President, ladies, and fellow speakers. I note that I am scheduled to speak this evening on the topic, Water and the War. Speaking of water, I'm reminded of the seafaring man who, while traveling in the West Indies, purchased an expensive parrot as a present for his wife. Are you kidding? <laughs> what do you mean? I heard that joke in the second grade. Leroy, I'm trying to make a speech. It's not a very good speech, perhaps, but it's the only one I've got. I have only from now till dinner time to learn it. Well, I'm only trying to help you, Uncle. I don't want any help. It's too late for that. All I want is somebody who can shut up and listen. I'm telling you, Uncle, if you start off with that joke, they'll chase you out of there with sticks. <laughs> All right. William McKinley may have made a few bad speeches in his time, too. But he kept making them, and he got to be president. Okay, I'll have it your own way. Go ahead, I'm listening. No, I won't let you hear it now. Where are you going? I'm going into the kitchen where I can at least get a civil audience. My, don't you look nice, Mr. Gill, please. Dinner will be ready in two sheets. Yes, yeah, Bertie, have you got time to listen to a brief address? A what? An address, a short speech. You going to make a speech to me? Yes. Have I done something? Yes. <laughs> no, no, Bertie. I'm, I'm just trying to commit a speech to memory. I'd like to get somebody to hear me. Oh, well, you go right ahead, Mr. Gilsey. It won't bother me. Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, Madam President. Oh, go on, Mr. Gilsey. <laughs> I ain't no president. <laughs> Bertie, I'm addressing the president of the women's club. We're trying to. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Madam President, ladies, I note that I am scheduled to address you this evening on the subject water and the war. Water? What if there's any water on them string beans? <laughs> Bertie, I'm trying to make a speech. Will you forget the beans? Uh, yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Gilson. Uh, let's see, where was I? Oh, I'll skip the anecdote. Uh, <laughs> Since the earliest times, water has always been a subject of vital interest to man. Even in those... Uh, uh, Bertie, I smell something burning. Yes, it's them string beans. It, well, put some water on them. But you said... Never it. mind what I said. There's no use spoiling the supper. Yes, sir. Yes. It's not perhaps generally known that it was in medieval times that water first came into general use for the purpose of washing. 
However... Uh, excuse me, Mr. Gilsey. Oh, uh, what is it now, Bertie? Well, if we're going to have biscuits for supper, i got to put them in the oven. Well, go ahead. But you stand in front of it. No. Oh. However, with the invention of the Roman aqueduct... It... Bertie, what kind of biscuits are those? Raisin biscuits. Ooh. Where was I? Oh, water fish. What else are we having? Beef stew. I thought I smelled beef stew. Let me see. <laughs> oh, look at that. Hey, Bertie, have you got a spoon there? <laughs> I could put a little on a plate for you, Mr. Gillsleeve. Oh, no. Well, maybe just a little on a saucer. On a piece of bread. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. There you are. Oh, my goodness. This is just what I needed. Doing out here? Uh, I just found out what's the matter with me, my dear. I'm not nervous. I'm hungry. Well. Come to think of it, I didn't have any lunch today. A little solid food in my stomach, and I'll be a regular silver-tongued orator. I'll go over there to that meeting, and I'll spellbind those women. When I get through with them, Hooker will wish he'd never been born. <laughs> I feel I can truthfully say that now, more than ever, it is the husband's duty to show his wife special consideration. Yeah, look at the old goat. Your turn next, Uncle Mark. In conclusion, I am reminded of the seafaring man who, while traveling in the West Indies, what? purchased a very expensive <laughs> and sent it to his wife as a present. What's he... Hooker. And when he returned from his he said to her, how is that bird? I the bird? The old goat stole my story. Well, it's just a story. Tell some other story. What other story? I can't think of one. I can't even think of my speech now. And he could speak 17 languages. 17? Well, replied the wife, why didn't he say something? <laughs> Oh, listen to that. I could have told it better. What am I going to do now? Uncle Mark, couldn't you just skip the story and start in the middle? I'd rather skip the whole speech. Can't we get out of here? Thank you, thank you, George Hooker. Now, before we go on to the next speaker, is our finance chairman here tonight? I'll kill Hooker for this. Now, she's cool. Uh, isn't Mrs. Green here this evening? Uh, wait a minute. I can tell a joke on Hooker. What? I'll fix him. It's a little thing that Peavy got off this afternoon. Why does a politician have two hats? Yeah. Fits Hooker perfectly, my dear. Well, I'm afraid our finance chairman isn't here, but I've seen her report, so I can tell you the wonderful news. For the year 1942, the club had the smallest deficit since 1939. Uh, I wish I had a drink of water. You'll be all right as soon as you get out. Here we go. Now watch me give it to Hooker now. Now, ladies, ladies, our last speaker of the evening it is my pleasure to introduce one of the most important men in Summerfield City Administration, our Water Commissioner. Well. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve is no ordinary politician. Uh. Uh, incidentally, a politician, as you may have heard, is a man with two hats, one to wear and one to talk. <laughs> I didn't even know you were here. Well, I didn't tell you I was coming because I didn't want you to be nervous. Well, I was a little nervous as a start there. Oh, I never would have known it in the world. I thought your speech was just wonderful. Oh, thank you. It seemed to be well received. I was terribly interested in the part about how those old Romans built the aqueducts and all. Oh, well, I did a little research for that part. <laughs> and all that about the average rainfall. Oh, my, I thought that was very instructive. Oh, did you? Mm-hmm. But you know what I like the best? What? That silly story Judge Hooker told about the parrot. It, that old story, I heard it in the second grade. Come on, dear, let's go home. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Original music played on this program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve.
Ben, you want your wife to save money, don't you? Well, then tell her about this thrifty, swell-eating main dish. The macaroni and cheese she can make with Kraft Dinner. One package of Kraft Dinner serves four, and the cost is only a few cents per serving. And big news for, the, for your wife is this. Kraft Dinner cooks in just seven minutes. She'll love the way the special Kraft Dinner macaroni cooks up so fluffy and tender in a jiffy. And how the Kraft grated, which also comes in the package of Kraft Dinner, quickly gives the macaroni its delicious cheese flavor. Yes, sir, Kraft Dinner is a triple attraction. Downright good tasting, fast to make, and economical. So ask your wife to get some Kraft Dinner soon. It's wise for her to order it early in the week. That will help her food dealer with his supply problem. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. The Kraft Cheese Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. You know, just about everybody is interested in good nutrition these days. The newspapers and magazines play up articles about vitamins, food energy, good nourishment in general. And, of course, better nutrition is more important than ever in wartime. So let's look at the nutrition facts about parquet margarine, Kraft's delicious spread for bread that's an economical source of important food values. First, parquet margarine is an excellent energy food. In fact, it's one of the best energy foods you can serve. Now, that's mighty important these busy wartime days. Second, parquet margarine is a reliable food source of vitamin A. In fact, every pound contains 9,000 units of this essential vitamin the whole year round. Now, that's important, too, because vitamin A is so necessary to good health. And, incidentally, parquet is wonderfully good tasting. It's the margarine that tastes so good. So get acquainted with delicious economical parquet margarine. Ask your food dealer tomorrow for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Well, now let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve. After a hard day at the water department, he comes trudging home, shakes the snow from his collar, stamps his feet on the doormat, opens the front door, and is greeted by a warm smell that can mean only one thing. Cabbage. Well, where there's cabbage, there may be corned beef. Leroy! Hi, Arthur, right down. Oh, you're going to break your neck one of these days. I won't. Well, I'm going to break mine. Is that your sled out in the sidewalk? Yeah, that's funny. I was just going to put it away. Yeah, that's funny. I was just going to suggest that. <laughs> Judge Hooker was here a few minutes ago. He left something for you. Oh, he did, eh? What did he want? Nothing. He just left it and said, here, maybe this will shut your uncle up. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> what did he leave? A gas mask. You... <laughs> so they finally got around to the gas mask, eh? I've been after Hooker for months to get some action on that. A fine head warden he is. All he needs is a head. They expect us to fight a war with armbands? Where is the thing? Right in here on the sofa. Oh, well, let's have a look at it. Oh, I see you've already had a look at it. Oh, well, I didn't. Probably want... broken it. That's not a toy, Leroy. Okay. Try it on, Unc. Let's see. How do you get into this thing? Yeah, there. How do I look? You never look better. You... Here, take a look in the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's, let's go out and show Bertie, huh? Come on out in the kitchen. Can you see? Here, I'll open the door for you. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, swing chair. Oh, 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 what's that? It's all right, Bertie. It's only me. Oh, man. I thought they'd come for to carry me home. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll put it on again and see if it works. See if you can smell the cabbage through it. Yeah, oh, well, that's an idea. You put that thing on again, Mr. Gillsleeve, and you're going to have to find a new cook, because I will have rent. Oh, 
It's nothing to be afraid of, Bertie. Here, you put it on. Me? Yes. Mr. Gillsleeve, I'd just as soon stick my head in a lion's mouth. Oh, come on, Bertie. Leroy, you get away from me with that. Go on now. Get out of here. I got things to do. <coughs> got to sweep up this mess. Yeah, come on, Leroy. I think we better leave Bertie alone. Ain't going to have people coming in my kitchen with no gas mask. My cooking ain't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, Uncle Lord, you beat me home. Hello, Marjorie. I didn't hear you come in. It's still snowing. Leroy, I nearly fell over your sled out in front. Well, why don't you look where you're going? Y- young man, I told you to put that away. Oh, just going to. Well, just do it. How's the new secretary, Uncle Mort? Oh, uh, secretary, she'll never do. I'm going to have to let her go. Bessie, she drives me crazy. Oh, that's too bad. Say, so we had a little excitement at the plant today. Excitement? Really? What happened? We had a fire. No kidding. Did the engines come? Yes, but it didn't amount to much. The fire was out by the time they got there. Wait a minute. Uh, where did this fire start? In the shipping room, in a pile of crates. What time did it happen? Oh, it must have been around 12.30. The alarm rang while we were at lunch. Well, everybody was out of the way, eh? Were the police called in on this? I don't know. I didn't even see the fire. Some of the boys told me about it afterwards. So, they didn't even call the police. Hey, Yunk, do you think it was a fire bug? I have my own ideas of what it was. But I'll tell you one thing. By George, it's about time this town woke up. Woke up to what? To the danger. With this arms plant here, anything might happen. Oh, but Uncle Mort, it was only a very small fire. You don't think it was... I don't say it was, but it could have been. What? Sabotage. Oh, boy. I've been expecting something like this. Give me my coat. Where are you going, Uncle Mort? Now, maybe they'll listen to me. Give me my hat. Here, what are you going to do, Uncle? Give me my galoshes. Uncle Mort, you'll be careful. Give me my mittens. Uncle, wait a minute, and I'll get you my secret decoder. No time. (laughs) All I can say is it's lucky there's one man in this town who's got his eyes open. Uncle, look out! The sled! Sabotage! Good evening, Mrs. Grubley. Can't stop to talk. i got to see Judge Hooker about the sabotage. Sabotage, Mr. Gildersleeve? Yeah, fire in the arms plant just this morning. What else could it be but sabotage? Well, now I wonder. I hear a trolley jump the track on State Street this afternoon. Sabotage, Mrs. Grubley, sabotage. (laughs) Uh, Good evening, Mr. Jackson. Terrible about the sabotage, isn't it? Fire in the arms, plant, State Street trolley, jump the track. It's everywhere. Well, now I'm beginning to understand what's going on around here. For the last two days, somebody's stolen my morning paper. Sabotage, Jackson, sabotage. Have you heard about the sabotage, Mrs. Plotnick? Arms plant burned down, trolleys all off the track, and some fiend is stealing newspapers. That's terrible. And have you noticed what a cold winter they're having? It's sabotage, Mrs. Plotnick, sabotage. Well, hello, Gillisleeve. Come in. Wipe your feet first. We haven't got a moment to lose, Judge. Why, what's up? You're in charge of civilian defense here. What are you doing about it? What do you mean? You heard about the fire down at the plant? Yes. Sabotage, Hooker, as sure as I'm standing here. Now listen, Gildy, that fire was a plain accident. It was thoroughly investigated by the police. The police? Hooker, this is war. Would you use a bean shooter to sink a battleship? Nix, Gildy, Nix. There's someone in the parlor. They hear you. I don't care who hears me. The police department in this town is no good, and you know it. Gildy, please. Well, he couldn't find a spy in a bathtub. Gildersleeve. I'll handle this, Judge. Oh, hello, Chief. (laughs) Mr. Gildersleeve, as chief of police in this town, I don't have to take any talk like that from a water commissioner. Just a minute now. Let me explain something to you, Gildersleeve. The dumb cops in this town aren't so dumb. Uh, We're keeping pretty close tab on what goes on, who goes where, and why. It's nervous guys like you that make trouble for us. I'm not nervous. (laughs) Going around alarming everybody. Who do you think you are, Paul Revere? I've got my hands full now denying this thing. Denying? Well, I'm sorry, Chief. I thought that that... It's very important now for people to keep calm. And as an influential citizen, you should help them. You're a leader in this town, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, you think so, Chief? Well, I hear you're making addresses now and then. People look up to you for guidance. Well, I try to do what I can. So at a time like this, you must try to calm people, not not get them excited. Calm, huh? Maybe you're right, Chief. Maybe I had it wrong. Certainly. Well, Judge, I haven't got a moment to lose. Where are you going? I'm going out and calm people. So long. Marjorie! She's gone out, Uncle. Oh, hello, Mrs. 
Mrs. Lancel. Hello, Leroy. Your uncle just came over and kidnapped me. Yeah. Leroy, go and get Bertie, will you? Tell her Mrs. Ransom will be spending the night with us. But why, Throckmorton? Why are you being so mysterious? I just don't want you staying over there in that house all alone. That's all. Leroy, don't stand there staring. I told you to go get Bertie. Bertie! <laughs> and don't whistle. Do you want to scare the life out of people? What's the matter? What happened? It's nothing happened, Bertie. Be calm. Everybody be calm. Mrs. Ransom is spending the night with us, Bertie. You think we can find a place for her? Oh, why, sure. I'll put her in a room with Miss Marjorie, if that's all right. Well, I hope I won't be too much trouble to y'all. No trouble. I'll go right up and make the other bed so it'll be all ready. Uh, Leroy, why don't you go up and help Bertie make the bed? Oh, I don't need no help. Oh, she don't need no help. Yes, yeah, oh. <laughs> well, uh, uh, come on in the living room, Leela. Yeah, come on in. Make yourself at home. I'll be the host here, Leroy. <laughs> Uh, have you done your homework? Yep, I did it all this afternoon. Oh. Well, uh, it's time for you to go upstairs and take a bath. But I took a bath, Uncle. Huh? When? Yesterday. I thought so. Go right upstairs. And... But, Uncle. Don't argue with me. You're filthy. I want you to take a bath. Okay. If you want to get rid of me, why don't you just say so? I can take a hint. <laughs> Good night, Leroy. Good night. Sleep tight. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's so cute. Yeah. Uh, now, Throckmorton, what are you being so mysterious about? Leela, I want you to be calm. You mustn't be alarmed. I'm not alarmed, Throckmorton. Well, don't be. Whatever happens, don't worry, because nothing is going to happen. Uh, <laughs> Throckmorton, hold my hand. Remember, I'm always near you, Leela. Day or night, I can be at your side in five minutes. Uh, four minutes. <laughs> So be calm. Oh, Throckmorton, you're hiding something. Now, don't get excited, honey. There was a little trouble down at the arms plant today. Nothing much, but it looked like sabotage. <gasps> oh, hold me close, Throckmorton. There, there, now. Uh, feel better? Oh, much. Uh, tell me, what is sabotage? <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps it's better that you don't know. But where there's sabotage, there's usually a saboteur. <laughs> Leroy, I told you to go up and take a bath. I was just going on. Uh, that darn kid, Sabu. I've got to do something about him. Let's see. Uh, where were we now? Uh, you were over here, remember? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> go on. Uh, tell me all about whatever it was. Yes. Uh, what was I going to say? Uh, funny, it's gone completely out of my mind now. Well, uh, tell me about something else, then. I love it when you tell me about things. Yes, yeah, you do? <laughs> yes, I love you when you get serious. Leela, seriously? Yes, Rockmart. We've been engaged quite a while now. Three whole weeks. Leela, tell me, do you believe in long engagements? Oh, I... Uh, excuse me, telephone. Be right back. Uh, Rockmorton P. Gildersleeve. Mr. Gildersleeve, Charlie Anderson out the waterworks. Oh, hello, Uncle Charlie. How's everything out there? Everything's peachy. The dead blame sniffs. The valve is jammed and the dead blame whatchamacallit. Stop the whole dead blame pump. Won't be any water till we get it fixed. If, oh, my goodness. No water, eh? Well, how long will that take? You tell me. I can't fix a pump without parts, can I? Yes, well... All I got to say is, if I'm going to be super and gall darn tendon to this gall darn waterworks, I've got to have a little cooperation, gall darn it. <laughs> All right, Charlie, keep your shirt on. Uh, what do you need? I need a snifter valve. What do you think I need? That's what's busted, ain't it? Uh, all right. What's the nearest place we can get a, one of those things? I'll go myself if I have to. Well, you might be able to pick one up over to Grafton. Honeywell Supply Company there, if you can get the fellow to open up. I'll run right over. Uh, what is it you want now? A snifter valve. Snifter valve, God darn it. <laughs> Snifter valve, huh? Okay. And Charlie? Yes? Don't say a word about this to anybody till I've had a chance to investigate it. It may be sabotage. How's that? It may be sabotage. Maybe what? Dirty work. I call darn it. Leela, something has come up. What? Would you be game to drive over to Grafton with me tonight? Oh, Throckmorton, I'd go anywhere with you. Maybe midnight before we get there. I don't care. We'll have to get the fellow out of bed. Oh, Throckmorton, this is so romantic. Uh, do you think so? Oh, you know, I've always had a secret longing to elope. Elope? I was just going over to Grafton for a snitcher valve. Trotmorton Gildersleeve. 
Please. Now, Leela. You deliberately let me out. Leela, I did not. You did too. <laughs> Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. You know, it's just natural that when a food is particularly good, lots of people want it. Well, that certainly is the case with parquet margarine, Kraft's delicious, nutritious spread for bread. And it explains why sometimes you may find your food dealer is temporarily out of parquet margarine. The fact is, Kraft is doing everything possible to keep dealers supplied. But so many of you have discovered parquet's delicious goodness, so many of you are asking for parquet these days that, well, some dealers just can't keep up with the demand. So it's a good thing to watch your dealer's stock. Buy parquet whenever you can. No doubt about it, parquet margarine is well worth waiting for if your dealer should happen to be temporarily out. It's such a delicious spread for bread, so nutritious too, providing food energy and important vitamin A. So always watch for, always ask for, parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Let's return now to the great Gildersleeve and his one-man crusade to save Summerfield from an unknown enemy. Last night, he drove 30 miles to Grafton for a new part to repair the pump, the waterworks, which may explain why he's a little late in arriving at the office this morning. But his new secretary is there and already hard at work. Hello? Are you still there, Mabel? Well, so he said, what do you want to do? So I said, I don't know, what do you want to do? So he said, I don't know, what do you want to do? Well, you know, it could have gone on like that all night. So I said, oh, let's go to the movies. So we went to the, oh, I think the big boy's coming. I'll call you back, Mabel. Oh, good morning, uh, uh, Bessie. Good morning, Mr. Gildersleeve. Any calls? Oh, about a million, Mr. Gildersleeve. Any complaints? Oh, yes, they're all complaints. Don't be so happy about it. <laughs> this may be very bad for me, very bad. Oh, they all say there's no water. I know that. Puts me in a very difficult position. Did you tell them what I told you? Yes, sir. There's been a temporary interruption in the service owing to circumstances yes. beyond that. Yes, all I right, know. all right. I wrote it. I ought to know what it is. No word from Judge Hooker? No, sir. Were you expecting? Yes, I asked him and the chief of police to drop over. I'm holding an investigation of that affair at the waterworks last night. Oh, that reminds me, Mr. Gildersleeve. What? I turned on the water at my house this morning and nothing came out. Nothing came out. <laughs> uh, oh, hello, Judge. What is it now, Gildy? This is a busy morning for me. Yeah, what's this all about? Uh, step into my private office, will you, gentlemen? Uh, miss, uh, it's you there, Bessie. When Uncle Charlie turns up, send him right in, will you? Your Uncle Charlie. Charlie Anderson, the superintendent of the waterworks. My Uncle Charlie. Uh, cigar, gentlemen. Judge? No, thanks. Uh, Chief? Never smoke before lunch. Well, gentlemen, now perhaps you'll listen to me. Last night, I tried to call your attention to an act of sabotage. Gildersleeve, are you still harping on that? Chief, I take exception to that word, harp. Listen, instead of telling me how to run my department, why don't you learn how to run your own? I got up this morning and there was no water. Same at my house. I couldn't shave. Couldn't make any coffee. And do you know why there was no water? I suppose you think it was sabotage. It's as plain as the nose on your face. Uh, oh, uh, come in, Uncle Charlie. But, Gildy, what makes you I'm think... I'm not that... asking you to take my word for it. Ask Charlie Anderson here. Charlie was there when it happened. What's that? Oh, darn it. Yes, Charlie, I want you to tell these two gentlemen in your own words just what happened at the waterworks last night. Why the dad blame... Wait a minute, wait a minute. We're going to conduct an investigation here. Let's be orderly about it. Your name is Charlie Anderson, is it not? You know darn well it is. I know, I know. Just customary to ask. Where do you live? What's the matter with him? He knows where I live. God darn, he knows as well as I do. Yes, I know. That's 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 for the record, Charlie. <laughs> now, answer the judge's question, please. Well, God darn it, I live next to Pink's garage. Right where I've lived for 23 years. God darn it. Yep. Perhaps, uh, <laughs> perhaps you'd better let me interrogate the witness, Judge. Uh, Charlie... What went wrong out at the pumping station last night? Holy cow, you was out there. You seen it with your own eyes. I know it. But tell these gentlemen. The dad blames this the Val busted. That what you want to know? Tell us more about it, Charlie. What sort of a pump do you operate out there? Well, it's a vertical triple expansion crank and flywheel pumping engine with an independent superheater, mechanical stoker that does about 20 RPMs with 175 whoa, pounds. Whoa, <laughs> Well, you ask, I'll turn it. Tell me, Charlie. Jeepers. Yes. <laughs> yes, take it easy, Charlie. Now, now tell us, about this incident to the snifter valve, now think carefully before you answer this, 
Do you think it might have been sabotage? Sabotage, my eye. That valve was living on borrowed time. <laughs> I told Flanahan, I told him two years ago when he was commissioner she was going to blow. Told him right to his face and gall darn it, she blowed. <laughs> Your witness, Gildy. Now, look here, Judge. You got Charlie all confused. Confused my neck. You stay out of this. Uh, you listen to me, Gates. I demand adequate protection out there at that reservoir, and I intend to get it. We can't be guarding every dog, kennel, and fire hydrant in town, Gildersleeve. We haven't got enough men. If you want your little duck pond guarded, you'll have to guard it yourself. All right, Judge. If the police won't help us, this is a job for civilian defense. It's up to you as head warden to appoint a volunteer guard. All right, Gildy, I'll do that. There's no time to lose. I want you to appoint somebody to stand guard out there tonight. All right, Gildy, I appoint you. Why, God darn it! And don't you let me catch you napping either. <laughs> Come on. Leroy! Yes, Leroy! He's down in the cellar, Uncle Mort. Oh, what's he doing down there, Marjorie? I don't know for sure, but it smells like chemistry. Anything I can do for you? No, thank you, my dear. Oh, wait a minute. Have you seen my shotgun shells anywhere? No, I haven't. I bet Leroy is responsible for that, too. Hi, Alf. What do you want now? Young man, where is my helmet? Helmet? What helmet? What helmet? I suppose I've got thousands of helmets. Sure. I've got football helmets, diving helmets, King Arthur helmets. Where is my air raid helmet? Oh, all that. Don't get excited, Uncle. It's up in my room. What's it there for? Nothing. Nothing? He's keeping a turtle in it. I am not. He died. <laughs> I'll settle that with you tomorrow. Now, where are my shotgun shells? I know where they are, Mr. Gill, please. In the box with your collar button. There's only one in there. That's all there are, Unc. Don't you remember when we went duck hunting and the P 38 came by and you used Never duck- mind. <laughs> Do you remember now? Never mind. Then go get my helmet, please. Okay, Unc. You ain't going hunting tonight, is you, Mr. Gill, please? Uh, nobody. This is not duck hunting. A night like the night is cold enough to shoot a polar bear. <laughs> Here you are, Unc. Yes, thank you, Leroy. No, Bertie, I'm not hunting polar bears tonight. I'm hunting saboteurs. Oh, boy. Can I go along? No, Leroy. Are you really going to shoot somebody, Miss Gilsey? I hope not, Bertie. But if necessary... <laughs> oh, quiet, you. I'm going to guard the reservoir. Oh, Gil, can I go along? No, my boy. I'll have a man with me to share the responsibility. Oh. Well, I don't know yet. Hooker will send somebody out. Suppose you bring down my shotgun. But don't load it, Leroy. I'm going next door for a word with Mrs. Ransom. I thought she was sore at you, Uncle, from last night. Leroy, I don't like the word sore meaning angry. And Mrs. Ransom is not angry. Go get my shotgun and mind your own business. Okay, Uncle. I wonder if she is sore. I mean angry. She can't be. Not when I'm going out to defend the city against sabotage. Not on a cold night like this. Good evening, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, Leela. I trust you enjoyed a pleasant ride last night looking for a sniffling Val. Uh, uh, Leela, I'm going away. I'm going to stand guard duty tonight out at the reservoir. I'm going to carry a gun, Leela. It'll be dangerous. I thought maybe you might have something you wanted to say to a man who was going to risk his neck to defend your water supply. Yes, I have. Good night, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh! <laughs> Nine, ten, eleven, eleven o'clock, and all's well at the waterworks. I say it's eleven o'clock. Are you asleep? Uh, no, Mr. Gildersleeve. I, I wish I were. Yes. Well, you might as well be, Peavy, for the company you've been to me. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve, but I'm cold. Uh, couldn't we call it a night and go home? It, no. We have a duty to perform here, and we're going to do it. Well, look, Mr. Gildersleeve, if you insist. It is kind of lonely out here, isn't it? And cold. Yeah. All right, it's cold, but it's lonely, too. Yeah. We couldn't go home. No. No. Peavy, when you left your house tonight, did Mrs. Peavy speak to you? Yes, we usually exchange a word or two when either of us is going anywhere. 
uh, helps keep things straight. Yeah. Leela wasn't speaking to me tonight. Well, Mrs. Peavy and I understand each other pretty well by now, I guess. Tell me, what did she say to you? When? When you left the house. Did she say anything in particular? Uh, yes, she did. She told me to be sure and be quiet when I came in. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, may I ask a question? Oh, certainly. Go ahead, Peavy. What are we doing out here? What are we waiting for? Sabotage, Peavy. I told you that. But how can anyone sabotage the water when the water is frozen? They could chop a hole in the ice. Yes, I guess they could. Or they could break into the pump house and do something to the machinery. Yes, I guess they could. Or they could simply dynamite the whole business and blow the place to bits. And you and me with it. Oh, dear. I don't say they will, Peavy. Not tonight, anyway. Well, that's good. I don't expect to be here every night. Well, I guess it's time to take another look at the pump house. Yes, it's warm in there. Yes, come on. Uh, shall I bring my gun? Gun? No. For the last time, Peavy, we're going to take no chances on your grandfather's muzzle loader. M Mr. Gildersleeve, can't I uh, just bring it? Well, all right, if it'll make you any happier. If there's any shooting to be done, my shotgun will take care of it. Remember that. Come on. I really can't remember when I've been so cold. Oh, stop complaining about the cold, Peavy. Think of Valley Forge. I've been thinking of it for quite a while. It wouldn't be time to go home yet. No. No. Mr. Gildersleeve, do, do you hear something? Of course I do. Why, George, I hear a car. Yeah, that's what I hear, too. I can see lights. They're coming this way. Look, it stopped down there near the gate. You see it? Yes, I, I do. It's a saboteur. P.B., it's a lucky thing we came here tonight. I don't know. I wouldn't say that. He's getting out of the car. He's carrying something. Do you think it's a bomb, Mr. Gildersleeve? What else could it be? I'll give him a hail. Saboteur, stop where you are. We got you covered. He isn't stopping. Maybe he can't hear us. He'll hear us. I'll fire a shot over his head. That'll stop him. Here goes. Yep, misfire. Shell was pretty old. Have you got another? No. Uh, then I'll use Grandpa's gun. <laughs> for goodness sake, Peavy, is it loaded? Oh, yes. Uh, Grandpa was always ready for anything. I'd uh, stand back if I were you, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> Don't forget to aim over his head. All right. Oh, my goodness, you hit him. I didn't aim anywhere near him. Well, he's down. Come on. If he's unconscious, we can capture him. Hey, it's a woman, Peavy. <gasps> Leela, Peavy, you shot my fiance. Well, no, I, I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> Leela, Leela, speak to me. Speak to me, Leela. Are you shot? No, Throckmorton. I reckon I just fainted. But, oh, I declare, you just about scared the life out of me. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, I must say, it's a little surprising to have my own fiance shoot at me after I came all the way out here just to bring you some hot coffee. I didn't shoot at you, Leela. Peavy did the shooting. Uh, I didn't know it was coffee, Mrs. Ransom. <laughs> Leela, what in the world were you thinking of, anyway? What are you doing out here? Oh, Throckmorton, I was so ashamed letting you go off like that without even kissing you goodbye. Oh, uh, Leela, you're wonderful. Then you forgive me? Forgive you? The question is, do you forgive me? Oh, yes, Throckmorton. Goodness, how could I resist you in your air raid helmet and all? Uh, Leela, let's make a vow. Let's make a vow that we'll never let anything come between us again. Not even a sniffling vow? Yeah, nothing. Is it a bargain? It's a bargain. But it's not legal, you know, without a seal. A uh, seal? Mm, the law says you have to seal it with a kiss. You little saboteur. Darling. Mr. Gildersleeve, would you like a little hot coffee to warm you up? Oh, go home, Peavy. <laughs> Well, folks, I guess I got a little excited there. The chief is right. These amateur spy hunts usually turn out to be a lot of nonsense. But there is one kind of sabotage that's a constant danger to this country and to all of us, especially our children, and it's something we can all help to fight. That's infantile paralysis. There's a drive on against it right now, and we can help it along by sending our dimes and dollars to the president of the White House. Remember, war breeds epidemics. Let's not get one started here. Good night, everybody.
and this season for the Kraft Cheese Company, inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Ladies, your food dealer has a wonderful product that gives you a grand-tasting macaroni and cheese dish in less time than you'd believe possible. Just seven minutes cooking time, to be exact. Kraft Dinner is the name. But let me tell you why this Kraft Dinner at Macaroni and Cheese is so quickly prepared. You see, the macaroni in a package of Kraft Dinner is a very special kind. It cooks up fluffy and tender in only seven minutes. Then, too, the Kraft Dinner package contains an envelope of Kraft Grated. You sprinkle Kraft Grated on the fluffy macaroni, stirring its cheese goodness through and through. There, your Kraft Dinner macaroni and cheese is ready, and what a grand-tasting dish it is. Economical, too. One package serves four, costs just a few cents a serving. Try Kraft Dinner soon. And if you can, buy Kraft Dinner early in the week. That will help your dealer with his supply problem. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, quite likely, a lot of you have been wondering about margarine lately, wondering what it's made of, what it tastes like, whether it's really nutritious. Of course, I'm not qualified to speak for all margarines, but I can tell you about parquet margarine the delicious, nutritious spread for bread made by Kraft. Parquet is a wholesome vegetable margarine made from selected American farm products in Kraft's spick-and-span modern plants. And as for flavor, well, parquet margarine is made by Kraft to the same high standards of flavor and quality as all of Kraft's fine foods. Parquet's flavor is really outstanding. It's known, you see, as the margarine that tastes so deliciously good. Now about food value. Parquet margarine is a wholesome, nourishing food, one of the best energy foods you can serve. And every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So with these facts in mind, ask your dealer tomorrow for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Let's see what's happening to the great Gildersleeve. It's 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and the great man is just arriving home. He's a little early this afternoon, since big things are afoot. And as he enters the house, he finds Marjorie and Leroy in the parlor. Well, 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 happy little family. You're looking very pretty, my dear. Thank you, Uncle Morris. So are you, Leroy. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mr. Gildersleeve, Miss Ransom just phoned. She wants you to come right over. Oh, well, I'm going right over, Bertie. Thank you. Yes, sir. What's going on over there, Unc? Everybody's invited but me. Well, it's not exactly a party, Leroy. It's a committee meeting. We're going to raise some money to buy the town a new fire engine. A new fire engine? Yeah, the old one's got no pumping power, and besides, it never gets to the fire till half an hour too late. Oh, that's not on account of the engine, Uncle Ward. It's on account of the driver. Yeah, what are you talking about? Well, Charlie Prentice drives the fire engine, and Charlie is nuts about a girl who lives way out on Lincoln Avenue. Well, what of it? Well, every time they go to a fire, Charlie drives past her house no matter where the fire is. <laughs> I don't believe that, Leroy. Well, you can ask anybody. When they go past the house, he waves at her and she waves back at him. Unless her old man's home. Yeah. <laughs> Leroy, I'm sure that story is nonsense, but I'll look into it. We'll have no three-alarm courtships in this town if I can help it. Are you all ready to go, Marjorie? Yes, I'm ready. Excuse me, Mr. Gildersleeve, but are you going to be out for supper? No, no, Bertie. I'll be back for supper. He's just going over there to buy a fire engine. Oh, you go along, Leroy. Uh, he isn't joking, Bertie. I am going to buy a fire engine. Mr. Gildersleeve, you can't keep a fire engine in your garage. If I'm not going to buy it for myself, Bertie. The town of Summerfield's going to buy it. I'm just a member of a committee to raise the money. Oh, what do a fire engine cost, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, another committee is looking into that. I'd guess around $1,000. <laughs> My, my. Do that include the tires? Uh, oh, yes, that's with everything. How are you going to raise a $1,000, Unc? Yeah, we're going to put on some kind of entertainment. Oh, amateur night. Well, I don't know what kind of a thing it'll be exactly, but 
I suppose they'll be after me to play a prominent part. Is Judge Hooker going to be in it, too? Hooker? What can he do? Send petty crooks up for 30 days? That's not entertainment, my boy. No. But have you ever heard him recite the children's hour? No. He does. Yeah. Well, he won't do it in this show. Oh, my goodness, I gotta go. Maybe I can help Leela get a few things ready. Shall I come now, too, Uncle Mort? Uh, well, uh, suppose you just wait till you see someone else coming, then you come over, huh? You see, I haven't seen Leela at all today. I get it. Leroy. Everybody gets it, Uncle Mort. Uh, you go on, and I'll be over in a few minutes. Oh, well. Who said a man is only young once? <laughs> <laughs> afraid it was some of the others. Am I early? I hope. <laughs> well, there's nobody else here yet, if that's what you mean. Oh, good. You know, I'm so excited. I love giving tea parties, don't you? Now, let's see. There'll be Marjorie and Judge Hooker and Dr. Pettibone and Mrs. Pettibone. Yeah, why does Hooker have to ring her in for? She always wants to run everything. But this is one show Mrs. Pettibone's not going to run. Well, I hope we'll get to play opposite each other, Throckmorton. Wouldn't that be romantic? We will. Either they make you my leading lady or I don't accept the part. <laughs> and I hope it will be a costume play. Well, I think something with a little singing in it would go well. You know, I have this perfectly gorgeous costume. It was my great-grandmother Winfield's wedding gown with a hoop skirt and no shoulders and all. Oh, I'd like to see that. <laughs> I wore it in a performance we gave down in Savannah, and it was a tremendous success. Uh, the gown, I mean. The entertainment lost money, but the bow weevil was bad that year. <laughs> well, the gown is in, definitely. Uh, gracious, here I am rambling on, and I've got biscuits in the oven. I'll have to excuse uh, me, have to ask you to excuse me for a moment, Throckmorton. Oh, uh, don't get nervous. Let me come and help you. Oh, goodness, no. You sit down, and I'll be right back. Oh, no, let me help. Oh, the kitchen is a mess. And I must apologize for the way I look. I'm a perfect fright in this old apron and all. That's the cutest apron I ever saw in my life. It ruffles. <laughs> oh, gracious, it's just an old thing I had around the house. And I'm afraid I'll probably have flour on my nose. You're adorable with flour on your nose. Have I? Where? Want me to show you? Please. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> Track, Martin, let me go. It's probably burned. Oh, let it burn. Well, if you want to help me here, you'll have to help. Otherwise, I shall have to banish you to the park. Well, just tell me what to do. Well, first, stop interfering with the cook. I make no promises. Well, for wonder, the biscuits are not ruined. I'll give them a few minutes more. Leela, this is kind of fun, isn't it? Watching the biscuits? No. Being here in the kitchen together. You know what I'm pretending? What, Trout Martin? I'm pretending it's our kitchen. Oh, let's do that. Let's play house. <laughs> yes, let's. Now, first, you must put on an apron, darling, so you won't spoil your nice new suit. Here, I'll get you one of mine. Well, uh, uh, your apron would never fit me. <laughs> we'll try it. Now, stand still. Uh. Why, the strings won't even meet and buy. I told you. Are you so big or am I so small? It's you, honey. You're no bigger than a minute. Oh, why, that just isn't so, Throckmorton. Though, of course, my great-grandmother Winfield was famous for her tiny waist. And I can get her wedding gown on without any trouble, hardly. Yeah. I'll bet I can get my hands around your waist. Now, now. Gonna have to... Gonna have to send you to the parlor. Uh, Throckmorton, do me a great favor, will you? Anything for you. Uh, get me a can of anchovies. That's a lime. You'll find them in the pantry closet. Uh, where in the closet? On about the third shelf, I think, toward the back. Hey! <laughs> what is this, Pepper McGee's closet? <laughs> Oh, no, I just got hit on the head with a load of canned goods, that's all. <laughs> Leela, what is all this? You've got enough canned stuff in there to start a grocery. What's the idea? Well, maybe you'll think it's silly of me, Throckmorton, but I call that my hope check. <laughs> but Leela... Well, you see, I have this little man down at the Supreme Market, and he's just as nice. Every now and then he slips me an extra can of something, and I just put it away here for when we're married. But, Leela, that's hoarding. I'm not hoarding, Throckmorton. I'm just saving up. If you can tell me that... If 
if you can tell me the difference between that and hoarding, it's unpatriotic, Leela. Are you implying that I'm unpatriotic, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, 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 you don't mean to be. You might be interested to know that I had a grandfather who was a general. Well, he's probably turning over in his grave right now, then. <laughs> the army needs the food, Leela. That's why it's a crime to buy any more than you need. Oh, so I'm a criminal now. Well, I didn't say that. Yes, you did. I scrimp and save to make everything nice for you, and this is the kind of thanks I get. Uh, this is the way you play house. <laughs> oh, brother, what a start for a tea party. Oh, thank you, Marjorie. Well, if you ask me, I think what we ought to do is give a concert. After all, we have some very fine talent here in Summerfield. Mrs. Ransom plays the piano beautifully. Oh, Throck, Ma. You do. And I'm told that our friend Peavy here is a real artist on the flute. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. I, <laughs> I haven't played since the town band broke up, and then it was a piccolo. Oh, well, that's all right. You can practice up, Peavy. Then there's Dr. Pettibone here. I'm sure he has his musical side. How about it, Doctor? Oh, I'm a wizard with the saw. <laughs> yeah. You see, folks, we have a wealth of musical talent present. And, of course, I can always sing if necessary. I don't think it'll be necessary. <laughs> what do you mean, Hooker? Well, you're charging admission for this. You've got to give them something for their money. I know, a costume drama. Yes. Now, I recall a performance we gave some years ago of a tale of two cities in which I happened to play the part of Sidney Carton. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. That is a far, far worse performance than I've ever heard. <laughs> Well, it's better than your singing. Yeah. Why don't we have a minstrel show? I'll be down to get you in the taxi. Yes, yes, love. Yes, love. Let's agree on one thing. Shall we, everyone? There will be no singing. Yes. Time for that. If there's anything worse than an amateur baritone, I don't know what it is. Well, now, just a minute, Mrs. Excuse Pettibone. Excuse me, Mr. Gildersleeve, but while I have the floor, I should also like to say that I don't think we're going to accomplish anything at this meeting unless we organize. It organize? Yes. I think we should have a chairman. I nominate Mrs. Pettibone. Oh, that's very kind of you, Judge Hooker. But I'm afraid with my many other duties, the women's club and so on, all in favor, I oppose nobody. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I, I guess I have nothing to say about it then. Look her eyes. I suppose my first act should be to appoint a secretary. And for that, I think we should choose one of our non-performing members. Uh, Mr. Peavy. He plays the piccolo. Nevertheless, I shall appoint Mr. Peavy. Mm -hmm. But I, I've never been a secretary before, Mrs. Pettibone. All you have to do is write down the minutes. Uh, give him a pencil and paper, somebody. Now, there arises the question of what type of entertainment we're going to give. Chairman asked what type of entertainment. I think we ought to give them a good drama, like a tale of two cities. Well, why don't we give them something more popular, something that's been on Broadway? Oh, I think a costume play would be I quite... still think we ought to do something musical. Uh, just a moment. Would you repeat those suggestions, please, for the minute? <laughs> yes. Uh, never mind, Mr. Peavy. As chairman, I think I can settle this very quickly. It happens that I have a play which I wrote myself that I think would be perfect. The chairman suggested own play. Is there any singing in it, Mrs. Pettibone? No. Oh. Gildersleeve wants to sing. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure you'll like the story, Mr. Gildersleeve. It's about this terribly attractive man. He comes home from Paris and runs into this sweet young thing. Oh, Leela. And they fall madly in love. Oh, sounds very interesting. Go on. Uh, would you repeat that, please, for the minute? <laughs> Later, Mr. Peavy. I won't tell you the whole plot now, but it's a wonderful part for the right man. Oh, great. And I think it would be perfect for Judge Hooker. Yeah, Hooker? I thought this was supposed to be a romantic part. Well, whom would you suggest, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, I wouldn't want to suggest anybody, but there must be two or three people here who could do better than the part than Hooker. Two, anyway. 
Or one, at least. <laughs> Would you repeat that, please, for the minute? Oh, never mind. Don't tell me you think you could play the part, Gilder. Well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> Can you imagine Gildersleeve as a lover? <laughs> <laughs> Why, Gildersleeve, you're 60 pounds overweight. I told you six months ago, keep eating those starches, you'll bust those arches. <laughs> Nobody loves a fat man, you know that. <laughs> Leela, do you agree with that? Well, no, Throckmorton, of course not. But I do think they've got a point. Oh, you too, eh? Oh. Now, don't take it so personally, Throckmorton. After all, your waistline is something you just can't get around. Oh, <laughs> very good. Gildersleeve's waistline is something you can't get around. <laughs> Wait a minute. I don't see that that's so very funny. Now, Marjorie. My uncle may be a little big, but I'd rather be big like him than small and mean like all of you. <gasps> Never mind, my dear. Let you and I go home. And he can sing, too. Gildersleeve, you're acting like a spoiled baby. Really, Mr. Gildersleeve, I must say. Rock Martin, in my own house, I think you might show a little more consideration. I'll show you some consideration. I'm going home. But before I go, I want to say that for a bunch of ignorant, incompetent, stupid people, this committee takes the case. <laughs> Would someone repeat that, please, for the minute? <laughs> Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. You know, that nursery rhyme about old Mother Hubbard and her bare cupboard has a pretty up-to-the-minute ring to it these days. Because many of you are finding, I suppose, that favorite food products are sometimes missing from your grocer's shelves. Take the case of parquet margarine, for example, Kraft's delicious spread for bread. Even though Kraft is doing everything possible to keep dealers supplied, some dealers just can't keep up with the ever-increasing demand. That's because more people are asking for parquet margarine than ever before. They've discovered how deliciously good parquet is, how nutritious it is, too. Of course, maybe you've been lucky. Maybe your dealer has always had enough parquet to go around. But with a war on, it's wise to watch your dealer's stocks and buy parquet whenever you can. Remember, besides being an excellent energy food, parquet margarine is a reliable year-round source of important vitamin A. So always watch for, always ask for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve and his campaign to provide Summerfield with a new fire engine. Several days have passed. He's still on the outs with Mrs. Pettibone and her committee, but in the bosom of his family we find him his old genial self. Bertie, you're a queen. I'll bet there's not another cook in the country who can make coffee cake like this. Oh, I didn't make that, Mr. Gill, please. Miss Ransom sent it over. Oh, well, now, wasn't that nice of her? <laughs> like another piece, Mr. Gill, please? No. And if you see me reaching for one, take it away from me. I'm reducing. Reducing? What's come over you, Unc? Well, nothing. What's so strange about my reducing? Can the leopard change his spots? Huh? Can the ch hippo change his potamus? <laughs> See, Roy, that's not very nice. Well, let the boy speak his mind, my dear. I seem to be fair game for everybody else. I don't know why my own nephew shouldn't pass a few remarks. There. I thought those people were very rude making fun of you the other night. Leroy should have better manners. Well, I may have flown off the handle a little myself, Marjorie. If the truth be known, I am a trifle overweight just at present. Yeah, you're really filling out there, Unc. All right, that's enough. You're developing quite a rotunda. Yep. <laughs> Leroy, that'll be quite sufficient. I've been noticing it too, Mr. Gilson. You, you too, Bertie. <laughs> yes, sir. The last few weeks you've been busting all the buttons off your pajamas. Yes. Well, I think I'll drop a pound or two and get back into fighting trim. A pound or two, he says. Say, here comes Judge Hooker. Oh, Judge Hooker, eh? Coming around now, huh? They'll all be coming around now, I suppose. Now, Uncle Mort, be nice to him. I know he must feel terrible about the other evening. Well, he'll have to be a little nice to me first. I'll go. Hi, Judge. Morning, Leroy. I haven't seen you for some time. Well, anytime you want to see me, I'm right here. <laughs> Marjorie, you're looking very charming this morning. Thank you. Bertie, how are you? Just fine, Judge. Just fine. Got all over that, uh, whatever it was? Oh, yes. Yeah. I had a little misery last night, but it's gone now. That's good. Well, Gildy. Well, Judge, I suppose you've come here to apologize. Well, we talked it over. You and... can forget about what happened the other night. I've already dismissed it from my mind. 
And you with it. Now, Gildersleeve, don't be a sore head. Listen, is that any way to apologize? Gildersleeve, you don't deserve an apology. But the unfortunate fact is we can't get along without you. Sure. If we're going to get anywhere with this project, we've got to have you in on it. Uncle Mort, I think you ought to. Well, I'm willing to go halfway with you, Judge. Well, we'll go the other half. All right. Who gets a lead in the play? <laughs> well, now, Gildy, we went into all that the other night. Yeah, uh, so I remember. Let's face it, old man. If you don't fit the part... Who says I don't fit the part? Well, Mrs. Pettibone wrote the play. She ought to know. Mrs. Pettibone. We're having another meeting at her house. And if you just come around, I'm sure... Hooker, I wouldn't go near Mrs. Pettibone's house if it were the last house on earth. And you can tell her so. Gildersleeve, you're just being bullheaded. Out of my way. I'm due down at the office. I'm a busy man, Hooker. I haven't got any time for charade. Mrs. Pettibone. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. She's been laying for me. Oh, hello, Mrs. Pettibone. Oh, you've been avoiding me, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, no, I haven't. I've been busy. Oh, yes, you have. But you know, I don't blame you. A man in your position must have so many things on his mind. Well, as a matter of fact, I have. Now, today, I have to see a man at 11, and then I have to see another man at 11.30. Oh, think of that. Well, I hate to impose on you when you're so frightfully busy. But we're having another meeting tonight at my house, and I really feel that the water department should be represented. It's such a worthy cause. Well, as you know, Mrs. Pettibone, the fire engine is very close to my heart. Frankly, Mr. Gildersleeve, I don't see how we could accomplish anything without you. There's always Judge Hooker. Oh, you know, Judge Hooker is a dear old thing. But then he is old, and he tends to forget things. And he dawdles. Yeah. Now, one thing I'll say for you, Mr. Gildersleeve, you're not a dawdler. You're a doer. Yeah. Well, I've always prided myself on getting things do, uh, done. <laughs> that is the kind of man we need, the executive type. Oh, the world is so full of dreamers, isn't it? And there are so few of us who really get things done. Oh, dear, the world. What are we going to do about it? Uh, oh, well, uh, see you at 8 o'clock tonight. But wait a minute. I'm simply thrilled that you can come. Uh, oh, and be sure to bring Mrs. Ransom. I think she's so sweet. I told her you'd call for her. But, but... I'm so glad I ran into you. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. Oh, this is going to be one of my bad nights. I want to say, quiet, please. Everybody quiet. At any moment now, Mr. Gildersleeve will be arriving. We are very happy to have him back with us, and let's show him we are, shall we? Well, I don't know why not. Uh, how shall we do that, Mr. Pettibone? Well, that's a very good question, Mr. Peavy. Well, in the first place, none of us think Mr. Gildersleeve is fat anymore, do we? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't be so literal, Peavy. He means nobody should make any remarks about his figure. And one more thing. Remember that Mr. Gildersleeve is not completely won over yet. The question of the play remains a delicate point, and I suggest you let me handle that. Shall I go, love? Will you, love? Yes, love. <laughs> now, uh, we're all clear on everything? Yeah, oh, yes. So. Well, of all people, Gildersleeve and Mrs. Ransom. Gildersleeve, I never saw you looking better. Mrs. Ransom, you look like a million dollars. Oh, now, don't. Oh, I should have gone myself. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I'm so glad to see you. And Mrs. Ransom. Good evening, Mrs. Pettibone. Mrs. Pettibone, I want to make one thing clear to your committee. I'm only here because I believe in fire engines. Oh, so public-spirited. I quite understand, Mr. Gildersleeve, and believe me, all of us appreciate your generosity. Good evening, Throckmorton. Martin. Leela, glad to see you. Good evening, Judge. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. You've lost a little flesh, haven't you? <laughs> I don't really know, Peavy. I fluctuate, of course. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, uh, Mrs. Ransom, won't you sit down, please? Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> now, as you all know, we've made quite a little progress in planning our entertainment. And I would like to call in the chairman of the different committees to make their report. Let me see now, Judge Hooker. I believe you were the auditorium committee. Yes, ma'am. I'm very happy to report that we've been offered the Elks Hall for the night of the show. Will it cost us anything? No, but we'll have to let the Elks in at half price. <laughs> oh, uh, thank you, Judge. Isn't that splendid, Mr. Gildersleeve? Just fine, Mrs. Pettibone. Congratulations, Judge. Uh, Mrs. Pettibone, can uh, I make my report now? Mr. Peavy, if you don't mind, I'll call on my husband first. I know he has some very good news for us on the ticket situation. Speak up, love. Well, Fred Rosenoff is going to print the tickets for us. And if they're all sold, that'll bring in almost $1,500. Oh, I think that's marvelous, Dr. Pettibone. That's an awful lot of money. Well, of course, so far we haven't sold any. It, oh. 
Is Rosenoff charging us to print the tickets? Oh, no. He has a bad gallbladder I'm looking at. Yeah. <laughs> Could I make my report now, please? Just a minute, Peavy. Uh, Mrs. Pettibone, I'd like to say a few words. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve will be so pleased, won't we? Oh, of course. Oh, yes. you thank you, thank you. We'd just like to say that I think the committee has done a wonderful job, and I'm proud to be associated with the committee. Uh, that's all. Oh, uh, Mrs. Pettibone, I'd like to have some idea about the show. Oh, of course, my dear. One thing I meant to tell you, we have a wonderful part for you in which you simply must wear that lovely dress you were telling me about. Oh, now, isn't that thrilling, Throckmorton, you hear? That's fine, Lily. Oh, may I say at this time how pleased I am that we've all forgotten our little differences. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure we're all going to put our shoulders to the wheel and all pull together. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, there's just one thing now that would make the evening perfect. Uh, what's that, Mr. Pettibone? Oh, I've never heard you sing. Won't you favor us with a selection? My gala, she stops at nothing. Uh, now, Mrs. Pettibone, I told you I'm much too busy to take part in the oh, entertainment. But just for our pleasure this evening, Mr. Gildersleeve, uh, please, I'm told you really have a golden voice. Well, I used to do quite a bit of singing in my younger days. Oh, he sings beautifully. Do sing, Throckmorton. Will you play for me, Leela? I'd love to. Well, what shall it be? Something short? Uh, how about drink to me only with thine eyes? Uh, nothing for me, thanks. Just... <laughs> <laughs> why, please? Why not? Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine. Or leave a kiss within the cup, and I'll not ask for Thirst that from the soul doth rise, doth ask a drink divine. But my thy of the Job's nectar sip, I would not. For thy. Well, uh, how magnificent! Oh, you think so? Oh, simply thrilling, and it's given me a perfectly marvelous idea for my play. Oh, it has. Yes, a twist to the story, where a famous opera star comes to this little town where the heroine lives. That's Mrs. Branson. Oh. And of course, when she hears him sing, she falls head over heels in love with him. Naturally. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, you've got to play the part. Oh, no. Now, please, please, remember our cause, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, for the sake of the fire engine, all right. Oh, splendid. That's fine. Oh, isn't that wonderful? I'm so happy. I just know the play is going to be a tremendous success. Yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll take in enough money to buy two fire engines. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Pettibone, could I make my committee report now, please? Oh, of course, Mr. Peavy. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, just what was your committee? The fire engine committee. Oh, yes. And the report? There won't be any fire engines for sale until after the war. Oh! <laughs> kidding around here about Gildersleeve's stomach, but I guess we're all a little concerned about our stomachs these days and what we're going to put in them. They tell me the Army's going to need half of our processed foods this year, which leaves just half as much for you and me as we've been accustomed to. That's why they're going to put in this point rationing system. There'll be a lot of jokes about rationing. I hope I get my share of them. But when you come right down to it, rationing is the only fair way of distributing the food that's available. It gives women with war jobs the same chance as those who can spend the whole day shopping around from market to market. And the poor man will get just as much as the rich man. It's the only fair and democratic way of handling it. Another thing. You hear a lot of vague talk about how much of our food has been going to our allies on Lend-Lease. We looked into that. And do you know how much of our food all our allies got last year? Only 7.5%. And if that contributed even a little... To what the Russians are doing to the Nazis right now, brother, it was cheap. Good night, everybody.
Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to listen again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Have you discovered the speedy way to make swell macaroni and cheese? These days, clever women prepare that favorite main dish without any fuss of making a cheese sauce, without any bother with blanching and baking the macaroni. They simply open up a package of the product called Kraft Dinner. They cook the special Kraft Dinner macaroni quickly in boiling water. And with the Kraft grated, which also comes in each Kraft Dinner package, they sprinkle the cheese flavor through and through. Presto, the dinner main dish is ready in only seven minutes cooking time. And the cost is only a very few cents a serving. But the best part of it is, Kraft Dinner Macaroni and Cheese is extra special good. Fluffy, light, and drenched in cheese flavor. When good cooks discover the seven-minute way of making macaroni and cheese, they say never again to the old-fashioned slow method. Of course, Kraft Dinner is extra popular these days. You can help your dealer with his problem of keeping stocked by ordering your Kraft Dinner early in the week. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Meantime, let me tell you what a friend told me the other day. She said, we tried spreading parquet margarine on our bread for the first time last week, and we were certainly surprised. Why, it's really delicious. Well, I don't know why anyone should be surprised that parquet margarine tastes so good, because parquet margarine is made by Kraft. Yes, and made to be just as good tasting and nutritious as all of Kraft's fine foods. Parquet's flavor is delicate and appetizing, just right for a really satisfying spread for bread. What's more, parquet margarine adds important food values to meals. It's an excellent energy food, one of the best you can serve. And besides, every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. Yes, parquet margarine is both nutritious and delicious, and it's wonderfully economical, too. So why not treat your family to parquet margarine tomorrow? Just ask your food dealer for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now let's see what the great Gildersleeve is up to. For a week, he's been strictly on the job at the water department, but today, with everything running smoothly, he's been able to give a couple of hours at lunch to laying out future strategy for Eisenhower and MacArthur. So we find him now at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, returning to his office to sign some letters before proceeding to the barber shop. Hello. You still there, Mabel? So then we hung around for a while and... Oh, wait. I think somebody's coming. I'll call you back. Uh, miss. Uh, you there. Bessie. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. I was so bu busy finishing these letters, I, I didn't hear you come in. Yeah, that's just what I was going to ask. They're not done yet? All but three, Mr. Gildersleeve, and I'll have those for you right away. But I only gave you four. If any phone calls? No, sir. Oh, yes, there was one from the newspaper. The indicator. What did they want? Well, it was kind of personal, Mr. Gildersleeve. What do you mean? Who called? The editor? No, sir. He said he was a society editor. What did he want? He asked when you were going to <laughs> get married. Oh, well, the date hasn't exactly been set yet. What did you tell him? Oh, I didn't tell him anything, Mr. Gildersleeve. Good. I just said what you told me to say when people called up and I didn't know what to say. Huh? You did what? Well, I just did what you told me, Mr. Gildersleeve. He asked when you were going to get married and I didn't know. What and... did you say? We regret there's been a slight delay owing to the shortage of manpower. <laughs> That's all, brother. That'll fix it nicely. But, Mr. Gildersleeve, these letters... I'll sign them in the morning, and if the phone rings, don't answer it. Oh, that Bessie, I'm going to have to let her go. Well, speak of the devil. Oh, hello, Floyd. Judge and 
I was just talking about you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Are you living at this barber shop now, Hooker? Every time I come in here, you're here. Every time I'm here, you come in. Yes, well, <laughs> just give the judge a quick trim, Floyd. There's no use trying to make him look good. Gildersleeve, go over there and sit down, will you? And keep out of my hair. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I was just saying to the judge here, Mr. Gildersleeve, I can't imagine you a married man. I'd like to know why not. Well, you know what they say. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. When none of us get any younger... Maybe you're not. By the way, Gildy, uh? when are you and Leela planning to get married? Why do you want to know? Just interested, that's all. Well, we haven't set the date yet. What's the matter, Gildy? Is she giving you the runaround? Why do you ask that? Well, you've been engaged quite a while now. People are beginning to talk. Yeah. Beginning to say, what about this? Is she going to marry him or isn't she? Of course she's going to marry him. Uh, me. We're just waiting till... Well, we thought we'd wait a while, that's all. Well, that's women for you. Try to pin them down and they give you the slip every time. Yeah. Now, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I made the mistake of going with a girl for three years. Yes. That was before I met my present wife. Everything was lovey-dovey from the start, but there was always a million reasons why she couldn't possibly marry me till the day after tomorrow. So in the end, what happens? A cattleman from Kansas moves in, and I wind up married to my present wife, which is okay. We've got a nice little place there. Yeah. Now, you take my advice, Mr. Gildersleeve. Don't make the mistake I made. Pin her down. Get tough. Yeah. Floyd, you know, you could be right. Get tough. And what's more, they love it. Why, 20 years ago, if I'd known as much about women as I do today, it would have been a different story. You'd have married the other girl? I wouldn't have gotten married at all. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute now. You got me confused. <laughs> That's the way to treat women, all right. Now, look here, Lila Ransom. I've stood all the shilly-shally, and I'm going to. I want an answer, and I want it now. Boo! Boo! Leela, never do that to people. It's liable to stunt their growth. I'm sorry, Throckmorton. Come in, won't you? Uh, thank you. I was coming in anyway. I was just going to call you up. I've had the most wonderful news. It'll have to wait. Leela, I demand to know when we're going to be married. Well, for goodness sake, is that all? It, all? Isn't it important to you? Of course, but I've been trying to tell you, Throckmorton. My only sister, Winfield, is coming to visit me tomorrow. That's fine, Leela, but what's that got to do with our wedding day? Why, I wouldn't think of getting married without having Winfield at my wedding. Huh? And besides, I wouldn't want to rush into anything without consulting her. Yes. I hope she likes you, Throckmorton. I hope so. What if she doesn't? Oh, that just couldn't happen, darling. I'm sure it couldn't. Because when you try, you can be so charming. You will try, won't you? Well, of course. You see, Winfield's married to a Yankee, just like you. But he's the handsomest man I ever saw in my whole life. I hate him. <laughs> he's an engineer, and he's doing some secret construction work for the government at Camp Fuller. So naturally, Winfield and little Michael wanted to be near him. It, Michael? Hmm. That's their little boy. He's just about Leroy's age, but he's not like Leroy at all. Well, that's something. <laughs> Look, Lita, I'll be good to your sister and I'll be good to her little boy. But answer me one thing. When are we going to get married? I'll tell you, Throckmorton. I'll let you take us both to lunch tomorrow and we can ask her then. Oh, mercy, that reminds me. Here it is almost 9 o'clock and I've got to get up and meet a 6 o'clock train tomorrow morning. Uh, can't you stay up just a little longer, Leela? I'll meet the train. Oh, that's sweet of you, Throckmorton, but I'd rather. All right, I'll go. Throckmorton, you're not going away angry. No, I'm going home and think about the Romo plan. Wedding bells. Hey, Aunt, wake up. It's after 7 o'clock. <laughs> Go away. I want to dream some more, Leroy. Well, hurry up or you won't get any buckwheat cake. If that's different. I'll be right down. Okay, I'll... Yeah. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Leroy. What do you want? My cake will get cold. Uh, never mind. I have something important to tell you. You certainly picked the crummiest times to give out with the old malarkey. <laughs> <laughs> this is not malarkey. <laughs> Shut the window. Turn off the cold air. Turn on the hot. I heard that, Leroy. I meant turn on the heat. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, listen to me, young man. Mrs. Ransom's sister is coming to visit her. Is she good-looking? You're getting too fresh. 
The lady is arriving this morning, and I want you to make a good impression on her. Okay, what do you want me to do? Stay out of sight. <laughs> she has a little boy, and when the proper time comes, it may be all right for you to play with him. But until I say so, don't you go near him. Up here. Oh, good morning, Marjorie. I was just about to get up. I sent Leroy up because Bertie's making buckwheat cakes, and now Leroy's cakes are cold. Oh, I'm sorry, my dear. I was telling him how to behave himself while Mrs. Ransom's sister is here. Oh, when did she come? This morning. I'm eating him for lunch today, but we'll have him here soon. And I want everybody to be as nice to her as possible. Well, I'll certainly do all I can, Uncle Mort. And I'll keep an eye on Leroy. Oh, sure. Let's all keep an eye on Leroy. No, young man. You better start keeping an eye on her, Uncle. If you know what time she came in last Leroy, night... mind your own business. Mr. Gildersleeve, what's the matter with this family? Oh, good morning, Bertie. I've been cooking here a long time, but this is the first time my buckwheat cakes ever run into a boycott. If... Now, Bertie... It's discouraging, Mr. Gillsleeve. Oh, but your buckwheat cakes are wonderful, Bertie. Maybe they are, maybe they ain't. All I know is that you and Leroy walked out on them, and your uncle won't even get out of bed to try a sample. Oh, but, Bertie, I was telling him about Mrs. Ransom's sister. She and her little boy are coming to visit Mrs. Ransom, and all of us must do our very best to make them happy. Yes, sir. That gives me an idea. Yeah. What's that, Bertie? I wonder, do they need a good cook? Oh, gangway, everybody. Get downstairs and plow into those buckwheat cakes. <laughs> Uh, nice windy corner I picked to wait on. Why can't women be on time? Throckmorton! Uh. Oh, Throckmorton, are we too frightfully late? Only about three quarters of an hour. Oh, good. Huh? Uh, Throckmorton, I want you to meet my sister Winfield. Winnie, this is Throckmorton. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Why, darling, he's a spitting image of Harvey Diefenbach. Only Harvey was thin. <laughs> Well, is indeed. I see what you mean. I don't. Oh, you'd have to know Harvey to appreciate it. <laughs> well, well, this little man must be Michael. How are you, Mike? I'm very well, thank you. And you, sir? Uh, huh? Oh, oh, yes. Well, I'll bet you're a pretty tough customer. You want to fight, Mike? Put up your dukes. Oh, no, thank you. I'm not allowed to fight. Yeah. Oh, Winnie, I'm so glad you're here. It's going to be just like old times. Won't it? You know, Leela and I were always together. People used to call us the heavenly twins. Oh, really? Well, you don't talk alike. Oh, well, Winnie's been up north so long, she talks like a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> In the old days, we were more like chums than sisters. Uh, remember when we used to go on dates together? And dress alike. Oh, you remember the summer at Virginia Beach when we switched bowls? Yes, and remember the summer I was so crazy about Tubby Walker? Till the day of the picnic. <laughs> uh, speaking of picnics, ladies, how about a little lunch? Oh, gracious, here we are rambling on like a couple of schoolgirls and forgetting all about Throckmorton. You know, I can't get over how much he looks like Harvey Diefenbach. Who on earth is Harvey Diefenbach? Who is Harvey Diefenbach? Well, Harvey was an old beau of mine that I got engaged to once when I was young and foolish. Oh. <laughs> I lie if every time I think of him. You were dead serious at the time, though. Oh, gracious, yes. And Winnie couldn't see him for dirt. She did everything in her power to break it up. Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, how about a little lunch, huh? <laughs> I don't mind telling you, I'm starved. Oh, Throckmorton, I hope you don't mind, but we've only got five minutes to get to the hairdresser. But I thought I was taking you to lunch. Well, that's terribly nice of you. Well, we you... thought if you didn't mind, you could take little Michael to lunch while we have our hair done. Uh, uh, don't you think that would be a good idea? Well, uh, what about the question we were going oh, to ask? Oh, Throckmorton, the... you're a lamb. Isn't he a lamb, Winnie? Now, Michael, you go with Uncle Throckmorton and have a nice lunch. We've got to run. Be a good boy, Michael, and do what? Uncle Throckmorton tells you. Have a good time, you man. You're here. See you later. Uh, come on, Mike. My name is Michael. Yeah, Michael, come on. We're going into the hotel and have lunch. But I'm not hungry. Well, I am. I've been waiting an hour. This isn't a very nice hotel, is it? It's the best hotel in Summerfield. I've been in bigger ones. Sorry it doesn't measure up to your standards. Let's sit here. Yes, sir. Now, how would you like to eat, Michael? I see they've got roast beef today. Well, I don't like roast beef, thank you. Don't like roast beef? What boy doesn't like roast beef? Well, uh, how about uh, pork chops? Well, I'm allergic to pork. What? It makes me break out. Oh. 
Well, how about a poached egg? You think you can handle that? I had one for breakfast. Wasn't very good either. Look, Michael, how about a nice bowl of milk toast? Let's go away from here. I Just don't... a minute. But I really don't see anything. Sit down, you. I'd like a little something to keep body and soul together. I'm going to have roast beef, baked potato, peas, succotash, and pie a la mode. And you, you little squirt, you can sit there and watch me eat it. The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. I'm sure you mothers and housewives have noticed that when you cook or bake something especially good for your family, it disappears mighty fast. Well, the same thing often happens to a food product that's exceptionally good, and that explains why your food dealer may sometimes be temporarily out of parquet margarine, Kraft's delicious spread for bread. Of course, Kraft is doing everything possible to keep dealers supplied, but these days so many people prefer parquet margarine that some dealers just can't keep up with the demand. Now, I don't mean to say that you can't get parquet margarine. Likely as not, most of the time you can. But it is wise to watch your dealer's stocks and buy parquet whenever he has a supply. Remember, parquet is an excellent energy food and a reliable year-round source of vitamin A. So it's good advice to always watch for and always ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now let's see how the great Gildersleeve is coming. The last we saw of him, he was stuck with little Michael at lunch while Leland, her sister, went off to the hairdressers. Well, lunch is over now, and a couple of hours have passed, and we find Gildersleeve plodding up the front walk to his house, still with little Michael. Uh, Come on. What are you waiting for? Why are we going in here? This is where I live. Oh, it's kind of funny looking, isn't it? (laughs) Listen, I know it's not much, but it's home to me. Now, come on. Whose bicycle is that? That's Leroy's bicycle. He doesn't take very good care of his things, does he? Yeah. Well, no, he doesn't. But he's a good kid. I'm just beginning to appreciate him. <laughs> uh, Bertie! Oh, you didn't wipe your feet. Yeah. <laughs> this is my house, and I can come in with dirty feet if I want to. That you, Mr. Gilsley? Uh, Bertie, has Leroy come home from school yet? I'll say he's home. I just caught him out in the kitchen stuffing himself with the applesauce I made for dinner. I don't know what's for dinner, Uncle. That's all right, my boy. If you're hungry, it's a sign you need food. I like to see a boy eat anyway. Huh? (laughs) Leroy, this is Michael. Hi. Michael, meet Leroy. How do you do? I've been looking forward to meeting you. Is he kidding? (laughs) Now, Leroy, remember that Michael is your guest. My guest? Yes, I thought it'd be nice if you two boys played together all afternoon. Oh, but Uncle, I was just going over to Piggy. She's expecting me. Leroy, I'm asking you as a favor to me. But I thought you told me to keep away from the little punk. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you entertain the little punk and don't give me an argument. Mother says it's not polite to whisper. Uh, yes, and you're right, too, Sonny. <laughs> Here, Leroy, here's a dollar. Take it and entertain your little friend in any way you see fit. Okay, come on, Mike. Where are we going? Down to the drugstore. Do you like comic books? Oh, Mother doesn't allow me to read comic books. That's all right, Michael. You go with Leroy and have a good time. Oh, but Mother... Mother will never know. (laughs) Boy, that was a short soda. I win. I hit bottom first. Well, you cheated. You've still got some left. I have not. Look... Well, anyway, I made mine last longer. Sour grapes. And when I finish this one, I'm probably going to have another. Yeah? Who's going to pay for it? Oh, I've got money. Oh, mister? His name is Peavy. Yes? What can I do for you, young gentleman, now? I'll have another chocolate raspberry soda. Well, sorry, son, but we have a rule here. Only two of those to a customer. I suppose you think if you make me another one, I'll be sick. If I make you another one, Sonny, I'll be sick. (laughs) Well, my mother lets me drink all the sodas I want. If you'll bring me a note from your mother to that effect, I'll be glad to fill the prescription. But (laughs) I wouldn't care to take the responsibility myself. Listen, you have no right... Hey, why don't you stop hollering and finish the soda you've got? I don't want to. 
I paid for it. You go on and finish it. I don't want to. Why not? I don't think I feel very well. <laughs> Here, give it to me. I'll finish it. Oh. Here you are. Hi, Unc. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Leroy, where in the world have you two been? Right here. You know what time it is. Michael, your mother's been looking all over the place for you. She's just about crazy. Well, I'm afraid our young friend here has overindulged a bit, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> yeah? What do you mean? I don't feel very well. Oh, my goodness, look at him. Spots. <laughs> well, now, there's nothing to be alarmed at, Mr. Gildersleeve. I... Say it was just a simple case of hives. Nothing to be alarmed at. I'll get the blame for this. What's he been eating? Uh, he's under the influence of a couple of raspberry sodas. A couple? Peavy, what kind of a joint are you running here? I'm just trying to run a respectable duck store, Mr. Gildersleeve. You know what you're running? A public nuisance. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> you ought to know better than to stuff a kid with sodas. How is this going to look for me? I'm supposed to be taking care of this little twerp. When his mother sees me, sees him, she'll burn up. What am I going to do? Well, a little calum and lotion might relieve the irritation. Oh, goodbye, TV. Oh, it's you, Throckmorton. I won't come in. I just wondered if little Michael is better today. Mm, a little better, I think. Fine. Uh, keep him warm. <laughs> Leela, I wondered if you'd care to go to the movies with me tonight, Bing Crosby and something or other. Oh, I'd love to go, Throckmorton, but Winfield's crazy about Bing. Uh, why don't you take her instead? Well, that'll be all right, only... Oh, thank you, Throckmorton. I know she'll have a lovely time. Hello, Leela. I have two tickets to the subscription concert this evening. Would you be able to go? Oh, Throckmorton, you must take Winfield. She just loves me. But I want to see you. Oh, you can see me any time. When, for instance? I got these tickets just for you, Leela. I know. Get three tickets and we'll all go. <laughs> Leela, you're going out to dinner with me tonight. But Throckmorton... No, I won't take no for an answer. I haven't seen you alone for a week. Well, I'd love to, Throckmorton, but I just don't like to go out and leave Winfield alone. I got that all taken care of, too. Judge Hooker's going to take Winnie to dinner and the movies. Oh. Uh, now, will you have dinner with me, or do I have to kidnap you? Oh, Throckmorton, you're so masterful. Yeah. <laughs> what can a girl say? All right. And I'll be expecting an answer to a certain question you've been putting off, too. That was certainly a wonderful dinner. Well, I'm glad you liked it. Oh, but it's nice to be home here with just you. I hope Judge Hooker took Winfield to a nice place. Yeah, don't worry. The judge is a spender. They're probably at the movies by now. Well, I'd rather just sit here by the fire with you and talk. Yeah, me too. <laughs> what shall we talk about, Throckmorton? Well... I've been trying all evening to get you to answer one question. Oh, Throckmorton, you're not going to stop that again. I'd like to know why not. Well, you're so unromantic about it. Oh. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> let's talk about you then, huh? You know what I think is the cutest thing about you? No. What? Your ears. <laughs> <laughs> Your ears are so pink, and they stick out. What? What's wrong, Morton? From under your hair, I mean. Oh. You know, there's something I've been wondering for a long time. What? If you kiss a person in the ear, do they feel it or hear it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very interesting question, Throckmorton. Yeah, and I know how to find out, too. Mm -hmm. Uncle Throckmorton. What are you doing? <laughs> I wish that kid was Leroy for five minutes. Gracious, Michael, why aren't you asleep, honey lion? Well, I got nervous upstairs, Aunt Leela, so I thought I'd come and sit with you for a while. But, Michael, don't you want the Sandman to come and take you to the land of Nod? Oh, no, I never go to sleep until Mommy comes home. You don't, huh? Well... 
Now, that's no way to grow big and strong, Michael. I bet if you lie down in your little bed and let Uncle Throckmorton tell you a little story, you'll be asleep in no time. I don't like stories, thank you. Oh, uh, you'll like this one. Now, Mr. Throckmorton, don't force the child. Yes, I won't, Leela. Now, let's just try it, shall we, Michael? Just come upstairs with me, and if you don't like the story, you can come down here again. Is that a promise, Uncle Throckmorton? Cross my heart and hope you die. I die. <laughs> All right, but I'm warning you, I hate animal stories. Uh, suit yourself, my boy. No animal stories. I'll be back in a moment, Leela. And I don't like fairy stories either. All right, no fairy stories. And I really can't stand them. Never mind. <laughs> now, young man, let's come to an understanding. I want you to get in your bed and stay there. But I don't want to. All right. Now, what do you want most of anything in the world? I want to be one of the quiz kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, next to that, be reasonable. I want a chemistry set. You sucker. What do they cost? Two dollars and a half, I believe. All right. Here's three dollars. Now, do you think you can go to sleep? I think so. All right. Sweet dreams. <laughs> Leela, I have a way with children. <laughs> I didn't realize you were such a storyteller. You'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't stop playing, Leela. That was beautiful. Well, if you really enjoy it. Tell me the story you told Michael, won't you? What, and put you to sleep, too? <laughs> I'll bet it wouldn't. Tell me a story, Throckmorton. All right, I'll tell one just for you. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess named Leela. Uh, she was the prettiest princess in the whole world. Uh, is the princess asleep for a hundred years on account of a witch? Uh-huh, that's right. And, um, and what does it take to wake her up? A kiss. From a prince? No, from a water commissioner. <laughs> Leela. Yes, Rock Martin. Leela. Oh, hello, everybody. Well, I'll be. A... Oh, hello, Winnie. Don't Why? need to serve you. I'm just going upstairs. But Winnie, I'll be right now. Leela, this is the last straw. Uh, what do you mean, Rock You know what I mean. I wanted an evening alone with you, and here she is again. Well, I'm sorry, Rock Martin. Don't you try to pull a wool over my eyes. You and your sister planned this. But Rock Martin, we didn't. I'm not blind, Leela. Your sister's doing to me just what she did to Harry Dittendorfer. <sighs> Harvey Diefenbach. Harvey. I, I don't know what you're talking about. She's been keeping us apart, tearing me down, trying to break off our engagement. It's a conspiracy. Throckmorton Gildersleeve, I never heard such talk. It's not just talk, Leela. I'm through being made a fool of by your sister and your sister's little boy. You can choose between us right now. Mr. Gildersleeve, I will not deny my own flesh and blood for you or anybody else. Please consider our engagement at an end. Here. But what? Your ring. Good night, Mr. Gildersleeve. Good night. Hello, Gildy. Hooker, what did you bring that woman back here for? Why, we're on our way to the movie. She just stopped in to get her lipstick. Oh! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here's a special bulletin from Washington. Price Administrator Prentice M. Brown announces that effective today, shoes are rationed. This includes all shoes with leather or rubber soles. Wartime requirements make this necessary. Every person will be entitled to buy one pair of new shoes during the next four months. There are only three things you must know. First, no shoes may be sold to consumers until Tuesday. Second, Beginning Tuesday, every person is entitled to buy one pair of shoes with stamp number 17 of War Ration Book 1, the Sugar and Coffee Book. Third, the shoe stamp for, from the ration book of one member of a family may be used for any other member of that family group living in the same household. And here's a special word for shoe dealers. Remember, shoes cannot be sold at retail until Tuesday morning, but dealers may make and receive shipments and place orders as usual within the trade. Beginning Tuesday... Retailers must collect stamp number 17 from War Ration Book 1 for every pair sold to consumers. Supplies are large enough to provide everyone with shoes and to give everyone his fair share. Good night, everybody. <laughs> the 
Mr. Kenny Blackman, your singing for the Fast Food Company, and inviting you to listen again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. You women are having your shopping troubles these days. So let me tip you off to a quick solution to that main dish problem. At your food store, whenever you see the yellow and blue package marked Kraft Dinner, think of this. Macaroni and cheese ready in seven minutes cooking time. You see, that Kraft Dinner package contains a special quick cooking macaroni that cooks fluffy, tender, in boiling water. The package also gives you some Kraft grated so you can sprinkle in the cheese goodness in a jiffy. Just seven minutes at the stove and you have a dish full of fluffy, light macaroni drenched in cheese goodness. A grand main dish all by itself. And a wonderful extender for a little leftover meat or chicken, too. Each package of Kraft Dinner gives you four good servings at the cost of only a very few cents a serving. Of course, this quick-made macaroni and cheese is extra popular right now. So it's wise to order your Kraft Dinner early in the week. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, if you tax-paying husbands have the special interest in economy that I have this week, just ask your wife to listen closely. It's wise economy to serve the family foods like parquet margarine, the quality spread for bread that's made by Kraft, for many reasons. First of all, parquet tastes so deliciously good, it makes the family want to eat more of the plain, wholesome foods that give them strength and energy. When spread on bread or toast or rolls, the delicate parquet flavor is really special. When used as a seasoning by itself or in tasty cream sauces, parquet adds real zest to the eating of everyday vegetables. It's a wonderful flavor shortening for baking, too, and for pan frying. Just try it. I know you'll like it. Yes, parquet margarine is a favorite in millions of homes for all these reasons and because it's a highly nutritious food in itself. In fact, it's one of the best energy foods you can serve. And every pound contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. So ask your dealer for economical parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve. With the Ides of March almost upon him, he's barricaded himself in his den, where we find him now, alone with his conscience and his income tax return. <sighs> there. Wait a minute. What's this? It, computation of alternative tax. Use only if you had an excess of net long-term capital gain over net short-term capital loss. And item 23, page 1, exceeds $18,000. <sighs> what does that mean? Well, I guess the $18,000 lets me out. <laughs> Let's check through this once more, see if I've got everything. Uh, salaries and other compensation. Uh-huh. Dividends. Don't make me laugh. Interests on bank deposits, notes, etc. Uh, oh, wait a minute. That savings account. What about the interest on that? Why bring that up? Yeah. What? Who's there? Did somebody speak? You heard me. Why bring up a little thing like that bank account? Who are you? Your conscience. Conscience? Well, long time no see. <laughs> <laughs> Where have you been? Oh, around. Well, look, about that savings account of mine, the interest on that is income. I'm supposed to report it. Gildersleeve, are you going to be a weak sister all your life? How are you ever going to get ahead that way? Well, I want to be fair. All right, be fair to yourself. Give yourself a break for once. If you don't, who will? I know, but... Listen, there are men in this town who make four and five times what you do. 
Let them pay their taxes. But it says right here, interest on bank deposits. All right. How are they going to find out? Well, I don't know. If they find out, all right, you pay. But why should you go out of your way to lose your hard-earned cash? Well, that's a point, maybe. I always say what they don't know won't hurt you. Maybe you got something there, brother. Suppose we just overlook the bank interest. Now you're getting smart, Gildersleeve. Now you're getting smart. You guarantee this massage, do you, Floyd? When I get through with you, Judge, your face will be as smooth as a baby's well if it ain't Mr. Gildersleeve. Greetings and salutations, Commissioner. Uh, how chances for a haircut, Floyd? Come right in. I'll only be a few minutes just giving the judge a little massage here. What's the matter, Judge? You feeling a little under par today? Not too good. Been working pretty hard lately. This is a busy season for the legal profession. How about a little sun lamp, Judge? Take that unhealthy look off you. Who's unhealthy? Take the other chair there, Mr. Gildersleeve. Thanks. I can work on you while the judge is cooking here. Yeah, those old goats are tough. You have to let them cook a long time. <laughs> there, how's that, Judge? Too hot for you? No. What are you trying to do, blind me? Oh, I forgot. I'll, I'll put some cotton over your eyes. Yeah, stuff some in my ears, too, so I won't hear Gildersleeve. Yes. Better keep that mouth of yours shut, Judge. You'll get your tonsils sunburned. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, glad you liked it. <laughs> Feeling pretty smug, aren't you, Gildy? Well, why shouldn't I? I've got my income tax all done. Not a care in the world. I'll be enjoying a pleasant weekend while the rest of you fellows are sweating over yours. You mean you got yours done already? Sure, all but mailing it. I tossed it off in a couple of hours. Listen, my friend, this year is no time to be tossing off income taxes. What do you mean? Well, they tell me the government's checking up on them twice as carefully this year. Oh, who told you that? Never mind. I heard. Oh, that Treasury Department, they're tough. That's the same as the G-men, you know. Uh, well, I've got nothing to worry about. Like last year, there was a guy I knew over in Compton. Had a shop there. Doing a nice little business, too. Not terrific, but okay. As a matter of fact, his brother's wife and my wife were... Well, never mind that. The point is, last year, he did a little finagling on his income tax. You know, held out a little interest. Uh, interest? Yeah. And a few months later, a big guy walks into his shop and says, What's about this, mister? Well, if you ask me, he had it coming to him. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's all. Guy just walks in and says, what's about this, mister? Boy, what they can do to you for that. Practically send you up for life. Look, life nonsense. They can't do anything to you if you just make a little mistake. Can they? You're downright they can, Gildy. The penalties are pretty severe. Me? I'm taking no chances. I'll tell you about another case I heard about. A fella got the idea that... Uh, look, just... maybe I'd better come back some other time, Floyd. Uh, gotta be getting home now. But I'm almost through here. It won't be a minute. Some other time. My hair isn't very long anyway. I'll be back. <laughs> gotta run now. Well, sure, Mr. Gildersleeve, if you gotta run. Yeah, I gotta run. <laughs> <laughs> What's your hurry? I'm not in any... Uh, who said that? Same old conscience. Oh, uh, you again. Yes. Are you going to give in to that weakness, my boy? What weakness? You know. You're about to give yourself the worst of it on that bank interest. Sucker. Yeah, who's a sucker? I am not. I'm not going to do anything of the sort. That's the way I like to hear you talk. Who's that? It's me. I mean, it's I. Leroy. What? What are you doing at my desk, young man? Have you been looking at my income tax return? No. What's the matter with it? Nothing. I wonder if the FBI would listen to a kid. What? Uh, never mind, Leroy. I'm I'm in a hurry. I want to get that return in the mail right away. In fact, Mr. if I... Mr. Gilkey. Oh, Mr. Gilkey, I'm so glad you came home. Could you give me a little financial advice, please? Uh, Bertie, I told... Oh, this ain't a finance company, Mr. Gilkey. This is a lot tougher than that. What's tougher than a finance company? Income tax man. Yes. Yeah. 
You're right, Bertie, but your tax shouldn't be too difficult. Oh, no, sir. The tax part's easy. What's worrying me is easier reduction. The reduction? Oh, well, let me see your blank. Yes, it's out in the kitchen. I'll get it right away. Oh, confound it. I haven't got time to fool with Bertie's taxes now. Say, Uncle, as long as you're here, how about giving me a little help with my homework? No, Leroy. Homework is intended to be done by the child, not by the parent. But this is very timely, Uncle. It's a composition for current events. On what topic? The privileges of being a taxpayer. I don't believe it. How about it, Uncle? Can you help me? No, my boy. With that topic, you'll just have to use your imagination. And plenty of it. Here's my black, Mr. Deal, please. Say, what does this mean right down here? Where? Oh. Uh, check whether this return was prepared on the cash or accrual basis. Are they talking to me? Yes. I don't know who they're talking to, Bertie. That question has been on the forum for 20 years. I bet even Morgenthau doesn't know the answer. Now, let's see. Uh, you put down your salary. Yes, all but the reduction. Reduction? Oh, well, let's hear some of the reductions. Well, I bought some furniture and a radio, and I sent some money to my brother, and I lent some money to my sister, and beside that, I owe a lot of money. Bertie, these items are only deductible if they're expenses. Mr. Gilsey, if my brother ain't an expense, I never saw one. <laughs> Bertie, the government is talking about business expense, like a farm or a store. I think you can forget the expenses. Oh, you mean I don't have to say nothing about my farm? Farm? What farm? The farm back home where my papa lives. Uh, does your father own the farm? No, sir. He just runs it. He don't run it very good, but he runs it. Uh, what does he raise on it? Peas. Peas? I never heard of a pea farm, Bertie. No, sir, I didn't either. We used to raise cotton, but the government said they'd give us some money to raise peas, so we switched to peas. And now we get a pea check every year from the government. <laughs> Bertie, I advise you to forget the farm for the present. I'm busy now. I'll help you with this thing tomorrow. Oh, and Leroy, you forget your composition. Okay, I'm where are you going? I'm going to get this return notarized, then I'll mail it and forget the whole thing. Hello, PB. Yeah. What's that bell? It surprised you, didn't it? It's operated by an electric eye. It's just a new service for my customers. For your customers? Yes, if I'm asleep and then back at the store, it wakes me up. <laughs> That's very remarkable. Look, Peavy, I'm in a hurry. You're a notary public, aren't you? Yes, I am, Mr. Gildersleeve, although I haven't done much of that sort of thing lately. Never mind. I've got the postman in this truck outside waiting for this letter, and I want you to notarize my signature. Well, I... Oh, there's the postman now. I'll tell him you'll only be a minute. Newt, I'll just be a second. Okay. Now hurry up, Peavy. There's nothing difficult about just notarizing your signature. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. It tricks to every trade. Uh, be with you. I'm too safe. What are you doing, Peavy? I'm trying to find my stamp. It's been some time since I've done any of this legal work. Oh, well, get a move on, Counselor. United States mail waits for no man. Oh, here it is. All right, where I left it. Where was it? Underneath the razor strap. Yes. Now, let's see. Hmm. Stamp pad's dried up a little, but I guess we can moisten her up with some H2O. <laughs> That's pharmacy lingo for water, Mr. Gildersleeve. I know that, Peavy. I'm water commissioner in this town. Mm -hmm. I've clean forgotten that. Uh, hurry up, Peavy. This is the last mail. Uh, just a second, Newt. Okay, but I ain't got all day. <laughs> now what, Peavy? It's working. There. See? Oh. Given under my hand and seal as a notary public in this state on the blank day of blank in the year 19 blank, my commission expires on March 31, 1918. <laughs> Peavy, you haven't been a notary for 25 years. Well, what about it? Yep. Never mind, Newt. I can't make it today. Well, for... <laughs> Peavy, I, I don't know why I keep doing business with you. You're the most inefficient druggist in the county, and you know it. 
Well, when you say that. Uh, what was it you wanted notarized, anyhow, Mr. Gildersleeve? What do you suppose, Peavy? Monday's March the 15th. I wanted to notarize my income tax return. Well, I wish you'd told me that, Mr. Gildersleeve. It's not necessary to get them notarized this year. What? That's right. Yeah. Just look at the bottom of the form. Where? Oh, by George, you're right. Well, I guess I'll be running along. Uh, can't I tell you something, Mr. Gildersleeve? No, not today, Peter. Uh, well, just a minute, Mr. Gildersleeve. I, I'll show you a trick. If, if you know how, you can step over the beam of this electric eye and go in and out without making a sound. Look. See? <laughs> I fooled the beam. Yeah. <laughs> Evie, you're a fool. <laughs> the great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. Meanwhile, a few homemakers are finding it harder than ever to serve food that combines the flavor your family wants with the nutrition they need. Let me suggest a food that's helping millions of families solve that very same problem. It's parquet margarine, the delicious, nourishing spread for bread made by Kraft. Parquet has a delicate, satisfying flavor that makes it a just about perfect spread. And when used as a shortening, it makes delicious, crispy cookies. Parquet margarine is a wonderfully tasty seasoning for hot vegetables, too, and most good cooks prefer it for pan frying. You see, parquet doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. In all these ways, parquet margarine adds real appetite appeal to wartime meals. But it's important to know, too, that parquet is one of the best energy foods you can serve. And every pound contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. Now, if you can't buy parquet the first time you try, it's because of wartime shortages and parquet's growing popularity. But Kraft is doing everything possible to keep dealers supplied, and you should be able to get it soon. So ask for economical parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. <laughs> Let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. Our hero has spent a restless night dreaming of deductions, exemptions, and computations. He rises Sunday morning still suffering the pangs of indecision and making them pretty tough on the rest of the household. Bertie. Yes, Miss Gildersleeve? I wonder if you could warm up this miserable little cup of coffee. Yes, sir, right away. Why didn't you drink it while it was hot, Uncle Moore? Because then it would be gone. This way I have the fun of smelling it a little longer. <laughs> You didn't eat much breakfast. No, my dear. Breakfast doesn't mean what it used to on Sunday mornings. But you had everything you used to have. I know, but I feel guilty eating it. Aunt, could you help me with my homework now? Leroy, I'm in no mood to compose a composition. Oh, please, Aunt. No, I'm going to lie down and read the Sunday paper. But you haven't had your coffee. You can help me a little, Uncle. i got a swell start on it. Start? Let me hear it. Okay. Let us be thankful that we live in a country like this where freedom shines like a beacon unto the world. Till this war is won, we at home should consider it not only our duty, but our privilege to go without things and pay our taxes. How's that, Unc? Say, that's pretty good, Leroy. Thanks, Unc. Yes, my boy, you're beginning to develop quite a style. A little like Macaulay. Wait a minute. Did you make that up, Leroy? Uh, practically. Where did you find it? On that flutter from the bank. Oh, so. <laughs> I thought so. Young man, do you know that plagiarism is a serious crime? Yeah, who do such a thing? You, you have just done it. Here's your coffee, Mr. Gilsey. Thank you, buddy. Leroy, go up to your room and write 50 times, plagiarism is a crime. 50 times? 50, and don't argue, it'll be 100. Okay, Uncle. Gosh, 50 times. Uh, I gotta do something about that kid. See who that is, will you please, Bertie? Yes, sir. No time for anybody to be calling on anybody. Good morning, Throckmorton. Oh, hello, Leela. <laughs> hello, Marjorie. Good morning. Say, I like it. You do? I think it's awfully cute. What are you two talking about? <laughs> My new fascinator, Throckmorton. Don't you like it? Where is it? <laughs> on my head, silly. 
I thought that thing was a shawl. Oh, man. Throckmorton, hurry and put on your coat. We're late already. Late? Late for what, Leela? You haven't forgotten your promise to go to church with me this morning, have you? Oh, but Leela, uh, my income tax, I've got to get it off. You can finish it later, Throckmorton. Here, here's your coat. Now, come on, you old heathen, you. Oh, but I... Hush up now. We've got to get along. See you later, Marjorie. Yes, we'll be along. Here's your hat, Throckmorton. Uh, that's Leroy's hat. Here's mine. Well, let's go, then. Hey, Al, wait a minute. What is it, Leroy? How do you spell plagiarism? Uh, P-L... P-L... Just right, I've been a naughty boy. It was such a worthwhile sermon today, didn't you, Fox Martin? Yeah. And Dr. Needham is such a fine looking man. Don't you think so? Don't you think so, Rock Martin? Yeah. You know, when he stands up there and preaches, the way he looks at me, I just feel that everything he says is meant for me. Don't you, Rock Martin? Yeah. <laughs> Throck Martin, can't you say anything but yes? Yes. I mean no. I mean yes. Oh. Honey, what's wrong? You haven't been yourself all morning. Tell Lita what's wrong. Oh. You seem so distant somehow. Well, I was just listening to the sermon, that's all. Well, I don't know what was so fascinating about the sermon. Oh, of course, I thought it was very worthwhile and all that, but the way of the transgressor is hard. I guess we all know that. I wonder if we do, Leela. I wonder if we do. <laughs> Martin, you're the strangest man. You're so moody. Just sat there all through the sermon, staring at your hands, and never once looked at me. I couldn't help noticing that George Bagby never once took his eyes off me, if it interests you. Interest? <laughs> well, I see it doesn't. Leela, don't misunderstand me, but I've got problems. Well, I'm sure I don't know what kind of problem would make a gentleman invite a lady to church and then be rude to her. But I'm not being rude. I mean, I didn't mean to be. The, the sermon started me to thinking, Leela, that's all. There's something I've got to attend to. Well, you run right along and tend to it. Just leave me here at the gate. But, Leela... No, I won't invite you to stop in this morning because I know you're much too busy. Leela... Goodbye, Throckmorton, and thank you for the use of your arm. Bertie, when's dinner? Pretty soon now. Fully Yonkel and Miss Marjorie and Mr. Ben get here. What are we having? Something you like. What is it? Oh, something you like. Hi, you won't talk, huh? Leroy, you get out of here and don't come messing around my kitchen when I'm getting Sunday dinner. I ain't in no mood. Okay, okay. And keep away from that dining room table after I said it. Well, can't I just have a piece of celery? I'm starving. Well, just one. And I didn't say you could have no olives. Now, go on. Gosh, I'd like to die of hunger around here and nobody would care. Oh, hiya, Ben. Hi, hello there, young fella. There's Uncle. He'll be along. He just got a word with Mrs. Ransom. A word? That can run into days. Let me take your coat, Ben. Oh, no, I know where the closet is. Here, let me take yours. Oh, thank you. Hey, Ben, you know anything about putting airplanes together? A little. I used to make a lot of them when I was a kid. Swell. How would you like to help me with one? Now, leave, Roy. I get all the parts. It's me. Complete kit. 98 cents. I'll go up and get it if you say so. Well, the uh, time's a little short, isn't it, for dinner? Nah, we can get a good start on it and finish it up this afternoon. Leroy, now, don't bother Ben. We've worked hard all week, and he'd just like to sit down on a sofa and rest. Wouldn't you, Ben? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you say? How do you know what he wants to do? Let the guy plane if he wants to, will you? He doesn't want to make an airplane. Oh, no? Don't you, Ben? Don't you want to make an airplane? Well, I do anything anybody says. <laughs> there, what did I tell you? Leroy, go away. Just go away. Go away. That's all anybody ever says to me. Go away. What am I, a leopard or something? <laughs> all right, do it. I'm warning you, Ben. Give her an inch and she'll take a mile. She'll henpeck the life out of you. <laughs> That quiet brother you got there. Oh, don't mind him. He's spoiled. Come on, let's sit over here on the sofa, shall we? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere you say. There. <laughs> <clears throat> now, what is it you were going to tell me? Well, I... 
I don't know what you're going to think of it. Well, why don't you ask me and find out? Well, maybe I've got nerve thinking you care one way or the other. Why, of course I care, Ben. What is it? Well, Marjorie, I've got a chance to become an assistant inspector. Oh. It's a good job. <laughs> it's for quite a lot less money. Less? Yeah, it's for the Army. Sort of an inspector on Army contracts, I guess. Well, they must need people pretty badly or they wouldn't take me. Well, not right away. I'd probably be working here at the plant, only I'd be working for the Army instead of for the company. Oh, then I think it's wonderful. I think you ought to do it. You do? Uncle Mort, is that you? Yes, me. Uncle Mort, guess what? Ben's been offered a job for less money. Well, that's fine. Or is it? <laughs> it's for the Army. Plant inspector, is that it, Ben? Well, it's not said or anything, Mr. Gildersleeve, but... They were just talking to me about it. I told him you ought to go ahead and take it. They're uh, going to pay you less, you say? Yes, sir, but I figure after all, the boys in the Army are only getting $50 a month. That's right. Money isn't everything, as the saying goes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not. And I figure anybody who doesn't do anything he can to help these days isn't going to feel he's worth much. Oh, Ben, I'm proud of you. And I'm going to kiss you right in front of Uncle Mort. Mm. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Aren't we proud of him, Uncle Moore? Yes, I'm proud of you, my boy. Your lips are so red now, too. <laughs> I wish I could say I was proud of myself, though. Uh, will you excuse me for a moment? I'm, I'm going to the den. Call me if dinner's ready. But Uncle Moore, it'll be ready any minute. And start without me. I've got something I've got to get off my mind right away. <laughs> No, we'll see about this thing. I want to get an honest night's sleep. It costs me a year's salary. Where is it? Where is that tax blank? Right in the upper left-hand drawer where you put it. Thanks. Hmm? <laughs> oh, you again. I thought you'd be coming around. What you gonna do, Gildy? Never mind what I'm gonna do. You just watch. Gildersleeve, are you going to be a sucker all your life? Oh, go away and let me alone, will you? Now, Gildy, don't be like that. I'm your pal. I'm just trying to help you. Well, I don't need any help right now. Listen, pal, do you know what's going on right this minute, only three blocks from here? What? Judge Hooker, that pillar of the law. <laughs> he just deducted $150 for a bad debt that never existed. That's a lie. Hooker wouldn't do a thing like that. Listen, that old goat... He may be an old goat, but he's an honorable old goat. Gildy, I'm trying to tell you that kind of thing is going on all over the country. Why should you be different? Listen, you can't talk like that about this country. You're not my conscience. Who the devil are you, anyway? Yes. Hitler? <laughs> the devil, that's who you are. You're the devil. <laughs> and what are you going to do about it? I'll show you what I'm going to do about it. There. Take your dirty, crooked deductions and get out of here. No! Oh! <laughs> yeah. Now... Interest on savings account, $2.16. <laughs> By George, I feel better already. George, dinner's on the table. It's getting cold. Coming, my dear. Save some for me. Well, is nobody eating? Why, we're waiting for you to call. And step on it, will you, Uncle? I'm dying. No more than I am. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. You ain't going to have to, Mr. Gilsleeve. I got a roast of beef. Ooh, look at that. Oh, oh Bertie, beef. that's the prettiest sight I ever saw in my life. Where in the world did you find it? Oh, I had my eye on it. I've been trailing it for a week. Yes. <laughs> ben, how do you like yours? Rare, medium, or well done? Oh, any way at all for me. Oh, speak up, man. We've got all kinds here. Every man to his taste. He likes it medium, Uncle Moore. But Ben decides for himself, why don't you? Yeah. Kind of a medium for me, Mr. Jones. <laughs> That's the stuff. Well, eat hearty, everybody. This may be the last roast beef we'll see till the war is over. Oh, don't say that. My boy, till this war, while this war is on, no sacrifice is too great. That's true. Uh, let us be thankful that we live in a country like this, where freedom shines like a beacon unto the world. <laughs> I mean it. Till this war is over, we at home should consider not only our duty, but a privilege to go without things and uh, pay our taxes. <laughs> Remember that. Yes, sir.
Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to give you a brief message of great importance. If you're a single man or woman and you earned more than $500 during 1942, you must make out an income tax report. If you're married and living with your wife or husband and you earned over $1,200 in 1942, you must make out an income tax report. You must mail your report before midnight Monday, March 15th. To make out one of these reports, all you have to do is go to any bank and ask for an income tax form. They'll give it to you and tell you where to mail it. Good night, everybody. <laughs> on this program was under the direction of Clark Sweet. And this is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to listen again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. You women are having your shopping troubles these days. So let me tip you off to a quick solution to that main dish problem. At your food store, whenever you see the yellow and blue package, mark Kraft Dinner, think of this. Macaroni and cheese ready in seven-minute cooking time. You see, that Kraft dinner package contains a special quick-cooking macaroni that cooks fluffy, tender, and boiling water. The package also gives you some Kraft grated so you can sprinkle it in the cheese goodness in a jiffy. Just seven minutes at the stove and you have a dish full of fluffy, light macaroni with cheese flavor through and through. A grand main dish all by itself. And a wonderful extender for a little leftover meat or chicken, too. Each package of Kraft dinner gives you four good servings at a cost of only a very few cents a serving. Of course, this quick-made macaroni and cheese is extra popular right now, so it's wise to order your Kraft dinner early in the week. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, if there are cheese lovers in your family, you're probably wondering how to adjust their appetites to your red stamp ration booklet. But that's easily solved when you learn how simple it is to extend such favorites as Pab Step, the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred uses. You see, a great many of those hundred uses combine the unique cheddar cheese flavor of Pab Step with other foods for appetite-tingling results. So Pab Step becomes an economical luxury that you can use thriftily and often. Take leftover meats or vegetables or fish. Add a smooth, appetizing cheese sauce made with Pabstet, and you have another delightful main dish for another meal that's wonderfully good to eat and extra nourishing. Yes, besides adding flavor goodness when you melt or toast or slice it, Pabstet helps supply many of the milk nutrients your family needs. Milk protein, milk minerals, food energy, vitamin A, and vitamin G that's also called riboflavin. So remember the name, Pab Step, the delicious golden cheese food that comes in the flat, round package. Pab Step, the nourishing cheese food of a hundred uses. Now on to Summerfield and the Great Gildersleeve. It's spring in Summerfield. Lovely, lovely spring. You can feel it in the first warm rays of the sun slanting across the backyard. You can hear it in the excitement of the birds twittering in the maples and the lazy clop-clop of the milkman's horse coming up the street. You can see it everywhere. Spring does something to people, and spring has done something to Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. <laughs> For early in the morning, hours before he's due at the office, even before Bertie is astir in the kitchen... Summerfield's foremost slug a bed is up and dressed and out of doors. He stands now on the back stoop barefoot with a shoe in each hand and dabbles a toe in the dewy grass. <laughs> it's cold. Well, anyway, here goes. <laughs> it tickles. Why, Uncle Oh, 
<laughs> Good morning, Marjorie. You startled me. I thought I was alone. What are you doing up so early? Well, it was such a fine morning. And what in the world are you doing with your shoes off? Oh, those. Well, uh... I suppose it's silly, my dear, but I've always had a sneaking desire to go barefoot in the dew. <laughs> you know, so have I. How is it? Cold. Don't try it. I think I'll put my shoes back on before I catch my death. Yes, you better. And, uh, Marjorie. Yes? Uh, you don't have to say anything about this to anybody. You know, people might not understand. Don't worry, Uncle Mort. I understand. My favorite niece. Now, how am I going to get my feet dry? <sighs> Isn't it a glorious morning, Uncle Mort? Yes, it is. It's glorious. I love spring. I love to see things growing. If darn grass gets between your toes. <laughs> it all feels so warm and friendly. Seems somehow as if the whole world were in love. Well, there's one shoe on. What were you saying, my dear? Nothing. Uncle Mort, what's it like being in love? Being in love? Yes. I think I know, but tell me. Well, it's a little like an attack of chills and fever. <laughs> Only nicer. Where's my other shoe? Oh, I had it. Marjorie, look. Look there. What? By the hedge there, sticking out of the leaf. Why, it's a crocus. Yeah, the first crocus of spring. Look at that little thing peeping up at us down there. Oh, Uncle Mort, now it's really spring. Yeah, isn't that cute? Oh, don't pick it. Why not? But why? It looks so sweet there. I know a place where it's going to look sweeter. Oh, Uncle Mort. Yeah. Uh, there you are, little crocus. I know somebody you're going to make a big hit with. Well, you better put it in water right away, Uncle Mort. They don't last long when you pick them. Then I'll run over there with it right now. But Uncle Mort, do you think Mrs. Ransom would want to see you so early in the morning? Why, of course. She'd be glad to see me any time. But before breakfast? On an empty stomach? Huh? Well, I'll only be a minute, my dear. I'll only be a minute. <laughs> Funny. She must be here. Uh, here comes my beautiful angel. Hello, Leela. <laughs> he. Throckmorton, what on earth are you doing here at this hour in the morning? I've got something for you. Guess what? Oh, this is no time for guessing games, Throckmorton. You woke me up. But, Leela, it's 7 o'clock and it's spring. Spring? Yes. Doesn't spring mean anything to you? Not at this hour in the morning. Please go home, Throckmorton. Oh, look what I brought you, Leela. The first crocus. <sighs> Isn't it pretty? Yes, it's very pretty. Yeah, let me put it in your hair. No, Throckmorton, and take your foot out of the door. Why, Leela... Just one little springtime good morning kiss? No, Throckmorton, you may not kiss me. What? No. In the first place, it's too early, and in the second place, you haven't shaved. Now, please take your foot from my door. But, Leela, after all, we're engaged to be married. Oh, we are, are we? Well, sir, I'm not even sure of that. Good morning. Ooh, women. <laughs> Yes, my dear, it's me. Come on in. We have company for breakfast. Uh, company? Oh, so it's you, hooker. <laughs> yes. Old goat, what are you laughing at? <laughs> you look so darn silly with that crocus in your hand. <laughs> crocus? Oh, oh, yes, I just picked it out in the garden. That's funny. When I came past Leela Ransom's house a moment ago, I could have sworn that you were trying to give that crocus away. No, see here, hooker. I didn't invite you here to breakfast. What are you doing hanging around this neighborhood anyhow at this hour of the morning? Well, I came to weed my victory garden. Oh, yeah. With that victory garden in the lot next door, I can see we'll get plenty of drop-in trade. Oh, have some breakfast, Uncle Mort. Maybe it'll cheer you up. I'll try it. Bertie. Yes, Mr. Gilsey. Morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, put this crocus in water, please, and then bring me two three-minute eggs, half a grapefruit, and plenty of toast and coffee. Yes, sir. Oh, Bertie. Yes, Judge? Seeing as how it's such a nice day, you can give Mr. Gildersleeve a few of those little sausages that I brought over here. Yes, sir. Y did you say sausages, Judge? That's right, Gildy. Well, now, that was mighty friendly of you, although I hate to admit it. Yep. I defended a farmer who makes his own sausage yesterday, and I took my whole fee out in trade. I wonder if I could get him to pay his water bill in potatoes. Goodness, here comes Superman. Who? Hi, sis. Hi, Uncle Morning, Judge. So 
Hello, Leroy. Morning, Leroy. Leroy, stick in your shirt tail. Oh, it was okay when I started downstairs. Here's your orange juice, Miss Gill, please. Thank you, Bertie. Oh, Leroy. Good morning, Bertie. Don't soft soap me. Was you in my cake box last night? Why, no, Bertie. Now, Leroy? No, honest, I wasn't. Oh, Leroy, nobody's going to hang you. Why don't you own up? Oh, because I never touched the darn cake. Uh, wait a minute. What is all this? It's a case of the people versus Leroy, Throckmorton. The charge is larceny of a piece of cake. Oh, cake? Oh. Uh, Bertie, it's just possible I took a piece of cake last night. <laughs> you say it's possible, Mr. Gilsey? Yes. That's good enough for me. Case dismissed, hang the jury in Habeas Corpus. <laughs> Bertie, you could very easily become a lawyer. Don't go putting ideas into her head, Judge. She's a good cook. Get those sausages, will you, Bertie? I can smell them from here, and they're ready. Yeah, Mr. Gilsey, you're right. Them sausages has reached their zero hour. Yeah. Then bring them on. A plate of sausages, a nice two-hour nap, and I'll be ready to go to the office. <laughs> That Bobby? Oh, you can't talk to me like that, you fresh boy, or I'll just hate you. Uh, uh, goodbye, honey. <laughs> good morning, Mr. Gildersleeve. Good morning, uh, good morning, uh, uh Bessie. Uh, thank you. Any mail I need to look at, Bessie? Well, most of it could wait till tomorrow. Oh, uh, that's good. And I took care of the rest. Oh, uh, good girl, Bessie. You're beginning to get the hang of the waterworks. Oh, thank you, sir. There was a letter from that new laundry on State Street, and I answered it. It's on your desk for you to sign. Oh, fine, Bessie. I'll clean up my day's work in no time. Yeah, now, let me see here. Oh, here it is. Parker Hand Laundry, Summerfield. Dear sirs, received your inquiry about special water rates for laundries. In reply, beg to inform you we have no special water. We sell only the regular kind. <laughs> your... St- that Bessie, I'm going to have to get rid of. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. What is it now, Bessie? There's someone here to see you. Oh, for heaven's sake, I can't see. Oh, hello, Leela. Hello, Throckmorton. <laughs> you may go, Bessie. <laughs> well, quite a surprise seeing you here. Uh, Throckmorton, I just had to come and see you for a minute. I'm afraid I was a little bit cross early this morning. You hurt my feelings, Leela. Well, I'm sorry, Throckmorton, but you have to understand that no woman likes to be seen early in the morning when she's not exactly at her best. And um, tell me, how do you like my new dress? Leela, what did you mean this morning when you said you weren't sure we were engaged? Well, I didn't mean it just the way it sounded, but sometimes I think you take me too much for granted. Well, I always thought if you're engaged, why, you're engaged, that's all. There you go, Throckmorton, taking things for granted. But I... You think being engaged is just sitting around holding hands and kissing and such. You mean there's more to it? (laughs) Of course there is. Our engagement should be a preparation for our life together. While we should be spending this time trying to develop some interests in common, things we like to do together. Well, I like to... No, I mean besides kissing. (laughs) I mean things we're both interested in. Things we like to talk about. Uh, Worthwhile things like like world affairs and and current events and all. Uh, Leela, when I'm with you, I can't think about worthwhile things. (laughs) But you must try, dear. If we're going to be happy later, we must learn to be friends now. Well, I'm willing to try if you want to. Friends. Uh, let's start now, then. How about a nice lunch with me at Dabney's Grill? We can get a booth. Oh, I can't possibly, Throckmorton. I'm having lunch with Marie King at the Woman's Exchange, and afterward we're going to the Red Cross. Oh, gracious, I'm late now. I must fly. But, Leela... Goodbye, Throckmorton. And you think about what I said now like a good boy. Goodbye. Good to women. There were no such a thing as women. This world would be a lot better place. Yeah, but who'd want to live in it? I'm going to lunch. (laughs) The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. Meanwhile, let me suggest a really practical way to add extra nourishment and extra flavor to everyday meals. Dozens of ordinary dishes turn into very special treats when you add the delicious flavor of Pabstet, the nourishing cheese food of a hundred uses. For example, use Pabstet in making a macaroni casserole. 
and see how good tasting this economical dish can be with that grand cheddar cheese flavor baked in. Or melt Pabstet into a smooth cheese sauce and see how it transforms leftovers of meat or fish into exciting main dishes for the next meal and makes even the plainest of vegetables wonderfully appetizing. Pabstet slices perfectly, too. With fruit or pie or just by itself, it tops off wartime meals with a grand touch of cheese goodness. Yes, for real flavor and for some of the vitamins and minerals your family needs, ask your dealer for Pabstet. He may not always have it on hand because so much of the nation's dairy foods are going to war that supplies sometimes run low. But watch for economical Pabstet. Buy it when you can. Pabstet, the delicious cheese food of a hundred uses. Well, time mooches on. Two hours have passed while Gildersleeve, alone in Dabney's Grill, lingered over lunch, glaring at the women around him and muttering into his salad. And now, reluctant to get back to work, he's thought up an excuse to go out to the reservoir and confer with the superintendent. I hardly need to tell you that on a spring day, there isn't a pleasanter place in Summerfield than the reservoir. Uh, cooler here. Charlie! Uh, Uncle Charlie! Uh, might be in the pumping station. Charlie! It's Charlie Anderson. Yeah, not here. Well, it's a nice day. I'll just lie down here in the shade till he turns up. <laughs> uh, spring. Spring, spring, you lovely thing. Bees and birds are on the wing. Listen to the way they sing. Ting a ling a ling a ling. Not bad. No, Mr. Gildersleeve. That's pretty good. Yeah. PB, where did you come from? I didn't hear you. Well, I learned to walk Indian fashion as a boy. <laughs> See? One foot in front of the other. Uh, huh? If I had moccasins on, you couldn't hear me at all. What are you doing out here, PB? Well, <laughs> Gildersleeve, I could ask you the same question. Me? I'm out here on business. Oh, I see. Yes, I'm uh, waiting for the superintendent here, Charlie Anderson. Well, in that case, I'll sit down and help you wait. Who's tending the drugstore while you're out here, Peavy? <laughs> Mrs. Peavy. Yeah. But it's all right. I've been picking her some wildflowers. See, trailing our beauties. It's like poison ivy to me. Yeah, and you don't know trailing our beauties. Maybe you don't know poison ivy. I always carry a bottle of calamine lotion with me just to be on the safe side. Uh, you'd better. Uh, care for some? No, thanks. Uh, Peavy, uh, speaking of poison ivy, have you ever had much to do with women? <laughs> well, in a manner of speaking, I'm married to one. <laughs> then tell me, Peavy, what does a woman mean when she says you've been taking her too much for granted? <laughs> I haven't heard that in 15 years. Well, what does it mean? Well, it usually means that she's been reading a book. Oh. I'll never forget the year that Mrs. Peavy subscribed to the Ladies' Home Companion. No peace that year. Well, what'd you do? I let the subscription run out. Hey, you! What you think you're doing there? Don't you know this is city property? Oh, Charlie Anderson. Wait a minute, Charlie. Don't get out of there. Get off the property, dead busted. Whoa, there. Hold your horses, Uncle Charlie. Put on your glasses. It's me, Gildersleeve. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, well, by jiggers, it's about time. I called you up. We got to do something here. People coming out here all over the place, breaking bottles, scattering papers, like a dead busted picnic ground. Oh, but uh, Charlie, you know Mr. Peavy, don't you? Of course I know him. What do you think? Know him as well as I know you. Hello, Mr. Anderson. Folks come out here at night, too, and park in the dead busted automobiles. Come out here to spoon. <laughs> what are we running here? A waterworks or a dead busted petting parlor? <laughs> Well, Charlie, you have to remember... Holy Toledo. You you have to remember this is public property. And after all, boys will be boys. Well, they don't mind the boys. It's the women. They come out here in their slacks and, uh... And, uh... They're worse than the men. Well... (laughs) I wouldn't say that. Come out here and... uh, What'd you say? He said he wouldn't say that. Well, what would he say? You'll have to ask him. Would you care to enlarge on that thought, P.B.? Well, my experience with the fair sex has been that they take a little understanding. I'll say. Now, Mr. Gildersleeve here has a problem. He... I don't know what your problem is, Commissioner, but I'll tell you the answer. I have nothing to do with women, Dad. Bust them. 
especially this time of the year. Charlie, I'm inclined to think you're right. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Don't be saying that. <laughs> Pete, Snake, what do you know about women anyway? Well, I've got one of them waiting at home for me right now. <laughs> Can either of you gentlemen say the same? Uh, well, Peavy's been a bad boy today. He, he's he been playing a little hooky. Well, no, I wouldn't say... Dad, what's it? <laughs> there he goes again. Uh, no offense, Mr. Anderson. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, if I might offer a suggestion. Yes, Peavy? Have you tried taking your lady friend a posy? They're usually well received. I took her a posy. That's what started all the trouble. What did? What did you take her? A dad busted crocus. <laughs> Gildersleeve, is it all right if I clear away the dishes now? Yes, we're finished, Bertie. And that was a fine dinner. Well, it should have been, Mr. Gildersleeve. It was pretty expensive. Oh, really, Bertie? What did it cost? Eighteen red points, sixteen blue points, two dollars in cash, and a coffee stamp. <laughs> well, uh, Leroy, go get me a cigar, will you, in the den. Okay, I'll... And stick your shirt tail in. Is that out again? Well, Marjorie, I suppose Ben will be coming over this evening. Well, how did you guess? Are you going over to Mrs. Ransom's? Well, I don't know, my dear. I'm not sure I want to. Why, what's wrong? Oh, nothing, really. I told you this morning not to go rushing over there at the crack of dawn. Well, she wants me to talk about foreign affairs or something. I don't know what she wants. Worthwhile conversation and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, why don't you do it? Me talk about foreign affairs? Well, you wouldn't have to talk about them very long. Huh? I don't understand. You will. You just try it. Uh, Here's a cigar, Uncle. I bit the end off for you. Oh, well, perhaps you'll be good enough to smoke it for me. Yeah, sure. You got a light? Yep. <laughs> I'm fooling. Give it to me. Camp, have you got a minute? What do you mean, have I got a minute? Well, I'd like to discuss something with you. All right, my boy. Let's discuss it. Privately, I'd like to discuss it with you alone. What's this all about? I don't know. Uh, will you excuse us, my dear? Just step into the den here, Leroy. Thanks, Tom. Now, uh, what's on your mind, young man? Um... Uh, could I have 53 cents to go to the movies? I thought movies cost 35 cents. Well, well you see, I'm going with Piggy. Uh, we're each going to buy our own tickets. That's 35. Yes. And then we're each going to pay for half of the other ticket. What other ticket? Well, we have to have another ticket. Why? Well, we're taking somebody. Who? Who are you taking who can't pay for his own ticket? Well, we're taking a girl. Yes. Yeah. A girl, huh? Yeah, Janie Owen. You too, Leroy. <laughs> well, I suppose it was bound to come. Here, here's a dollar. Maybe she likes sodas. Ah, oh, thanks, Uncle. Gee, you're swell. Uncle, uh, one more thing. Now what? Don't say anything about this to Marge. Marge? Why not? Because I'd just die if she found out, Uncle. Honest, I'd just die. <laughs> All right, my boy. I won't say anything to your sister. Thanks. Well, I gotta go. Uh, Leroy. I know. Stick my shirt tail in. Hiya, Ben. What did you blow in? So long, my Hold on, buddy. Uh, well, he was in a hurry. Evening, Mr. Gillisley. Oh, hello, Ben. Uh, won't you take the sofa? Oh, no. Sit still, you two. Sit still. I can sit over here if I want to. Uh, well, um, we were going out anyway, weren't we, Ben? Huh? Oh, sure. Anything you say, Marge. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> uh... We thought maybe we'd go to the movies or something. Yeah, we just thought we'd go to the movies. <laughs> now, now, don't let me drive you out of here. I'll go into my den or someplace. Oh, now, we don't want you to do that, Mr. Gildersleeve. Ben. Stick around. We weren't going to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I may go out. I haven't decided. Uh, don't let me get in your way. Oh, you wouldn't. Uh, ben. <laughs> Uncle Mark do what he wants. If he wants to go in his den, let him go in his den. If he wants to go out, let him go out. Uh, all right, my dear, I'll go. I know you young people want to be together. Oh, honest, Mr. Gildersleeve. Ben! <laughs> yes, I, I think Ben wants to be alone. <laughs> I'll go and look into the international situation next door. <laughs> Hello, Leela. Oh, 
Hello, Rock Martin. I was hoping you might come over. You were? Yes. Uh, come into the parlor, won't you? Uh, all right. What do you think I did after I got through with the Red Cross this afternoon? What? I took a walk out south of town. Uh, you know that big tall hill just before you get to the Mansfield Road? Well, I climbed up there all by myself, and I lay there in the grass and just let the spring breeze blow through my hair. I could just feel spring all over me. Leela, the Allied forces in North Africa made definite progress today. <laughs> Yes. Uh, you know what I think? What, Throckmorton? Well, this is just my personal analysis, of course. But after the Allies take Africa, I wouldn't be surprised if they'd use it as a base to attack Europe. Uh, Throckmorton, you're so clever when you want to be. Now, I just would never think of anything like that. But, of course, you men are all so military. Uh, yeah. Leela, I'm thinking of joining the Book of the Month Club. I imagine it'll be very worthwhile. Oh, I'm sure it will. All my cousins used to belong back home, and they just loved it. I used to wish I had the time to read all those books. They come pretty often, you know. Every month. Mm. Uh, sit down here beside me, honey. All right. Uh, uh, did you hear the symphony concert on the radio this evening? Oh, I missed it. What did they play? Uh, something by Beethoven. You know, Ludwig Beethoven, the well-known composer. Oh, yes. I just adore his symphonies, especially the Moonlight Sonata. Yeah. I thought that was a piano piece. Oh. Well, uh, it's been arranged for the piano. Um, would you like me to play it for you? Oh, you know I love to hear you play, Leela. <laughs> Strange I should think of the Moonlight Sonata when there's such a lovely moon outside, isn't it? Yeah, huh? Yeah. Uh, you're sure you want me to play? Oh, please, please play. Yeah. Yeah. Beethoven was certainly a fine composer. Mm, wasn't he, though? Very classical. Uh, what does Moonlight make you think of, Throckmorton? <laughs> Lots of things. Uh, Throckmorton. Do you like this song? Uh, oh, if moonlight becomes you. Mm, I just love it when Bing Crosby sings this. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Bing Crosby, huh? Moonlight becomes you. It goes with your hair. You'll certainly know the right thing to wear. <laughs> Moonlight becomes you. I'm thrilled at the sight. And I could get so romantic tonight. <laughs> You're all dressed up to go dreaming. Now don't tell me I'm wrong And what a night to go dreaming Mind if I tag along If I say I love you I want you to know It's not just because there's moonlight Although Moonlight becomes your soul. Uh, Leela. Uh, what is it, Throckmort? Leela, uh, come out into the garden. What for, Throckmort? I want to tell you about the rummel plan. <laughs> <laughs>
boy. Did you and Piggy have a good time at the movies with your girl? No, not very. What's the matter? Wasn't the picture any good? Nah, just a lot of mushy stuff. Besides, after two hours, I found I'd been holding hands with Piggy. Yeah. <laughs> good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Music on this program was under the direction of Claude Sweet. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, inviting you to listen again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. These days, the old saying, a penny saved is a penny earned, has a running mate. A point saved is a point earned. Stretching ration stamps has become just as important as saving dollars. And one of the best ways you homemakers can do both is to buy quality foods like parquet margarine that are good tasting and nutritious and tops for many uses. Parquet margarine has a delicious, satisfying flavor that makes it just about perfect as a spread for bread. It's a wonderful seasoning for hot vegetables. And when it comes to baking, you can depend on parquet because it is a real flavor shortening. You like it for pan frying, too. It doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. Every economical package of parquet margarine helps supply the energy and vitamins your family needs. It's one of the best energy foods you can serve, and every pound contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. Now, if you can't buy parquet the first time you try, it's because of wartime shortages. But Kraft is doing everything possible to keep dealers supplied and should be able to get it soon. Ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine made by Kraft. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. (laughs) The Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, an old proverb says that you've got to spend money to make money. Be that as it may, I'll twist that old saying around and tell you how one clever homemaker spends just three red ration stamps to save red ration stamps. Oh, that sounds odd. Try doing what she does with Pabstet, the delicious nourishing cheese food of a hundred uses. First, make a smooth cheese sauce with Pabstet and a little milk. Then pour it over leftovers of meat or fish or vegetables or rice, fixed any way you like, and see how family appetites react to that simple magic. You've saved food and you've pleased Dad and the kids. That's worthwhile economy. They'll like the unique cheddar cheese flavor of Pabstet in a variety of other ways, too. You can melt it with macaroni for grand-tasting casseroles, toast it to perfection, or serve it sliced with dessert or just by itself. Pabstet is made to please the most particular appetites, And it's a splendid source of important milk nutrients your family needs. So ask your dealer for Pabstet, the delicious, nourishing cheese food of a hundred uses. Remember the name, Pabstet. First came the horse. In time, the horse was eliminated and a self-propelling vehicle was developed through the efforts of men like Henry Ford, Stutz, Chandler, and others. None of these could have foreseen that the culmination of all these centuries of progress would be a 1940 six-cylinder four-door sedan at the wheel of which could be found Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Yet that's where we find him today, just turning into his driveway and heading for the garage. Something seems to be amiss, and it sounds like a motor. Uh, come on, Jenny. Uh, uh, come on, old girl. We're almost there. <laughs> well, we made it. Mom, is that you? Certainly. Who does it sound like? Barney Oldfield. Yes. Uh, I don't know, Leroy. There's something wrong with the old bus. Stick your shirt tail in. Yes, sir. I stopped by the service station to get Mike to take a look at it. Mike's been drafted. So I discovered. 
I don't know what I'm going to do now. I guess I'll have to fix it myself. Are you kidding? You... No, I'm not kidding. We'll all be making our own repairs sooner or later. We might as well start now. We might as well start walking. Uh, I guess I'll go in and get some old clothes on, Leroy. Uh, bring that package when you come. It's on the front seat there. Cigars. Hey, Uncle wait. I got an idea. Oh? What's that, my boy? How about the boyfriend? Boyfriend? Oh, you mean Ben? Yeah, he'll be bringing Marge home any minute. He knows all about motors and stuff. Well, I know a few things about motors myself. I don't need any help from Ben. Yes, Bertie? Good evening. Have you got my groceries? Hey, groceries? Oh, well, I'll tell you about that, Bertie. I didn't forget. I thought about the groceries, but the way the car's acting up, I didn't dare stop. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do for dinner. Oh, uh, here are your cigars, Unc. Uh, oh, thanks. I got these before the car started acting up, Bertie. <laughs> well, I'm sure I don't know what I'm going to do about dinner, and that's a fact. Well, couldn't we just have some beans or something? Mr. Gilsley, beans come out of a can. That's 14 points in the ration book. Oh, uh, hang the expense. Have we got any? Well, we've got one can. I've been saving it in my hope chest. Yes. <laughs> Break it out, Bertie. This is an emergency. If you say so, Mr. Gilsey. Oh, and uh, Bertie. Yes, sir? Do you think we'll have enough to invite Marjorie's young man to stay to supper? Well, if I stretch him, maybe. I thought you didn't need any help from Ben, Unc. I don't. Uh, never mind, Bertie. Just the three of us. Uh, oh, but wait. Here they come now, Marjorie and Ben. I'll just see what his plans are. Well, my dear. Well, Marjorie, don't act like this. Gosh, you don't understand. I understand perfectly. And as long as you act like that, I'm going to act like this. Goodbye. Uh. Hello, Uncle Mort. Hey, what's the matter with her highness? I don't know. Sounds like trouble. What's it going to be, Miss Gillespie? Beans for three or beans for four? Uh, beans for three, I guess, Bertie. Come on, Leroy. Let's get at that engine. Um, if I help you with the car, can I drive it after? No, Leroy, you may not. Just a little? Just down the driveway? No. Why not? I've told you why not. You're too young and you don't know anything about cars. I know as much as some people. Uh. Besides, it's against the law. Now, let's get busy here. How do you open this hood? Darn thing. Never get it open that way. And how do you open it? Oh, I don't know anything about cars. Come on, Leroy. How do you open it? You have to unlock it first. Well, unlock it then, if you know so much. Sure. There you are. No, no, up the other end. Oh, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> There. Now we're getting someplace. Well, well, look at that, the engine. <laughs> what are you going to do to it, Unc? Fix it. Yeah, but how? Don't keep asking questions. I'll figure that out when I come to it. If you ask me, you've come to it. Yes. <laughs> well, Leroy, get me the screwdriver and we'll see what's what here. Got to get to the bottom of this. Screwdriver. Here, you are, Unc. Thanks. Well, I guess we better unscrew something, huh? Well, what seems to be the trouble, Unc? I think the engine's missing, Leroy. Either that or the clutch is slipping. In either case, it's probably the carburetor. There's a little valve in there. Dirt gets into it. You just take it apart and blow into it. How did you learn so much about carburetors, Unc? Oh, you pick up these things, my boy. I've seen Mike do it. Now, where is the little devil? Uh, here we are. Unc, um, that's not the carburetor. How do you know? Uh, don't do that. I didn't. You did it. Huh? Oh, must have some connection with the horn. It is the horn. Oh. <laughs> well, the horn seems to be all right. <laughs> we better try something else. Uh-oh. I don't like the looks of this. If you're looking for the carburetor, Unc, you're getting cold. Uh, a little less advice, young man, and we'll get along better here. Okay. Just to watch the way I do this, you'll be in a position to do it yourself if you ever have to. You see, I just... <laughs> it sticks. Did you get a shock, Unc? And I bumped my head, too. Uh, I dropped the screwdriver in there. It's down inside the engine there. You'll probably have to take the grease pan off to get it. Well, how do you get the grease pan off? Screwdriver. <laughs> Fine. What did Marjorie have to go and get in a fight with Ben for? 
Well, I'll just have to see if I can reach down in there and get it. Unless you want to try, Leroy. Your arms are longer than mine, Uncle. Uh, well, agility counts, too, you know. Yeah, but I don't know as much about cars as you do. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> want me to boost you in there, Uncle? No, keep away from me. Greasy, filthy, dirty, nasty, filthy, dirty, nasty, filthy. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Well, well, the boy mechanic. Who's that? His honor. Hi, Judge. Hello, Leroy. Rock Martin, what have you been up to? Look at you. Grease all over your shirt. You're a mess. Yeah, I know it. What seems to be the trouble, Gildy? The engine's missing. Well, have you notified the police? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 23 skidoo, hooker. What do you want in here anyway? Well, I just dropped in to ask for the loan of a rake, Gildy. I thought I'd do a little work on my victory garden. But if I can be of any assistance to you Give here... Give him the rake, Leroy. Okay. Unc's been looking for the carburetor, Judge, and I tried to tell him that's it. Where? Right there. The boy is absolutely right, Gildy. Any fool knows that. What do you know about it, you old grampus? You and your real. I bet it hasn't even got a carburetor. There's an old saying, Gildersleeve, there are none so blind as those who will not see. Go on, pull your car to pieces, scatter it all over the place, but when you've finally taken everything else apart, you'll discover that that is the carburetor. You don't have to make a speech about it. I'll take that rake now, Leroy, if you'll be so good. Here you are, Judge. I shall return it. See that you do. Thanks. You're welcome. The old windbag. <laughs> he could be right, though. Leroy, just for the sake of argument, suppose we take this little gadget apart here. Huh? Now you're getting somewhere. You're going to need a wrench for that, though. After all the work I went to to fish this screwdriver out? Yeah, you might as well throw it back in. <laughs> here, let me see if this will fit. Leroy, I'm doing this. Okay, okay. You getting it? Yeah, it's coming. Oh, boy. Uncle Mort. Oh, what does she want? Leroy. What do you want? Leroy, don't holler in my ear. Supper. Leroy, stop. Oh. oh, now you did it. There goes the carburetor all over the lot. Who did it? What did you let go for? Why did you shout for? Who shouted? Well, who let go? It came apart in my hand. If you hadn't shouted, I wouldn't have dropped it. I told you not to shout. Uncle Mort. All right. <laughs> with the car, Uncle Mort. Is it a powerhouse now? Well, not exactly, my dear, but I think I've definitely located the trouble. <laughs> carburetor. Well, what's wrong with the carburetor? It's all over the garage. Eat your beans. <laughs> well, I only hope we'll get it finished by tomorrow. Brady and I have some shopping to do, haven't we? We sure have. Got to get all the groceries for the weekend. Well, you can always have them delivered if you have to. Not no more. The A1 grocery doesn't deliver now? No, sir. With them, it's strictly come and get it. And the last one gets a rotten egg. Yes. That's right. You have to go down there in person and raffle for it. Yes. <laughs> well, Leroy can always run down on his bicycle. Nope, flat tire. Oh, well... Oh, come clean, Uncle Mort. Aren't you going to get that car put together by tomorrow? Oh, I'll get it put together. Don't worry about that. I'll get it put together. <laughs> just hope it'll run, that's all. <laughs> um, why don't you just break down and get Ben to help you? He could fix it in no time. Young man, when I want any advice from you, I'll break down and ask for it. Okay. Can I be excused? You may be excused, Leroy. And stick your shirt tail in. Okay. Uh, by the way, Marjorie, speaking of Ben, why don't we have him to supper tomorrow? Uncle huh? Mort, you know perfectly well that Ben and I are not speaking. Since when? Since four o'clock this afternoon. Oh, no, I'm sorry to hear that. We're not going to be speaking till Ben makes up his mind. About what? Whether he's a man or a mouse. Oh, I don't think you're being fair to Ben, my dear. He's a little shy, perhaps. A little? But he's a fine, capable lad, and I don't like to hear you capable say... Capable of putting a car together, maybe, but he's not capable of making up his own mind. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Uh... He won't speak up. He lets people walk all over him. No woman wants to marry a man like that. Has he asked you to marry him? No, that's another thing. <laughs> it's not what I'm mad about. What are you mad about? Well... Down at the plant today, a job opened up in Ben's department. And did Ben get it? No. Chet Healy got it. Who? That loud mouth? Yes. At least he had the nerve to walk into the front office and talk to them. Not Ben, though. No, Tar Baby, he ain't say nothing. So now he's working for Chet. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, it burns me up. Ben knows three times as much as Chet does. Five times. How's anyone going to find it out if he never opens his mouth? Well, you seem to have found it out. <laughs> That's different. Yeah. Trouble with Ben is he's, he's just too nice. 
Everybody imposes on him, and he lets them. Every time he comes over here, you get him to work on something. Uh, uh, telephone, my dear. All right. You don't want to be too hard on Ben, my dear. You could do a lot to help him if I'm you. I'm not don't... interested. Gillis, wet wash. We pick up and deliver. <laughs> Uh, ben? Is your chance, Hunk. Tell Ben I don't care to speak to him. Uh, wait a minute now. You can't tell him that, my dear. Tell him to hold on, Leroy. Tell him I'll speak to him. Just a minute. Hunk wants to speak to you. Uncle Mort, if you ask him over here, I won't see him. Now, be fair, my dear. We haven't had him over here in several days, and I think it'd be only decent... And if you use me as an excuse to get him over here to help you with that car, I won't speak to you. Why, Marjorie, I'm hurt that you would even think such a thing. Uh, be right there, Leroy. Here he comes. Here, give it to me. Hello, Ben? How are you, my boy? Just fine. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Marjorie? Well, uh, I'll tell you, Ben, she's, uh, she's in the bathtub right now. Uncle Mort. Yeah, taking a bath, Ben. You know, all wet. <laughs> Is there any message I can give her? There's a message you can give him. Tell him I don't care if I never see him again. She's dying to see you, Ben, and... She wants to know if you'll come over to supper tomorrow night. I said nothing of the kind. If he comes over here, you can entertain him. Fine. She says to come early, about 2 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. We'll play games, Ben. Yeah. And, oh, Ben, be sure to wear old clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. But first, let me ask, are you a homemaker shopping before you go to the store these days? Now that it takes two kinds of money to buy so many foods, red ration stamps as well as cash, you'll find that planning in advance will save many vexing moments. For each meal, plan the main dish first, then carefully build the rest of the meal around it using your newspaper list of point values. That way you can be sure that family appetites will be tempted and that meals will be satisfying because they're well-balanced. If you want to surprise the family with a real treat that's economical with both red ration stamps and cash, in planning your meals for this week, include the delicious cheese food, Pabstet. Pabstet has a unique cheddar cheese flavor that's grand with main dishes, or serve it as a smooth cheese sauce with leftovers in a variety of ways. Pabstet's wonderfully nourishing, too. It's a fine source of many vitally important milk nutrients your family needs. Now, you may not be able to buy Pabstet the first time you try because so much of the nation's dairy food is going to war. But watch for it and buy Pabstet when you can. Just three red ration points for a generous package. Remember the name Pabstet, P-A-B-S-T hyphen E-T-T. Pabstet. <laughs> Back to our hero. His plans are progressing favorably since after a good night's sleep, Marjorie seems more or less reconciled to the thought of seeing Ben. It's afternoon now, and we find Gildersleeve lying on the floor of his garage working on his long suffering car, assisted by the long suffering Leroy. Yeah, I think she's coming now, Leroy. You'll be sorry, Unc. Don't be silly, my boy. I've got a suspicion the whole trouble is right in here. And that's what you said yesterday when you took off the carburetor. Yeah. Uh... Well, when Ben gets here, he'll confirm my theory, I'm certain. You're going to make him work too, ain't you, Unc? I'm not making anybody work, Leroy. I'm entirely opposed to the principle of slave labor. If you're not interested in what you're doing, you may go. Oh, boy! Leroy! <laughs> Can't I go? No. I only said that to test your character. <laughs> I'd like it better if I could do some of the hammering down under there. You sure gave me the worst part of this job. Yeah, but yours is a very important part, my boy. Be patient. Oh, nuts. Yeah. Well, Leroy, if you aren't a model for a Christian martyr, what on earth are you doing? Can't you see? Well, I can see you standing there with a vacant look on your face, holding that blanket as if you were going to catch somebody jumping out of a burning building. Don't make fun of Leroy, Marjorie. He's helping me with an important job. Oh, you're down under there. What's Leroy doing? Well, I'm trying to knock the timing gear loose. And once she busts loose, I catch all the pieces in the blanket. <laughs> Are you kidding? No, no. <laughs> well, 
in that case, I want you both to hold still while I go get my camera. Huh? I want to record this for posterity. Yes. Hi, Marjorie. Hello, Ben. Hi, Ben. Hi, young fella. I'll be right back, Ben. I want to get my camera and take a picture of these two idiots. Two? Where's your uncle? I'm under here, young <laughs> Gosh, I mean... Don't let Uncle Moore talk you into any work on that car now. Oh, don't worry, Marjorie. I won't get under there. Uh, new suit. <laughs> nice, too. <laughs> well, I won't be a second. Uh, Leroy, uh, give me a hand. I want to come up and see Ben for a minute. Okay, Uncle. Blow out all your breath and pull in your stomach. <laughs> Keep home! Mm. <laughs> Well, hello, Ben. Glad to see you. Glad to see you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Doing a little repairing, I see. Yes, I am repairing. It's every motorist's duty duty in wartime. (laughs) By the way, I'm having a little trouble getting this gadget loose here, Ben. I wonder if you'd mind just slipping under there and having a little peek. Oh, I'm afraid I could, Mr. Gildersleeve. Not in these clothes. (laughs) New suit. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well... Now, don't you worry, my boy. I wouldn't have you spot that suit for the world. Here, slip into these overalls. Oh, but gee, Mr. Gildersleeve... No trouble at all, my boy. Here. But Marjorie said I... You'll never know. Leroy won't tell, will you, Leroy? Leroy... Why, that little... He sneaked off. Marjorie will never know, Ben. Here. You'll be under there and out again before she gets back. Yeah, but she only wants to get a camera. That's what she said, my boy. But I guess we know women, don't we? Oh, yeah, you bet. Yeah. <laughs> that's the stuff. Here. Here's the wrench. You see that thing that's holding it? Yeah, I think so. That a boy. Here, here she comes. Well, I've got the camera and it's all loaded. Where's Ben? Uh, Ben? Yes, Ben. Where did he go? <laughs> 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 Uncle Throckmorton, you should be ashamed of yourself. Now, Marjorie. And you should be ashamed, too, Ben Waterford. Now, wait a minute, Marge. And his new suit, too. How could you do it, Uncle Mort? Overalls. Besides, it was really his own idea, Marjorie. He practically insisted. I don't believe it. Well, Ben, aren't you coming out of there? What'd you say, Marge? I said, I suppose you're going to stay down there all day. Oh, no, I'll come right out. But, Ben, did you get the whatchamacallit loose? No, I didn't. And he's not going to. Well, it'll only take a second, Mark. Oh, well, you listen to me, Ben Waterford. You haven't any more spine than a piece of spaghetti. Yes. You let yourself be pushed around down to the factory by a boy with half your ability. And then you come out here and let yourself be pushed around by a lazy old man with a big stomach. Oh, <laughs> Marjorie. Goodbye. Hey, Mark. Hey. Well, stop for a minute, Gillespie. Oh, gosh. Let me get out of here. Wait till I get... Oh. Hmm. Overalls, no suit. <laughs> Where did Marge go? She went out the front gate, Ben, and down the street. Oh, golly, I can't chase her in these torn pants. What'll I do? Don't worry, lad, you'll be all right. Oh, it was wonderful the way you stood your ground there. Oh. By George, you certainly told her, Ben. <laughs> Yes, sir, that was a mighty fine supper. Aren't you glad you stayed now, Ben? Well, pretty glad. Yes, sir. Oh. Well, let's get at that car again. What do you say? Uh, You don't suppose Marjorie might be coming in soon? Don't worry about her. She'll turn up soon enough. She's probably seeing the early show at the Majestic. Might just as well work on the car until she gets here, Ben. Well, I want to talk to her before I go. But in the meantime... That's the spirit. We'll both work on it, and before you know it, zingo. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Oh, my goodness. What's the matter? I'm clean out of cigars, practically. Uh, tell you what, I'll run down to the drugstore and pick up a couple while you get started. Then I'll come back and zingle. Hello, PV. Oh, good evening, Mr. Gildersleeve. How can I be of service to you? Uh, give me a couple of cigars, will you, PV? And make it snappy. I'm in a hurry. Mm, yes, sir. Here they are. Yeah, Fifty, seventy-five, one dollar, and I thank you. Yeah, oh, thank you. Well, how's business, Peavy? A little quiet, Mr. Gildersleeve. I I lay it all to this rationing. It's rationing, but they're not rationing drugs, Peavy. And that's just the trouble. The ration stuff gets all the publicity. Yes. I see. Well, got to get going. 
Oh, I got a match, Peavy. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, it's got a Lucifer on me somewhere for a good customer. Here. Thanks. Well, you got to be running along. In a rush, eh? Uh, going to a picture? No, I'm fixing my automobile, and I've got to get back and finish the job. Well, it's too bad you're in such a hurry. I can't help it. Why? What if I wasn't? Well, I was just thinking, the business being so quiet and all, that maybe you and I could play just one game of Chinese checkers. Yeah, here? Now? Yes, it only takes about a half an hour. I, I've got the board here with the hot water bag. Yeah, uh, well, I've got to get back to that tar, Peavy. Besides, Chinese checkers is a kid game. There's no skill to it. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> There's nothing to the game, Peavy. There's more than to it than you think, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you beat me, I'll give you a ten-cent soda on the house. Oh, well, just one game, Peavy. But we'll have to play fast because I'm in a hurry. Well, hello, Ben. Now, let's get at that car now, huh? Oh, it's uh, all finished, Mr. Killersleeve. Just finished a minute ago. Well, can you beat that? I'm much obliged to you, my boy. Well, that's okay. Now we can sit here on the porch and enjoy the spring evening for a while. Yeah. Something accomplished, something done to earn a night's repose. <laughs> Longfellow. <laughs> Darn rocking chair has a bad squeak. You notice it? Yes, sir. But I don't know anything about rocking chairs. <laughs> you didn't happen to see Marjorie on the way to the drugstore, did you? No, Ben, I didn't. But don't you worry about her. She's probably at the home of one of her girlfriends playing Chinese checkers. <laughs> she probably wishes she was here right this minute. Oh, you think so? Uh, no doubt about it. She'll be along soon. See, I guess you must know quite a bit about women, don't you, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, I've been around quite a while, my boy. You get so you can figure them out. Tell what a woman's thinking just by looking at her. Gosh, that must be a neat trick. When I'm with a girl, I can't seem to... can't seem to think at all. Can't think? No, I just sit there and sizzle. <laughs> Well, that's not the way to captivate a woman, Ben. It sure isn't. What do you suppose Marjorie's got against me, Mr. Gildersleeve? Why, that's as simple as ABC, young man. You're not using any finesse. Any what? You gotta be smooth, Ben. Look at the men the women go for in pictures. Look at Adolph Mongeau. Yeah, and look at me. Uh, well, I'm sorry about your suit, Ben. Oh, that's all right. Gosh, I couldn't be like Adolph Mongeau anyway. I tried to raise a mustache once. What was the trouble? Well... Came out pink. You... <laughs> pink? Yep. Been shaving pretty close ever since. Oh, there's a car turning down our street. Yeah, whose is it? Oh, it's probably Marie King driving Marjorie home. Hey, has Marie got a 42 convertible? Uh, no, that's not Marie. No, it isn't. That's Chet Healy. Chet Healy? What? It, it, Marjorie! Oh, hello, Uncle Mort. I didn't see you there in the dark. Oh, hello, Ben. Hello. Uncle Mort, I want you to meet Chet Healy. I've told you about him. How do you do? Well, how are you, Mr. Gildersleeve? Say, who's that with you? Well, if it isn't my new assistant. Hiya, Junior. Uh, hello. Hey, we just saw a great picture, and then we had a good look at a wonderful moon. Ah, uh, this is a mighty attractive little niece you've got there, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, uh, you think so? Yes, sir. I'd like to be an uncle to her myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, say, Junior, what happened to your Sunday suit? What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? How would you like a punch in the nose? Oh, Ben! Oh, now, don't worry, honey. Nothing's going to happen to me. That's what you think. Oh. Well, well, hey, this is quite a spectacle. I'll let me. There, Mr. Healy, you asked for it. In the future, keep away from my girl. But, oh, Ben, I never thought I... Well, well you're wonderful. Can you ever forgive me? Well, I don't know. You keep picking on me as if I didn't know what I was doing. You treat me like a child, and I'm sick of it. If you're going to be my girl, you've got to let me say what's what from now on. Oh, Ben, I will. Well, that's telling her, Ben. I'm glad to see you're following my advice. Your advice? Mr. Gildersleeve, you're full of wet hay. Oh! <laughs> What are you doing up? What are you doing at that window? 
Come over here and get a load of this, Unc. You can hear the two lovebirds out in the porch. Why, Leroy? Ooh, is that Ben laying it on? You get away from that window, young man. I'm surprised at you. What did I do? Don't you know that eavesdropping is wrong? It's dishonorable to listen in on other people's conversation. Don't ever let me catch you doing that again, you understand? Yes, sir. Leroy, did he kiss her? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Good night, my boy. Good night, everybody. <laughs> This program was under the direction of Claude Sweeten. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gilders, please. Here's a question for homemakers. What delicious, nourishing spread for bread is economical with both red ration stamps and money? The answer, parquet margarine, the quality spread made by Kraft. Parquet margarine has a delicate, appetizing flavor that is grand with bread and toast and rolls. It's a fine seasoning for hot vegetables, a real flavor shortening for baking. It is especially good for pan frying because it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. And besides being wonderfully good to eat, parquet is highly nutritious. In fact, it is one of the best energy foods you can serve. What's more, it is fortified with important vitamin A. So for flavor, for good nutrition, and for all-around economy... Ask your dealer for parquet margarine. If he doesn't have parquet the first time you ask for it, it's because of wartime shortages and because more and more people are asking for parquet every day. But Kraft is doing everything possible to keep all dealers supplied. So watch for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine made by Kraft. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. The Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton. from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. You know, these are the mornings when waffles or pancakes really hit the spot. And you need hearty food this crisp fall weather to start the day off right. Well, waffles and pancakes taste mighty good when you spread them with delicious parquet margarine before you pour the syrup on. You see, parquet margarine is the spread made by Kraft, and it has a delicate, appetizing flavor that's just about tops. Yes, parquet is entirely different from old-time margarines, and you can tell the difference the minute you taste it. Parquet is a wholesome, nourishing vegetable margarine made to Kraft's high standard of quality. You'll find parquet margarine is grand for every use, as a spread for bread, a flavor shortening for baking, yes, and for pan frying, too. And remember, parquet margarine is a fine energy food and a reliable source of vitamin A. So order a pound or two of economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask your dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Summerfield and the Great Gildersleeve. There's a snap in the air these days and a touch of football. It's the kind of weather that makes a man want to be up and doing. And sure enough, at 10 o'clock in the morning, we find Gildersleeve arriving at his office ready for big things. Good morning, Miss Fitch. Good morning, Mr. Gildersleeve. How's business this morning? Just about as usual. There was a young man in to see you. Oh, yes? Who was he? Uh, Mr. Brinkerhoff. He had a letter of introduction. Here. Uh, Brinkerhoff? I don't know any Brinkerhoff, do I? That I couldn't say. Yes, yes. (laughs) The only Brinkerhoff I ever knew was a fellow I went to college with. And there was a Brinkerhoff who traveled for some wholesale house, but he was killed in a bus crash. It wouldn't be him. (laughs) I doubt it. Yes, yes. Of course, there's Brinkerhoff and Schultz. But I don't know anybody there, so I don't see who'd be writing to me. I wonder who it could be. Uh, May I make a suggestion? What's that? 
Why don't you open the letter and find out? <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> Excellent idea. <laughs> You're a wonderful woman, Miss Fitz. I don't know how I'd get along without you. Sometimes I'm tempted to try. <laughs> oh, it's from Brink. Brink? You know Brink? No, I don't suppose you do. But you've heard of him. He was All-American in 1919. All-American what? Halfback. He's the one who made the famous play against Navy. Oh, but maybe you don't remember. It was in the last quarter, about one minute to go, and we had the ball on our own ten-yard line. Here, I'll show you. Bend over. I beg your pardon. Bend over. I'm Brink, and you're playing center for Navy. Oh, no, I'm not. Well, I'm just trying to show you. What's the matter with you? <laughs> anyway, that's the fellow. Imagine me getting a letter from him. You see, it's addressed to me personally. Dear Tubby. Dear Tubby. I used to be a little stout. <laughs> Wait till I show this to Hooker. I bet he never got a letter from an All-American. Oh, he says here, Tempest sure does fugit. I'd give my right arm to see you again, you old son of a gun. Uh, this is me he's writing to. Oh. He says, maybe you and me can get together at reunion sometime and have a good old chin fest. You and me. Uh, this man went to college. It's, it's all American. It's scholarship. <laughs> then he goes on and he says, well, enough of such bourgeois. <laughs> bourgeois. <laughs> this epistle will introduce my son, Larry, who has just graduated from the old alma mater and is now starting on his own out in your neck of the woods. Anything you can do to introduce him around and help him make contacts will certainly be appreciated. Well, I'll have to do that. I'll have to have him right out to the house right away. And look, look how he signs it. As ever, Brink. Good old Brink. What times we had together. By George, I'll have the boy out tonight. I'll have him out to dinner. Hey, get my house on the phone, will you? Yes, sir. Any son of Brink's is a son of mine. <laughs> Anybody home? Hiya. Uh, hello, Leroy. I got the paper tonight with funnies. Here. Where is everybody? I don't know. Freddy's out in the kitchen or someplace. Do you have to read it on the floor, Leroy? It's easier that way. Well, don't leave it there. Pick it up when you get through. I always do. Yes, you do. <laughs> Where's your sister? What? I asked you a question. She's in the hands of pirates. Marjorie, what are you talking about? It's not different. She's been trapped by river pirates. Yes. Now, hold the prisoner on an old Japanese junk. It's an old Could you tear yourself away from that Japanese junk long enough to tell me where Marjorie is? I don't know. She went out somewhere. The hairdresser's, I guess. She's got a heavy date. Date? How do you know? She's been going around all afternoon with gunk on her face. Yes. <laughs> well, date or no date, she's going to have to postpone it. Uh, Marjorie? No, it's me, Mr. Gill, please. Oh. Uh, what have you been up to, Bertie? I just got back from marketing. It's a little late for marketing, isn't it? It was a little late when you called up about dinner. It's, oh, yes. Well, I'm sorry, Bertie. I couldn't get a hold of the man sooner. Did you get the pot roast? Mr. Gillsleeve, I've been all over, and there ain't a pot roast in Summerfield. Oh, uh, well, that's a shame. Brink was particularly fond of pot roast, as I remember. He was the greatest man for meat and potatoes I ever knew. Present company accepted. Huh? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what did you get, Bertie? Well, they had some nice liver. Oh, liver and bacon is good with French fried onions. Yeah, but you know how some people is about onions. How's that? They can't stand them, so I didn't get the liver. Oh, well, <laughs> perhaps it's just as well. They had some leg of lamb instead. Oh, lamb is good. You have plenty of other things with it. Mint sauce or currant jelly. Yeah, but you're liable to run into lamb every day of the week, so I didn't get the lamb. Uh, well, what did you get? Mr. Gilsey, if you like guinea hen. Guinea hen? Oh, now you're talking, Bertie, with nice stuffing and wild rice. And maybe some cream mushrooms on the side. Oh, wonderful. I love it. <laughs> Wish I'd know that I'd have bought the guinea hen. <laughs> what? You didn't get it? No, not knowing the gentleman you invited for dinner, I figured I'd better play safe. Well, what did you get? Well, I figured I'd better get something that didn't take too long to cook in case maybe he was a little late. Yeah, maybe that's a good idea. What did you get? You know, something I could put on the fire after you got here. Something people like. Come clean, Bertie. What did you get? I got pork chops. <laughs> pork chops. Oh, I better be getting this stuff out to the kitchen. Here comes Miss Margie up the wall. Pork chops. Oh, well. Oh! oh look out there! Leroy, do you have to lie in front of the door? Yes, young man. Pick that paper up. Gosh, I can't tell me even doing a little reading around here. 
the idea. Well, you're looking blooming, my dear. Oh, it looks terrible now, but I think it'll be all right when it's combed out. I had him cut it off a little shorter. It looks fine. Uh, I hope you didn't make any plans for this evening, my dear. Well, you know I have. Why do you think I had my hair done? I don't know why women have their hair done. It's just something that comes over them. <laughs> Uncle Mort, you knew I had a date. Yes, but... I stood dug up last Saturday because you asked me to, and I'm not going to do it again. What have you got against Doug? Nothing, nothing at all, my dear. It's just that this son of an old college chum of mine turned up unexpectedly, so I asked him out to dinner. Oh, fine, I'll be glad to have dinner with him, but after that, I, I'm sorry. But you don't understand, my dear. This boy is all American. What do you think Doug is, an Indian? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's a football player. No kidding, Uncle, an all-American? Well, his father was. I don't care if his dad was president. I've got a date with Doug. Marjorie. Yes? It's not very often I ask you to do a thing like this, but I'm asking you tonight. This means a lot to me. I'd like to show this boy a good time, and I'd like you to help me. But Uncle Moore... You like this boy, my dear. I, I haven't met him yet, but if he's anything like his dad, you'll be crazy about him. All the girls were crazy about Brink. He was a great big strapping fellow, had a grip like a bear trap. Mm. He'd shake hands with you and your knees would turn to water. He must have been a, a charmer. Yes, Brinkerhoff was a hero to me. To me. <laughs> he was a hero to everybody in school. I remember in my senior year, the biggest weekend of the year. The day of the junior prom. The day of the big game. Well, you're both right. The weekend of the game with State was also the weekend of the junior prom. And I'd invited a girl down for the occasion. <laughs> a blind date. Uh-oh. You're wrong, Leroy. This girl turned out to be a Pippin. I do... How did you recognize her when you met her, Uncle Moore? It was all very romantic, my dear. She wrote me she'd wear a red hat with a green feather. And I wrote her I'd be wearing my raccoon coat, my beanie, and a chrysanthemum. <laughs> you must have been quite a boy owning a raccoon coat. It belonged to my roommate. He was rich. But I, I'll never forget that day waiting down at the depot. There was a flock of us there. And as the train pulled in... Oh, where is she? Where is she? She'll probably get off at the other end. Oh, a red hat. And uh, pardon me, miss. Are you addressing me, sir? Uh, my mistake. No green feather. Uh. <laughs> oh, there's a blue hat. And look what's under it. Ooh, I wish it was her. Oh, my goodness. Maybe she didn't come. Oh, wait. There's a red hat with a green feather. What a chassis. <laughs> Oh, miss, are you by any chance Miss Betty Beaumont? Oh, yes, I am. Are you Mr. Throckmorton Gildersleeve? Uh, that's me in person. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fine you got here. Did you have a pleasant trip? Oh, it was Cassie. Uh, here, let me get those grips and we'll go on up to the fraternity house. That'll be Cassie. Uh. <laughs> oh, look, you, you see this fella coming? Uh, yeah. That's Brinkerhoff, the captain of our team. Really? Hi, but he's handsome. Do you know him? Well, uh, sort of. Uh, hello, Mr. Brinkerhoff. Hello there. Oh, I mean, uh, hello there, Gildersleeve. Put it there. Yeah. <laughs> Ow! My hand. <laughs> Glad to see you, Brinkerhoff. <laughs> Miss Beaumont, I have the honor to present Mr. Brinkerhoff, the captain of our eleven. How do you do? Well, I'm mighty glad to know you, Miss Beaumont, I'm sure. Hey, can I give you folks a lift up to the campus in my car? Well, I... Well, Mr. Brinkerhoff, that would be Cassie. Oh. <laughs> Just call me Brink, Miss Beaumont. All right, Brink. Can we ride up with Brink, Mr. Gildersleeve? Call me Tubby. <laughs> Could we, Tubby? Sure, Tubby. Come on. Hey, I tell you what. We can stop off the sweet shop and let Tubby buy us a soda. How about it? <laughs> Gee, Brink, that would be Cassie. <laughs> Hey, by the way, what are you and uh, Betty doing tonight? Uh, tonight? Well, tonight I'm going to sing in the Glee Club tonight. Uh, me, 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 me. Tubby's quite a singer. Yeah. Say, Tubby, uh, how about letting me bring Betty to the concert to hear you so she won't have to go along? You know what I mean, Betty? Uh-huh. How about it, Tubby? Gosh, Brink, thanks. What a pal. You think of everything. <laughs> You're going out on that field for that second half against State. 
The only way you can lose this game is if you all fall asleep. So I want you to play like you're behind. And that means fight. F-I-G-T, fight. That's right. <laughs> Gee, I, I love that. Yes. Hey, Tubby. Oh, hello, Brink. Gee, you're playing a great game, Brink. Oh, that's nothing to what I'm going to do this half. Say, Tubby, uh, how about bringing Betty over to Sig Sig dance tonight, huh? Oh, gosh, Brink, I'd sure like to, but I can't make it. Oh, you can, huh? No. Well, that's too bad. I fixed it with Coach Mulligan for you to play a couple of minutes in this second half. Oh, gee, no kidding. Yeah, that'll get you your letter, you know. It'll make you look like a hero to Betty up there in the stands. Oh, gosh, Brink, you sure are a pal. Yeah. You sure you couldn't change your mind about tonight? Uh, I'd like to, Brink. I'd sure like to bring Betty to that dance, but I promised my roommate we'd go with him and his cousin and spend the evening at his aunt's house. <laughs> oh, well, that's uh, too bad, Tubby. That's too bad. Huh? Oh, thanks, Coach. That's how I got my letter. If it hadn't been for Brink, the coach might have never put me in that game. Yeah, but how did you do in the game, Unc? How did it come out? Well, it was a funny thing about that. On the very first play, somebody clipped me from behind, knocked me down, and kicked me on the nose. They carried me off the field on a stretcher. Gosh, were you hurt badly? Broke my collarbone. I was laid up in the infirmary for ten days. But do you know what Brink did? What? He took care of my girl for me all the rest of that weekend. <laughs> uh, 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 Betty, she was a queen. That's the last date I ever had with her. After that, she went with Brink. Yeah, how did you know? Are you sure he wasn't also the one who broke your collarbone? Brink? Never. Brink was my pal. Are you kidding? <laughs> Oh, that must be young Brink now. Gosh, I can't wait to see if he looks like his dad. I'll go, my dear. Ah, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes, come in. Come right in. By George, you're the spitting image of your dad. I'd know you any place. Yes, sir. Always glad to meet the son of Brink. Put her there, my boy. Glad to. Oh! My hand. <laughs> Chip off the old block, all right. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. You homemakers are budget conscious these days, I'm sure. But none of you wants to sacrifice good nutrition for your family just to keep the food budget in line. Well, you don't have to if you serve your family foods like delicious parquet margarine because they're thrifty and mighty nutritious, too. Yes, grand-tasting parquet margarine is an economical source of important food values your family needs. You see, besides tasting good... Parquet margarine is a wholesome, nourishing food. It's one of the best energy foods you can serve your family. And it's also a reliable source of vitamin A, because every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A the year round. So serve parquet margarine as a spread for bread. Use it for cooking, too. Your family is sure to like its flavor. Yes, tomorrow, ask your food dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet. The margarine that's made by Kraft. Now let's return to the great Gildersleeve, who has invited a few of his closest friends in for the evening to meet the son of his old college chum, Brink Brinkerhoff. Dinner is over, and our host beams with pride upon the little group of guests clustered about the young hero. But did that yeah. stop me? Not me. I double back, ran through the whole team, circled around right end for a good 30 yards, and would have made the touchdown if it hadn't been I ran into my own interference. Well, uh, a chip off the old block, all right, folks. <laughs> Mr. Brinkerhoff, I think that's the most exciting story I ever heard. Tell us some more of your experience. Uh -huh. Speaking of college puts me in mind of a rather amusing little experience in my own youth. Oh, brother. The time we stole the clapper out of the chapel bell. Yeah. You know the old saying, boys will be boys. Oh. Well, sir, for some reason... Hey, Margie, old... come on in the den here. What is it you want? Who's that old geezer out there shooting off his face? That's Judge Hooker. He's a friend of my uncle's. Well, is he going to talk all night? Why don't he give somebody else a chance? <laughs> He's a very nice man. Well, he talks too much. Hey, what do you say we get out of this fire trap and shake these stale characters? These are my friends. Oh, come on. Come on. Let's get out of here. I don't see how you can say that. After all, Uncle Mort invited all these people just here to meet you. Well, they've met me. They've had their thrill. 
<laughs> we don't have to stay here all night while that lame brain swipes the clapper out of the bell, do we? Well, that's good for three hours. Well. Come on. You and I could make beautiful music together, honey. They'll never miss us. Well, Uncle Mort did say he wanted you to have a good time. You see? That settles it. Uncle's orders. My car is right outside. <laughs> Frightfully late. Good night, Throckmorton. Uh, good night, Mrs. Ransom. Good night, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, g- good night, P.V. Well, Gildy, what do you suppose became of our young friend? They'll turn up, Horace. Don't be so nosy. That uh, young Brinkerhoff seems to be quite a fella. Yes, well, he takes after his dad. Brink always did have a way with the girls. Yes, yeah, youth, I guess. Youth. Reminds me of the time I swiped the clapper out of the chapel bay hall. Yeah. <laughs> But I guess I told you about that. More than once. Good night, Horace. Good night, Gildy. Uh, the old goat. You'd think he was the only man that ever stole a clapper out of a bell. <laughs> oh, two o'clock in the morning. Why, George is going too far. I'll tell that Brink. Look here, Brinkerhoff. I'll say to him, friendship is friendship, I'll say to him. But enough's enough. We have a rule in this house, I'll say to him. When my niece goes out in the evening, I want to know where she's going, I'll say to him. And furthermore... <laughs> Oh, I guess they're back. And about time, too. Well, thank you, Brink. I've had a perfectly wonderful time. It, Brink? Hey, what's your hurry? The evening's young yet. I'll come in. We can scramble some eggs. Or something. <laughs> no, no, I'd love to, but I can't, really. I, I, I've got to get up early tomorrow. What for? What for? What do you got to get up for that's better than this? Answer me that. Oh, brother, chip off the old block. All right. <laughs> Please, I, I've got to go, really. Please. No, I don't take my foot out of the door till you give me a kiss. Oh, are you going to start that again? We'll see about that. Marjorie! There, I told you. Coming, Uncle Mort. Good night. I'm sorry I'm so late, Uncle Mort, but there wasn't a thing I could do about it. Marjorie, where have you been? This wasn't my idea, remember? You said give him a good time. Uncle Mort, there's a man following me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, I want to complain about your niece. She doesn't treat me right. Uh, Uncle Mort, if you don't mind, I think I'll run up now. I'm, I'm tired, and I think I'll just say good night. Uh, good night, my dear. Good night, sugar. Good night. <laughs> Ah, it's a great little girl you got there, Mr. Gildersleeve. She's a dilly. Yeah, she's a fine girl. A little difficult at times, though. Well, that's women, you know. You can't get along with them, and you can't get along without them. Uh, very good. <laughs> hey, speaking of Marjorie, uh, I wonder if you're going to be busy tomorrow, Mr. Gildersleeve. If m- m- Marjorie? Busy? Yeah. I wonder if I could drop into your office to speak to you for a few moments. If you mean about Marjorie? Yeah. Yeah, about Marjorie. Well, well, certainly. Always glad to see you any time, my boy. Shall we make it around 11? 11. Suits me. Fine. Good night, Mr. Gildersleeve. It's been swell. Good night, my boy. Oh, wow, my hand. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> uh, great kid. Uh, Marjorie. Oh, Marjorie. What is it, Uncle Mark? I know a secret, and I won't tell. Well, what do you mean? I know. I don't know what you're talking about, Uncle Mort. And I'm tired. It, you can't fool your old uncle, but I won't tell. I don't know what you're talking about. Good night. Good night, my dear. Uh, pleasant dreams. Leela! Uh, oh, Leela! Oh, hello, Throckmorton. Uh, hello, Leela. I had a most enjoyable evening at your house last night. I want to tell you about last night. Hmm? You know, Marjorie and young Brinkerhoff disappeared early in the evening. Uh, you noticed that. Well, I didn't like to say anything. Yes. Well, guess what? He's coming down to my office this morning to talk to me. You mean about? Uh-huh. Oh, I think that's so romantic. Yes, so do I. Why, who'd ever think little Marjorie? Why, she never even met him till yesterday, did she? That's right. It, last night. Mm. Of course, it's all up to Marjorie. I don't want to influence her, but his dad was one of my best friends at college. Oh, I think it's just wonderful. You know, I always long for somebody to sweep me off my feet like that, but my husband, Beauregard, was such a cautious man. Oh, yes. Mm. He was a lawyer, you know. He courted me for three years till finally Father had to speak to him. (laughs) 
Well, hey, don't lose any time these days, by George. Yes, it happens so fast nowadays, you never know who'll be next, do you? Uh, next. <laughs> I gotta be getting along. See you at the church, please. <laughs> Oh, uh, hello, PV. Well, it looks as if I might be losing my little girl, PV. You mean Marjorie? Yeah, she and young Brinkerhoff slipped out early in the evening last night, if you noticed. Yes, I thought there was something funny going on there. <laughs> well, he's coming down to the office to talk to me about it at 11 o'clock. Is that so? Yeah. Uh, suppose congratulations are in order, then. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to hate to lose her, though, PV. Well, marriage is a great institution. I've had a good many years' experience with it. So has Mrs. Peavy. <laughs> and I think we'd agree that your niece is making no mistake. Uh, you know, Peavy, I've always regretted that I didn't marry. Have you, Mr. Gillespie? Yes, I've always felt somehow that I was missing one of the finest things in life. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Marriage has its conveniences and its inconveniences. Oh, well, of course, it's like anything else. It's a matter of give and take. More give than take. <laughs> I think Mrs. Peavy would go along with me on that, too. I know, but you've been married a long time, Peavy. Twenty-three years. So has Mrs. Peavy. <laughs> when you've been married as long as that, I suppose the novelty sort of wears off. Well, no, I wouldn't say that, either. Mrs. Peavy still manages to spring a little surprise on me now and then. Only the other day, she presented me with a watch fob she crocheted for me. <laughs> Last thing in the world you'd expect. Watch fob crocheted? I take it all back, Peavy. I'm glad I never got married. Oh, i got to be getting there. I can't keep him waiting. Goodbye, Mr. Gilbert. Uh, wait a minute. What did I come in here for? Uh, razor blade? No. Stamp? No. Uh, well, it'll come back to me. Goodbye, TV. Hey, goodbye, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, uh, is he here yet, Miss Fitch? Is who here yet? Uh, the kid, young Brink. No one's been here. Were you expecting someone? Was I expecting someone? <laughs> yeah. Oh, but you don't know. No, what? Uh, that young fellow who was in here yesterday, you know, the one I uh, said I couldn't see. Yes. Uh, little did I know. Uh, Miss Fitch, I think, I'm not sure, but I think he may going to be marrying my niece. No. Yeah. You know, I thought he was rather good looking. Looks just like his dad, a chip off the old block. Oh, little Margie, a wedding. Won't that be exciting? You know, I love weddings. Yeah. And funeral. <laughs> uh, this may be him now. Well, good morning, Governor. Well, come in, my boy. Come in. Nice of you to give me a little of your time. Not at all. Uh, I won't shake hands. <laughs> Always glad to oblige the son of an old college chum. Uh, step right into my private office here. Thanks. Uh, Miss Fitch, uh, will you please see that we're not uh, disturbed? Yes, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> Sit down, my boy. She's all right. <laughs> Take the chair there. Uh, have a cigar. Oh, thanks. Don't care if I do. I always like a man that smokes cigars. There's a lighter on the desk there. Well, I guess if Marjorie knew that you were down here talking to me, she'd be kind of surprised, wouldn't she? <laughs> you think a lot of that, Nancy. Yours, don't you, Mr. Gildersleeve? Oh, uh, I think the world of her. She's a fine girl, Marjorie. I don't know a finer one. I agree with you. Uh, she's been a good niece to me, and she'll make a darn good wife to uh, somebody. I'm with you 100%. Say, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes? Have you ever considered what would become of Marjorie in the event that you were to pass on? Huh? Now, I have an insurance policy here that... Oh! <laughs> You're just like your old man. You get out of here. You know, here in Summerfield, we've sort of prided ourselves on doing the best we could every time a scrap drive or a bond drive came along or anything that would help the war effort. But tonight, our hats are off to three other towns, Green Bay, Wisconsin, Freeport, Illinois, 
and Decatur, Indiana. In each of these towns, the Kraft Cheese Company has a plant, and those three plants have just been given the Army Navy E Award for outstanding service in the production of food for our fighting men. Many manufacturers have been given this award, but this is the first time it has ever been presented to the men and women who help to make our Army and Navy the best fed in the world. We in Summerfield can't claim any credit for that accomplishment, but we can take pride in it, and we do. To you, men and women of the Kraft Company in Green Bay, Freeport, and Decatur, our hearty congratulations. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Music heard on this program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. A word for all you thrifty women who are trying to keep the food budget on an even keel. The product called Kraft Dinner is just your dish. For Kraft Dinner gives the economical way, the quick way to make delicious macaroni and cheese. Fluffy, tender macaroni drenched with cheese goodness. With Kraft Dinner, you make it in just seven minutes cooking time. You see, every Kraft Dinner package contains a special fast-cooking macaroni and an envelope of Kraft grated so that you can sprinkle in the cheese flavor in a hurry. And say the family will go for this thrifty, speedy macaroni and cheese. We'll tell you it's as good as any you ever baked in the oven the old-fashioned way. Why don't you get several packages of economical Kraft Dinner tomorrow? Have it on hand on the pantry shelf. A main dish ready in seven minutes is such a help on busy days. Tomorrow, ask your food dealer for Kraft Dinner. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. You know, these days, it's pretty difficult to get the variety of foods you used to get. And that's why you should make the plentiful foods you can get as appetizing as possible. Now, one easy, economical way to make foods taste better is to use delicious parquet margarine at the table and for cooking, too. First of all, of course, parquet margarine is a perfectly delicious spread for bread or toast or rolls. And next, parquet margarine is a tasty seasoning for potatoes and all hot vegetables. Parquet margarine makes cookies and pastries taste better, too, because it's a real flavor shortening, not bland and tasteless as some shortenings are. And lastly, you'll find parquet adds tempting extra flavor to pan-fried foods. Yes, you can make everyday foods taste better when you use parquet. Remember, too, it's a nourishing energy food that contains vitamin A. So ask your dealer tomorrow for wholesome, economical parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine made by Kraft. Well, let's get on to the great Gildersleeve, who's been putting in a busy Saturday morning down at the water department, trying to clear his desk of all the odds and ends that have piled up there. As we join him now, we find him almost down to the blotter and feeling pretty good about it. Action, yes, action. That's the keynote today, Miss Fitch. And you have accomplished a great deal this morning, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes, sir. Never put off till tomorrow what you can do today. I try not to. Uh, Procrastination is the thief of time. Uh, there's a letter here. Time and tide wait for no man. This woman wrote in two weeks ago. For what? one of a nail, the shoe was lost, Miss Fitch. <laughs> action, that's the thing, action. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, are you going to answer this woman's letter? What does she want? Action. Be sure. <laughs> well, uh, let's see the letter. She says she wrote in two weeks ago and never got an answer. Oh, oh yes, I remember this. Uh, take an answer. Very well. uh, dear Madam... In reply to your recent letter regarding a kneel in your bathtub, <laughs> we wish to thank you for calling this to our attention. After a thorough investigation of the matter, we wish to report 
that it would have been impossible for the said eel to have gained access to your tub through the faucet. Because all our water is carefully filtered, and furthermore, standard plumbing fixtures are too small to accommodate an eel of the dimensions you describe. <laughs> We can only suggest that the creature either crawled up the drain, in which event your attorney should get in touch with the Department of Public Works, not us. Or possibly it was placed in your tub by an enemy. While it's out of our department, we'd suggest that a stopper kept in the tub at all times should prove an effective precaution against eels in the future. <laughs> Failing which, we'd advise a closer check on your friends. <laughs> Very truly yours, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, Water Commissioner. You got that? Yes, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, that ought to hold her. What's next? Well, I don't know whether you want to do anything about this. Let's have it. Action, Miss Fitch. Let's clear the decks here. Uh, very well. This it's... is no time for bottlenecks. Uh, no. Uh, this You'll is... notice that in every photograph of Donald Nelson, <laughs> there's not a single paper on Donald Nelson's desk. That's the only way to be an executive. Do it now. Strike while the iron is hot. Come, come, come. What have you got there? A six-month reminder from your dentist. You. <laughs> well, suppose you put that in the deferred file. That's where it came from. <laughs> You're a hard woman, Miss <laughs> All right, call up the dentist and make an appointment for Monday. Good. For Leroy. <laughs> Come on, let's get on here. Time's a wasting. Hey, have you got the application for my B gas ration? Yes, it's right here. Oh, I must remember to get that in this afternoon. It's all filled out. All you have to do is sign it. I better check it over. Let's see here. It says, uh, occupational use of the vehicle. If vehicle is used for driving between home and fixed place of work, in the principal occupation as stated in items four and six above, answer all questions in part A below. <laughs> if vehicle is used in the performance of the principal occupation stated in items four and six above, Oh, brother, I'll take your word for it, Miss Fitch. <laughs> oh, uh, you also have to get the signatures of any person sharing the ride with you. Oh, well, Judge Hooker is my share of the rider, but he isn't speaking to me. He can darn well sign, though. I understand very few people are going to get the B rations. Oh, I'll get one, all right. After all, I'm a city official. I have to do a lot of official driving. I'm entitled to one if anybody is. Yes, but uh, have you heard who's head of the ration board now? It doesn't make any difference. Who? Judge Hooker. Ooh, Judge Hooker. <laughs> oh, my goodness. If Hooker will find some technicality. He'll block it if he has to stage a filibuster. Maybe I'd better invite the old goat to Thanksgiving dinner after all. That might soften him up a little. Yes, certainly. Mm -hmm. He couldn't accept a man's hospitality and then trick him out of his B card, could he? I don't recall that the application form covers that. No, I didn't think that. <laughs> Quiet. Here comes the old sourball now. Well, hello there, Judge. <laughs> When does the bus leave, Gildersleeve? Uh, the bus leaves whenever you're ready, Judgey. I'm ready now. Be right with you. Can't keep a customer waiting, can we, Miss Fitch? I'll get my hat and coat. Mr. Gildersleeve, uh, you're not forgetting. Forget uh... Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, while you're waiting, Judge, Miss Fitch has an application blank there that requires your signature. Uh, a mere formality, you know. What's this? Uh, just to show that I'm sharing my car with you. Oh, so you're applying for a B-ration book, huh? Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> Give the judge a pen, Miss Fitch. Here, oh, use mine. It's a self-filler. I think you'll like it. There, that's it. There you are. Thank you, Judge. Well, see you Monday, Miss Fitch. Oh, uh, by the way, Horace, I meant to ask you before. I hope you'll give us the pleasure of dining with us as usual on Thursday. Mm, I thought you'd forgotten all about Thanksgiving. Not at all. Thanksgiving wouldn't be Thanksgiving without you, Horace. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> Roy, now while I fit this, I feel like a sissy in this fool outfit. This is the kind of clothes the pilgrims wore, and they were no sissies. Yeah, but they didn't have to wear them in front of a whole auditorium full of people. Stand still, will you, before I jab you with this pin. Courtship of Miles Standish. Why don't you speak for yourself, John? Yeah. Oh! I told you you'd get stuck. You know, <laughs> I think you're going to look real cute when I get this down. That's just what I'm afraid of. That's what the whole school is going to think. Leroy, will you stand still? It wouldn't have been so bad if I was Miles Standish. I'd get to wear a helmet. But John Alden, that panty waist. I'm lucky the teacher didn't make me play Priscilla. <laughs> I don't see why you feel that way. John Alden is a hero. Remember, it's John Alden who gets the girl. Yeah, Ethel Hammerschlag, you can have her. 
Hello, good morning. Well, hello, Marjorie. And Leroy. Hello. Well, look at our little pilgrim. Hey, Marge, can't I take this off now? No, wait till I get it pinned. You know your lines yet, young man? Some of them. Well, it's about time. You've been rehearsing that part for a month. I've been trying to get out of it for a month. That's no attitude to take. The courtship of Miles Standish is great literature. I studied it in school myself. I remember it to this very day. Uh, this is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines in the hills. That's Evangeline, Uncle Mort. Ev- well, that's good, too. <laughs> Uh, let's hear you recite that speech you were having trouble with last night, Leroy. No, oh, I don't want it. Come on now. I want to see if you've learned it. Oh, some other time, Uncle. No, right now. I'd like to hear it. We both would. Wouldn't we, Marjorie? We'd love to. No, I won't do it. Not if she's going to listen. Young man, you'll recite that speech or you'll go right upstairs to your room. Okay. <laughs> we're waiting. <laughs> let's see. Uh, um, pretty Mistress Priscilla, turn out of that field of the suit of one who go out and yet... Uh... Yet, uh... Yet loves thee with a noble and undying passion. Go back and try it again. Do I have to? Yes. If you don't keep at it, you'll never learn the part. If I don't learn the part, maybe we won't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you'll do it or I'll know the reason why. Come on now, once more. Pretty, Mr. Pretty, Mr. I can't say it. You're not trying. <laughs> Pretty, Mr. <Miss> Pretty, <laughs> Now you've got me doing it. <laughs> oh, Bertie, I want to talk to you. Leroy, you go up to your room and practice. Go on, old Miles Standish, anyway. Uh, quiet, you. <laughs> Bertie, I've invited Judge Hooker to Thanksgiving dinner. So that'll mean one more. That'll mean five more. If what? Yes, I hope you don't mind, Uncle Morse. I invited four of the boys from Camp Fuller. Oh, well, fine. The more, the merrier. Thanksgiving isn't Thanksgiving unless there are plenty around to enjoy the turkey. Uh, speaking of turkey, Mr. Gill, please. Uh, yes, Bertie? You wouldn't want to buy a chance on one, would you, I don't suppose? Uh, what do you mean, Bertie? Well, the ladies at my church is holding the turkey raffle. Again? If, all right, I'll buy a chance. How much are they? Twenty-five cents. That's for one. One chance. There you are. There's a quarter. Thank you. Most everybody around here has bought one from me. All the neighbors. Well, you're doing fine. Of course. If you used to buy two chances. It stands to reason you have twice as good a chance as they have. Yeah. <laughs> no getting around that, Bertie. All right, I'll take two. Mr. Gillsleeve, you're making no mistake. Turkey's awful expensive this year. Yes, I know, Bertie. Forty-eight cents a pound at day one grocery. Oh, brother. Yeah. <laughs> So if even you used to buy three chances, you'd still be ahead. <laughs> Sold, Bertie. Make it three. Yes, sir. Let's see now. How many is it going to be for dinner? Well, there's Marjorie and Leroy and Judge Hooker and Mrs. Ransom and the four soldiers and you, Bertie. That makes nine. And you? That makes twelve. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's me. That's going to take a big taking. Well, maybe we should order one right away and ask him to hold it for us. Well, let's wait and see how this raffle comes out first, Marjorie. We don't want to be stuck with two turkeys, you know. Of course, they've sold quite a lot of chances on it, and you've only got three. Uh, Bertie, if you can guarantee I'll get the turkey, I'll take five chances. Well, I can't promise nothing, but my cousin's doing the drawing. <laughs> I'll take five. Well, that'd be a dollar and a quarter. That's right. Well, here's another dollar. That's quite a lot of money. Yes, it is. A dollar and a quarter will buy a lot of things. Don't I know it. You wouldn't like to take a couple more chances just to protect your investment. <laughs> you get out of here, Bertie, before you ruin me. i got to get down to the ration board. <laughs> Look at that crowd. It, pardon me. It, could somebody tell me whether this is where you get B ration books? No, this is where you don't get them. <laughs> yeah, wise guy. And madam, would you mind? You can't shove in here. I'm not trying to shove in. Right into the line. Into the line. I've been waiting here since 2 o'clock and you come trying to shove in. Yeah. Madam, I was merely trying to ask a civil question. Right into the line, yeah. bud. Just a minute. Who do you think you're pushing? Well, who do you think you're pushing? Well, who do you think you're pushing? Why, George, if you weren't wearing glasses... Well, I'll take them off. There. You look worse. Put them back on. <laughs> yeah, what's the fuss here? What's the fuss? He's tried to shove in ahead of me. I did not. He did, too, and he squeezed my hand. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> now, look here, my good woman. We'll have to ask for order here, my friend. Why don't you just take your place in the line? I'm trying to find out whether this is the right line. I've come for my B-ration book. Oh, you've come for it, huh? Yes. 
I have my application right here. Uh, you and a hundred million others. What? <laughs> Young man, evidently you don't know who I am. I happen to be Throckmorton P. Gillisleeve, and I have to do a lot of driving. Where to? Well, out to the reservoir. To the reservoir? What for? To see if there's anything in it. Yeah? <laughs> Listen, brother, if we gave a ration book to everybody who wants to drive out to the reservoir for a little necking in the moonlight... I don't do any necking in the moonlight. Oh, you like it in the dark. Yeah. No! <laughs> and I didn't come here to be insulted by underlings. End of the line, bud. Yes, end of the line. End of the line. End of the line. End of the line. Oh, shut up! <laughs> oh, judge. I want you to tell this young whippersnapper here where I get where he gets off. Well, now, Gildy. He has the nerve to tell me I'm not entitled to a B-ration book. Well, he may be right, Gildy. You're only sharing the ride with one person. You can't throw those technicalities at me, Hooker. You're the share of my rider. You signed this application yourself. I know that, Gildy. As a share of the rider, I'd be delighted to see you get your ration book. But as a ration official, I couldn't possibly pass this application. My conscience wouldn't allow that. All right, Judge. As a ration official, you needn't bother to come to Thanksgiving dinner. And as a share of the rider, from now on, you can walk. I'm the line. Oh, you can have your own line. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. If you're troubled with a food budget that's hard to keep in line these days, just remember this. There are any number of wholesome, good-tasting, nutritious foods that can help you keep your food budget down. Now, one such food, surely, is parquet margarine, Kraft's delicious spread for bread, because it's good-tasting, economical, and nutritious. Parquet margarine's flavor is something pretty special. Thousands know it as the margarine that tastes so deliciously good. And just as important, parquet margarine is an economical source of food elements that your family needs. Yes, wholesome, nourishing parquet margarine is one of the best energy foods you can serve. And the year round, every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. Yes, it's wise to economize with parquet margarine. It's delicious, nutritious, and thrifty. So buy parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask your food dealer... For Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet, the margarine that's made by Kraft. Now back to Summerfield at the Great Gildersleeve. Apparently, he'll get no more gas than the rest of us, but uh, what about turkey? It's Tuesday afternoon now, only two days before Thanksgiving. We find our hero checking last-minute details with Marjorie. What about those four soldiers, my dear? Are you sure they're coming? Oh, yes. I had a note this morning from their commanding officer. They'll arrive at 12 o'clock sharp in a jeep. A jeep? Mm -hmm. Oh, brother, what an appetite they'll have. <laughs> I'll have to run around the house a couple of times to get myself up to concert pitch. Can't let the boys show me up at my own table. I don't think you need to worry about that, Uncle Mort. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess we're all set. Soldiers accepted. Hooker canceled. Mrs. Ransom. Uh, Mrs. Ransom's coming, isn't she? Well, you invited her, didn't you? No, I thought you'd take care of that. You're the lady of the house. Oh, but I thought you'd want to. Oh, dear. And I went over there this morning to borrow a roasting pan for the turkey and never said a word about it. Uh, what, must, what must she think? Oh, this is terrible. This is awful. I'll run over there right now. Sir was right. She's made other plans. A fine thing. Borrow a woman's roaster and then not invite her to dinner. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Eh, uh, Leela, I've come to explain. I don't know what there is to explain, I'm sure. Uh, may I come in? Well, I'm rather busy. Just for a moment. Well. Leela, of course you're coming to Thanksgiving dinner Thursday. Well, I'm hardly in the habit of going to places to which I've not been invited, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, but you are invited. You've been invited all along. There was a mix-up, that's all. I thought Marjorie had asked you, and Marjorie thought I had. How do I know? How do I know you're not just inviting me for my roasting pan? <laughs> Lilo, when I thought of inviting you, nothing was further from my mind than a roasting pan. Oh, you say those things, but you don't mean them. It's the truth. You were the first one on my list, Lila. Was I, Throck Martin? Sure enough. Yeah, sure enough. <laughs> 
Oh, but I'm afraid I couldn't accept at this late date. You see, I've had all these other invitations. Yeah. If I turn them down now, I know they'd be heartbroken, much as I'd like to have dinner with you. We're having a 20-pound turkey. I love turkey, but I'm afraid I can't. I'll save you the white meat. No, don't tempt me now. I'll save you the wishbone. We can make a wish on it. What would you wish, Throckmorton? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not supposed to tell you. Well, I don't know that I could trust you with a wishbone. And, <laughs> and anyway, I've promised these other people. But you've got to come, Leela. Marjorie and Leroy will be terribly disappointed if you don't. And so will I. So will Bertie. If so will the Army. The Army? Yes, we're having four young lieutenants to dinner, too. Throckmorton, why in the world didn't you say so? You mean you'll come? Will I? You're too good to me, Leela. <laughs> She's coming with bells on. I wouldn't put it past her. Huh? Uncle Mort, can I borrow your shotgun? No, Leroy, certainly not. Why? I'm supposed to bring a gun to school tomorrow. What kind of a school are they running? A reform school? <laughs> no, Miles Sanders has got to have a blunderbuss. A blunderbuss. Here's your building suit, Leroy. I pressed the collar, so don't mess it up. Oh, put it on, Leroy, and show Uncle Mort how nice it looks, not finished. Oh, no. Go ahead. You look real nice in it. I look like a sissy in it. You look better than you do in that Mickey Mouse sweatshirt you wear all the time. Yeah, and cleaner, too. <laughs> put on the pilgrim suit, Leroy. Oh, uh, Your sister worked hard on it. Won't do you any harm to put it on once. Go ahead. Okay. I'd like to meet that guy Longfellow. Yeah. <laughs> well, Bertie, you think we're going to have enough turkey for all these people Thursday? I don't know, Miss Gilsley. Let's see now. We've got four soldiers and the four of us here and Mrs. Ransom. What about Judge Hooker? Judge Hooker is an ungrateful old goat. Never mention his name in this house. Excuse me. I didn't know it was like that again. <laughs> There'll be eight of us at dinner. And you know the way soldiers eat. You think we ought to figure on two turkeys? I don't know, Mr. Gillsleeve. I don't know what we ought to do. What's the matter, Bertie? You seem to be sort of dragging today. <coughs> I don't know. I don't guess I feel so good. Out a little late last night? No, sir. No later than usual. I just got a feeling, that's all. Yeah. What kind of a feeling? Like things wasn't going to work out somehow. Oh, well, don't let it get you down. Uh, by the way, when are they going to raffle off that turkey I bought all those chances on? Yes, we can't wait much longer to find out about that. Thanksgiving's only two days off. I was thinking, Mr. Gillsleeve, how would it be if we had a nice ham instead of a turkey? <laughs> Bertie, are you hiding something from us? No, sir, I ain't hiding nothing. Except they had that raffle last night. Oh. You came close, Mr. Gillsleeve. You came mighty close. The winning number was 61, and you had 62. <laughs> but it still leaves us without a turkey. Well, sort of. Oh, well, if you gamble, you have to expect those things. Well, we better order a turkey right away, though. Yes, we can't invite all those soldiers to come 20 miles for Thanksgiving dinner and have no Thanksgiving dinner. Well, I'll go call up the market and reserve one. That's just a trouble. What do you mean? I called up the market, and all the turkeys is reserved. You mean they won't sell us one? Butcher says there ain't a turkey left in Summerfield. I don't know what's the matter. Last week, no pot roast. This week, no turkey. <laughs> We've got to have a turkey. We've invited all these soldiers. We've invited Mrs. Ransom. We've got to find one. But where? Don't ask me. All right, Unc. How do you like it? Like what? The pilgrim suit. Oh, forget the pilgrim suit. We just lost our turkey. <laughs> no turkey? No turkey. How do you like that? Well, it looks like we'll all wind up eating turkey sandwiches at the drugstore. Yeah. Some Thanksgiving. The drugstore. Maybe Peavy's got a turkey. Hold everything, kids. I'll be right back. I'm going to the drugstore. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, Peavy. Peavy, you've got to help me out. Well, I'm always glad to do a customer service. Good. Have you got a turkey? Uh, what was that again? Have you got a turkey? A turkey? Well, now, I've had people come in here and ask for some strange things, but this is the first time I've ever had a request for a turkey. It is, but never mind that. Have you got one? Uh, no, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, turkeys are one thing that I don't carry. I'm sorry. Uh, have you tried to meet market? <laughs> of course I've tried to meet market. Why do you think I came in here? Uh, I wonder. It... <laughs> now, just a minute, Peavy. You serve turkey sandwiches at your soda fountain, don't you? Yes, we do serve a turkey sandwich. You can't make a turkey sandwich without a turkey, can you? Well, now, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> 
<laughs> In other words, P.V., your turkey sandwich is not a turkey sandwich. Well, turkey sandwich has become a sort of a trade expression, although we serve it with genuine cranberry jelly on the side. <laughs> but suppose you don't care for cranberry jelly. Yeah, and then you just ask for the regular chicken sandwich. Yes, sir. P.V., I'm surprised at you. I don't know how you can sleep nights. Well, I did used to have a little trouble, but I just take a cup of hot cocoa before going to bed now, and I find that sets me right. So does Mrs. P.V. <laughs> Well, this isn't finding a turkey. i got to get going. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Gildersleeve. Have a nice Thanksgiving. And same to you. Don't drink too much cocoa. And don't let Mrs. Peavy. Any luck, Uncle Moore? Uh, not a bit, my dear. I've been everywhere. It's no use. The Army's picked the place clean. There's not a single turkey left. Maybe I should warn those boys at camp. They'll do better if they stay there. Yes. Wait. There's just one chance left. What's that? If we can find out who won the turkey in Bertie's raffle, we might be able to buy it from him. Yes, Bertie! Yes, Mr. Gilsley? Would you mind coming in here? Yes, sir. Bertie, do you know who won that turkey in your raffle? Uh, no, sir. Hmm. Do you think you could find out? Well, sir, I might be able to. Then again, I might not. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, if I still find out who won, you might not like it. Come clean, Bertie. What bush are you beating about now? Do you know who won the turkey? Uh, yes. Well, why didn't you say so? Who is it? Well, you said never to mention Judge Hooker's name. Oh! <laughs> I told you you wasn't going to like it. Well, there goes our only chance. Uncle Moore, don't you think Judge Hooker would be willing to let you have it? After what I told him down at the ration board? No, my dear, I really gave him a piece of my mind there. But if you took it all back and invited him to dinner again... When he's got the turkey, he'd just laugh at me. He'd... He'd... Uh... Wait a minute. Uh, Bertie. Yeah? Does Judge Hooker know yet that he's won the turkey? No, sir. I'm supposed to deliver it to him this evening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excuse me, folks. I got to see a judge about a bird. <laughs> I've come to ask your forgiveness. You've come to the wrong place, Gildersleeve. That's a cruel attitude, Judge, but I don't blame you for taking it. You behave like a boor, Gildersleeve. You're right, a big boor. In front of a whole lot of people, too. Yeah. I could kick myself when I think of it. Well, we all fly off the handle sometimes. There was no excuse for it, doing a thing like that to my old friend. Well, Gildy, of course. Horace, you may think me a sentimental old fool, but we've been pals for a good many years now, haven't we? Uh... Off and on. <laughs> yes, Gildy, we have. Off and on. Yes. <laughs> and we've always had Thanksgiving dinner together, haven't we? Yeah, I guess that's right. Well, I want you to have it with us again this year. You really mean that? Horace, I've said it before, and I mean it now more than ever. If you don't come to Thanksgiving dinner, it just won't be Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> certainly be delighted to come. Good. Don't forget now. I won't. We'll be counting on you. I'll be there. What time would you like to have me come? Oh, come early, Judge. Uh, come about nine o'clock in the morning. Nine o'clock? <laughs> yeah. And when you come, would you mind bringing that turkey you won in the raffle, Judge? <laughs> It's been a mighty pleasant day. Oh, stick around, Judge. The evening's young yet. No, I've got to get an early start in the morning. But I don't know when I've had a finer Thanksgiving. Well, it was your turkey, Judge. Well, I share my turkey, you share your car. 
That's the spirit today. Yeah, and the good spirit, too. It brings people together, Judge. Yes, it does, Gildy. I'm sorry we had that misunderstanding down at the ration board. As a matter of fact, you're probably entitled to a B ration. You use your car for official business. Well, I don't want a B book. What? No, I've been thinking about it, Horace. It seems to me the spirit of rationing is to get along with as little as you can, instead of grabbing all you can get. You're absolutely right, Gildy. And I'm glad to hear you say it. You're a credit to the community. Well, thank you, Horace. And you may rest assured that even though I only, I've only a humble A ration, my car will still be at your service at all times. You mean that, Gildy? I do indeed. That's fine. I've got to meet a train at Moore's Junction at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. Good night, Gildy. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Ladies, when you want to make good macaroni and cheese, get a package of Kraft Dinner. This wonderful product is really an answer to a housewife's prayer for an easy and quick-to-make main dish. It takes only seven minutes cooking time to fix delicious macaroni and cheese with Kraft Dinner. Put the macaroni that's in the package into boiling water and cook rapidly for seven minutes. In just that short time, you have fluffy, tender macaroni all ready for the cheese goodness. So you take the package of Kraft Grated, which comes with Kraft Dinner, and sprinkle it on the macaroni. Stirring the delicious cheese flavor through and through. That's all there is to it. Your macaroni and cheese is ready to be served. And once you've prepared it this way, you'll never want to go back to the old-fashioned way of baking it. Not when Kraft Dinner gives you such tempting macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes. Why not try it tomorrow? Just ask your dealer for a package of Kraft Dinner. It's so convenient, so economical, and so good. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. You know, bread is a mighty important food, but after all, to make bread really appetizing, you need a good tasting spread on it. And that's the reason you should know about parquet margarine, the delicious, wholesome spread for bread made by Kraft. You see, parquet is economical, so you can serve your family all they want. And if you haven't tasted margarine for a good long time, you're going to be pleasantly surprised when you taste parquet. Parquet's flavor is something you'll want to tell your friends about. It's so delicate and appetizing, so downright good. Besides using parquet as a spread, you'll want to use it for baking and pan frying, too. It's a fine energy food that helps provide the vitamin A your family needs. You're going to be pleased with Parquet's economy, too. So order a pound or two tomorrow. Just ask for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet, the margarine made by Kraft. Summerfield is a flutter. Showbills have appeared around town announcing a revival of the student print starring Vera Laval of the original company. When the box office opened this morning, the first in line was our friend, the great Gildersleeve. And we find him now at home, stretched out on the couch, gazing into the fire and warming himself in the memory of days gone by. While through his head run the immortal melodies of Sigmund Romberg. I have a dream of you. Uh... Fashioned of a starlight Perfume of... Oh, she was lovely. She was lovely. Vera Laval. Mm -hmm. Mr. Five, 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 Five,
that song. Hey, I'm sorry, Uncle. Didn't know you were here. I told you I don't like that song. I don't like a song that makes fun of anyone's physical peculiarities. Oh. <laughs> well, gee, Uncle, you don't have to take it personally. I don't see any other way to take it. It's certainly not music. Mr. Five by Five. Fatty, tolly, fatty, wag. He don't know. Yes, must you sing that song? Well, you were singing, Mr. Gildersleeve. Let me make my position clear to everyone. I do not like Mr. Five by Five. I don't want to hear it. You must sing it. Sing it when I'm not around. Yes, sir. Can I even play the record? No. After I bought it with my own money? It's Freddie Slack's band. Freddie Slack? I don't care if it's Kusevitsky's. I don't like it. <laughs> but, but why not, huh? Because it's, well, it's ungrammatical, for one thing. He don't measure no more. What kind of talk is that? That jive talk. It, j- j- jive talk? Well, I'm not going to have this place turned into a juke joint, and that's final. Let's have no more discussion of it. Bertie, when's dinner going to be ready? Oh, my goodness. That's what I came in to tell you. What? It's ready. It's... Leroy, run upstairs and tell your sister, will you? <laughs> oh, my God! Oh, don't stand down here and whistle. Go up and tell her. Okay. Mr. Five, five, five. Yeah. Oh, what's the use? I'll be right in, Bertie. By the way, what are we having tonight? Well, we have a turkey. But we had turkey last night. We've had turkey croquettes. We've had turkey hash. We've had cold turkey and warmed over turkey. Well, that's turkey for you. Yes. Steve, <laughs> give me that. I just got a new fella. What? Leroy, you give me that. I just got a new fella. I'm going to make him give it to me. Leroy. <laughs> Look what Dopey keeps stuck in our mirror. Give it here. No, now give it to me. It's mine. Just a minute, my dear. Don't snatch. Well, I don't see why he has to come snooping around my bedroom. Uncle Moore told me to. Yeah. If I told you nothing of the kind. I told you to go up and tell her dinner was ready. And it is. Come on, we'll settle this at the dinner table. Well, Leroy has no business taking things that don't belong to him. You're quite right, my dear. Leroy, give it back to her, whatever it is. What is it, anyway? <laughs> nothing. It's just an old picture out of a magazine. It's Alan Ladd. She thinks he's murdered. Leroy, I'd like to break your neck. And who, may I ask, is Alan Ladd? Oh, you know him. He played in that movie with Veronica Lake. Who's Veronica Lake? Are you kidding? (laughs) You know Alan Ladd. He plays gangsters. He talks with his mouth shut. Come one step closer, bud, and you're dead. (laughs) That is not like Alan Ladd. Well, you don't know Veronica Lake. Leroy, eat your soup. I don't know what this generation is coming to anyway. Movies... Gangsters, juke joints, Mr. Five by Five. Yeah! You. <laughs> In my day, we had good, wholesome, artistic entertainment, and we enjoyed it. Such as what, Uncle Moy? The Merry Widow? Oh, you kid! No, no, not the Merry Widow. I'm not quite as old and dilapidated as you might think. Well, what? I'd like to know what you thought was hot stuff when you were young. Marjorie, I don't recall that we ever referred to it as hot stuff. But as long as I live, I'll never forget a performance I saw of the student prince. Oh, brother. <laughs> oh, for goodness sake, it's staying here right now. It, it opens tomorrow. I know that, my dear. And with the same star I saw in it, Vera Laval. Oh, she was a gorgeous thing. <laughs> Golden curls and blue eyes and dimples and a smile. Well, I saw it four times. Oh, my Uncle Mort. I never thought of you as a stage door, Johnny. You may think you're joking, my dear. But as a matter of fact, I did wait outside the stage door for her one afternoon. I stood three hours in the snow just waiting for a glimpse of her. What happened? Nothing. They weren't giving a matinee that day. (laughs) Oh, I think that's sad. Oh, but that didn't stop me. I went back to the stage door again that night. Did she come out? No, she came out the front door. (laughs) But I saw her and I ran after her. And that was when she spoke to me. What did she say? Well, I remember she was getting into a cab, and I saw a glove lying at her feet, and I picked it up and gave it to her. And what did she say? She said it wasn't hers. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, but she was wonderful. I remember a song she sang. Deep in my heart, dear, I have a dream of you. Passion of starlight, perfume of ro... Oh, and she sang that. The whole audience rose to his feet as one man. I walked out. <laughs> Young man, have you ever seen the student prince? No. 
And I'll thank you to reserve criticism until you have. Excuse me, is everything all right? Oh, yes, Bertie, I'll ring when we finish the suit. Yes, ma'am, I thought I heard Mr. Gildersleeve hollering. What? <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve was not hollering. The idea is... I don't know. I've been hearing things lately. Must be the gremlins or something. Yes. You may take up my plate now, Bertie. I don't care for any soup. Don't you? You ate it all. Did I? Oh, well, take it away anyway. <laughs> I'm not very hungry this evening. Oh, I didn't mean to make you mad, Unc. I'm not mad, Leroy. I'm just distressed at what seems to be a serious lack in your education, that's all. You'd spend less time listening to Mr. Five by Five. By George, tomorrow night I'm going to take you and Marjorie to hear the student prints. Oh, gosh, Unc, I'm afraid I can't make it. What do you mean you can't make it? I'm offering to take you to the theater, young man. Live actors on a real stage. <laughs> something that hasn't been seen in Summerfield in ten years. You understand? Yeah, I know, but Unc... But what? Well, Toots Malarkey is breaking in a new band out at the Avalon Ballroom tomorrow night. Toots Malarkey, forsooth. But he's got a trombone player that's supposed to be out of this world. And he's got Mary Moffat singing the vocals. You too, my dear. Well, all right, you can have your Toots Malarkey and your Mary Muffin. I know somebody who can appreciate good music when she hears it. And I'm going over there right now. Mr. Gilsley, your dinner. You coming back? I haven't the slightest idea. Yep. It's the gremlins. Throckmorton, I'd love to go to the play with you. I really would. But just about an hour ago, Judge Hooker called up. And... Oh, Hooker. Yes, and he asked me to go with him. Well, Leela, of course the judge is tone deaf, but if you don't mind that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd ever so much rather go with you, Throckmorton, because I know your real love of music and all, uh... but I can't very well turn the judge down now, can I? No, I suppose not. I just hope he won't spoil it, spoil it for you, that's all. How do you mean, spoil it? Well, as soon as he gets in the theater, he usually goes to sleep. Oh. Yeah, and when he sleeps, he snores. Oh, dear. And when he snores, oh, brother. <laughs> oh, dear, I do hope he won't be conspicuous. Conspicuous? Oh, they'll probably throw him out before he gets too bad. <laughs> they usually do. Well, I hope you enjoy it, Leela. Oh, don't go, Throckmorton. Yes, I've got to go. I've got to get down to the hotel and pay my respects to Kitty. She'll be expecting me. Kitty? Uh, Vera Laval, uh, the actress. Her friends call her Kitty. Oh, you know her? Oh, yes, yes. We met some years ago. Uh, did you know her well? <laughs> <laughs> Why, Throckmorton, you never told me about that. Well, that was there to tell. It was the old story. She had her career, so eventually she went her way and I went mine. <laughs> she was a lovely creature, though. And now, after all these years, we meet again. Life is funny, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. I remember the night I first met her. It was in front of the theater, the Tivoli. She was waiting for a car, and she dropped her glove. I still have it. Oh, Throckmorton, you're so romantic. Mm. You know, uh, people used to tell me I ought to go on the stage. They did? Yes. You know, I'd love to meet your friend. I'll tell you what. I'm giving a little chafing dish supper here after the theater tomorrow night. Uh, why don't you come and bring this whatever her name is? Oh, I'm afraid I couldn't do that. <laughs> Uh, Kitty's the shy type, and you know how actresses hate publicity or anything like that. Oh, do they? <laughs> yes. And anyway, with Hooker here, well, you know, he's a little uncouth. He wouldn't know how to behave with an actress. Well, try to come anyway, will you? I will if I can, Leela. Uh, got to go now. Well, goodbye. Well, what is it, Throckmorton? Have you forgotten something? Uh, egad, she was lovely. Goodbye, Leela. <laughs> goodbye, Throckmorton. <laughs> Hey, good morning, Floyd. Well, come in, Judge. Come in. It may be a little while, Judge. I'm giving Mr. Gildersleeve the works here. A little massage. What are you doing, Gildy? Have your face lifted? No, I'm. Oh, get that stuff out of my mouth, Floyd. I'm sorry, I didn't know you were going to open it. <laughs> You think I could keep it closed with that old goat sounding off around here? Uh, take the other chair there, Judge. Got some new magazines, light, pick, radio mirror. Got a new Esquire. <laughs> I've seen it. Well, you don't lose any time. It only came in yesterday. Come on, you book lovers. Let's get on with this, Floyd. I've got things to do. Yeah, make it pretty, Floyd. He's got a big romance on tonight. Who told you? Oh, a little bird. Yeah, a little bird named Leela Ransom. <laughs> 
I guess I sort of cut you out there, didn't I, Gildy? Yeah. I guess you were a little slow on the trigger. Cut me out nothing. I've got other plans. Yeah, I heard all about that. Floyd, you may not believe it, but our friend Gildersleeve here was quite a Romeo in his younger days. Oh, now, Hooker. He was just like that with Vera Lavelle. You mean the actress? Yeah, if you could call her that. Now, listen here, Hooker. Vera Lavelle could have gone into the Metropolitan Opera. Now, why didn't she? She was too pretty. The prima donna was jealous. <laughs> Who told you that? Vera Lavelle? Well, maybe she did and maybe she didn't. Oh, Gildersleeve, who do you think you're fooling? You may be able to fool Leela Ransom with those stories, but not me. You don't know Vera Lavelle any more than I do. Oh, no? Prove it. I don't have to prove it, but I'll bet you you can't even get the woman's autograph. All right. I'll bet you a new hat. What do you want with a new hat? You never had any trouble talking through the old one. <laughs> <laughs> I got him that time, didn't I, Floyd? Yeah, that was a good one, Judge. <laughs> yes, all right, Hooker. Just for that, I'll fix you. I'll see you at Leela Ransom's tonight. And I'll already turn up tonight with Vera Laval's autograph. I'll turn up with Vera Laval. I'll fix you. Ooh, who am I fixing? <laughs> the great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. If you read the food pages in the newspapers and magazines, you know how important our government thinks good nutrition is these days. Our health and strength really depend to a large extent on the wholesome, nourishing food we eat. So you'll be glad to know that the right foods need not be expensive. And an example of that is parquet margarine, the delicious, nourishing spread for bread made by Kraft. You see, besides being mighty good tasting, parquet margarine is an economical source of important food elements. Parquet is one of the best energy foods you can serve. It helps provide the vital energy your family needs for hard work and play. And Parquet Margarine is a reliable year-round source of vitamin A. Every pound contains 9,000 units of this important vitamin. Yes, Parquet is one of America's highly nutritious foods, yet it's wonderfully thrifty, too. So put Parquet Margarine on tomorrow's grocery list. Remember, it's Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve, whom we find preparing himself for an evening of high adventure. He's bathed and shaved, and now, with his dress trousers dragging and his suspenders drooping, he burrows through his bedroom closet looking for his patent leather shoes. Uh, I wish Bertie wouldn't keep straightening out this closet. I saw those shoes only last week. Bertie! Oh, here they are. What is it, Mr. Gillespie? Uh, nothing. Look at the dust on the darn things. Inside them, too. <laughs> Ooh, a miniature storm. You'd think Bertie would get into that closet once in a while. I'd better speak to her. Uncle Mark! Yes, Marjorie? Will you please make me walk out of the tub? Make him what? Get out of the tub! Get out of the tub! I'm not in the tub. <laughs> I'm talking about Leroy. Oh, Leroy, whatever you're doing, stop it. <laughs> well, Bertie put all the studs in my shirt. That's just like finding money. Let's see. Front collar button. There you are. Uh, back collar. Uh, back. Uh, no back collar button. Well, I'll use the wooden one from the laundry. Come to think of it, that's what I had to use the last time. Who's that? It's me, Mr. Gillespie. Oh, yes, Bertie? I got your white kind. I'll put it right here on the doorknob. Uh, thank you, Bertie. Oh, that looks fine. Uncle Mark! Yes, Leroy? Marjorie won't let me use her comb. Why don't you use your own? It's busted. That's ridiculous. What do you mean, it's busted? No teeth. Mrs. No teeth. <laughs> Well, let him use it this once, Marjorie, and stop this bickering, and we'll never get to the theater. No wonder who thought of a white tie to go with a tail coat. <laughs> Looks like a penguin. Uh, this vest doesn't come down very far. <clears throat> Guess I'll have to button the top button of the pants after all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> now, the coat. Uh, by George Gildersleeve, you're a fine figure of a man. <laughs> Wait till Leela sees you in that. You'll make Hooker wish he'd never been born. Hooker with his 1929 tuxedo. <laughs> yeah. oh, hello, Phoebe. Oh, hello, Mr. 
shoulder sleeve. Hmm, all dressed up, I see. Never mind that, Pete. <laughs> Give me half a dozen panatellas. I'm in a hurry. They're the children waiting outside. Panatellas? Why, you usually take the... Yeah, I know. Perfectos. But I need them to fit my case here. Ooh, cigar case, too. <laughs> you must be going down to the opera house. That's right. I'm stepping out later, too, with the star of the show. Well, now, that's real friendly of you, Mr. Gildersleeve. I suppose he is a stranger in town. Well, P.B., I'm stepping out with Miss Vera Laval. Ooh, stepping out. Yes, Miss Laval and I were rather close friends some years ago. Mm, I guess those actresses like to flirt, don't they? <laughs> Where did you ever hear that? Did you ever take her to one of those intimate little suppers? I'm not talking, P.B., uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, did you ever drink out of her slipper? <laughs> <laughs> that chapter of my life is a closed book, Peavy. I see. But I may open it up for just one little peek. <laughs> <laughs> well, in uh, that case, have you thought of taking her a box of candy, Mr. Gildersleeve? A nice selection of chocolates often makes a favorable impression on a woman. Uh, I'm saying it with flowers, Peavy. You see this corsage? Mm, those are nice. Uh. Mm, such a refined odor. Of course, Mrs. Peavy is very partial to geraniums. Yes. You don't give an actress geraniums, Peavy. Actresses need special handling. Actresses are entirely different from ordinary women. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> don't you fool yourself, Peavy. With an actress, you never know where you are. An actress can look you right in the eye and lie like a trooper. She can laugh one minute and cry the next. She can run through the whole gamut of human emotions in no time. And for no reason. Yeah, so can Mrs. Peavy. <laughs> Give me those panatellas. Oh, oh, yes, here you are. Oh, uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I couldn't interest you in a new perfume for men. It's called uh, Heather. No, perfume is for people who have something to conceal, and I have it. Uh, have I, Peavy? <laughs> well, not really, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, nothing to be ashamed of, but uh, Mothballs do have a characteristic aroma. It'll wear off. Good night, Peavy. Good night, <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve. Do you call this an opera house? No remarks, young man. It looks like a Roman ruin. This was a very fine theater in its day. It's a jump alongside the Majestic. Quiet, you. You're going to see this whether you like it or not, so stop beefing. Okay. Hey, Uncle, can we buy some candy? Where are we going to buy candy? They were selling it out in the lobby. We just got settled, Leroy. Why didn't you ask for it then? No, you can't have any candy. We didn't get any programs, Uncle Mark. Oh, so we didn't. Uh, Usher? Uh, Miss? Well, I'll get her when she comes back. Oh, there's Dr. Pettibone and Mrs. Pettibone. Hello! Hello! Oh, boy, that's so loud. People uh, are looking at you. Uh? Hey, Uncle. No, Leroy, you may not. What is it? When does the show start? 8.30. Do they give us a newsreel, or do we just get this student prince thing? Suppose you just wait and see. Hey, look. Look who's coming down the aisle. Who? His Honor, the old ghost. <laughs> and Mrs. Ransom's with him. Say, they're coming in here. They must be sitting in these seats right ahead of us. Yeah, Hooker fixed that. He did it deliberately. Oh, how could he, Uncle Moore? I don't know, but it's no coincidence. He did it to burn me up. Oh, good evening, Leela. Hello, Horace. Well, isn't this nice? We're all practically sitting together. Yes, yeah, quite a coincidence, isn't it? Hello, Marjorie. Hello. Leroy. Hi. Didn't know you were bringing the brood, Gilly. I'm leaving him after the show. My, you're looking so distinguished this evening, Trotmont. Oh, thank you. You're looking, uh, uh, well, yourself. <laughs> Say, Gilly, have you got a pocket full of mothballs, or have you been sleeping in a cedar closet? <laughs> Excuse me, Judge. Uh, miss... Miss, uh, would you mind stopping the usher there, please, madam? Uh, thank you. Uh, where's that card now? Uh, miss, uh, will you kindly take this calling card back upstage and, and give it to Miss Laval with my compliments? Yeah, Vera Laval, uh, the star of the show. Oh, Maud, not so loud. Everyone in the theater can hear you. Yes, miss. She'll be thrilled when she learns I'm out front tonight. I sent her some flowers, of course, earlier. Her favorite kind. I just wrote him a card from an old admirer. <laughs> but she'll know. Louder, Gildy. They can't hear you up in the balcony. <laughs> oh, Frost Martin. Yes, Leela? I do hope you'll be coming to my house after the show and bring your friends. Yes, don't forget the friends. Well, she's not too tired, Leela. We'd love to. Hey, never the lights. Oh, isn't this exciting, kids? This is what I love about the theater. When the lights go down and the curtain's just about to go up, there's nothing like it. The orchestra's coming in now. 
See the head? Yeah, like a raw pool balls. <laughs> Can you imagine any of those guys playing with Toots Malarkey? It's you wait, Leroy. You're going to love this. It's got some of the most wonderful music. There's one scene in particular where Kathy comes in, that's Vera LaValle, and they sing, Deep in my heart, dear. Oh, Lord, please. Uh, what people think? Uh, forgive me, my dear. I always forget myself when I hear that song. You see, we used to think of that as our song. Oh, for goodness sake. Usher, will you ask them to stop that racket back there? Yeah. Uncle Moore, the usher, she's signaling to you. She can't do anything to me. I'm not disturbing anybody. No, no, she's got a card for you. Look, she's passing it in. A card? Oh, a card. It must be from Vera. Or Kitty, as we call her. It must be from her. Uh, thank you, miss. My goodness, it is from her. She wants me to come back to her dressing room. Hey, where are you going, Uncle? Uh, backstage. I'll probably see the show from the wings. You and Marjorie stay here and enjoy it, understand? Oh. I want you to enjoy it. Hey, let me out of there. I mean, pardon me, will you, madam? Oh, so my corn. Have you got the chafing dish going, Judge? Yeah. Doesn't blow up again. Well, I've got the cheese and everything. Oh, I suppose I might as well start it. Leela, I owe you an apology. Hmm? I've seen some bad performances in my time, but that one tonight, wow. Oh, I, I can't agree with you, Judge. I quite enjoyed it. And I thought Vera Laval took her part real well. Of course, I could have sworn she was wall-eyed, but maybe it was just where I was sitting. I'll tell you one thing, she'll never see 50 again. Well, you can hardly blame the poor creature for that. But those costumes, I mean, really. Do you suppose she made them herself? <laughs> oh, I wonder if that could be her now. If it isn't, Gildersleeve owes me a hat. I'll go, Leela. Well, come in, Gildy, come in. Uh, Miss LaValle, uh, may I present Judge Horace Hooker? Oh, how do you do? This is a pleasure, Miss LaValle. <laughs> Judge Hooker is our local uh, constable, so to speak. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, always glad to meet a judge socially. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh, uh, and our hostess, uh, Mrs. Ransom, Miss Laval. <laughs> I'm just so thrilled you could come, Miss Laval. But darling, you were such a darling to invite me. <laughs> I smell something cooking. <laughs> well, Shrazzy. <laughs> Judge Hook and I were just singing, Miss LaValle, how much we enjoyed your performance. Oh, did you, darling? Thanks so much. Oh, I'm afraid I wasn't really in voice tonight. I was nervous for some reason. Oh, yes, I can imagine. It must be quite exciting you and Throckmorton meeting again after all these years. <laughs> Leela. <laughs> and you knowing each other so terribly well and all. Uh, how's that again, darling? I said it. Uh, be... uh, excuse me, Leela. <laughs> Vera, I'm going to hold you to that promise you made. What promise was that? You know you were going to sing. Oh. oh, you've been after me all evening to sing, as if I hadn't sung enough already. But you said you would. Oh, but not right now. Not before the Welsh Rare Bear. Yes, right now, this very minute. Please, Vera. Oh, oh he's cute, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, how can I resist him? <laughs> <laughs> Much to you, I'll see. Oh, good. Bravo, bravo. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, what should I sing? Uh, sing something romantic. Sing the song that brought you two together. Brought who together? Uh, well, well, what shall it be? Uh, well, after all, Vera, there's only one song where you're concerned. That's it. That's it. <laughs> No, if you don't mind, I think I'd rather sing a new song. Oh, a new song? What's that? One that will always remind me of you. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> All right, you sing it. <laughs> Mr. Fine! <laughs>
you? Well, it's almost 12, my dear. Did you have a good time at Mrs. Ransom? Yes, yes, yes. Mm. I love the student prints. Yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marjorie, would you mind not singing that? But I thought you liked it. As far as I'm concerned, I wish the student prince had never gone to college. <laughs> wish he'd gone to reform school. <laughs> good night, my dear. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> heard on this program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Frank Bingman speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Do you like macaroni and cheese? If you do, listen to this. Your grocer has a product that gives you wonderful macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. The name of this product is Kraft Dinner. In a package of Kraft Dinner is a special type of quick-cooking macaroni and some Kraft grated which puts grand cheese flavor through and through the macaroni. You cook this special macaroni in boiling water for seven minutes. Just seven minutes. Then you sprinkle in the Kraft grated. That's all there is to it. Your macaroni and cheese is ready to be served. No blanching or baking is necessary. None of the old-fashioned bother of making this grand American dish. Kraft Dinner gives you macaroni and cheese a new-fashioned way. And here's something else that's wonderful about Kraft Dinner. It's economical. A single package makes enough for four. Serve Kraft Dinner once a week or oftener and keep a package or two handy for those last-minute emergencies when you need something to stretch the meal for the unexpected guest. Ask your dealer for Kraft Dinner. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. (laughs) The Kraft Cheese Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton. from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Uh, what kind of appetites do you have in your family? Well, if they're the kind of appetites that have to be tempted, here's a suggestion. Get acquainted right away with parquet margarine, the delicious, wholesome spread for bread made by Kraft. Because the delicate, appetite-tempting flavor that makes parquet margarine such a delicious spread for bread makes it grand for cooking, too. Serve parquet at the table, of course, at every meal, but keep it nearby when you're preparing meals as well. You see, Parquet seasons potatoes and all hot vegetables to the king's taste. You'll find cookies and cakes taste better made with Parquet because it adds its own delicate flavor to all baked foods. Parquet makes pan-fried foods tastier, too. And remember, you're adding extra nourishment to foods when you use Parquet margarine. It's an excellent energy food that contains vitamin A. Best of all, Parquet is economical, so... Get some tomorrow. Just ask for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Now let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve. For several days, he's been harboring a dark secret. To wit, the third tooth from the rear on the upper left-hand side has been giving him a little trouble. Oh, it has not. This morning, after lingering alone over a hearty breakfast, he rises from the table, saunters past the sideboard, sneaks a piece of taffy from the bonbon dish, pops it into his mouth, and... Ouch! Excuse me, what's the trouble? You got toothache? No, Bertie, certainly not. I just happened to bite on something, that's all. Your tongue, maybe? Yeah, my tongue. Well, there's only one thing to do about a bad tooth. I know that, but I'd rather not be reminded of it. Oh, this don't hurt none. And anyway, I haven't got a bad tooth. What do you do, Bertie? Well, you got a penny? A what? A penny. Have you got a penny? Well, I have, but don't let it get around. The government might hear about it. (laughs) All right. You take the penny and you put it in your mouth. Now, you put it next to the gum where the tooth hurts. And you keep it there for two days. Don't even take it out. But how do I eat? 
Well, you just eat around it. Eat around it. And by the end of the second day, the penny will draw all the misery out of the tooth. Can you guarantee that? That's if the moon is right. Yeah, but, <laughs> but suppose it isn't. Well, then you still got the penny. It's, uh... <laughs> and the toothache. Why wouldn't it be better just to break down and go to the dentist? Well, that's good, too. What's all this about dentist? Oh, I was just... Uh, saying... Nothing, Marjorie, nothing. Uh, Bertie and I were just having a little discussion, weren't we, Bertie? Uh, yes, um, about te- people that don't take care of the teeth. Uh, Bertie... Well, I don't care. I don't care if I am a tattletale. When I know something's wrong with you, I ain't going to hide it. You're right, Bertie. You've got to take care of yourself, Mr. Gillsleeve, and you've got to take care of your teeth. Your teeth is my meal ticket. <laughs> Come on, Uncle Mort. Which tooth is it? Marjorie, there's nothing whatever the matter with my tooth. I'm just a little uh, aware of it, that's all. That settles it. You're going to the dentist. No, my You've dear. You're putting it off and putting it off, and you're not going to put it off any longer. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm cornered. <laughs> when did you go to the dentist last? Tell me. Well, it was very recently. It was? Yes, it was only, uh... It was only... I thought so. No, it was even more recent than that. <laughs> I remember it perfectly. I just don't remember the date. Mm, I'll bet you don't. Well, why should I? You asked Donald Nelson when he went to the dentist last. I bet he can't tell you either. But ask him something important, and he's got it right at his fingertips. <laughs> uh, what are you laughing at, Bertie? Getting that man to the dentist is just like pulling teeth. <laughs> <laughs> You keep out of this, Bertie, and keep pulling teeth out of it, too. I never saw people in such a hurry to rush a man to the dentist. You know what I think, Uncle Mort? I think you're afraid. Afraid nothing. Well, you ought to be ashamed. Even Leroy isn't afraid of the dentist. He went yesterday, and he's going again today. Well, I'm not afraid either. Then why don't you call up Dr. Shanks and make an appointment? Certainly. I'll call him up. I'll make an appointment. Good. Only don't rush me. What is... What is... Oops. What's that? Just Leroy coming downstairs. Sounds like a barrel of potatoes. <laughs> Leroy, can't you ever walk? No, no, I'm late for school. Goodbye. Leroy, ain't you going to take any lunch? Oh, almost forgot. Where is it? I'm just finishing it. Well, i got to get going. Leroy, when was your appointment with the dentist? You would have to bring that up. It's this afternoon, 3.30. Would you be willing to let Uncle Mort go in your place? You mean, let him go to the dentist instead of me? Yes. Would you mind if he took your appointment? Are you kidding? <laughs> now, Marjorie, I don't want to rob the boy of his... No, not at all. I'm glad to do it, glad to do it. What's the matter? You got a toothache. It's nothing but a slight twinge. Nothing for everybody to get so excited about. Oh, gee, that can be bad, though. You want to take care of that. Uh, no, my boy, it's more important for you to keep your appointment. Take care of your teeth when you're young, and they'll take care of you when... Uh, they'll take care of you. <laughs> doesn't ache. That's funny. What? Now that you mention it, neither does mine. It stopped. What do you know about that? <laughs> Much ado about nothing, huh? Uncle Maud? Uh, oh, there's Judge Hooker. I'm riding on his A card today. My hat and coat, I've got to go. Goodbye, Marjorie. Goodbye, you big baby. <laughs> Hurry up, Gildy. I got the motor running. Oh, good morning, Judge. Well, this looks like a wonderful day, doesn't it? Never mind the salutation. This is costing me gas. Hop in. Uh, well, how goes it, Gildy? Well, uh, tell the truth, Judge. Not so good. Did you ever have a tooth that... Hey, look out! I saw him. You saw him. Did you ever have a tooth that hurt whenever you bit down on a Judge? Did I ever have a tooth? Well, just take a look in there. I see you in the lag. Where? If judge, watch where you're going. I'm watching. Well, keep your hands on the wheel, you old goat. I want to tell you, I had an impacted wisdom tooth once, and he had to go in there after with a hammer and a chisel. Ooh. <laughs> Worst thing that ever happened to me. Only thing to do, though, if you got a bad tooth, get it out of there. Chop it out. Get rid of it. It'll only make you trouble. But mine isn't a wisdom tooth. Makes no difference. Does it ache when you chew candy? Well, yes, it does. Same as mine. It's impacted, all right. It'll have to come out. <laughs> oh, I was afraid of that. You judge, watch out! <laughs> Hooker, that was a little close. <laughs> Listen, who's driving this car? I don't know. Is anybody driving it? <laughs> 
Well, it's my car. Don't be telling me how to drive it. Yeah, well, it's my tooth, so don't be telling me what to do about it. All right, Gildy. You want to get locked, Jaw, that's your business. What do you mean, locked jaw? A friend of my father's had a bad tooth like yours. He neglected it. He ended up with a locked jaw. Couldn't even open up his mouth to eat. You? Had to go in there with a hammer and a chisel. Oh, Horace! <laughs> if you don't mind. Yeah. I'm just telling you for your own good. All right, I was feeling fine till you started talking. Hey, what are we stopping here for? Barbershop. I gotta get a shave. But I don't need a shave. <laughs> Well, that's just too bad, Gildy. You forget, you happen to be sharing my car today. Well, I have to share your shave? <laughs> well, no, you can walk the rest of the way if you want to. All right, I will. All right, go ahead. Uh, by George, I would, too. I'd walk the whole way if it wasn't for this tooth. Starting up again, is it? Now, I'll tell you what you want to oh, do. Oh, no, you won't. You're not going to get in there with that hammer and chisel again. <laughs> Quick shave, Floyd. I got Gildersleeve waiting here. Oh, carpool, huh? Now, how you been, Mr. Gildersleeve? Not so well, Floyd. Tooth's been bothering me. This one I have. Well, yeah. Well, you think that's bad, huh? My wife's uncle had to have a tooth out last week. He lives 12 miles out of town, and all he's got is an A card. Yeah. An A card, mind you. Is that fair? I'll leave it to you, Judge. Well, Floyd, where does your wise uncle do for a living? Oh, well, he's retired. He's got his pension. He's... I thought so. Oh, well, wouldn't you retire if you got a pension? Is that any reason to take a man's gas away from him? Under the present circumstances, it's as good a reason as I can think of. And they're not taking his gas away from him. They're just holding him down to what he needs. Yeah, well... The government isn't picking on your wife's Uncle Floyd. They're just cutting out a few things like those trips over to your house for Sunday dinner. Hey, maybe they're doing me a favor at that. <laughs> hey, but I had a fellow in here yesterday. He sat right in that chair where you're sitting, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, I think I'll move. This is too much like a dentist chair. Hey, don't say dentist to me. But I was telling you about this fellow. I don't know who he is, but he came in here, and it turns out he's very close to a certain party, and he tells me that this gas rationing is a lot of bunk. Oh, he did, huh? Yeah. He says there's no shortage of gas. He says there's gas to burn right here in Summerfield. They're not rationing gas, Floyd. They're rationing mileage. They're rationing rubber. Well, why don't they say so, then? They've been saying so. If you could just read, you ignorant... No, oh, Horace. Perhaps reason would be more effective with our little chum here. Yeah, gee, let's not get into an argument over this. All right, Gildy, you try to explain it. I will. Now, Floyd, you say that gas rationing is the buck. Well, that's what the fella told me. Yeah, but, Floyd, do you know who, who controls most of the rubber in the world today? The Japs. Ninety percent of it. That's right. That's right. And do you know how important rubber is? This whole country moves on rubber. Well, now, wait a minute. Trains don't. I've been on a train. <coughs> You've been on it. I know, but the fact is that most of this country's traveling is not done on trains or trolleys or airplanes or buses. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Wait a minute. Here's a piece of paper I cut out. Look. Eighty-six percent of the traveling done by Americans last year was in private automobiles. Is that a fact? That's why it's important to keep your car and my car going. Because of all the private automobiles pulled up, the country's paralyzed. Well, sure, I can see that. Well, that's all there is to it, then. You see, Judge, all it takes is a little reasoning. Well, it's... there's just one thing I don't get. What's that? Well, my tires belong to me. Why shouldn't I ride on them all I want? Floyd Munyon, you're the stupidest man I ever met. I don't see how you ever got through even barber college... Why is... Hey, Gildy, Gildy. What? What happened to the light of pure reason? Well, all right, you try explaining it. Let me see you get anywhere with him. All right. What is it you don't understand, Floyd? Well, what about this synthetic rubber? What about that? What about it? Have you got any? No. Then how are you going to ride on it? Say, Gildy. <laughs> Who's explaining this, you or me? Well, all I got to say is they're my tires, and why shouldn't I ride on them? This is a free country, isn't it? By George, it won't be free much longer if people figure the way you do. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Gilbert. I will not if I... Stop waving that razor at me, Floyd. <laughs> all I say is a man has a right to his opinion. Well, I have an opinion I'd like to express at this time. What's that? You and all the other people who squawk about gas rationing, give me a pain. And not in my tooth, either. I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm late, Miss Fitch. I shared Judge Hooker's car with him this morning, and when you share his car, you share his private life. When I came to work on a bus, the woman next to me shared my feet. <laughs> Very good. They're big enough. 
Any important problems come up in my absence? Nothing that I couldn't handle. Uh, I'd like to see anything you couldn't handle, Miss Pitt. <laughs> well, after 33 years in the water department, life doesn't hold many surprises. Yeah, uh, I suppose not. Say, uh, what are we going to do about that inquiry from the Board of Health? I keep forgetting about it. Don't worry. I took care of that. Oh, good. We had a communique from the pumping station this morning. They're getting low on coal. Uh, well, you better put it in order for some more coal. I did. I took care of that. Oh, fine. Uh, by the way, I ran into Mr. Powers over at the air raid meeting last night, and he was complaining about... I know. I took care of that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Why, Miss Fitch, you're wonderful. Well, what's the order of business here now? I have all the figures for the annual report, if you want to start on that. Oh, fine. Let me get a cigar first. Then we'll roll up our sleeves and go to work. Oh, didn't I bring any cigars? Uh, even Donald Nelson can't work without a cigar. I believe you'll find some in your upper right-hand drawer. Oh, you even took care of that. You're a remarkable woman, Miss Fitch. If I don't keep an eye on you, Donald Nelson will be stealing you away from me. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, you're joking. Oh, no, I'm not. Would you like to be in Washington? No. I'd rather be a big frog in a small puddle. You mean you're happy here when you could be working for an important man like Donald Nelson? I don't want to work for anybody important. I want to stay here and work for you. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Fitch. Let's get on with the report. If you'll hand me that lighter. <laughs> Thank you. There. Now. Oh. Oof. Can't even bite on a cigar. I'm afraid I'll have to be seeing a dentist one of these days. Don't worry. Oh, no? I took care of that. You have an appointment for four this afternoon. Oh! The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. You know, nowadays, it's really a homemaker's duty to see that her family gets the right kind of foods. Yes, and it's just as much her duty to keep her food budget in line. Well, there's one important food that helps you do both these jobs. And that food is economical parquet margarine, the delicious, nutritious spread for bread made by Kraft. Parquet margarine is one of the kinds of foods that our government recommends for good nutrition. That's because it's so wholesome and nourishing. Actually, parquet is one of the best energy foods you can serve. What's more, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A, making it a really dependable source of this important vitamin the year round. Economical parquet, you know, is widely known as the margarine that tastes so deliciously good. So why not start serving it to your family tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow, sure, ask your food dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet, the delicious vegetable margarine made by Kraft. hurry back to the great Gildersleeve, who was in a sorry state by this time, unable to work, unable to eat, and unable to think of anything but his approaching appointment with the dentist. He's decided to come home for a little rest before the ordeal, and we find him now trudging up the walk, while in the living room, Marjorie and Mrs. Ransom are deep in conference. Don't you tell your uncle now, you hear? Because I don't want him to know I'm making it for him, not till Christmas. Oh, not a word. You just pretend like you want to know his measurements out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. I'll find some way. I should know them, but I keep forgetting I guess because I can't believe them when I hear them. Leroy? Who's that? Uncle Moore, it's so early. Uh, hello, my dear. <laughs> oh, hello, Leela. Oh, Throckmorton, you just came here to spy. Oh, no, I live here, remember? <laughs> <laughs> Spy on what? Wouldn't you love to know? Oh, would I? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, Christmas isn't so terribly far off, you know. Uh, Christmas. Oh, Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm making something for you, but I won't tell you what. Be careful now, you'll give it away. Well, I thought it wouldn't do any harm to tell him that much, but you'll have to guess the rest. Oh, well, that's nice of you, Leela, but you really shouldn't have done it. Uh, Marjorie, is Leroy home yet? No, not yet. He usually doesn't bust in until about ten after three. Burst, Marjorie. Oh, yes. Yeah. Burst. Yes. Well, don't let him get away without speaking to me. Oh, but Throckmorton, don't you want to guess? Haven't you any curiosity? Uh, guess? Guess what? 
what I'm making for you. Oh, well, I'm afraid I wouldn't be very good at guessing today, Leela. Tell the truth, I'm feeling a little under the weather. Uncle Mort, is it that tooth again? Well, yes. Oh, I knew it. If you'd gone to the dentist, you'd feel better. I'm going to the dentist, and I feel worse. I'm glad you finally got some sense. Now, why don't you just lie down here and rest till it's time to go? I think I will, if you don't mind. Yes, now I'll go get a hot water bottle. That may help. Uh-huh. Oh, lie down now, Throckmorton. That's huh? right. Yeah. Poor boy. Got a nasty tooth. Lay your head down now, and I'll just kneel here and soothe your brow. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that feels so good. You have healing hands, Leela. Oh, gracious, I'm afraid they're pretty rough now that I'm doing my own work. Isn't that admirable? <laughs> Don't stop. I think the pain is going away. <laughs> Trot, Martin. Yes, Leela? It begins with an S. If what does? The thing I'm making for you. Oh, yeah. It's a nice letter, S. I don't want you to get the idea that just because I'm making you a present, you have to give me one, though. I, I, I don't want you to think that. Oh, I wasn't thinking that. <laughs> uh, promise you won't give me anything now. All right, I promise. On your word of honor? On my word of honor. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go, Leela. Oh, I'm afraid I must. But Leela... You don't even care enough about my present to guess what it is. I do, too. Let me see. S. Uh, S. Hot water bottle. Now put it on the side that aches. That may relieve it till the dentist gets at it. Marjorie, guess what? The most wonderful thing has happened. While you were out of the room, all of a sudden, the pain was gone. Oh, no, you don't. What do you mean? You're coming with me to the dentist. Uh, oh, yes, you are. Don't worry, Throckmorton. You go to the dentist, and before you know it... Bingo, it'll be all over. Uh, that's what I'm afraid of, that bingo. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, hello, Peavy. Peavy, I just sneaked in for a minute. I've got to talk fast. They're waiting for me outside the drugstore. Who, the police? The police. <laughs> No, no, Marjorie and Leroy. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, you're shaking. Well, you'd be shaking, too. I'm on my way to the dentist. The dentist? Well, that's something we all have to face at one time or another, I guess. It don't give me any philosophy. What I want is something that'll cure a toothache, and quickly. Well, now, that's rather a large order. That's a problem science has been working on for a good many years. I can't wait for science, PV. I've got to be at the dentist in 15 minutes if I don't cure this thing first. Now, how about it? Well, that word cure, Mr. Gildersleeve, is a word we druggists like to avoid. Never mind the word. What I want to know is... You sell toothache remedies, don't you? Yes, I do sell a toothache remedy. Several varieties, as a matter of fact. Though most of them come down to about the same thing, all the clothes. Yes, all right. A toothache remedy remedies a toothache, doesn't it? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> It may relieve it temporarily. Relieve it or remedy it, PV. Don't quibble. All druggists are supposed to be friendly, aren't they? Yes, we do rather pride ourselves on our friendliness. Well, then be a pal. Help me out of this, PV. If I can cure this tooth before I get to the dentist, I may be able to call the whole thing off. Mr. Gildersleeve, if I could guarantee to do that, I wouldn't be in the drug business. I'd set up as a dentist. In other words, you admit your toothache remedies are no darn good. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> But if you're looking for something really effective, I can recommend a cure for corn. Corn? <laughs> I've used it myself with great satisfaction. So has Mrs. Peavy. If a cure for corns isn't going to help me with my tooth, Peavy. No, but it's a good thing to know about. You're no help to me, Peavy. Goodbye. Oh, you know, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes? There is one remedy for toothache I've heard recommended. What's that? I've never had occasion to try it myself. I don't know that it has any scientific basis. Oh, never mind the science. What is it? Have you ever tried placing a penny next to gum? Oh, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, Mr. Wouldn't you think the doc could get some decent magazines in here? Not a comic book in the whole place. Be quiet, Leroy. Why, who's dead? Leroy. What are you so nervous about, Uncle? I'm not nervous. I just don't like waiting, that's all. 
Makes me restless. Your hand's trembling. Leroy, read your magazine. Look at mine, steady as a rock. I bet I could hold it still for five minutes. You think you could hold your tongue still for a few minutes? Sure. Well, try it. If you're not nervous, huh, what did you make Marge drive you down for? Well, because if you must know, dentists sometimes give people gas. I don't want to drive home and I'm under the influence of laughing gas. <laughs> now, stop asking questions. What are you reading, Unc? Uh, National Geographic. Interesting? Oh, yes, very. Wouldn't it be easier to read if you turned it right side up? Good. <laughs> Dr. Shanks is ready now. After you, Unc. Uh, no, you go ahead, Leroy. In the age before beauty. Leroy, you get in there. <laughs> All right. Hello there, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, hello, Doctor. I won't keep this young man but a minute. Just finishing up with him. Oh, that's all right. No hurry. Take your time, Doc. Uh, They always tell you that, Marjorie. It won't take but a minute. It isn't going to hurt a bit. That poor kid's liable to be in there an hour. Oh, I don't think so. He hasn't got much left to do. I feel sorry for him, though, my dear. He puts up a big front, but underneath it, I'll bet he's scared to death. I don't believe Leroy has a nerve in his entire body. If he had, he couldn't stand the noises he makes. <laughs> well, there's something in that. Uh, say, it's awfully quiet in there, isn't it? Is there anything strange about that? No, I just wonder what they're doing to him. Why don't you try not to think about it, Uncle Mort? Why don't you read your magazine? You suppose they could be giving him gas in there? Why do you keep worrying about gas? Then just don't give gas all the time. Well, they never let you know when they're going to. They sneak up on you with it. Did you ever have gas? No, but I've heard all about it. Laughing gas. They sneak up behind you and clap one of those things over your face. <laughs> oh, Uncle Mort, that's old-fashioned. If you go to the dentist more often, you get rid of those ideas. You needn't try to make me feel good, my dear. I know what I'm in for. Just wish it wasn't so quiet, that's all. <coughs> I could stand it if it wasn't so quiet. If somebody would just make a noise... <laughs> All right, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, Uncle Moore, that's you. Uh, me? Steady. Steady. Uh, What's the matter, Aunt? You look as if you were going to the chair. I am. <laughs> well, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, hello, Doc. Uh, long time no see, huh? <laughs> How have you been? Just climb into the chair there and make yourself comfortable. Yeah, I've been pretty well, Doctor. Except for this little tooth of mine. Well, we'll get to the bottom of that. (laughs) Uh, How's that new neighbor of yours that moved in there next door to you? Oh, Mrs. Ransom? Oh, she's fine. See much of her? Oh, we pass the time of day now and then. (laughs) What's that? What's that, Doc? It's just my instruments, a few drills and whatnot. (laughs) What not? What's the matter? Why, you're perspiring. You're looking a little pale there. I am? Miss Mitchell, take that bottle there and give him a whiff, will you? Oh, no, you don't. Now, Mr. Gildersleeve, it's nothing to be afraid of. Take it away. Take it away, Doc. Breathe in, please. Take a breath. You can't fool me. I know what you're up to. Hold it under his nose. Now, breathe in. (laughs) (laughs) Here, here. Come out of that. Stop it. Nothing but nothing but spirits of ammonia. I thought it was laughing gas. <laughs> <laughs> laughing gas? I haven't given laughing gas in twenty years. Yeah. Well, let's have a look at that mouth of yours now. Yeah. It's a hard tooth on the upper left hand side. Hmm. Well, plenty of space in there. Uh, I see, Doc. Hmm. That's very interesting. It is. Uh, you get a sharp pain when you bite down. Uh. Miss Mitchell, hand me those tweezers, will you? Uh, Where are they, Doc? Relax, man, relax. This isn't going to hurt. Where have I heard that before? Now, open your mouth. Uh, okay. By the way, what did you have for dinner on Thanksgiving? Erky. I thought so. There. There. There's the whole cause of your trouble. What's that? A little sliver of turkey bone lodged between your second and third molars. When you bit down on it, it jabbed your gum. It, that's all? That's all. There's nothing else the matter with my teeth? Not that I can see. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be ten dollars, please. Dear diary, 
Well, it's been nearly a week now, and I've still got more than three quarters of a tank full. I've managed to get to most of the places I wanted to go, and I even got to one place I didn't want to go to at all. <laughs> yeah, maybe it isn't going to be so bad. What worries me is people like Floyd the Barber. They don't seem to realize that the shortage of rubber is nationwide, and that's why rationing has to be nationwide. I read where Jeffers says the tires we have on our cars now are going to have to last us at least till the middle of 1944. Of course, I don't know Jeffers personally, but Donald Nelson speaks well of him. <laughs> anyway, it strikes me that saving our tires is like saving money. Most of us can't do it unless we figure out a system that'll force us to. And that's what this gas rationing is. Naturally, it's going to take a little time to get it adjusted so that every man gets the gas he needs to get him to his job. But that's the intention. So let's have a little patience and try to make this thing work, folks. Because if it doesn't, heaven help our men at the front and heaven help us. Good night, everybody. Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. It's a time saver. It meets any mealtime emergency. What does? Why, that seven-minute macaroni and cheese made with Kraft Dinner. Now, the macaroni in a package of Kraft Dinner is a very special kind. It cooks up tender and fluffy in just seven minutes. But that's only half the secret of Kraft Dinner. The Kraft Grated is the other half. It also comes in the package of Kraft Dinner. You just sprinkle it through and through, and the macaroni is drenched with mild cheese flavor. No fuss or bother to this new-fashioned way of making that old-fashioned dish. And you'll find Kraft Dinner is a handy thing to have around when your family is on time for dinner and you're late. Because in just seven minutes, you can serve them swell macaroni and cheese. So keep a few packages of Kraft Dinner on your pantry shelf always. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Whedon. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Well, Christmas is still a few days away, but I imagine in most of your homes the festivities have already started for the youngsters. Yes, with the kids on vacation, there are probably plenty of parties and occasions when friends drop in. And that calls for a well-filled cookie jar. Yes, and a big bowl of popcorn now and then. So here's a tip. For cookies that fairly melt in your mouth, try making them with parquet margarine for the shortening. You see, besides being grand for table use as a spread for bread and seasoning for hot vegetables... Parquet, when used as a shortening, adds delicate extra flavor to all baked foods. Try parquet melted over popcorn, too, and just watch the youngsters go for it. Best of all, these Christmas treats aren't expensive when you use economical parquet. So get your holiday supply of parquet margarine tomorrow and surprise the youngsters with the best holiday cookies and popcorn they ever tasted. Just ask your dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve. With December almost gone, he's been working like a beaver the past few days, trying to get out the annual report of the water department. That's why we find him now in his office asleep at 9 o'clock in the morning, with his head buried in the annual report and his arms sprawled across the blotter while through his troubled dreams run thoughts of this happy holiday season. Something must get at that Christmas card list, Uncle Mo. All right, Marjorie. A model airplane. That's all I want for Christmas, a model airplane. I know, Leroy, I know. How about that annual report, Mr. Gildersleeve? Right away, Miss Fitch. 
How many for Christmas dinner, Miss Gillsleeve? Can't order till I know how many. Give me a chance, Bertie. Just because I'm giving you a present, Throckmorton, I don't want you to think you have to give me a present. Oh, Leela, I almost forgot. Have you bought the tree? Tree? Have you bought the mistletoe? Wait a minute. Have you forgotten anybody? Wait! Mr. Gildersleeve. What do you want? We regret to inform you that federal regulations require payment for all charge purchases on or before the 10th of the month. <laughs> oh, go away, all of you. Christmas, I hate it. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, my goodness, what's happened? Mr. Gildersleeve. He's still warm. Go away, go away. Wake up. <laughs> oh, uh, Miss Fitch. Uh, let me see, where were we? Uh, afraid I dozed a little there. Uh, dear sir, read that back to me, will you? Mr. Gildersleeve, it's morning. Morning? Is there anything strange about that? Only that you slept here all night. Uh, I did? Oh, I must apologize, Miss Fitch. I'm afraid I need a shave. Oh, and the suit looks as if I'd slept in it. Oh, well... Let's finish this report and get it over with, huh? But you haven't even had breakfast. Breakfast can wait, for once. Uh, will you check these figures as I read them off? Yes, Mr. Gildersleeve. Thank you. Uh, statement of financial status. Cash on hand, $386.52. Check. Uh, accounts receivable, uh, $2,873.38. Check. Interest, $139.10. Check. Marjorie, negligee, and slippers. Uh, Leela Ransom, passion flower. Uh, uh, there must be something wrong here. <laughs> I think there must. Yes, I guess I must have got to thinking about something else during the night. <laughs> Silly, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, uh, perhaps I should explain, Miss Fitch. I was thinking about my Christmas list. So I assume. Uh, yes. Uh, perhaps I should explain further, Miss Fitch. Passion flower is the name of a perfume. I know. I use it exclusively myself. Oh, maybe I better give it a little more thought then. <laughs> You know, Miss Fitch, I had the most awful dream last night. I don't wonder. Yes, I dreamed that I hadn't done a bit of Christmas shopping, which I haven't. But I also dreamed that it was the day before Christmas. I want to tell you I was frantic. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I don't want to spoil your dream, but it is the day before Christmas. Uh, what? It can't be. But it is. Uh, what happened to all those other days? There's a whole week I've lost track of. You've been working too hard. You've been going around here in a fall. Oh, but I haven't bought a single present. I haven't had breakfast. I haven't even had a shave. Oh, this is really going to be one of my bad days. Come right in, Mr. Gildersleeve. You're next. No waiting. Uh, good morning, Floyd. Gee, Mr. Gildersleeve, you look like the grapes are raft. Uh, yes, I had a hard night last night, Floyd. <laughs> what happened? Did you run into some friends? Uh, no, no. I worked all night at the office. Ah, uh -huh, that's what they all say. I told you, Floyd, I worked all night at the office. Okay, okay, you worked all night at the office. I haven't had any breakfast either, so let's skip the conversation and make it a quick shave. All right, Mr. Gildersleeve, if that's the way you want it, that's the way it'll be. This is one place where the customer is always right. That's fine. If a man comes in here and doesn't feel like talking, that's all right with me. I can take a hint. Good. One thing I know how to do is hold my tongue. Good. I'm not like some barbers who go into their shop and they talk your ear off from the time you get into the chair to the time you get out of it. Good. I want people to feel they can come in here and just relax and not have to listen to a whole lot of stuff. Fine. Not that I haven't got my troubles like everybody else, but I keep them to myself. Good. Now, like last night, I came home after a long day, and my wife had dinner waiting for me, ham hocks and sauerkraut. Yeah. So we had that and some apple pie, and after dinner, I took off my shoes and turned on the radio. I was just getting comfortable, and my wife's sister calls up. Yeah. And what do you think she wants? Come right over and play pinochle. Well, if you know my wife's sister. Yeah. So I said to my wife, I said, nothing doing. I said, I'm all set here, I'm comfortable, and right here is where I'm staying. Good. I said, you couldn't move me out of here with a ten-ton truck. <laughs> so we went over and played pinochle for a while, and then in comes the old Come in, Judge. Come in. Just finishing up with Mr. Gildersleeve here. He hasn't even started on me yet. Why, I'll have you shaved in two shakes. See that you don't, brother. I thought I'd find you here, Gildersleeve. How are you, Judge? What's on your mind? I just dropped in to serve notice on you, Gildersleeve, that after your recent performance, I'm not giving you any remembrance this Christmas. And please do not embarrass me by giving me any. Good day. Good day. Wait a minute. I don't know what you're talking about, Horace. I haven't seen you in a week. I've been very busy. Yeah, I'll say you've been busy. Busy over at Mrs. Ransom's. Uh, Judge, I haven't even had time. Don't deny it. The minute I told you I'd bought a ring, you went scurrying over there to try to cut me out. Was that the act of a friend? Well, Judge, the best laid plans of mice and men gang after Glay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's scotch. <laughs> What's the matter? Did she turn you down? 
Wouldn't you like to think so? Well, she didn't. She merely asked for time to consider. It's the same thing. If she considers it, she won't do it. <laughs> when is she giving you her answer, Judge? As soon as she gets back from Savannah. Savannah? Now, that'll show you how innocent I am, Judge. I didn't even know she was going to Savannah. Now, don't try to give me that. You know as well as I do that she's going home to see her brother. On my word, Judge, I told you I've been busy this week. I haven't seen anybody. I don't know what your game is, Gildy, but this time it isn't going to work. I know all about Leela's plans, and I intend to be out at that airport today at 12 sharp to see her off. So do I, Judge, and thanks for the tip. 12 o'clock at the airport, is it? Well, if it hadn't been for you, I might have missed saying goodbye to her. <laughs> Gildersleeve, I've borne a lot from you, but this is the last straw. You now place me in the unpleasant position of having to ask you hereafter to do me the favor not to speak to me. Oh, anything for a friend, Judge. You know that. <laughs> Floyd? Merry Christmas. Bye, Judge. Same to you. Floyd, get going. I got a lot of ground to cover between now and Christmas. <laughs> I wonder if I'm in time. I wonder if she's left yet. Leela, have you left yet? Well, of all people, Mr. Gildersleeve. Leela, why didn't you tell me you were going away? I didn't suppose you'd care whether I came or went after the way you treated me last Saturday. I can explain that, Leela. You see? Please don't bother. I'm hardly in the habit of having gentlemen run out on me without so much as a buy or leave. Uh, Leela, let's talk this over. Uh, aren't you going to invite me in? Well, if you're going to break my door down, I suppose I'll have to. Uh, but you. I'm leaving right away. I've got all my bags packed, and I'm expecting a gentleman to call for me any minute. I know. Hooker. I'm not saying who it is, but he's more of a gentleman than you are. Leela, about last Saturday, Bertie came back unexpectedly, and I had to go down to the station to meet her. Did you ever come back? But Leela... Did I ever hear a word from you all week? But I haven't had a minute. I've had to get out the annual report of the water department. And if you know what that means... I know what it means. It means you care more for your old waterworks than you do for me. All I can say is I'm glad I'm going away. Oh, now, Leela. I'm glad. I'm glad. Oh, Leela, don't be like that. Leela. Oh, help. Somebody help. <laughs> Look, Leela, I, I bought you a present. You brought me a what? A present. A Christmas present. You see, it's got Santa Claus on it. You see, he's waving to you. Go on, wave to Leela, Santa. <laughs> oh, Shrock Morton, you're such a fool. And you didn't forget, did you? Forget? How could I forget after what happened the last time I saw you? What happened, Shrock Morton? Don't you remember? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. I just wanted to see whether you remember. By George, if there were any mistletoe around here, I'd show you whether I remember or not. Do you have to have mistletoe? Hmm. <laughs> oh, gracious, it must be time to leave. Oh, Leela, don't go to Savannah. It's not patriotic to travel now. Oh, but I have to, Throckmorton. My only brother, Marvin, is leaving for the Navy. Oh. Leela, we haven't got any time to lose. Coming, George. Oh, you were so sweet to call for me, Judge. Not at all. Not at all. A pleasure. My bag's already here, and I have a nice surprise for you. Throckmorton's coming to the airport with us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I hope he's got his car. I'm afraid there won't be room in mine. Tell the judge we wouldn't think of crowding him, Leela. You can come with me, and he can take the bags. Oh, yeah? Well, you tell Gillespie for me. Nonsense, nonsense. Now, we can all ride in one car. We'll put the bags in back and all ride in the front seat. Leela, you either overestimate my seat or you underestimate Gillespie. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let him take the bags up front with him. You and I will ride in back, Leela. Oh, no. Oh, now, we're going to be late. Who's going to carry out my bag? I've got him. Yeah, not. I got this one first. Now, let's oh, go. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. No fighting now, you hear? Right, yeah. Throckmorton gets to carry the suitcase and the hat box, and, and Horace gets the overnight case. Oh, Throckmorton gets everything. Say, don't forget your present, Leela. Oh, gracious, Throckmorton's present. Uh, pick it up when you come, will you, Judge? This thing? Uh, be careful of that, Hooker. Come on, come on. The plane leaves in half an hour. <laughs> Savannah, all passengers aboard, please. That's you, Leela. 
That's your dream? Oh, my goodness. I'm so excited. You know, I've never been in a flying machine before in my life. I've got a good notion to come with you, Leela. Oh, I wish you could. Yeah. I think I'll stow away on the plane. I'll bet you would, too, Throckmorton. That blimp? There isn't room to stow him away on the B-19. <laughs> no, look here, Hooker. Boys, boys. This is Christmas Eve. Peace on Earth, goodwill toward man. Well, he started it. I don't care who started it. I want you both to promise me one thing before I go. What's that? Promise me you'll both be friends while I'm gone. Come on now, shake hands. Mm. Shake hands, Throckmorton. Come on. Well, all right. <laughs> That's better. Now you write to me every day, you hear? I will, Leela. I'll write twice a day. So will I. No, you won't. I will, too. I don't know. <laughs> You're so impulsive, you boys. I want you to do me another thing. Anything you say, Leela. I want you both to spend Christmas together just thinking about me. Uh, Mrs. Ransom? Uh, yes? We're holding the plane for you. For me? Oh, how nice. I'll be right along. Oh, my. Isn't he handsome in his uniform and all? Uh? I wonder if he's going, too. Uh, goodbye, Leela. Oh, goodbye, Throckmorton. I'll be waiting for your answer, Leela. Bye. Oh, yes. <laughs> now, remember, you two, you're going to be good friends. And don't you dare open your present till Christmas, you hear? Mrs. Ransom, the plane is waiting. Oh, my goodness. I'm in such demand here. I hardly know what I'm doing. Just come with me, please. With you? Oh, you know, Captain, this is my first trip on a flying machine. Captain, I'll bet he's not even a sergeant. <laughs> Have a pleasant trip, Leela. Yes, yeah, she will. <laughs> she goes. Yeah, she'll soon be 5,000 feet in the air. Yeah, that's right. Oh, dearie me. Now, oh, isn't that too bad? What? Something I forgot to give her. Huh? Your Christmas present for Leela I'm still carrying. Oh! <clears throat> Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. Nowadays, it's really a homemaker's duty to see that her family gets the right kind of foods. Yes, and it's just as much her duty to keep her food budget in line. Well, there's one important food that helps you do both these jobs. And that food is economical parquet margarine, the delicious, nutritious spread for bread made by Kraft. Parquet margarine is one of the kinds of foods that our government recommends for good nutrition. That's because it's so wholesome and nourishing. Actually, parquet is one of the best energy foods you can serve. What's more, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A, making it a really dependable source of this important vitamin the year round. Economical parquet, you know, is widely known as the margarine that tastes so deliciously good. So why not start serving it to your family tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow, sure, ask your food dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet, the delicious vegetable margarine made by Kraft. Now let's see what's happened to the great Gildersleeve. After a frantic three-hour battle in Hogan Brothers' department store, he bursts out of the store with his arms full of bundles and his hat over his ear. Uh, uh, Christmas. There ought to be a law against Christmas. Oh, there, Gildersleeve. Merry Christmas. Uh, Merry Christmas, Dr. Pettibone. If you see anything the matter with me, please keep it to yourself till after the holidays. But you're looking fine, old man. I was going to remark on it. Oh, do you think so? Never saw you looking better. Maybe those old arteries are beginning to soften for a change. <laughs> Pettibone, I'm in no mood for the humor of the dissection room. Oh, come, come, Gildersleeve. A cheery smile will do more for your digestion than all the Epsom salts in the world. Come on, Gildersleeve. Let me hear you say ha-ha. Ha-ha. Oh. <laughs> you can do better than that. Come on. Ha-ha-ha-ha. That's better. That's enough now. That's fine. Just keep smiling, and your gastric juices will thank you. My dear. Let me see now. I got a present for everybody except Judge Hooker. That's fine. 
Well, hi, George. It's beginning to feel like Christmas. Yeah. Poker. Da 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 da. I wonder if I should break down and get Hooker a present. After what he pulled on me this afternoon, I know, but maybe he really did forget to give Leela that package. After all, this is Christmas. No time to bear a grudge. He isn't going to give me a present, though. I heard him say so. Yeah, but you can't trust him, Gildersleeve. He's just sneaky enough to go and do it. I could give him a little present. Not a very good one. I could stop in here and get him something kind of cheap at the drugstore. <laughs> I think I will. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas just like you are. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah. Hello, P.B. I didn't know that you were musically inclined, P.B. Well, no, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. I, I do find myself humming a tune occasionally when I'm alone here in the shop. Oh, well, you know what they say. It's music makes the world go round. Or is it love? Uh, did you ever listen to this fellow Crosby, Mr. Gildersleeve? Uh, Crosby? Oh, yes, yes. Quite a singer. One of the best. As a matter of fact, I've been compared to him once. Well, I was. Usually, I like to listen to him on Thursday night. So does Mrs. Peavy. Oh, Mrs. Peavy's a music lover, too. Huh? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, one of the things I'm giving her for Christmas is an album of records. Selections by John Philip Sousa. Yes. He happened to be playing at the Steel Pier when we were on our honeymoon. Oh. Well, between Crosby and Sousa, you can't go wrong. <laughs> hey, maybe you can help me out, Peavy. I came here to find a Christmas present. Oh, something for a friend? Well, I don't know that he's a friend, but i got to get him something. Well, I dare say we can find something suitable, Mr. Gildersleeve. Now, let's see. It doesn't have to be too suitable. Well, uh, what sort of thing does your friend like? He doesn't even have to like it. It just has to be a present. Well, that makes it rather difficult. If you could give me some idea. Well, I'll tell you. I'm buying it for Judge Hooker. Judge Hooker? Well, it's a small world, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, is it, Peavy? Would you believe it? Judge Hooker was in here not over an hour ago selecting a present for you. Oh, uh, so this is the kind of place he comes to buy me presents, is it? <laughs> I think you have a pleasant surprise in store for you, Mr. Gildersleeve. This gift is not the sort of thing you'd expect to find in a drugstore. I'd like to know anything you wouldn't expect to find in a drugstore. <laughs> tell me, Peavy, what did he buy me? Oh, well, no, I... Afraid I couldn't tell you that. Professional ethics, you know. But I, I want to know how good a present to buy him. At least you can tell me how much it cost. No, but I believe I can say without betraying any confidence that it was under five dollars. Yeah, good. Yeah, now we're getting someplace. And what have you got for an old goat that cost less than five dollars? Well, I've got a special on a fountain pen set here. Huh? You see, it says uh, double barrel, self filling, iridium point. Streamlined blue side case, special patented clip, indestructible, guaranteed to last till eternity. Is it any good? It's all right. You, <laughs> you can't expect everything for three ninety eight. Yes, sir. You say it's guaranteed to last till eternity? Well, how long is that? Ten years? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Five years? If you don't drop it. <laughs> of course, if you don't care for the fountain pen, I, I have other things. I have an eight-day clock here, but the thing about that is... I know, you have to wind it too often. Mm. Now, I'll take the fountain pen. may not last forever, but neither will Hooker. I uh, suppose you'd like it wrapped as a gift. Wrapped as a gift? What does that mean? Uh, take the price tag off. Oh, yeah, wait a minute. Does this pen cost more than the present the judge is giving me or less? Well, the pen is slightly more expensive. Then leave the tag on it. I'll just take it as it is. <laughs> Charge that, will you, PB? Hogan Brothers got all my money. Well, glad to, Mr. Gildersleeve. I hope you have a Merry Christmas. Uh, same to you, PB, and the same to uh, Mrs. PB. <laughs> You know, Leroy, maybe it's this green bulb that's making the trouble. It do look a little tired. Why don't you unscrew the bulb and stick the screwdriver in there? Oh, never do that, my boy. You blow out every fuse in the house. Besides, you can get a nasty shock that way. Well, that's what the electrician did when he fixed the lights last year. I saw him. Well, those electrician fellows are immune to electricity. Uh, let me have that other bulb there, will you, Bertie? Yes, sir. 
You know, Mr. Gillsleeve, when my vacuum cleaner starts acting up, I got a sure cure for it. Well, a vacuum cleaner is not like a light circuit, pretty. Well, maybe not. But to me, all them electrical things is about the same. Goes in there and comes out here, and you better stay out of the way. <laughs> well, the trouble here doesn't appear to be the green bulb. Uh, uh, what is your cure, Bertie? Well, sir, I pull the plug out, and I turn it around, and I shake the bag three times and put the plug back. It ain't never failed yet. Well, we tried everything else. Yes, I can remember when we didn't bother with these electrical gadgets on Christmas trees. We just used candles. Set the house on fire every year, but it was a lot simpler. <laughs> well, go ahead and let's try your system, Bertie. All right. Stand back, Leroy. Now, pull the plug, turn it around. Shake the cord. One, two, three. Put the plug back. Well, I be. Bertie, you're a genius. Mind you, come on in and see the beautiful tree. Oh, oh, it's beautiful. Let's turn off all the other lights and see how it looks. Hey, that's super. Oh, it's lovely. Isn't it, Uncle Moore? Yes, it is. It's lovely. That's the prettiest tree I ever saw in my life. Reminds me of the world's fair. Well, it's not as big a tree as we've had other years, but when you think of all the people who aren't going to have any Christmas tree at all this year... You know what gets me? Every year, Uncle Mort says, Well, don't expect much this year, kids. We're going to have to cut down and just have a very small Christmas. <laughs> I know. And every year seems like there's more presents than ever. Oh, Uncle Mort, you've been so good to us. You've been like Santa Claus and Daddy and, and our favorite uncle all rolled into one. Yeah, you were a swell, Uncle. Yeah. Uh. Now, now. I made some of them Christmas cookies special for you, Mr. Gilsleeve. Shall I bring them in? Well, I can't think of a better time for Christmas cookies than right now, Bertie. I'll go get them. Yeah, cookies. I think I'm going to like this Christmas. Hey, Uncle, can we open just one present? Can we, huh? Well, don't you think you ought to wait till Christmas, my boy? Oh, but you always let us open just one. I'll pick a little one. Well, all right, then. Just a little one. Come on, Marge. You pick one of yours, and I'll pick one of mine. Now, let's see what you got first. Gee, thanks, Uncle. War bond. Just what I needed. Uh, not what you needed, maybe, but what the country needed. I know it may be something of a disappointment to you. But... No, I think it's swell. I don't care if I didn't get a Model P-47 with a motor in it. Well, it may mean that somebody else will get a real P-47 with a real motor in it. You have to think of that, my boy. Yeah, I just wish I was the fellow who's going to fly it, that's all. Open yours, Marge. Let's see what you got. Mm, I think I know. Is it, Uncle Moore? Well, you you open it and see. <laughs> you remember? What you got there, Miss Marjorie? Every year he gives me one. Listen. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's a darling one. <laughs> I love music boxes, and, and I love Christmas. Merry Christmas, Uncle Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, my dear. Uh, who's that? I'll go maybe it's Santa Claus. <laughs> well, for goodness <laughs> sake, come in, Judge. Good evening, Bertie. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Judge. Hello, Leroy. Hi. Hello, Marjorie. Merry Christmas, Judge. Would you be good enough to ask your uncle, Marjorie, whether he's in? Ask the judge whether he's blind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's your attitude. Well, you may recall, Throckmorton, that... We gave a certain lady our promise that during her absence, we would be friends. Yes, I recall it vaguely. Well, I, for one, am a man of my word. Yeah. It's customary for friends to exchange tokens this holiday season. For that reason and for no other, I have brought you a slight gift. There. Oh. Well, now that you mention it, I have one for you. There. <laughs> Rock Martin. Rock Martin. You old son of a gun. Yeah. <laughs> Horace, you old goat, you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. By George, now it is a Merry Christmas. Rock Martin, what do you say we open each other's presents, huh? Huh? Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> I just can't wait. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> that everlasting fountain pen. Ooh, that eight day clock. <laughs> <laughs> Rock Morton, I think Brother Peavy unloaded something on us. 
Well, now, I wouldn't say that. On behalf of the Kraft Cheese Company and the cast of our program, I'd like to wish all of our listeners a very Merry Christmas and the happiest possible New Year. There are many of us for whom it'll be difficult to be merry this Christmas, with loved ones far away and families divided. But let's try to keep up the Christmas tradition for the sake of the men who are fighting to preserve it. And to those men also fighting in foxholes and slit trenches on the sea and in the air, northeast, south, and west, we also send our Christmas good wishes. God bless you all. Good night, everybody. Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Ken Carpenter speaking to the makers of Kraft Cheese and inviting you to tune in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. You lovers of macaroni and cheese will get a thrill out of the new-fashioned way of making this grand dish with Kraft Dinner. A package of Kraft Dinner contains special macaroni, which cooks up fluffy and tender in just seven minutes. And the Kraft Dinner package also contains some Kraft Grated, which supplies the grand cheese flavor. You just boil the Kraft Dinner macaroni for seven minutes, drain it, and stir in the Kraft Grated. Your macaroni and cheese is ready to serve. Now, because Kraft Dinner is so simple to make, so good, and so economical, it has become tremendously popular throughout the country. So popular, in fact, that sometime a dealer's supply is exhausted by the end of the week. You can help your dealer and yourself, too, by ordering Kraft Dinner early in the week. Then you'll have it on the pantry shelf, ready for grand macaroni and cheese you cook in seven minutes. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheat. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Christmas is still in most of our minds these days, but after all, food is something we have to think about the year round. So even though the Christmas festivities are still going on in many of your homes, let me say a word about parquet margarine, the delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. You really should know about parquet margarine, especially in times like these, because parquet margarine is so economical and so downright good tasting, too. Yes, parquet is the margarine with a very special flavor. It's so delicate and appetizing, so wholesome and good. Just try parquet spread on bread or rolls, and you'll quickly see what I mean. You see, parquet is the margarine that's made by Kraft, and you know that Kraft is famous for fine quality foods. And remember, parquet is wholesome and nutritious, an excellent energy food that contains vitamin A. So order parquet tomorrow. Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. While Christmas is over, New Year's is four days off, and in that lull that comes between the two, we find the great Gildersleeve. As he lingers at the breakfast table, trying to get up enough steam to drag himself down to the office, from Leroy comes the old refrain... What can I do, Unc? How, what can I do? Leroy, how can you say that? It's only three days after Christmas. I know, but I don't know what to do. That's ridiculous. You've got all those presents. You've got your erector set? Yes, go make something. What? I don't know what. Do I have to tell you what to make? Well, if you just let me use my chemistry set, I can really... No, for the last time, no. 
Well, I'll lay on. I've told you, you're not to use that unless I'm around to supervise it. Gosh, what's the use of having a chemistry set? It's too old for you, Leroy. I'm sorry now that I bought it. I wish I'd gotten you 2A instead of a 4B. But I'll be careful. It's too late. You've already burned a hole in my desk and smelled up the whole house. And made a nasty brown stain on the rug. Brown? What's that? I hadn't heard about that. Well, nothing. I just did what it said in the book. That's what I mean. You've no judgment. Out of the whole book, the first thing you had to make was a stink bomb. (laughs) Now you can just find something else to play with. Give me a chemistry set and won't let me make anything. You've got other things, Leroy. What about that wood-burning set? Yeah, go burn some wood. Oh, I, I don't want to. Young man, you do what I tell you to. Go burn an Indian head or something and stop pestering me. Haven't you got any homework or anything you can do? Yes, how about that theme? You keep out of this, Marge. Yep, yep, yep. What theme? Leroy's supposed to write a theme for his English class the day he gets back to school. All right for you. How I spent my Christmas vacation. Griping. Yeah, that's not it at all. Well, whatever the theme is, Leroy, you better get at it. This is an ideal time for it. What's the topic? Oh, it's corny. Yeah, corny? What is it? My New Year's resolutions. What's corny about that? I think it's a very good idea. Are you kidding? <laughs> Who makes resolutions anymore? Jack Benny. <laughs> well, you could do with a few, young man. Well, why don't you write the theme for me, then? I could write a book. Resolved? One, I will not come to the table without first washing my hands. I washed them. Two, I will not consider my hands washed until I clean my nails. All right, who had the nail brush last? Pickle push. I did not. Three, I will not be rude to my sister. Four, my sister will not be rude to me. Five? No, four. <laughs> I will not leave any roller skates on the front stoop again. And if I do, my dear Uncle Mort will lick the daylights out of me. <laughs> Five, I will always keep my shoes tidy. A tide. Six, I will always tuck in my shirt tails. Seven, I will give up the idea of the expression, are you kidding? Are you kidding? <laughs> and eight, just for that, you can go and get to work on that theme right now. Well, I was only kidding, huh? Well, I'm not. Get busy. Okay. Can't even make a joke around here. <laughs> I don't know what's the matter with kids these days. They have all these things, fancy erector sets, electric trains, electric wood-burning outfits... They can't think of anything to do but hang around and pester their elders. When I was a boy, we didn't have any of those things. And what did you used to do, Uncle Mort? Hang around and pester my elders. (laughs) But I had a better excuse. Here's the paper, Uncle. Thought you might like to read the morning paper. Oh, thank you, Leroy. Exceedingly thoughtful of you. Oh, not at all. You're uh, not forgetting about the theme. Oh, no, no. Yes, don't. Well, listen to this in the paper. Summerfield to have war plans. What else does it say? Summerfield Rat Trap Company converts to arms production. By George, now we're getting someplace. That the rats wait, we'll exterminate the Japs first. <laughs> After 23 years of building better mouse traps, Washington has finally beaten the path to the door of the Summerfield Trap Company. It was revealed today upon arrival of Leonard P. Brody of the WPB, ordnance expert and right hand man to Donald Nelson. Well. Brody will consult with civic leaders today about plans for the immediate expansion and conversion of the plant. You see, his picture standing here with the mayor. Trust is honored to get his picture taken with anybody from Washington. Yeah. I suppose Brody will be wanting to see me, too, as water commissioner. Those plants use plenty of water. Maybe I'd better be getting down to the office. Here's the mail, Mr. Gill, please. Still getting Christmas cards, it looks like. Uh, no time for the mail now, Bertie. you got to get down to the office and see a man from Washington. Oh. If there's any mail for me, just leave it on my desk. Yes, sir. There's a letter here from Savannah, Georgia. Uh, Savannah? Why, it must be from Mrs. Ransom. Huh? Well, just leave it on his desk, Bertie. Yeah. Here, give it to me. <laughs> yes, sir. What do you know? She's got the stamp all upside down. Oh, let's see it. I love coffee. I love candy. Leroy? I love the girls, and the girls love me. Give me that. Marge, catch. Leroy? You better give it to him, Leroy. Oh, you want it? Here, Uncle. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is from Savannah. I don't know what she'd be writing to me about, I'm sure. Why don't you open it and read it, Uncle Moore? Yeah, out loud. Yeah. <laughs> well, you too kindly mind your own business. I'll read my own letters in my own way and in my own good time. Well, what's this on the back of it? S-W-A-K. What does that mean? Uh, as if you didn't know. I don't. Oh, for Pete's sake, Unc. Well, if you know what it means, tell me. S-W-A-K. Some women are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Leroy, you find something to do and find it quickly before I lose my temper. Okay, Uncle, only kidding. Yes, I know. 
Uh, Marjorie, can you tell me what S-W-A-K means? Well, if you must know, Uncle Mort, S-W-A-K on a letter means sealed with a kiss. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe it. <laughs> Is there a lipstick mark on the flap? Uh, no. Let me see. No. <laughs> All right. You'll uh, pardon me if I read this. Oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> what does she say, Uncle Moore? She says the weather's fine. Oh, good. Well, well, well. <sighs> weather getting worse? Yeah, would you mind not interrupting? <laughs> <laughs> Can I clear away an addition, Mr. Gill, please? Oh, uh, for heaven's sakes. Yes, Bertie, I'm finished. Uh, can I play with the chemistry set if I get Piggy to help me out? Can I? Oh, where can I go to... Can re- I huh, use the chemistry set if Piggy is with me? Leroy, I don't care what you do. Blow yourself to pieces, if you like, but don't bother me about it. I'm going upstairs. There. On any piece around here, you have to lock yourself in. Uh, now. Uh, Sealed with a kiss. Mmm, <laughs> smells good, too. My own dear Throckmorton, just a line to say thank you, thank you, thank you for your gorgeous Christmas present, but just arrived by air mail. Santa was very good to little Leela this year, but of all the presents I received, yours was the one I loved the most. How do you like that hooker, you old goat? How did you ever guess that passion flower is my favorite perfume? Oh, I just guessed. <laughs> I have been having a perfectly marvelous time here in Savannah with teas in my honor and eggnog parties and whatnot. Life has been just a round of dances, and I've met some of the most attractive men. Uh, but I do miss you terribly. The other night I had the sweetest dream about you. Yes, who's there? It's me, Mr. Gillsleeve, Bertie. What is it, Bertie? I'm sorry to disturb you, Mr. Gillsleeve, but the laundry man's here. This is clean sheet day. Can I get the sheets off your bed? Yeah, all right, Bertie. No privacy any place. Won't be but a minute, Mr. Gillsleeve, and I'll be right out of here. Uh, take your time. I'll go in here. Uh, just a minute before you do. Let me get the bath mat out of there. Yeah. Well, let it go. I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> oh, you won't be in my way, Mr. Gillsleeve. No, but you'll be in mine. I'll go downstairs. Uh, this house has as much privacy as a bus There's no room in the whole place Where there isn't somebody reading over your shoulder Well, I'll try the den I suppose there's a convention in here Ah, this is more like it yeah, Let's see now But I do miss you terribly The other night I had the sweetest dream about you Mama Moore, do you like me in navy blue? Huh? Uh, yes, it's all right with me. But you don't really like it. <coughs> well, if you say so, where was I now? I don't really think it does anything for me. Uh, the other night I had the sweetest dream. About... I say I don't think it does anything for me. Maybe you're right. You know, I've just about decided I never did like this suit from the day I bought it. What'd you buy it for, then? Uncle Mort, you're not looking at me. Young lady, I'm in my private den trying to read a letter. Well, you don't have to be so cross. I don't know what's come over you. You haven't been yourself lately. Not since Mrs. Ransom left. Well, Mrs. Ransom has nothing whatever to do with it. I'll thank you to keep her out of it. She'd merely like to be left alone with her for a few moments. I mean with her letter. Well, close your door. Nobody will bother you. Well, it's too late now. Where are you going? I'm going down in the cellar, where I hope to enjoy the privacy of the coal bin, if nobody has any objections. <laughs> Who left the light on down here? Oh, Leroy, what are you doing down here? This is my chemical laboratory. Uh, I'll give up. I'll go down to the office. <laughs> uh, oh, I beg your pardon. Why don't you watch where you're going? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was reading a letter. I didn't see it. Why don't you read your letters at home? Yeah, why don't I? I could tell you why, brother. Oh, well. She called me her own dear Throckmorton, and she sealed it with a kiss. Gildy! Hey, Gildy! Oh, hello, Judge. Did you live downtown? Uh, just as far as the barber shop, if you will, Judge. No trouble at all, Gildy. Climb in. Oh, well, this, this is really a pleasure, Judge. Pleasure's all mine. 
I stopped by your house just now, but Marjorie said you'd just left. Well, it was such a fine day, I just thought I'd walk down to the office today. Well, if you really want to walk, I can let you out. No, no, no. I've had enough. You can overdo a thing like this. <laughs> well, how have you been, Jack? Just fine, Gildy. Just fine. How have you been? Oh, fine. That's fine. Fine day, isn't it? Yes, fine. You're looking well. Never better. You look pretty chipper yourself. I can't complain. And you? There must be a way out of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, i got to get downtown and see a man who just came in from Washington. Oh, you mean that fellow from Donald Nelson's office, Brody? Yep. Sent for me to talk over some of the problems on the plant. It's going to be a great thing for Summerfield, Gildy. Yes, it is. You'll probably be wanting to see me sometime today. Well, here you are, Gildy. Oh, thanks very much, Judge. Oh, uh, by the way, Gildy. Uh, yes, Horace? Uh, heard from Leela Ransom since uh, she left? Why do you want to know? Oh, I'm just wondering. Well, don't. You're wasting your time. Yeah? What makes you think so? Because I had a letter from her this morning. Congratulations. So did I. Y you did? <laughs> yep. Gildy, maybe you could tell me something. What? What does S-W-A-K mean? Oh! <laughs> Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. We all make good resolutions on New Year's Day, so here's one for you good homemakers listening in. Resolve in 1943 to serve your families more of the highly nutritious foods, and at the same time to keep your food budget in line. Now, one of the foods that can be a big help in keeping that resolution is delicious, nourishing parquet margarine, the economical spread for bread made by Kraft. Yes, grand-tasting parquet margarine is a thrifty source of mighty important food elements. It's one of the best energy foods you can serve your family. What's more, every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A the year-round. So, you see, by using parquet margarine in your household, you can economize and feed your family better, too. Resolve today to get acquainted with delicious parquet margarine before the new year sets in. Tomorrow, when you shop... Ask for a pound or two of Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet, the margarine that's made by Kraft. Now let's return to the great Gildersleeve, whom we find a few minutes later reclining in a chair at the barber shop while Floyd does a little trimming of his mustache. Yeah, Floyd... Never let a woman get a hold on you. You're telling me. She'll lure you and trick you and make you wish you'd never been born. Brother, you're talking to a guy that married one. And I'm here to tell you, last week we went over to her family's house for Sunday dinner. Well, sir, from the time we started to the time we got back, all I hear from her is... Floyd, how... I'm in no mood for any domestic sagas just now. Do you mind? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Uh... Say, it's too bad you didn't get here a few minutes earlier. Why? I bet you'd give a lot to know who I just finished shaving right in this very chair where you are. Uh, who? Some fellow, I don't know his name, Brody, Brady, something like that. Government man. Keep it under your hat, but I hear he's right-hand man to Donald Nelson. Why keep it under your hat? It's all over the newspapers. It's in the indicator. Yeah, I haven't read it. Uh, tell me, what kind of a fellow is he? Oh, he's a smart apple. You can tell that the minute you shave him. He wasn't born yesterday. He's an ordnance expert, whatever that is. He knows all about guns and explosives. Yeah, well, anyway, he told me some things that if I was at liberty to reveal them, you wouldn't believe them. One thing... Do you know what he came out here for? Why, certainly. To get the rat trap company switched over to war production. Who told you? The, the indicator. Read it. It's all in there. Well, you can't believe everything you read in the newspapers. You can't believe everything you hear in barbershops either. Well, I'll tell you one thing I heard. I have it on good authority from this fellow Brody that the government may spend as much as a quarter of a million dollars on this plant. Who told you that? Well, I heard him tell Sparks, the power commissioner. Yep, a quarter of a million dollars. Just think of it. A quarter of a million that's more than I make here in a year. <laughs> Come on, get this thing off of me, Floyd. I've got to get to the office. If Brody's getting together with a power commissioner, he's probably been going crazy trying to get in touch with me. Oh, good morning, Miss Fitch. Good morning, Mr. Commissioner. Happy New Year to the main spring of the waterworks. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, Miss Fitch, have there been any important calls for me this morning? There was one, Mr. Commissioner, yes. Uh, I knew it. The printer called about your annual report. Uh, Should the binding be in blue or buff? What color is buff? Well, a buff is between a beige and a, a puce. Puce? 
Well, that's three colors I never heard of. <laughs> Tell them to make it blue. Yes, sir. Did I have any other call? Not this morning, Mr. Commissioner. Were you expecting someone else to call? Well, Miss Fitch, I'll leave it to you. Mr. Brody's in town from the WPB in Washington. You know, Donald Nelson's department. Yes. Oh, that Mr. Nelson. Oh, well, I'm glad to see you admire him, too. <laughs> yeah, but this fellow Brody's here to convert the trap factory into a munitions plant. He sent for the mayor. He sent for Hooker. He sent for Sparks, the power commissioner. Does he think he can run the place without water? Well, of course, the rat trap factory has always been one of our biggest subscribers. I know, but there isn't much water in the rat trap. <laughs> they may need twice as much water as they've been getting. They may You're even... right, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, yes. If... What's happened is that Brody's fallen into the hands of a few chiselers like Sparks and Hooker. They're trying to prevent him from seeing me. Why should they do that? Uh, stupidity, that's all. I'm going to call up Brody and set him right. I think you should. Uh, hand me the phone, please, Miss Fitch. Uh, what's the number of the Summerfield House? Uh, 3894. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, the trouble with these fellows from Washington. They don't understand local conditions. Come out here and get in with the wrong crowd. Summerfield House. Uh, Mr. Leonard P. Brody. Just a moment, please. Hello? Oh, uh, hello. Uh, this is Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, and I'm the water commissioner of this town. Yes, sir? I'd just like to warn you that you're playing politics with the wrong bunch, Mr. Brody. And if I... Huh? Wait a minute. I'm not Mr. Brody. I'm his assistant. Oh. Uh, Mr. Brody's gone out to look at the plant. Oh. Well, I'll call him back later. Uh, Brody's gone out to inspect the plant. At least that's what his assistant says. Hmm. Maybe I ought to run out there and see him, huh? we go over the problem right on the ground. That might be very helpful. Yes, yeah. uh... Water Department, Miss Fitch speaking. Mr. Gillsleeve there? I'll see. Uh, who is it, please? Tell him this is Bertie, and you better come quick. Something terrible has happened. Uh, just a minute. Mr. Commissioner, you're cook. Huh? She says something has happened. Oh. Hello? What is it, Bertie? What is it? Oh, Mr. Gillsleeve, you better come down here right away, and don't let no grass grow. Yeah. I can't, Bertie. Can't you tell me what's the matter? No, sir, I can't explain it, but you better hurry home. But I can't do that. I've got an appointment with an important man about a new explosives factory. Well, you better come, because we've got an explosive factory right here. It... <laughs> what? Leroy's gone and cooked up a batch of TNT or something, and it looks like it's going to go off any minute. Oh, my goodness. Keep calm, Bertie. Don't let it go off till I get there. <laughs> What is this Bertie tells me? It wasn't my fault, Unc. I didn't mean to do it, honest. Didn't mean to do what? Piggy made me do it. He dared me. He didn't tell me till after I did it. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Get a hold of yourself, young man. What is it that you did? I made a bottle of nitroglycerin. Nonsense. You can't make nitroglycerin with a 4B chemistry set? Can you? Well, that's what Piggy said. He said it'd blow us all up. Where's Piggy? He beat it. He beat it the minute I did it. He was scared. Oh. Well, uh, where is the stuff? That's it, right there on the table. That? Why, that looks like nothing but water. Don't do it! No, don't do that, Bertie. <laughs> don't touch it, Mr. Gillespie. It's bad luck to touch nitroglycerine. Uh, bad luck, nitroglycerine. Come, come. <laughs> Let's keep our wits now, folks. Uh, uh, what did you make this out of, young man? I don't know, Unc. There were two things, and I just poured one into the other like he told me. Piggy did. He made me do it. Oh, uh, well, let's be sensible about this. Uh, Leroy, you get the dictionary. Uh, let me see. Who would know about such things? Uh, Bertie, you go and phone Mr. Peavy down at the drugstore. Ask him if he'd be kind enough to drop over here. Uh, shall I tell him to... Tell him nothing. Just ask him if he'd mind dropping over, that's all. Yes, sir, I'll do that. Here's the dictionary, Uncle. Uh, quit shaking, Leroy. Quit shaking. Now, let's see. Uh, probably just a lot of nonsense. Here we are. Nitroglycerin. A colorless, heavy, oily liquid. Well, it's that, all right. Of a highly explosive quality. Good. A pain... <laughs> By mixing nitric and sulfuric acids. That's what it was. Nitric and sulfuric. Those were the things. Wait a minute. It explodes by percussion. What does that mean? The least little jar will set it off. Uncle, let's get out of here. It's not a bad idea. Mr. Peavy's coming right over, Mr. Gill. Peavy, what we need is a bomb squad. Leroy, you run out and get a cop just as fast as you can go. A cop? Okay, I'll... No! Oh! <laughs> Thank goodness you've come, Peavy. What can I do for you, Mr. Gildersleeve? Is there sickness in the house? Not yet. <laughs> now, you're a druggist, Peavy. You know all about chemistry. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> We've got a little chemical problem here. I gave my nephew a chemistry set for Christmas, and I'm afraid the boy has gotten a little over his death. In fact, he appears to have made a quantity of nitroglycerin. 
<laughs> well, Mr. Gildersleeve, boys will be boys. <laughs> yeah. But there's the stuff in that little bottle there. You think there's enough of it to do much damage? Well, if it's nitroglycerin, yes. I'd say that it would easily blow out all the walls of the house and probably kill all of us at the same time. Uh, Break all the windows, too. Yep. <laughs> That is, if it's uh, nitroglycerin. Yes. yes. Well, I ain't staying around to find out. I'm getting out of this house. Uh, Don't slam the door, Bertie. Not me. I'm going out on my hands and knees praying. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, go away. Go away, Aesop. Give the cat a boot if he bothers you, Peavy. That's all right, Mr. Gildersleeve. I like cats. I find that cats generally like me, too. So does Mrs. Peavy. Yes. No time to be standing around admiring cats, Peavy. What are we going to do about that darn bottle? How are we going to get rid of it? Well, it does present a problem. Yeah. It... Aesop, Aesop, get down off of there. Aesop, get away from that bottle. Oh, he seems to like that nitroglycerin. Aesop! Uh, nice, Aesop. <laughs> He's rubbing up against it. If he knocks that thing over, good night. Uh, kitty, 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 kitty. Uh, a saucer of milk might be effective. Uh, yes. Uh, Bertie! Uh, Bertie, bring us a saucer of milk, quickly. I can't hear you, Mr. Kim, please. Besides, we ain't got no milk. <laughs> <laughs> well, a plate of sardines might be good. Oh. Oh, look what he's doing now. He's licking the bottle where it ran down the outside. Uh, uh, kitty, 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 kitty. Kitty, kitty. Uh, here, Aesop. Uh, nice, Aesop. Look at that. He's crazy about that stuff. Hey, come on, boy. Come on. That's it. Come, 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 come. There, you see, Peavy, he likes me. Come on, Aesop, old fellow. Yes. That's a nice Aesop. No, I don't know that I'd pat that cat if I were you. Why not? He's loaded. <laughs> uh, go away, Aesop. Go away. Go away, scat. Get him off of me, somebody. Here's the chief of police, Unc. Oh, Chief Gates, am I glad to see you. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Did you send this boy out with a cock and bull story about TNT or something? Nitroglycerin. There it is, right on the table there. How do you know it's nitroglycerin? Yeah, how do you know it isn't? Well, that's a point. Let's have a look at it. Don't touch it. Don't shout. The slab will go off. It... <laughs> I thought you said it wasn't nitroglycerin. Well, you've got me nervous now. All right. Now, how do we decide whether it is or whether it isn't? I don't rightly know. This kind of a job calls for a bomb squad. We've got no bomb squad. Hey, wait a minute. What? There's a fellow in town from Washington who's supposed to be an ordnance expert. Uh, oh, you mean Brody. That's the fellow. Come on, we'll take this stuff down to his hotel and show it to him. I've been trying to see Brody all day. He'll see me. Come on. All right. I'll carry the cat. You carry the bottle, Chief. You've got rubber heels. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, what is it, officer? Oh, who are all these people? I'm uh, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, Mr. Brody. I'm the water commissioner of Summerfield, and I've been trying to get in touch with you all day. I just wanted to assure you of my uh, cooperation. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, my assistant told me you phoned. Uh, We've got a problem for you, Mr. Brody. Mr. Mm. Gildersleeve's nephew here thinks he made some nitroglycerin. Is that so? Yeah, but I didn't mean to do it. Well, let's have a look at it before you start worrying about it. Here it is in the bottle. Well, there isn't enough here to do any real harm, even if it were nitroglycerin. Yeah, we'll have a look at it. Nitroglycerin. (laughs) (laughs) You mean it isn't, huh? Well, if it were nitroglycerin, I wouldn't dare do this with it. Here, catch. Hey! Oh! Oh, well, it was a two-pants suit anyway.
diary. Quite a day, quite a day. And tomorrow will be another. I've got to go to Wistful Vista to see about some business interests I've got there. A little tax matter. <laughs> oh, well, a trip will do me good. Help to take my mind off Leela and give me a chance to use that new military brush set I got for Christmas. I'll arrive in Wistful Vista on Tuesday, and I'll be there over New Year's. That means I'll be spending New Year's Eve with my little chums, Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to spend it. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance be forgot and days in wistful vista? <laughs> Good night, Diary. Good night, everybody, and Happy New Year. program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. Your favorite motion picture theater will soon be showing The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry. We hope you'll see it. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the makers of Kraft Cheese and inviting you to tune in again next week for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. Ladies, be good. To yourselves, I mean. Don't worry about what to have to dinner after a busy afternoon. Just open a package of that wonderful food product called Kraft Dinner, and in a very few minutes, you'll have delicious macaroni and cheese all ready to serve. Yes, in just seven minutes cooking time, you can make that favorite American dish, macaroni and cheese, if you make it with Kraft Dinner. Because the macaroni in a package of Kraft Dinner is a very special kind, it cooks up fluffy and tender in just seven minutes. And also in the package of Kraft Dinner is some Kraft Grated. You sprinkle this Kraft grated on the macaroni, stirring its mild cheese flavor through and through. That's all. Your Kraft dinner is ready. Now, ladies, because of the great demand for economical, nutritious Kraft dinner, your dealer may be out of it if you wait until Saturday to order. Help him keep stocked by ordering early in the week. You ask for Kraft dinner. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Meantime, let me tell you what a friend told me the other day. She said, we tried spreading parquet margarine on our bread for the first time last week, and we were certainly surprised why it's really delicious. Well, I don't know why anyone should be surprised that parquet margarine tastes so good, because parquet margarine is made by Kraft. Yes, and made to be just as good tasting and nutritious as all of Kraft's fine foods. Parquet's flavor is delicate and appetizing, just right for a really satisfying spread for bread. What's more, parquet margarine adds important food values to meals. It's an excellent energy food, one of the best you can serve. And besides, every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. Yes, parquet margarine is both nutritious and delicious, and it's wonderfully economical, too. So why not treat your family to parquet margarine tomorrow? Just ask your food dealer for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Well, morning, Wally. Hello there. Oh, hello, Judge. Didn't recognize you in the earmuffs. You're up bright and early, meeting somebody? Yep. I'm meeting a certain someone. Yeah, I figured you were. So you got some flowers. Just open up here and I'll build a fire in the stove. Come on inside and wait. Wally, I think I hear the flyer. 
Yep. Here she comes. Here she comes. By golly, here she comes. What's the matter, Judge? You're as nervous as a bridegroom. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, Wally, you're not far wrong. Between you and me, I got the ring right here in my pocket. Well, I didn't know you was considering taking the plunge, Judge. Who's the lucky lady? You will see. She'll be getting off here in a minute. And by the way, it hasn't actually been announced yet, so don't say anything, will you? Oh, not me. Especially to any Summerfield people. Oh, not a word. Uh, local girl, Judge? What's she like? Well, Wally, she's about as big as a minute and the cutest little thing you ever did see. <laughs> Got a telegram from her last night. Yeah? <laughs> yep. <laughs> see? She says, arrive Moore's Junction, 6-2 tomorrow morning. Can't wait to see you. Sign, guess who? Cute, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's a woman always keep you guessing. <laughs> Ever been in love, Wally? Well, yes, now you mention it. <laughs> but here comes 54. I better drag up that baggage truck. She's coming. She's coming. <laughs> Getting off to you. Don't be in there, Judge. The porter's putting some bags off. <laughs> that must be her. Leela! Leela! Ooh! Hello there, Judge. Gildersleeve. Nice of you to meet me, Judge. I see you got my wire. Yeah. <laughs> Judge, I Did you find your party, Judge? Yes, Gildersleeve. Well, I hope you two will be very happy together. <laughs> Yes, sir, I certainly appreciate your driving all the way over here to meet me, Horace. And I want to tell you, it's great to be back. I say, it's great to be back. Cap got your tongue? You tricked me, Gildersleeve, and you know it. Why, Judge, how can you say that? There's not an ounce of trickery in my entire nature. <laughs> Listen, we might as well come right out in the open. Leela's arriving sometime today, and I'm serving notice right now that I intend to make her my wife at the earliest opportunity. Well, now, I may have something to say about that, Horace. I'd like to see you try. You will, Judge, you will. That's no reason we can't be friends, is it? Come on, what do you say, Judge? May the best man win. No. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the ride. You're welcome. Sorry you won't come in to breakfast. Certainly I'll come in to breakfast. Yeah. Why didn't you say so? Why didn't you ask me? Well, come on, then. I'm coming. Wait a minute. What about my bags? Well, what about them? All right, then give them to me. Hiya! All right, come here! Well, hello there, young fella. Hiya! How was the trip? Can I get a job, Unc? Yeah, wait a minute. Hey, I'm an A and Civic. Piggy and I are building a Jeep. Guess what? The cat's been gone three days. Can I, Unc? Can you what? Get a job. One thing at a time, Leroy. Well, the Lord! Why didn't you tell us you were coming? I'd have driven over to get you. Well, I knew the judge would never forgive me if I didn't let him do it. Uh, judge? Good morning, Marjorie. Good morning, Judge. You'll have breakfast with us, won't you? I should be delighted. <laughs> Good. Come on in, everybody. Brady, company for breakfast. Mr. Gildersleeve, my goodness, I'm glad you're back. Things have been happening around here. Oh, have they, Bertie? Yeah, let me take you things. Uh, thank you. Did they feed you down there and whistle this to Miss Gildersleeve? Oh, like a king. I don't know a finer cook than Molly McGee. Hmm. Seems to me you're looking a little piggy. <laughs> well, she's not in the class with you, of course, Bertie. But uh, who is? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. What would you like for breakfast? We got oatmeal, we got ham and eggs, we got kidneys on toast, we got hot cakes, we got English muffins, we got sausage. That'll be fine. <laughs> Do you think you could scare up an extra prune for Judge Hooker here? <laughs> a cup of hot water? Oh, no, sir. I know what the judge is like. Don't I, Judge? Well, hurry up, Bertie. I've got to get to the office. Hey, come on in and sit down, Judge. You can gnaw on a banana until she gets things ready. <laughs> Perhaps I should explain, my dear, that the, the judge isn't speaking to anyone this morning. He's mad at the world. Oh, no. Marjorie? I hope I may consider myself your guest while I'm here. Of course you may. Thank you. Got up too early. That's what's the matter with him. Ask your uncle who got me up. <laughs> now, Uncle Moore, don't tease the judge. You haven't heard the news. The uh, news? What news? I've got a job. Hey, Uncle, can I get one? Can I get a job? Wait a minute. If, what kind of a job is it, my dear? A war job. I'm going to work in the new arms factory. In a factory? Yes, well, aren't you pleased? Well, I don't know, my dear. I think I might have been consulted about this. But you weren't here. And everybody's doing it. That's still no reason. Marjorie, I think you're taking a war job as a fine thing. 
And any man with the slightest spark of patriotism would applaud it. Look here, Hooker. Are you questioning my patriotism? All I say is, woman's place is in the home. You will sometimes hear it said, Marjorie, by persons of low intellect... Yes, sir. ...that woman's place is in the home. When you do, ask them what woman's place is going to be if we don't defend our homes. Listen, Hooker, address your remarks to me. It might be of interest, Marjorie, to ask your simple-minded uncle if he knows what a shortage of manpower there is in this town. Hooker, you can't come into my house, eat my food, and ignore me. You talk to me! (laughs) The facts are there. They are very simple. A child could grasp them, Marjorie. But with your uncle... It may take some explaining. Yeah, you old goat. <laughs> it comes down to this. The factory's going to require three times as many workers as we've got. We can't bring them in from outside because we haven't got houses for them. So what's the answer? We've got to man the factory with people living in Summerfield who haven't now got war jobs. And that means mostly women. That's true, I guess. Anyway, I can't think of a finer job for a woman than backing up the men at the front. And that's why I went out and got this job. You're right, Marjorie, and I'm proud of you for doing it. You're proud of her? Who are you to be proud of her? She's my niece. I'm proud of her. But you just said that woman's place... Don't you be putting words in my mouth, Hooker. (laughs) And don't give me any of your talk about woman's place being in the home. In my opinion, it's the duty of every person in this country to go out and get a war job. Man or woman, young or old, black or white. Bertie? Yes, Mr. Gill, please. Uh, how's my breakfast coming? <laughs> the great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. I'm sure you mothers and housewives have noticed that when you cook or bake something especially good for your family, it disappears mighty fast. Well, the same thing often happens to a food product that's exceptionally good. And that explains why your food dealer may sometimes be temporarily out of parquet margarine, Kraft's delicious spread for bread. Of course, Kraft is doing everything possible to keep dealers supplied. But these days, so many people prefer parquet margarine that some dealers just can't keep up with the demand. Now, I don't mean to say that you can't get parquet margarine. Likely as not, most of the time you can. But it is wise to watch your dealer's stocks and buy parquet whenever he has a supply. Remember, parquet is an excellent energy food and a reliable year-round source of vitamin A. So it's good advice to always watch for and always ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Uh, Good evening, my dear. Oh, anything wrong? Not a thing, Uncle Mort. Just a pleasant, healthy fatigue. Fatigue? Oh, oh, fatigue. My new job is going to be lots of work, but I love it. Yes, that confounded war. Is Mrs. Ransom home yet? How on earth would I know? Well, you might have seen her come in. Well, I'll just make sure. Operator? One, two, oh, oh. (laughs) That woman. Even her phone number is provocative. What's that, my dear? I say even Mrs. Ransom's phone number is cute. Oh, Everything about her is cute. Oh, you think so, huh? <laughs> well, oh dear, I guess she's not home yet. Uncle Moy, why all this sudden excitement over whether Mrs. Ransom's home or not? Why, there's no excitement, my dear, just a neighborly interest. Are you certain? Yes. At least I think it is. Uncle Throckmorton. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well. Yes, Marjorie, you've guessed something. What do you think about it? Well, honestly, I suppose I should have seen it coming. My dear, one never knows when love is coming or where it's going. (laughs) Uncle Mort, just how far has this particular love affair gone? I'm going to marry Leela Ransom if Hooker doesn't beat me to it, the old goat. You really mean this? Yes, my dear. While I was away, I realized how much she meant to me. I just can't live without her. Poor Uncle Mort. Why do you say that? Don't you think I'll get her? Of course you'll get her. But what's the matter with her? Nothing's the matter with her. If she's the one you want, then nothing's the matter with her. Well, I'm glad you feel that way. I think she's a lovely woman. <laughs> Wait a minute. Who's that coming up the street now? Oh, Leroy. Uh, Leroy. <laughs> Are you going to tell him? 
Uh, I'd like to tell him by mail. Excuse me, excuse me. Oh, what is it, Bertie? Do you mind if we have supper a half hour early tonight? Well, I suppose it's all right. Uh, uh, what are we having, anyway? Well, it's the kind of a meal you don't want to wait too long for. What do you mean? Well, it ain't the kind of meal you want to eat a whole lot of. Bertie, what are we having? Stuffed peppers. Yes, sir. <laughs> Bertie, you know my feeling about stuffed peppers. Why are we having them? Well, partly because I couldn't get nothing else, and partly because I have my first aid class tonight. Oh, you too, huh? Well, in that case, I suppose I can't complain. Bertie, we've got news for you. Who's that, Miss Marjorie? Uh, Uncle Mort's going to get married. What? That's right, Bertie. I'm going to marry Mrs. Ransom. Oh, this is me, Bertie! Bertie, don't take it like that. Bertie, why are you crying? Hey, what's the matter with her? Yeah, come here, my boy. I have something important to discuss with you. Uh-oh. Gosh, I've been pretty good the last few days. This has nothing to do with your behavior, Leroy. It hasn't, and I can stand anything. Shoot the bunk to me, Unc. <laughs> this is a serious matter, young man. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there uh, comes a time in every man's life, sooner or later, when he... He... That is, uh... It's one of nature's laws that a man should not want to live alone. Er, he should cleave unto another. Uh, Uncle Mort, have you got mixed up with some dame? <laughs> Leroy, I'm trying to tell you of my approaching marriage. Marriage? Yes, my boy. I'm about to risk the sweetest adventure life offers any man. I'm going to embark on the long, happy voyage that makes two people one. Are you kidding? Leroy! <laughs> Yes, he ain't. Leroy. <laughs> Uncle Lord is going to ask Mrs. Ransom to marry him. Mrs. Ransom? Yes. <laughs> I find that whistle intensely objectionable, young man. Sorry, Uncle. I didn't mean anything by it. Uh, see that you don't. Mrs. Ransom is a sweet, lovely woman, and I intend to make her my very own. Well, she's going to be your very own. What's she doing in Judge Hooker's car? Uh, Look out the window. Uh, Hooker? Where? By George, it's true. You must have found out what train she was coming in on. The dirty snake. she got a new hat. She has? Yes, remember to tell her. I will. Judge seems to be having trouble carrying all her suitcases. Good. Well, I'm not going to help him. I'll wait till he's gone. Then you go over and give her the business. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the way to describe my proposal. Judge Hooker's going in the house with her. What if she agrees to marry him right now? Oh, you think she might? No, nah, the judge hasn't got a chance against Uncle Morse. Oh, thank you, Leroy. Well, anyway, I'll give Hooker five minutes. And the minute he leaves, I'm going right over and pop the question. Now, Uncle Mort, you can't just tear over there and do it like borrowing an egg. Uh, no? No, you must feel it as something important. Call her up and ask her if you can see her after dinner. And put on your new suit, your best tie, a dash of cologne on your handkerchief. Bingo! You're right, my dear. <laughs> this must be handled like a major campaign. How much time till supper? Half an hour. Why, where are you going? After that dash of cologne. Hello, Mr. Gildersby. Hello, hello, Peavy. Peavy, I want to get some cologne. Cologne? Cologne, let me see. You want some cologne? Yes. You, uh, you uh, wouldn't want some bay rum? No. No, you want some cologne. Mm, uh, is this for yourself, Mr. Gildersleeve, or for a friend? For myself. Have you got any, or haven't you? No, Mr. Gildersleeve, I haven't. Then what do you care who it's for? Well, I'd just like to know. Just, uh, <laughs> what have you got that smells nice, Peavy? I want to make an impression on a lady. Any particular lady? Yes, a particular lady, but I'm not saying who. Oh, it's a little indefinite. Then give me something with an indefinite scent. That's all I'm going to tell you. Well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Gildersleeve, the holidays have just about cleaned me out. Uh, However, I have one item here that hasn't gone too well. What's that? And it comes in a rather attractive package, too. Yes, but what is it? No, it's a, a bubble bath. A bubble bath. <laughs> what in the world would I do with a bubble bath? Well, it smells nice. It has a sort of an odor of the pine woods. I don't want to come out of a bath smelling like a moose. <laughs> How does this stuff work? Well, it makes a rather extraordinary amount of lather, Mr. Gildersleeve. I understand that the bubbles fill the average bathtub right up to the rim. PV, I don't have any trouble filling a bathtub. <laughs> Is this stuff good for anything? Well, I don't make any claims for it myself, but 
Some people say it has reducing properties. Are you insinuating that I'm overweight? Oh, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I'm not interested in altering my figure, Peavy. I simply wish to give an illusion. With the proper help, any man can appear youthful and sprightly. Oh, no, I wouldn't say that either. <laughs> If you haven't anything better to offer than this bubble gum, Peavy, I'd better try somewhere else. Now, just a minute, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well? If you want to make a favorable impression on a lady, why not take her a tasteful gift? A gift? Oh, it's pretty soon after Christmas, but that might be an idea. How about some candy? If Mr. Gildersleeve, I have an ounce of candy left in the house. Oh, well, how about a book? Have you got a nice light novel on your shelf? Something uh, Frenchy, perhaps? Yes. No, all our fiction was cleaned out in the Christmas rush. Yeah. Uh... I have got a useful work on business law, but uh, frankly, it wouldn't make much of a gift. Yes, yes. Well, maybe something like a nice cigarette lighter, then. Well, the only lighter I have left is broken, Mr. Gildersleeve. I wouldn't want to sell it to you. Oh, for goodness sake, Peavy, the gift was your idea. You make a suggestion. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, how about a nice package of bubble bath? Uh, who's that? Oh, that's funny. I could swear I heard somebody knock. <laughs> I declare you just about frightened me to death, you silly boy. Come in, won't you? Uh, I brought you some roses, Leela. For me? Why, I think that's the sweetest thing. Uh. Oh, they're lovely roses. What is it about me, I wonder, that makes everybody think of roses? A dozen of them, too. I know. I'll put them in with the ones Judge Hooker brought me, and that'll make three dozen. Yes. <laughs> three? Oh, the old goat's been throwing his money around, eh? <laughs> Come and help me arrange them, sophomore. Well, I'm not very good at arranging flowers, I'm afraid. Oh, gracious, what mine is. I just want you to admire them, that's all. You're the one I admire, Leela. Uh, I think they look pretty here on the piano, don't you? You look prettier. Why, Mr. Gildersleeve, I declare if I didn't know better, I'd think you were from the South paying me such pretty compliments and all. Uh, Leela. Uh, tell me, how was your trip? Leela, let's not talk about my trip. Let's talk about you. Oh, goodness, what is there to talk about? I can think of much more fascinating things than mine. Tell me about the new factory. Judge Hooker wrote me... Forget the factory and forget Judge Hooker. He was over here this afternoon, wasn't he? Wasn't he? Gracious, if you're going to be jealous of every man who happens to propose to me... What did you tell him, Leela? That truck, Martin, is entirely between me and the judge. Uh, I'll give you a hint, though. Uh, if I if I were engaged to him, I'd be wearing his ring, wouldn't I? Yeah. <laughs> Leela, what would you say if I stole a kiss? Oh no, you don't. Oh yes, I will. Oh, no, you don't. Oh yes, I will. Oh my goodness, look at what I've done. That's all right, truck, Martin. <laughs> It's just an old lamp that belonged to my great-grandmother, Chesterfield. <laughs> well, I'm terribly sorry, Leela. I'm just a clumsy ox. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, oh I am. I've got you cornered. Well, just because I don't happen to be engaged at the moment, Mr. Gildersleeve, doesn't mean you have the right to take liberties. Well... Uh. Play something, Leela. No, I, I'm not in the mood right now. Oh, please, play something for me. If I sing... Well, what shall I play? I know. Uh, just a little love, a little kiss. Oh, I don't know that very well. I'm afraid I couldn't play it without the music. Well, what do you know? Here's the music. I found it right in my inside pocket. <laughs> Isn't that lucky? Oh, dear, I hope I can play this. And now you send the pages, Throckmorton. All right. Just a little love, a little kiss. Just an hour that holds a world of bliss. Eyes that tremble like I would give you all my life 
por ti. As I hold you fast and bend above you, and I hear you whispering. That isn't just a song. That's the way I feel, Leela. Oh, Strachmorton, I always dreamed that someday it would be like this. And now I'm afraid I've spoiled it. Uh Uh-huh. How could anything spoil it? I've gone and done something. What? Maybe it was reckless of me, but I want you to be the first to know. What have you done? I'm sure I don't know what my poor mother would say if she were alive. It's not at all ladylike. What is it? It just came over me and... I had to do it. Leela, what is it? What have you done? Throckmorton, could you still love me if I was operating a drill press? Huh? Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Ken Carpenter speaking to the makers of Kraft Cheese and inviting you to tune in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. You lovers of macaroni and cheese will get a thrill out of the new-fashioned way of making this grand dish with Kraft Dinner. A package of Kraft Dinner contains special macaroni which cooks up fluffy and tender in just seven minutes. And the Kraft Dinner package also contains some Kraft Grated, which supplies the grand cheese flavor. You just boil the Kraft Dinner macaroni for seven minutes, drain it, and stir in the Kraft Grated. Your macaroni and cheese is ready to serve. Now, because Kraft Dinner is so simple to make, so good, and so economical, it has become tremendously popular throughout the country. So popular, in fact, that sometime a dealer's supply is exhausted by the end of the week. You can help your dealer and yourself, too, by ordering Kraft Dinner early in the week. Then you'll have it on the pantry shelf, ready for grand macaroni and cheese you cook in seven minutes. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents the Great Gildersleeve. (laughs) Yeah. Cheese Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, a few homemakers listening in are on the lookout for foods that are low in red ration point cost and yet high in food value. Let me suggest Parquet, the delicious, nourishing margarine made by Kraft. For parquet costs just five red ration points per pound. It's one of the very best energy foods you can serve. And, of course, parquet is an excellent year-round source of vitamin A. It's mighty important, too, that parquet margarine has a delicate appetizing flavor that'll perk up family appetites in many ways. Yes, parquet is a wonderfully good-tasting spread for bread and toast and piping hot rolls and a fine seasoning for hot cooked vegetables. What's more, it's a real flavor shortening for your home baking, and it's grand for pan frying, too. So for outstanding flavor, for good nutrition, and for point value and cash economy, ask your dealer tomorrow for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft, just five red ration points per pound. the second week in May, and May is when Summerfield really comes into bloom. But while others take their ease, Summerfield's fighting water commissioner girds himself for a Saturday morning of busy accomplishment at the office. Uh, got to be going, got to be going. Let's see. Briefcase, I've got it. Handkerchief in my pocket. Hat on my head. Goodbye, Bertie. Bye, Miss Gillespie. One side there, Leroy. So long, Uncle. Don't let anybody put anything over on you. When did anybody ever put anything over on me? Are you kidding? Yes. Oh, uh, Mr. Gillespie. Yes, Bertie. Are you going to be home for lunch today? No, Bertie, I'm afraid not. Busy day ahead. Will that upset your plans? Oh, no, so that means we can have a 16-point dinner. Yes. Yeah. Well, well. Uh, Leroy. 
you know something? What, Unc? I do believe this grass is getting long enough to mow. Oh, now, Unc. Get the jump on it, my boy. It's the only way. Never let it get ahead of you. Gosh, you're liable to stunt its growth if you cut it now. Just, just once over lightly with a lawnmower, Leroy. It won't do the grass a bit of harm. It'll do you a lot of good. I'd mow it myself if I weren't so busy. Yeah. Hi, Mrs. Ransom. Oh, hello, Leela. Leroy, stick in your shirt tail. You look disgusting. Throckmorton, you're not leaving. Uh, well, yes, I was. I was just on my way to the office, Leela. Busy day. But what about your promise? Your uh, promise? You were going to go over the list of wedding invitations with me, who we were going to send them to and all. Oh, so I was. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, Leela. You just decide. Anything you decide is all right with me. But aren't you interested in who comes to our wedding, Throckmorton? Well, of course, Leela. I'm very interested. It's just that I've got a lot of important things to do down at the office. Is anything more important than our wedding? Watch it, Unc. It's a booby trap. <laughs> Leroy, I think we can dispense with your presence now. Yes, run along, Leroy, and play with some of your little friends. What a character. Uh, now, come and sit down on the porch with me, Throckmorton. It won't take long. Yes, but Leela... We've been putting it off and putting it off, but we've just got to tend to it now. We've got to order the invitations, and engraving takes time. Sit down beside me. I don't know anything about these things, Leela. Well, I've made up a sort of a tentative list here. Now, first, there's my great aunt Elizabeth. Oh, before I forget it, put down the McGee's. Fibber and Molly. I'll be sure to have that. Well, let's discuss that later. We can't just invite everybody, you know. It's a small church. Well, Fibber McGee is a small man. <laughs> well, we'll get to them. But my great aunt Elizabeth, we've got to invite her because when Beauregard and I were married, she sent us a chafing dish. We can't use more than one chafing dish. Oh, silly. And there's George William Hungerford. He's a sort of a cousin of Beauregard's. You know, it was the most awful thing. Beauregard and I never thought to invite George William, and he sent us a dozen hind-painted service plates with pheasants on them. I know Beauregard would never forgive me if I didn't invite him this time. Well, we want Beauregard to rest easy. Send George William a pass. <laughs> Well, then there's Aunt Ellen, Uncle Chase, and I thought I'd kind of like to invite poor little old Darwin Shaw. Well, aren't you going to ask me about Darwin? What about Darwin? Well, poor Darwin. He was terribly in love with me at the time I got engaged to Beauregard. There was a sort of a misunderstanding, and somehow he got the idea that I was engaged to him. Oh, it was terribly embarrassing. He threatened to shoot himself if I married anybody else, but he didn't. He's in real estate. <laughs> and still hasn't shot himself? Oh, no, he's doing real well, they tell me, but he's never married. I thought it would be nice if we invited him. Oh, yeah, invite him and tell him to bring his six-shooter, Leela. <laughs> and then, of course, we've got to invite Beauregard's mother. Listen, Beauregard had his wedding. What about my friends, Leela? I have a few friends, you know. Of course, Throckmorton. That's why I wanted you to go over the list with me. Now, who would you like to invite? Well, there's Fibber McGee and Molly. Yes, you mentioned them. Who else? The McGees live next door to me, you know, on Wistful Vista. Yes, yes, I know. Who else, Throckmorton? McGee. McGee. Well, there's the McGees. <laughs> I can't give you the whole list now, Leela. Look, it's late. I've got to get down to the office. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go over the whole thing with you this afternoon. Well, do you promise? Promise. Cross your heart? Cross my heart. I do it right now, but I've got a million things on my mind. Uh, Throckmorton? Yes, Leela? Aren't you forgetting something? Uh, my briefcase. Oh, no. Not your briefcase. No? What then? Well, I never had to remind Beauregard when he went off to the office. Uh oh. <laughs> Goodbye, honey. <laughs> That's better. Beauregard. <laughs> Let's see now. Hardly know where to begin here. Oh, here's a letter. Dear Mr. Gildersleeve, it has recently come to our attention that you're about to embark upon the happy venture of matrimony. Allow us to be the first to congratulate you on this important step in life. Well, have to send them an invitation. As a man of foresight, we know that you will want to look to the future, and when the time comes that we may supply you, what is this? Faithfully yours, Summerfield Dighty Service. Oh, <laughs> Uh, what else have we got here? Uh, here's another one. Dear Mr. Gildersleeve, 
You call yourself a water commissioner? Oh, my goodness. All right, Gildy, we're closing up here now. Come on. Oh, hello, Judge. Dr. Pettibone, how are you, Doc? Get your hat, Gildersleeve. You're coming with us. What do you mean? Have you forgotten what day this is? No, it's Saturday. Well, it's also opening day at the club. By George, so it is, Horace. Opening day. Come on, we got our golf clubs in the car. We'll stop the house, pick up yours. Pars will meet us out at the club. Oh, gee, I'd like to, fellas, but I can't. Not today. What do you mean you can't? Sure, they can't open the golf season without us. The old foursome, you know that. I know, fellas, but you better just go along without me. Nonsense. You want to get out in that old course and get some fresh air. Doctor's orders, Gildy. Gosh, I'd like to, but I can't. I've got important things to do. What have you got to do that's so important? Well, things. Besides, I promised. Promised who? Leela. Uh-oh. I promised her I'd help her with a list of invitations for the wedding. Gildersleeve, don't tell me she's got you tied to her apron strings already. I guess we know who's going to wear the slacks in that family. <laughs> no, see here, Hooker. Alas, poor Gildersleeve, I knew him well. Another good man gone wrong. Well, come on, Judge. I guess we'll just have to find somebody else. I'm sorry, Gildy, old man. We're going to miss you out there. Lovely day, too. Gee, I'd like to, fellows. You know that dog leg hole you always had trouble with? Well, they straightened it out now. They say you can drive the green in one if you're lucky. I only mention it in passing. Uh, now, don't urge him, Doc. Don't urge him. Maybe Gildy's doing the wise thing. After all, he's getting on in years. Who is? Perhaps he knows best. If he's reached the time of life when he feels he ought to settle down and just spend his declining years puttering around the house, I think we should let him. Listen, you old goat, I'll give you two strokes a hole and beat the pants off you. Well, come on, then. What are we waiting for? Well, boys, all even up to the 18th green. Pretty close match, I'd say. Yeah, if it hadn't been for Gildersleeve's hole-in-one, we'd have beat you long ago. Lucky stiff. Yeah, don't call it luck, Judgey. I was just trying to make a hole-in-one, you know. <laughs> Would you mind not laughing when I'm about to putt Gildersleeve? Oh, sorry, Powers. Uh, go right ahead. Thank you. That's a beauty, partner. You're surely down in five. Never mind the gab, Judge. Go ahead and shoot. I'll shoot all right. It's a very difficult putt. Nothing to it, Judgey. Just relax. That's the secret. Gildersleeve, if you don't behave, I won't print your hole-in-one in the paper. All right, Powers. You can't take a little joke. Yes, shoot, Judge. Good shot, Hooker. You're sure of a five yourself. Go ahead, Pettibone. Thank you. Say, it almost went in. Concede your five, Doc. Thanks. Looks like we'll have to play some extra holes. Not if I sink my putt, Judge. If I sink this, we win. Oh, don't be silly. That's an 18-footer. If I can sink him from 120 yards, I can sink him from 18 feet. <laughs> Every shot a little gem, fellas. Stand back, everybody. Quiet. Nobody's making a sound. I want it quiet anyway. <laughs> now, watch this. Gildersleeve, don't get fancy. This is no time to try a one-handed putt. Oh, that's one of my specialties, Doc. Look. Every shot... A little gem. Yeah. <laughs> Pay off, boys. Pay off. Uh, nice hot shower. That's the best part of the game. We were sailing along. Oh, that's terrible. Cheer up, Judge. It'll be your turn to win someday. That's right, Judge. Next time I'll be your partner. Oh, the oh, forget it, Powers. Come on, let's sing. Yeah. We were sailing along on a moonlight day. We could hear the voices singing. They seem to say. They seem to say. You have stolen my heart. Now don't go away. Except for you, Judge. I think your throat has burned out a berry. <laughs> that reminds me, the Cokes are on the winner. Huh? Oh, Eddie. Phil. Ah, oh, those dogs on boys. Awesome. Oh, Eddie, get the drinks ready and give Mr. Gildersleeve the check. Yes, sir. Oh. Well, fellas, here comes the old cold finish. Hang on to your hats now, boys. Oh. <laughs> 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 
Uh, give me a towel, somebody. Gildersleeve, I can see you put on a little weight. Huh? And once more, I can see where you put it. <laughs> well, you're my doctor, Pettibone. If I'm overweight, it's your fault. Oh, <laughs> nonsense. All you need is a little more exercise. That's easier said than done, Pettibone. His lady friend doesn't like to let him go out afternoons, you know. That's not true. My time is absolutely my own. Well, I was going to ask you, could you play in our poker game tonight? Oh, no. He's got to spend the evening choosing his wedding guests. Oh, is that so? Maybe that's his idea of a good time. Now, Throckmorton, should we invite Auntie Grace and Uncle Henry? Hey, whatever you say, dear. But, no, I'll cut it out, Petty Bone. <laughs> <laughs> the wedding just won't be a wedding unless we invite Cousin Percival. Booker, I'm warning oh, you. Oh, I can't stand Cousin Percival. <laughs> Powers, would you care to step outside? I can't, you darn fool. I haven't got any clothes on. <laughs> oh. Well, then cancel my subscription to your newspaper. Today. Don't you want to read about your hole-in-one? Cancel it tomorrow. <laughs> now, boys, boys, boys. Eddie, where are those coats? Eddie! Come in, Jed. Well, what about this poker game, Gildersleeve? Gentlemen, I'm at your service. And I'll show you that in poker as in golf, Lady Luck sits on the shoulder of the best player. Oh, for the love of He's just jealous, that's all. Uh, Sockaroo. Yes, ma'am. You, Miss Gilsley. Oh, uh, thank you, Eddie. Uh, <laughs> some uh, gentleman calling me? Gentleman? No, sir. No, indeedy. <laughs> Step up and tell her you're going to play poker tonight, Gildy. Let's hear you put her in her place, Throckmorton. Remember, Gildersleeve, never ask a woman. Tell her. Yeah, I know. I'll tell her. Uh, hello? Oh, hello, Leela. <laughs> yes, I, I decided I'd play a little... Get, the doctor said I needed some exercise. <laughs> Follow us, please, please. Uh, but, Leela, I, I didn't understand it was definite for this afternoon. But I thought if I... But I thought if I... But I thought if I... This program comes to you by electrical transcription. <laughs> But Leela... Tell her about the poker. Oh, Leela, there's a... Well, cut that out, Powers. <laughs> what was that, Leela? Oh, Leela, don't say that. Uh, uh, don't cry, Leela. I've got good news for you. Yeah, I made a hole in one. We were sailing along. Quiet, fellas. But Leela... Please, fellas. But Leela... Oh, shut up. Shut up. Quiet. Uh, oh, not you, Leela. Leela! Now look what you did. My girl hung up on me. Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. Meanwhile, along with the suggestion that planning family menus in advance will save you points and money, I have another thought that may prove useful. Shop early in the week if you possibly can, and early in the day. That'll help your dealer, and it'll help you, too. He'll be more likely to have on hand the foods you plan to buy, the outstanding red stamp values like parquet, the delicious, nourishing margarine made by Kraft. It's worth shopping early to buy parquet. For just five red ration points a pound, you buy a grand-tasting spread for bread that's equally fine for many other uses. You'll find it an appetizing seasoning for hot vegetables, a real flavor shortening for baking, and it's just about perfect for pan frying. Now, if it happens that your dealer doesn't have parquet margarine the first time you ask for it, it's because of wartime shortages and parquet's growing popularity. But Kraft is doing everything possible to keep dealers supplied. So ask for the vitamin A fortified energy food, parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. <laughs> Returning to the great Gildersleeve, we find him glumly finishing up his supper with Leroy, while Marjorie, dressed to go out, sits waiting impatiently for her boyfriend, Ben. Mr. Gildersleeve, I hate to see you peck at your food like this. I ain't seen you eat such a light supper since the day you took Leroy to the circus. Well, I can't help it, Bertie. Marjorie, don't you want something to eat? A little celery? No, thank you. I'm mad now, and I'll just wait for Ben if I starve to death. Where are you going, anyhow? We were supposed to go to Bishop's Chop House for dinner, but we're so late now we'll never get a table. 
We will stand there for an hour, and by that time the meat will be gone. And by the time we've finished our chicken a la king, we'll be too late for the first show at the Majestic, so we'll stand in line there for an hour. Well, the guy's probably run out of gas again. Wouldn't be at all surprised. Now, don't be too hard on the boy, my dear. He probably didn't mean to be late. Oh, you men always stand up for each other. Now, now, Ben's a nice boy, but I don't think you ought to mope over him. No, fair one, do not pine for Benjamin. Oh, for goodness sake. There is another who could love thee truly till death do his part. Kiss me. Oh, stop it, Leroy. <laughs> Let me take you in my arms. Let me fold you to my bosom. Let me... Leroy, stop that dribble. Oh, gee, I was just trying to cheer things up a little. You and Marge are so lovesick, it's terrible. I am not Neither am I. <laughs> Mr. Gilfrey, could I interest you in a little dessert? It's chocolate pudding with vitamins B, D, and G. Chocolate pudding? Bertie, we've been having chocolate pudding all the time lately. Well, Mr. Gilfrey, we ain't had chocolate pudding since week ago Tuesday. And I believe that was raspberry. Hmm? <laughs> Give both helpings to Leroy, Bertie. I'm not myself this evening. Not by a plateful. Uh. I'll go, Mr. Gilfrey. Well, there he is. Forty-five minutes late. Good evening, Mr. Ben. Oh, good evening, Bertie. Hello, Marjorie. Mr. Gilfrey. Hello, Ben. Leroy. Hello, Ben. Well, good evening. Ben, you didn't by any chance run out of gas, did you? Yeah, I did. Bingo! Leroy. <laughs> Yeah, but that wasn't the reason I... Ben Waterford, you make me so mad I could spit. But gosh, I... Here we are an hour late, and we'll miss dinner, and we'll miss the show. But Marjorie... Now you can wait for me for a change. I'm going upstairs and change my dress. Yeah. <laughs> gosh, uh, Ben, my boy, they're all alike. Well, Mr. Gillespie, if all the women act like that, all the men must be crazy. They are... We are crazy, we are crazy, we are nuts, oh, we are nuts. Happy little morons, happy little morons. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Leroy, that will do. You may leave the room, young man. Oh, uh, I want to hear you and Ben discuss days. Yep. Young man, go instantly. Okay. What a character. What was that? Nothing, nothing at all. Uh. He's a great kid. He's a pain in the neck. Well, that too. <laughs> Gee, you suppose Marge is ever coming down? Oh, yes, my boy. Just wants you to worry a little. Well, I am. When she comes down, there's just one thing to remember, Ben. Never ask a woman. Tell her. Tell her. Huh? That's the secret. That yeah, sounds like one of those good theories, but you don't know if she'll fly till you get her in the wind tunnel. Huh? <laughs> oh. Yeah. Well, uh, you take an example now, Ben. Take the case of a certain party I know. We'll call him Mr. A. He played golf recently when his fiancée expected him to spend the afternoon at her house. Was she sore? Oh, brother. <laughs> well, Ben, you got enough gas to get us downtown? Well, sure. I had a gal in the back seat, but that wasn't what made me late. It wasn't. No, I was fixing up this little kind of a present for you. I hope you... Oh, here... Oh, Ben, why didn't you tell me? Oh, I'm so embarrassed. Gosh, what about me? <laughs> oh, I just can't wait to look at it. Have you got a knife? Oh, I left it in my other pants. New suit. <laughs> Here, here's my cigar cutter. No good for cigars, but fine for string. Here. Oh, twin bracelets. Oh, Ben, they're beautiful. I made them myself. <laughs> Made him out of piston rings. <laughs> I polished them on the lathe down at the shop. I thought they were handcuffs, my boy. <laughs> oh, Uncle Moore. Huh? Oh, they're just lovely. Ben, you were so sweet. Thanks. Well, should we get started? Yes. Uh, if you forgive me. Forgive you? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, good night, Uncle Mort. Good night, my dear. Uh, good night, my boy. Uh, oh, Ben. Yeah? I, uh, I think you've solved the problem of Mr. A. <laughs> Mr. Gillisleeve, I kind of thought I'd be seeing you today. Say, Peavy, you've got to help me out. Well, that's what we druggists are in business for. Peavy, have you ever been in a spot where you had to think fast how to please a woman? 
Mr. Gildersleeve, I've never been out of it. <laughs> well, I'm in that spot right now, Phoebe. I got into a little trouble this afternoon, sort of fell among thieves, and now I've got to go over and face her. I thought maybe if I brought her a little gift of some kind, you know, kind of dazzle her and take her mind off things. Mm, very difficult to do. Very. Yeah, it is, huh? You don't think she'd accept a gift? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> she'll accept your gift, all right, but then she'll get right back to the point. Oh, oh, I see. Unless you happen to hit upon some particular weakness. Uh, weakness? How do you find that? Well, the only way I know is trial and error. Now, in my own case, I was fortunate. Oh? I discovered Mrs. Peavy's weakness early. Oh, what is her weakness? Maybe you'd give me a clue. Well, sir, I remember it was Atlantic City on our honeymoon. We were staying at the Breakers. Uh, Mrs. Peavy came into a small sum of money just before we were married, so we stayed there uh, <laughs> overnight. Yeah. Oh, well, go on, Peavy. Quite an establishment, the Breakers. Quite an establishment. I remember John Philip Sousa was opening at the Steel Pier that same weekend. And we... <laughs> you told me about that, Peavy. Get to the point, will you? What was it you discovered about Mrs. Peavy? Well, you know, it's a, a funny thing. Uh? <laughs> that woman has a positive menu for saltwater taffy. Yes. Taffy? Saltwater taffy. I bought her a two-pound box there on the boardwalk, and I never heard another word out of her the whole trip. <laughs> Of course, salt water taffy is pretty sticky stuff. Yes. <laughs> Peavy, you've just given me an idea. What's that? Have you got any salt water taffy? Uh, no, Mr. Gildersleeve, I haven't. I'm sorry. Then what's the use of telling me all this? Peavy, you can waste more time than any living mortal I know. Well, no, I couldn't say that. <laughs> I haven't any salt water taffy, but I'll tell you what I have got. Yeah, what? Some nice assorted chocolates. And they're hard to get these days. Just the thing. Wrap it up, Pete. I have them already wrapped. It saves time. Oh. That'll be a dollar sixty-three. Okay, here. Oh, uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, there's just one thing. Perhaps yeah. I should have thought of it before. Yeah? What was that? The selection of chocolates you have there contains rather a large proportion of chewy pieces. Well, that's all right. What about it? Uh, merely a precaution. You don't mind if I ask rather a personal question? Go ahead, P.V., you're a druggist. Uh, about the lady in question. Uh? Are her teeth, uh, shall we say, uh, her own? Uh, I've never asked her, P.V., but I have every reason to believe that they are. Good day. Good day, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, good luck. <laughs> Moonlight Bay, we could hear the voices singing, they seem to say, what? you have stolen my, don't go away. Mr. Gildersleeve, will you kindly take your foot out of my door? Leela, let me explain. You didn't give me a chance this afternoon. You see, this thing came up. I have heard all the explanation I care to, Throckmorton. I am not interested in any explanations that come from locker rooms. Uh, uh, Leela, I've been a foolish boy and I'm sorry. I've come to ask your forgiveness. Well, there are some things a woman just can't forgive, Throckmorton. And one of them is when a person says he'll go over an invitation list with her, and then he doesn't. But, but Leela, wait a minute. Look, I brought you a present. Present? Uh-huh. All for you. Well, you can come in, but only for a minute. Yeah. Leela, you're an angel. You know, sometimes I think I don't know how lucky I am. Mm, sometimes I don't think you do either, Throckmorton. Here, from me to you, with love. Well, maybe I have been too hard on you. Sure, a man can make mistakes. Go ahead and open it. After all, we're all human. You wouldn't love me if I weren't human, would you, Leela? <laughs> no, I guess not, Throckmorton. <laughs> 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 Gracious, I'm so excited. I wonder what's in it. Oh, I'll tell you. It's candy. Candy? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so long since I've had any. Throckmorton, you're a... Leela, what is it? Mr. Gildersleeve, you may take your candy and go elsewhere with it. Huh? Here. Uh, what's this? What if you're careworn and wrinkled? What if your hair's turned to gray? To me, you'll always be mother, the dear one we honor today. Oh, Peavy!
Well, hello, boys. Make lots of noise. Deal me in. Gildersleeve. Well, I'll beat you off. Uh, you're surprised to see me, huh, fellas? I told you I'd be here. Deal me in. I never thought you'd make it. How'd you get away? No problem at all. I simply said, Leela, I promised the boys I'd play poker tonight, and I always keep my promises. And she said, all right, dear, just whatever you think best. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> Music on this program was under the direction of Claude Sweet, and this is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Are you puzzled with the main dish problem? Many women are these days. There's not only the money budget to consider, but also a ration stamp budget that can't be replenished with all the money in town. Well, here's one smart purchase that's easy on both budgets. It's Kraft Dinner, the product that gives you delicious macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. Yes, with Kraft Dinner, you get a nourishing main dish for four people, an economical main dish in a hurry. And the family will like Kraft Dinner macaroni and cheese. The macaroni is so fluffy light, and the cheese flavor is all through it. You see, each package of Kraft Dinner contains an envelope of Kraft grated along with the special quick-cooking macaroni. You cook the macaroni just seven minutes in boiling water. With the Kraft grated, you simply sprinkle the cheese goodness through and through the macaroni in a jiffy. Your main dish is ready, a main dish you can repeat time and time again. And here's an exciting part of the news I've been holding back. Kraft Dinner takes only one red ration point. Ask your food dealer for Kraft Dinner. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, I think most homemakers listening in will agree that between rising food costs and red stamp rationing, it's getting to be more and more of a problem to satisfy family appetites. Well, if that's the case in your house, one good way to practice true economy is to place parquet, the quality margarine made by Kraft, at the top of your grocery shopping list. For parquet margarine requires just five red ration points, and it's just about the finest flavored spread for bread your family ever tasted. What's more, parquet is a delicious seasoning for everyday hot cooked vegetables, a real flavor shortening for baking. And you'll especially like it for pan frying because it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. Yes, the family will like parquet for appetizing flavor and for wonderful nourishment, too. It's one of the best energy foods you can serve, and every pound contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. So for flavor, for economy, and for good nutrition, ask your dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. On to Summerfield, where we join that illustrious citizen and industrious lover, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. And where do we find him? Well, love is funny. The door that yesterday was slammed in your face today flies open at your approach. And so we discover the great Gildersleeve and his lady love once more together, seated on the sofa in his living room, gazing into the future and laying plans for the event that is shortly to make him the happiest man in the world. Leela. Yes, Ralph Martin. A penny for your thoughts. Oh, gracious. My poor little old thoughts, they're hardly worth a penny. Well, you know me, I'm a spendthrift. <laughs> <laughs> Silly. Huh? I'll tell you what I was thinking, though. I was thinking you and I are going to have to go and look at furniture one of these days soon. Furniture? What for, Leela? I've got more furniture now than you can sit on. Well, 
I know, Sherlock Martin, but after all... What's the matter with it? Well, I guess there's nothing really the matter with it, but it just hasn't any style. Oh, no. It's true, Sherlock Martin. Take that easy chair there. That's my chair. I know, and look at it. What's the matter with that chair? I like it. Oh, but look at the shape of it. That short little back and that great enormous seat. Well... <laughs> there's always a reason for everything, Lena. <laughs> You know, the trouble with you, Throckmorton, you've been a bachelor so long, you're set in your way. No, I... Yes, you are. But after we're married, things will have to be a little different. Now, this house, then... All right, I'll admit the house needs painting. That's all right with me. Well, that's not quite what I was thinking, Throckmorton. No? What were you thinking? Well, you know that big white house on the edge of town out toward the country club? The one that's sort of set back among the trees with a big lawn in front? You mean the old Burton place? I guess so, yes. Well, I understand it's for sale. Of course it's for sale. It's been empty for three years. Leela, you weren't thinking of moving out of this house. Well, it's a nice house and all, Throckmorton, but it is kind of old-fashioned. I like it. Well, it's, it's old-fashioned without being really antique, if you know what I mean. I like it. I just thought you are doing so well now and all. And Judge Hooker says he frankly doesn't think this place is suitable for a man of your position in this time. Oh, he doesn't. Well, you tell Judge Hooker not to worry himself about me. I'm not moving out of this house no matter what he thinks. Even if you knew that... No, that's my final answer, Leader. I wouldn't even consider it. Well, all right, darling. If that's the way you feel about it, I won't say another word. I... I hope you don't think I'm just being stubborn. Darling, the house is already forgotten. All I want in the world is for you to be happy. You know that. Uh. <laughs> After all, you're my lord and master. <laughs> or you soon will be. Lord and master. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and give me a kiss. Rock, Martin. Yes, honey. Would you do something for me? Anything, my love. Something awfully sweet. Anything. What is it? Would you shave off your mustache? <laughs> uh, shave it off, but Leela. Just to see how it would be. You can't tell. It might make you look younger. It's younger? Yes. You don't want people to think of me as an old man's darling. <sighs> Leela, you don't think of me as old. Of course not, Throckmorton, but I'd just like to see how you'd look without it. No, sir, nothing doing. I just wouldn't be me without my mustache, Leela. Very well. In that case, would you kindly move over, Throckmorton, and give me a little room on this sofa? Oh, now, Leela. You said you'd do anything I asked. You promised. Leela, why do you have to change everything? Can't you love me the way I am? Well, I don't think you can love me very much. All I ask you to do is to shave off a little old mustache. I'm not asking you to buy any new furniture. I'm not asking you to move. All right. Besides, it tickles. <laughs> all right, Leela, all right. I'll shave it off. Delilah. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Gildersleeve. Wasn't expecting to see you for another week or ten days. I know, I know, but here I am. Floyd, I want you to shave off my mustache. What? You heard me. Let's get at it because I'm a busy man. All right, Commissioner, but I don't mind telling you I hate to do it. Never mind that. Lather me up. Okay, okay, you're the doctor, but I'll tell you why I say that. It was some years ago when I had my other shop over in Ashton. One day a fellow came in. He was quite a character in town, sort of public figure. A little on the stout side, like yourself. I suppose what's under your vest is laundry. <laughs> no offense, Mr. Gildersleeve, no offense, but this fellow had been wearing a mustache all his life, 30 or 40 years. And all of a sudden he came in and asked me to shave it off. That's why I came in, too. Oh, in two shakes. Have to strop a little. <laughs> of course, I was just a young fellow then. I didn't know what I know now. Full of beans and no brains. But I never gave it a second thought. Just went right ahead and shaved his mustache like it was hay. Come on, Floyd. I haven't got all day. When I was through, the fellow took one look at himself. Then he put his hand over his face, ran out of the shop, tore down to the depot and bought a ticket and left town on the next train. He didn't come back till three months later. And by that time, he had a new mustache. I was the only fellow in town that ever saw him without it. And he never spoke to me again. So I hate to shave off your mustache, Mr. Gildersleeve, but... Here she goes. Uh, Floyd, let's not rush into this thing, huh? No, sir? No, uh, just trim off a little at each end so I can see how that'll look, huh? Oh, slow and easy. I got you, Mr. Gildersleeve. About uh, this much, say? Uh, a little less. About this much? Uh, a little more. Uh, there. Uh-huh. All right, now sit still. 
There. Now, if you cover up the other end with your finger, you can get an idea. Uh, I'm afraid to look, Floyd. Go ahead and even her up. All right, now sit still. There. Well, how do you like it? I don't know. What do you think, Floyd? It's hard to say. Makes you look different, all right. Well, if it ain't Judge Hooker, come on in, Judge. Good morning, Floyd. Well, Gildersleeve, what on earth? <laughs> <laughs> Whose idea was this, your lady friend? Never mind, Hooker. <laughs> Maybe I better call her up and tell her to get ready for a shot. You stay away from her. You've made enough trouble already. What do you mean? What's the idea of putting bees in her bonnet about my house not being good enough for me? I didn't say it wasn't good enough for you. I said it wasn't good enough for a man with political ambition. What do you mean by that? Well, it seems obvious enough. Man wants to be president, it's all right to be born in a log cabin, but the time comes when he has to get out of it. Isn't that right, Floyd? Well, you I... You stay out of this, Floyd. Uh-huh. <laughs> in the first place, Hooker, I'm not in politics. In the second place, the voters choose a man for his ideas, not his residence. Maybe so, Gildy, maybe so, but look at Congressman Abernathy. His house looks exactly like Thomas Jefferson's, and that impresses the voters, doesn't it, Floyd? Well, I... You know... stay out of this. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hooker, when I get ready to run for Congress, I'll buy a Jeffersonian house. Until all then... All right, Gildy, all right. But there's a house on the market now that'll be just right. May not be there by the time you throw your hat in the ring. They're talking about you for Congress in 44, you know. They are? Definitely. Who? I can't tell you. Yes. Yeah. But if uh, you were to get your hands on that old Burton place... Well, like... maybe I'll think it over, Judge. So long, and thanks for the tip. Oh, uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, did you say tip? What? Uh, oh, here you are, Floyd. <laughs> Hi, Unc. Say, what's going on? Uh, going on? What are you talking about, Leroy? Somebody's been sabotaging your mustache. Yes. I simply had a trim. Is supper ready? Any minute, Bertie says. Very well. Uh, come in and sit down here for a moment, my boy. I, I want to talk to you. Me? Yes, you. Gosh, Unc, I don't think you got a thing on me right now. <laughs> I'm not accusing you of wrongdoing, young man. Is that the only subject you can think of for conversation with me? Well, it seems to come up pretty often. <laughs> but if you just want chit-chat, I'll tell you about the horror picture I saw this afternoon. The Mummy's Claw. Mum, I don't want any chit-chat. It's about a mummy that came back to life as a zombie. That's enough of that. For long. Leroy, I want to ask you a question. Uh... Are you happy here in this house? Well, well, sure. Yeah, I like it fine, huh? You're not thinking of throwing me out, are you? <laughs> no, Leroy, I love you very dearly. Some of the time. <laughs> what I want to know is, would you like it if we moved to some other house in another neighborhood? And not live near Piggy and the gang? Well, you can still see him now and then. Oh, please, Unc, we don't want to move. It's swell here. Hello, Uncle Lloyd. What about supper? Any minute, Marjorie. I was just talking to Leroy. You look peculiar, Uncle Moore. What have you done to yourself? Nothing. It's his mustache. Well, it gets awfully hot in the summer, Marjorie, so I just thought... Oh, that... I think it looks cute. Well, thank you. Hey, Marge, you don't want to move to a new house, do you? New house? Now what's got into you? To me, nothing. It's Uncle Moore. Leroy, I'll handle this. Well, what is this? You're not thinking of leaving this house. Well, not exactly, my dear. It was, uh, well, I just wanted to get your reaction. Oh, but Uncle Moore, what... Well... I've lived in this house for more than 20 years. Leroy was born here. I love it. I love every room, every squeaky board in the stairs, every rattle in the window. All right, my dear, all right. I just thought you might like a little more room. The old Burton house, for instance. Burton's? Oh, my gosh, Uncle, it's got three acres of lawn. <laughs> miles from anywhere. Oh, it's not so far. Oh, I know why you're thinking about moving. Leela Ransom wants to live in the Burton house. That's what it is. Oh, but Marjorie, it was just a suggestion. I bet it was her idea fooling with your mustache, too. I don't like that now, either. Uh, Something's ready. My dear, if you don't want to, we won't move to the Burton house. My land, did you say move to the Burton house? And now, Bertie. Because if you're going to live in that house, you have to revise your kitchen personnel. Hooray! <laughs> but, Bertie, what's the matter with the Burton house? Mr. Gilsleeve, I don't want you to think I'm superstitious, but that house is haunted. It's haunted? Why, that's nonsense. Whatever gave you that idea? Well, everybody knows that old Mr. Burton shot old Miss Burton in that house, and one time I was walking past it with a gentleman's friend, and we heard the scariest noise I've ever heard in my life. 
Uh, what kind of a noise, Bertie? Well, like something out of this world. <laughs> Leroy! That's the exact sound, Leroy. Sure, that's the noise of a zombie that used to be a mummy. <laughs> Stop it, Leroy. That's horrible. <laughs> Bertie, when you and your gentleman friend heard this sound, uh, didn't he investigate? No, sir. By the time he caught up with me, we was two miles away. I'll go. Yeah, fine time for anybody to be calling on us. Oh, that's Bye, George. Here he is. It's supper time again. Uh, hello, George. I can't stay, Jock Morton. I stopped in to tell you I just found out the Burton estate would be willing to make a substantial reduction. Uh, 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 Judge, I have decided not to go into that any further. Oh, so it was Judge Hooker's idea for us to move. What's going on here? What do you mean, my dear? Why is everybody trying to get us out of this house? Now, Marjorie, I just found out that the Burton estate is willing to make your uncle a very favorable offer. Estate? By George, I begin to see the light. Estates have executors, don't they, Judge? Why, of course they do, you darn fool. What's that got to do with it? I dare say the executor of this particular estate would make a pretty penny in fees if this particular house were sold, would he not? It's just a set fee prescribed by statute. Answer my question. I did. All right. Now, who is the executor of this estate? Now, Gildy, that's neither here nor there. It just happens this particular executor prefers to remain anonymous. Oh, he does, eh? This particular executor wouldn't happen to be named Horace W. Hooker. Would he, Horace Hooker? Well, it just happens... Case dismissed. Let's get to dinner. (laughs) Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. Meanwhile, if you've noticed that it's a case of first come, first serve at your neighborhood grocery store, you've probably taken the hint and plan your shopping early in the day and early in the week. That's the best way to provide variety and balance in family meals. And it's also good insurance that your dealer will have on hand the outstanding red stamp values like Parquet, the quality margarine made by Kraft. Parquet sells very fast these days, and no wonder... Millions of people have found that for just five red ration points, they can buy a pound of a fine-tasting spread for bread that's also a delicious seasoning for cooked vegetables. They've learned, too, that parquet margarine is a real flavor shortening for home baking and that it's grand for pan frying. Now, if the growing popularity of parquet margarine in your neighborhood, combined with wartime shortages, have made your dealer supply run out, ask him for parquet again soon. For Kraft is doing everything possible to keep all dealers supplied. Ask for Parquet, the vitamin A fortified energy spread. Spelled P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Now let's get back to Summerfield where a picnic seems to be afoot. It's a lovely Saturday morning, and Leela Ransom, who proposed the idea, has promised to lead the way to an ideal spot, complete with brooks. Come on, come on, Leroy, and watch that hook. Okay, I'm ready. Get ready to cook plenty of fish tonight. You've never tasted fish like I'm going to catch. No, and you ain't never caught them. <laughs> come on, Leroy. I told Mrs. Ransom I'd be over there at 11.30. I'll be right with you. Let me see now. Have I got everything? Fishing rod, reel, bait, hooks, bobber, Come on, beef, come on. Scout knife, canteen, holding camp kit. Where's my camp kit? Leroy, we're only going for the afternoon. I know. Oh, here it is. Our spyglass, compass. Compass. The place is only a mile from here. We can't get lost. Flash. I forgot my flashlight. Leroy, we will back before supper. I know. I'd just like to take it. <laughs> mm-hmm. That Leroy sure gets excited. He's going to burn himself out before he's 15. Yes. Yeah. What does he want to drag all that stuff along for? I'm late now. Mr. Gilsey, you sure you don't want me to pack nothing for you? No, Bertie. Mrs. Ransom said she wanted to make you lunch. Yes, sir. I just wondered, does she know your capacity? Huh? <laughs> well, I wouldn't worry much about that. <laughs> you wouldn't want me to just wrap up a few pieces of chocolate cake. I uh, got one just fresh out the oven. You have, huh? Well, that sounds mighty good, Bertie. I might just call her up and ask her, huh? <laughs> After all, you got to have something to keep body and soul together. Yeah. Hello. Leela? Coogee. <laughs> I just called Le- Huh? Oh, we will, Leela. We'll be right over. I'm just waiting for Leroy. He's gone to find a... Co- huh? Oh. Oh, I see. Uh, I guess I misunderstood, Leela. Oh, sure. Sure, I think it'd be nicer that way. Uh, I'll fix it. Oh, that 
Leroy coming in on a wing and a prayer. <laughs> All set, Uncle. Let's go. Oh, uh, Leroy, I'm afraid there's been a little misunderstanding, my boy. It's my fault. I, uh, uh, you see, I thought you were invited. You mean I can't go with you? I can't go on the picnic? It's all my fault, my boy, and I'm sorry. Gosh, I never even used my folding camp kit. I know, and I'll make it up to you, Leroy, some way. You see, Mrs. Ransom and I have a lot of things to talk over. You know, about uh, weddings and such. Yeah, it's okay, Uncle, it's okay. And I'll tell you what. Why don't you get piggy and go on a picnic of your own? Well, it's an idea. Leroy, you come with me. I'm going to fix you up a nice picnic lunch with all the things you like. Yeah, do that, Bertie. That'll be great. Huh, Leroy? Yes, sir. And ain't no grown-ups going to get none of that chocolate cake, neither. No matter how much they come begging around. Oh, now, Bertie, just one little piece. No, sir, not one. (laughs) Now, you go on out of here and leave me and Leroy alone. I'm going, Bertie. By George, I envy you, Leroy. All that delicious cake. I wish I were going with you and Piggy. That's what I wish. I wish you were, too, Uncle. Have a good time. Gosh. Now, Leroy, it wasn't your uncle's fault. I know. I know whose fault it was. Invites you to a picnic and then changes her mind. What a character. I bet she's going to drag him out there and try to sell him that house again. Oh, my goodness. Don't worry. She won't get away with it. want me to help you carry that heavy old basket? Why, this is nothing at all, Leela. I could carry it with my little finger. Well, don't try. There's a thermos bottle in it. Uh, oh, you don't mind if I stop in here for a minute at the drugstore? Oh, not at all. I'll get all freckly if I don't, and you wouldn't love me with freckles on my nose, would you, Rock Martin? Huh? <laughs> oh, hello, Mrs. Ransom. Mm. Morning, Mr. Peavy. And Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, quite a little gathering. Lovely day, isn't it, Mr. Peavy? It is indeed. Oh, I see you're carrying a picnic basket there, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah. Yeah, picnic basket. Going on a picnic? Yeah. <laughs> Peavy, you're positively psychic. Well, no, I, I wouldn't say that. Mrs. Peavy is the psychic member of the family. Mrs. Peavy is psychic? Off and on, yes. She has what is called second sight. Second sight? That stuff is a lot of bunk. Well, now, I don't know, Mr. Gildersleeve. Mrs. Peavy does some pretty strange things. She often sees things that are coming. Did she see you coming? (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Gildersleeve. (laughs) But I'll tell you one experience of hers that's pretty hard to explain. Mrs. Peavy had a dream one night. Everybody has dreams. I have them all the time. I know. But... Even cats have dreams. Uh, I wouldn't care to dispute you on that, Mr. Gilbert, please. <laughs> but I was telling you about Mrs. Peavy. She dreamed one night that there was a very bad thunderstorm. Yes? Well, as a housewife, Mrs. Ransom, I don't have to tell you what a thunderstorm does to milk. Turns it sour. Exactly. I suppose the next morning you woke up and the milk was sour. No, stranger than that. The next morning, the milkman delivered us a bottle of buttermilk by mistake. Peavy, I wouldn't have believed it if you hadn't told me yourself. <laughs> and that's not all. Uh? The night Mrs. Peavy dreamed about the thunderstorm, there was a thunderstorm. Oh, so she wasn't dreaming at all. That's what I say. There are a lot of things in this world you can't explain. <laughs> Peavy, if you believe that, you believe anything. I suppose you believe in ghosts, too. Well, no, I wouldn't say that, but I... I wouldn't say I don't, either. I suppose you believe this story about the old Burton place now being haunted. The Burton place haunted? Well, people have heard some strange things going on in there. Why, nonsense. Just because a man happens to murder his wife? What's strange about that? Murder? Uh, well, that was some years ago, Leela. Don't tell me you're superstitious, too. Oh, <laughs> Now, Throckmorton, don't be silly. Well, shall we be going? Oh, yes, let's get started. Oh, yeah? gracious, I'm forgetting what I came in for. I'd like a jar of your cucumber sunburn cream, please. Yeah, sorry, Mrs. Ransom, but we've had a little more demand for that than we expected. We, we've we just run out of it. Oh. You must have run out of second sight at the same time, Peavy. Goodbye. Goodbye, folks. Have a nice picnic. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, Leela, you're wonderful. You know, I never realized you were such a wonderful cook. Why, the only thing we had that was cooked throughout Horton was the hard-boiled eggs. I know, but they were wonderful. Well, I must say I never saw a man put away so many. Are you sure you had enough? I couldn't eat another thing. Why, have you got some left over? <laughs> no. Oh. Uh... Well, what shall we do now? I'll tell you what, I'll race you down to the brook. Oh, Leela, race, I couldn't. I bet you can't catch me, Throckmorton. Oh, don't, Leela, I'm too full. Come back over here and lie down on the grass beside me. <laughs> All right, then. Right here, huh? <sighs> oh, this is nice. Look at those clouds up there. Aren't they beautiful? Uh-huh. <laughs> like little woolly lambs. Uh-huh. Throckmorton. Uh-huh. What are you... <laughs> What are you thinking? I wish I'd eaten one less pickle. <laughs> oh, this is no time to be thinking about pickles. Isn't it gorgeous up here on this hill? Oh, yes, it is. And isn't it a gorgeous view? Yes, it is gorgeous. <laughs> and that little clump of trees down below there with a white house nestling among them. Gorgeous. Mm. Rock Martin, you know what? I believe that's the Burton house. Huh? Yeah, I guess it is. What do you say on our way home if we stop off and just peek into it? Now, Leela, you know what you said. I know, but we have to pass there anyway, just for a minute. But we couldn't see anything, Leela. The bo- the, it's all boarded up. Yes, I suppose it is. You know what? I believe... Wait till I look in my handbag. Yes, sir. Now, what do you think of that? What? I just happened to have a key to the house. Judge Hooker left it with me. Yeah. Now, isn't that a coincidence? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get it over with. <laughs> Yes, Leela? Come in here. Come see what I found. Oh? Where are you? In here. Yeah, it looks as if somebody's broken in here, Leela. All this mess around. Now, wait a minute. Close your eyes. Why? I want this to be a surprise. Let me take your hand. Uh, no tricks now. Mm. All right. Open them. Now, this would be your den. Looks like the House of Representatives to me. <laughs> Don't you like it? It's too big, Leela. The whole place is too big. Oh, but I think it has charm, Throckmorton. I think it has definite charm. Yeah, it has gloom, too. It's as dark as your hat in here. Well, the shutters are closed, silly. I know, but I like a place with plenty of light, Leela. I like a place with people around. Did, did you hear something just then? Sounded like something falling. Uh, Throckmorton, where did he do it? Where did what do we, what? Mr. Burton, where did he shoot Mrs. Burton? How do I know? I wasn't there. I mean, here. Oh, this time I know I heard something. Uh, uh, now, Leela, don't get frightened. After all, you're with me. Oh, I wish we'd never come in here. Uh, I wish I'd... Listen, uh, it's in that closet. What? Whatever it is, it's in that closet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take me out of here. Take me out of here. Yeah, all right, Leela, but first I'm going to lock that thing in the closet. Oh, Oh, I'm not afraid. There. Oh, Throckmorton, come quickly, please. Never fear, my dear. As long as you're with me, you've got nothing to be afraid of. Shall we go? Oh, yes. I never want to come near this house again as long as I live. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get away from this awful place. Leela, you stay here. Now that you're safe, I'm going back in the house. To leave me alone here? Oh, you'll be perfectly safe here. I'm going back there and find out what that was. Oh, Throckmorton, I wish you wouldn't. Remember, if anything happens, Judge Hooker has my will. Now be careful, you hear? I'll bet that kid was scared to death when he heard me lock the door. 
I bet he thought I was never coming back. All right, Leroy. You can come out now, Leroy. Leroy, come out of there. Leroy. Ooh, it's empty. That's funny. Could have sworn it was Leroy. Sounded like Leroy. Oh, my goodness. Leroy! 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 Oh, what a character. Good night, everybody. program was on the direction of Claude Sweet. If you'd like to see pictures of the great Gildersleeve and some of the members of the cast, they're in the current issue of Radio Mirror. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the great Gildersleeve. One of the wartime problems you homemakers face is that of keeping meals from seeming skimpy. So here's a suggestion. When you're planning a vegetable dinner or when you have just a small amount of meat for the family, serve the vegetables or meat in a cream sauce in the center of a delicious macaroni and cheese ring. And make that ring the quick way with Kraft Dinner. Each Kraft Dinner package contains a special macaroni and some Kraft grated. Just seven minutes cooking and you have fluffy, tender macaroni with cheese goodness through and through. For the ring, you merely press the hot Kraft Dinner macaroni and cheese in a mold for just a moment. Still easier is Kraft Dinner served as is without fixing. Kraft Dinner is nourishing, economical, and so good. A box of it gives enough macaroni and cheese for a family of four and takes just one single red ration point. Notice that one red ration point for Kraft Dinner. Ask your dealer for Kraft Dinner soon. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, if you live in the South, you've probably already harvested many good things from your victory garden. If you live in the North, the first tender green shoots are pushing their way through the soil. Wherever you live, the chances are you're congratulating yourself on hard work that's worth it because you're providing your family with wholesome, good-tasting food. Kraft, the makers of parquet margarine, get much the same feeling of satisfaction, too, in making a food that fits in so well with your cash and ration stamp budgets. For parquet margarine requires just five red ration points a pound. And besides being a delicious appetizing spread for bread, it's also a fine seasoning that'll add delicate extra flavor to garden vegetables served piping hot on your table. Yes, and parquet is a real flavor shortening for your home baking, and it's grand for pan frying, too. What's more, parquet is one of the best energy foods you can serve, and it contains vitamin A. So ask your dealer for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, Parquet Margarine, made by Kraft. Now let's join the great Gildersleeve in Summerfield. It's a beautiful Saturday morning in May, the kind of a Saturday morning that makes a man think twice before he starts down to the office. Mr. Gildersleeve, who is strictly human, has thought twice and is about to think again when the doorbell rings. Oh, who the... I think it's a postman, Leroy. Postman? Gee, maybe he's got my stuff. Huh? Hi, Mr. Underwood. Hello there, young fellow. I've got something for you if you've got 97 cents for me. 97? Hmm. Just a second. Say, Uncle, could I have my allowance now, please? Well, I guess so. Let me see. Uh, I haven't got 50 cents in change. Isn't that so? Well, it's funny. I was about to ask for a slight advance anyhow. Isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very funny. Hey, hurry up, son. The United States mail waits for no man. Oh, um, please. Just once. It's an emergency. Well, all right. Here, pay the man, and we'll discuss it later. Gee, thanks, son. Huh? Here's the money, Mr. Underwood. All right, Sonny. Thanks. Oh, boy. This is it. 
from the Lincoln Novelty Company. Wait a minute. I thought this was an emergency. Well, it is. Tomorrow's Tom Ladd's birthday. Oh. So naturally, I had to get him some kind of remembrance, something worthwhile. Uh, what'd you get him? Oh, a few novelties. Yeah, novelties? What are they, Leroy? Oh, just little things a boy would like. Young man, let me see that package. Oh, no, long. From the Lincoln Novelty Company, the boy's best friend since 1878. What are you buying from him, Leroy? Oh, it's the greatest thing you ever saw. You put it in your mouth and you can throw your voice anywhere. It makes you a regular ventriloquist. Leroy, I bought one of those things 25 years ago and it's no good. Mm. Gosh, what do you expect for a dime, Edgar Bergen? Besides, they've improved it. Never mind. That's a dime. Now, what else did you spend the money for? Well, there's this certain powder. Yeah, sneezing powder? Uh, partly. Itching powder? Yeah. Did you try that too, Unc? Yeah, but you won't. <laughs> My father gave me a licking. I'll never forget for that. Well, I guess parents didn't understand children in those days, did they, Unc? I think they understood them pretty well, Leroy. I'm going to explain a few things to you right now. Oh, for corn's sake. Just because I want to borrow 47 cents. It's not the 47 cents, my boy. It's your whole conception of money. Where it comes from, what it's for. Now, if you had a job, as many boys do at your age... Can I get a job, Unc? I think it'll do you good. Teach you the value of a dollar, the dignity of honest labor. I think it'd be fine for you to get a job, Leroy. Earn a dollar or two every week, perhaps? A dollar or two? Are you kidding? I can go right down to a cartridge factory and knock off thirty-seven fifty every Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> what? Well, that's what Hector Briggs makes. Never but... mind. You'll get a part-time job that you can handle after school or you'll have none. Now, do you want it? Oh, sure, it's better than nothing. Well, where am I going to get one? I'll get one for you. Oh, my goodness, it's 11 o'clock. If I don't get to work pretty soon, people will say I'm a part-time water commissioner. Don't worry, Leroy. I'll get you a job. Come in, Gildy. Come in. Uh, hello, Judge. Uh, Horace, I come to ask your advice. Well, well, I don't know why you didn't come to me long ago. What do you mean? Throckmorton, you and I are old friends, aren't we? That's right, Horace. We've been through a lot together, haven't we? That's right. I guess we don't have to beat around the bush with each other, do we? Certainly not. Gildy, let's face it. Marriage is a wonderful institution, but it's not for us. You... What? Well, now, now, don't misunderstand me. Leela Ransom is a fine woman. Hooker, I don't know what you're talking about. What I'm talking about has nothing to do with Leela Ransom, and I'll thank you to keep her out of this. Sorry, Gilly. Sorry, old man. Sorry. Sorry. All right. If I spoke out of turn, I'm sorry. All right. I could bite my tongue off. You don't have to do that. <laughs> Ten thousand pardons, old man. I'm sorry. All right, you're sorry. <laughs> What I came here to talk to you about is Leroy, Judge. Leroy? Well, what has our young friend got himself into now? Nothing. It's just what I'm afraid he might get into. I think he needs something to keep him out of mischief, Judge. I think he ought to have a job. Best thing in the world for him. Oh, you think so? Absolutely. Well, I'm glad to know you feel that way about it. Uh, Horace. Yes, Gildy? You and I are old friends, aren't we? That's right, Gildy. We've been through a lot together, you and I. We certainly have. You know, Horace, if you had a son... That's one of the sorrows of my life, Gildy, that I haven't a son. I know, but if you had a son, and say that son was at the age where he was ready to take a job... Yeah? Do you know I'd feel positively hurt if you didn't send him to me for a job first? Would you, Gildy? Absolutely. I'd feel downright hurt. Now, I haven't any son either, but I have got a nephew, Judge. Gildy, do you mean you want me to give Leroy a job? That's right. <laughs> Are you kidding? Uh, all right, Hooker, try and get any favors out of me. Is that you, Unc? Yes, Leroy. And I'd like a word with you. Unc, guess what? I've got a surprise. Well, that's fine. But suppose you save it for a moment. Leroy, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint you. Disappoint me? Yes, my boy, I... I promised this morning that I'd get you a job, but I find it's not as easy as I thought. Yeah, but, Uncle... Um... Please let me finish. I realized that you'd be disappointed, so I decided I'd give you a job myself. At your office? No, right here, my boy, mowing the lawn. But I did that last summer. 
I know, but this summer I'll pay you. <laughs> uh, shall we consider it settled? Well, there's just one catch, Unc. What's that? I got a job myself this afternoon. Peavy's Drugstore. What? I start tomorrow. See you later, Unc. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, uh, who's going to mow the lawn? <laughs> the magazines here. I'll have them fixed in two shakes. That's all right. You go ahead and read the comics if you want. <laughs> no harm in that. I just wanted to say I'm going to leave you in charge here for a few minutes. Oh, boy, my big opportunity. <laughs> well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I'll only be a minute. I, I just got a little errand for Mrs. Peavy before the butcher shop closes. Veal cutlet. Well, I'll take your time, Mr. Peavy. I can handle the store. I think you can. There's just one or two things before I go, if you don't mind, Leroy. Yes, sir? I've noticed when you answer the phone, you've been saying Peavy's Pharmacy. Oh, don't you like that? Well, no, I, I think that's a little flashy. I prefer just a very conservative hello. Oh, all right, Mr. Peavy, I'll remember. And the only other thing is this. Don't prescribe for people. Well, I thought that was what brothers were for. Pharmacists, Leroy. We are pharmacists. Oh, I forgot. No, we never prescribe. I made an arrangement to that effect with Dr. Pettibone some years ago. <laughs> we agreed that I wouldn't try to cure his patients and he wouldn't make any ice cream sodas. <laughs> Just be careful, that's all. Oh, hello, Piggy. Hiya, Mr. Peavy. Hi, Leroy. Hi. I guess I can trust you to wait on your young friend here, Leroy. I'll be back shortly. Hey, you, put down that comic book. I'm just looking at it. Well, don't. I just finished straightening up those magazines. I can look at it if I want to. Not unless I say so. I'm in charge here. Who says so? I say so. Who are you? You'll find out. <laughs> Listen, thanks. Drop that book. Okay, okay. You keep your hands off things, see? I'm in charge here. I'm responsible. Don't want to look at your old comics anyway. I've read them all. <laughs> and don't be swinging on that seat. You're liable to bust it. Come on, come on. What do you want here? I want some candy. How much money you got? Oh, don't worry. I've got the money. My money than you'll ever see. Oh, yeah? You know how much money I make here? Three dollars a week. Yeah. I do. And you know how much that is in a year? About a hundred and fifty bucks. Gosh. What are you going to do with it all? Mm, I haven't decided yet. Probably buy a drum and a set of claps. Real ones? Of course, real ones. What do you think? Gosh. Will you let anybody else play it? Don't make me laugh. This is a very valuable drum I'm going to buy. Um... <laughs> Leroy. What? I'll tell you something if you'll tell me something. What? Who's your best friend? Well, I don't know. I've got a lot of friends. I'll have to think it over. You know who my best friend is? Who cares? Come on, are you going to buy anything around here? Sure. Sure, I'm going to buy some candy. And if I thought you were a friend of mine, I'd give you some of it. Candy? I can eat all I want of it here. Make up your mind. What do you want? Uh, give me a jazz bar. Let me see your nickel. Why? I have to see your money first. Who says so? I say so. Who are you? You'll find out. <laughs> oh, hello, Aunt. Well, what's going on here? Just making a sale. Sounds more as if you were killing one. <laughs> well, hello, Piggy. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Here's your candy, thanks. That'll be one nickel with tax. Well, Aunt, what can I do for you today? Leroy. Yes? What are you going to do with that nickel? Oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> Want to watch that, young man? Yes, sir. <laughs> I'll go on, you little squirt, before I beat your brains in. Leroy, that's not the way to speak to a customer. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hey, that is Mr. Peavy. What do you have, Unc? Uh, nothing, my boy. I happened to be driving by, and I thought if you were through here, maybe you'd like a ride home. Well, gosh, that's nice of you, but it's a little early, isn't it, Uncle? Well, I think if I speak to Mr. Peavy, I can get him to let you off. Gee, thanks. Uh, 
Hello, Mr. Hello, Peavy. I just dropped in to ask if I could borrow this boy of mine for the rest of the afternoon. Why, certainly, Mr. Gildersleeve. I don't think I'll be needing him. <laughs> well, thanks, Peavy. Yes, thanks. You know how it is. Grass is getting a little long there at home. Grass? Yeah. I quite understand. Yeah, oh, you didn't say anything Take about... Quiet, Leroy. I'll tell you what I'll do, Peavy. I'll hire him back from you. Fifty cents for the rest of the afternoon. Well, it won't be... Uh... Oh, excuse me. Telephone. Yeah. And if you need him for any deliveries, just phone and I'll send him right over. Hello? But now, 50 cents to mow the lawn. I don't even get the 50 cents. Well, that's business, my boy. Business? That's slavery. Yes, it is. <laughs> you can't do it, Uncle. It's against the Constitution. It's quiet, you. How can Mr. Peavy telephone? Oh, I, I'm very sorry to hear that. And maybe this will be a lesson to you, young man, not to try to match wits with your uncle. Yes, indeed. Right away. Yeah, I guess we'll be running along then, oh, Peavy. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I'm terribly sorry. What is it? They just phoned from Judge Hooker's house. Judge Hooker? It seems the old gentleman has just had a sudden attack of indigestion, and I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to send Leroy out with some epicac. Hooray! I mean, the gosh, that's too bad. <laughs> Why, the old goat? Why doesn't he watch out what he eats? Who does he think he is, a ten-year-old? No wonder he gets the cobbly wobbles. You know what I think, Peavy? I think he did this deliberately. Well, no, I, I wouldn't say that. Yeah, he did. He did this just to spite me. Oh! Leroy. What a character. The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. Now, I believe I've said all I need to about parquet, the delicious margarine made by Kraft. You know it's nourishing, and you know it tastes good. So now I'm going to talk about the men and women behind the counter in your favorite food store. I'm going to talk about them because they deserve a word of praise for the perfectly marvelous job they're doing in these trying times. The people in grocery stores have always worked hard. But in these days, with shortages of help, shortages of food, and food rationing, well, they really have a job to do. And believe me, they're doing it. They're doing a job for the manufacturers of food, for you, and for Uncle Sam. And in spite of the fact that point rationing is many times more complicated for them than for any of us, they carry on cheerfully, patiently, long hours, day in and day out. Without the willing cooperation of the grocer and his helpers, rationing could not succeed, nor could any of us eat as well as we're eating. Now, there are no awards of merit for these hard-working patriots, but they, too, are helping to win the war. Let's give them our support by budgeting ration points ahead, by shopping early in the day and early in the week. Now let's return to Summerfield. After a week with Leroy working for Peavy, Gildersleeve's lawn has become almost a jungle, and if he's ever to conquer it, it must be done today. So while Marjorie lolls in the hammock, we find him reluctantly trundling the mower out of his garage and calling upon the spirits of his ancestors to give him strength. Uh, 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 grass. Everywhere you look, nothing but grass. I hate the stuff. Talking to me, Uncle Moore? No, I'm talking to myself, my dear. I'm talking to the grass. <laughs> yeah, all right, you can laugh. You're a woman, Marjorie. You don't have to wrestle with it. <laughs> we could always get a goat. A yeah, goat? For this grass, we'd have to get a goat with a motor on it. <laughs> Why not? A motor goat. <laughs> A motor goat. You couldn't get any self-respecting goat to do this kind of work. It takes a dumb beast like a man. Oh, Uncle Mo. That's all I am, just a beast of burden, my dear, a slave. All day long, up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, is that any kind of a life? Oh, it'll probably be the making of you. A little exercise? In all this heat? It's the worst thing in the world for me. Say... I know. What? I'll just run in and send Bertie out with a nice big pitcher of lemonade, huh? That might help. All right, if you like. Uh, and some lady fingers to go with it. But we just finished lunch. Well, you can't run an engine without fuel, you know. <laughs> Motor goat. Uh, this darn lawn. What good is it? We never play croquet anyway. Uh, well, here goes. Stop, Martin. Oh, Leela. <laughs> Something, Trockmore? Oh, that's all right. I haven't really started here yet. Come on, Leela. Let's sit down here on the grass, huh? Shall we? All right, let's. Oh, oh, this is nice. You know what I love? Huh? I love to run my fingers through the nice, soft grass and feel the warm earth underneath. 
<laughs> Don't you? Yes, and feel those darn little roots pushing it up, pushing it up. <laughs> oh, so silly. Yeah. Listen, Leela. What? I think I can hear it growing. <laughs> Martin, I love you when you're like this. Like what? Silly. Silly? Well, what's silly about it? You don't realize I have to mow all this. Every blade of it. As far as the eye can reach. All by myself. And today. Oh, then, Throckmorton, I'd better be going so you can get at it. Oh, Leela, don't rush off. No. I was going to ask you to do something. Oh, I'd love to, Leela. No, not till you finish this. Well, tell me what it is. No, Throckmorton, not till you're through here. Oh, please. No. Uh, pretty please. Mm-hmm. No. Throckmorton, let go. Here comes Bertie. Huh? Uh, after I finished, will you? After you finish. So you hurry up and get to work now, you hear? Uh, darn lawn. Well, here goes. Here's your lemonade, Mr. Gilsley. Oh, just in the nick of time, Bertie. Say, it looks mighty good, too. Yes, sir. Here's a glass. Oh, never mind the glass. I'll just drink it out of the pitcher, like this. <laughs> Look out there, Mr. Gilsleeve. Look out, you don't fall in. <laughs> what a man. Mr. <laughs> Gilsleeve, you better come up for air. Uh, I tell you, there's nothing like a pitcher lemonade after a hard day's mowing. <laughs> Pretty good before it, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Bertie. <laughs> Oh, uh, say, by the way, Bertie. Yes, sir? Uh, tell me something. Don't you get awfully tired of staying in that hot kitchen all day long? <laughs> well, sir, I was mostly brung up in hot kitchens, so I guess I'm kind of used to it. My blood got thinned out or something. Uh, wouldn't you like to get outdoors once in a while and get a little fresh air? Oh, Mr. Gilsey, it's so long now since I had any fresh air, I don't know how I could handle it. <laughs> Nonsense. Fresh air is good for you, Bertie. Yes, uh, sir? Do you know anything about lawnmowers, Bertie? Well, yes, I know the main thing about them. What's that? Keep away from them. (laughs) Uh, This will be the death of me yet. Uh, Grass, it sneaks up on you. It grows when your back is turned. Hi there, Mr. Oh, Ben. Hello, Ben. Hi. Well, I haven't seen you around here lately, my boy. Oh, I've been kind of busy. Well, I'll see you're doing a little lawn mowing. Yeah, just mowing the lawn. Yeah. Great exercise. Great for the stomach muscles. Uh, yeah, great. <laughs> Is uh, Marge around? Marge? Well, she's inside there somewhere. Oh, good. Oh, uh, Ben. Yes, sir? Uh, you're a mechanic, Ben. I wonder if you'd come here a minute and take a look at this confounded lawnmower. Oh, is there something wrong with it? Well, I don't know there's anything really wrong, but it seems to push awful hard. Oh, well, maybe you've got it set too tight. Huh? Let's turn her over and take a look. Yeah, you go right ahead, Ben. Yeah. Seems thin, all right. Oh? Have you tried it? Have I tried it? I've been at this thing since lunch. I mowed clear down to that hedge and back, Ben. Huh. Funny, I uh, don't know what it could be, then. I'll tell you what. You try it, huh? Maybe I just haven't got the knack of it. Oh, well, all right, sure. Yeah, here. Better take your coat off, Ben. I'll hold it. Oh, I don't need to take my coat off just to try it. Oh, well, I know, but it's a hot day. You better give it to me. Don't you do it, Ben. Uh, oh, Marge. Uh, gosh, I didn't see you. Neither did I. <laughs> How long have you been standing there, my dear? Long enough to see what's going on. Now, Marjorie, nothing was further from... <laughs> nothing was further from my mind. Then what? Then, uh... You know. <laughs> All right, put your coat on, Ben. You're through for the day. Oh, uh, you dropped something there, my boy. Oh, my poppy. Uh, poppy day. <laughs> I suppose some pretty girl sold you that. I, uh, yeah, she was kind of. <laughs> now, Margie, <laughs> nothing wrong with Ben's buying a poppy. Poppy day is a very, very worthy cause. Only joking, Uncle Mort. I'm only jealous because he didn't buy it for me. Gosh, if I'd known you were selling them. Well, if you'd come around a little oftener. (laughs) (laughs) Well, shall we, uh... uh... Yes, let's. Oh, don't go, don't go. Sit down on the swing here. Yeah, but I, uh... You see, I've got something I'd kind of like to talk over with her. Some uh, some news. Well, I'll talk it over with her right here. Uncle Moore? I know you two want to be alone. Doesn't take a lawnmower to fall on me. (laughs) You make yourselves comfortable here, and I'll just knock off for a little while, huh? Mr. Gildersleeve, gosh, we don't want to interrupt your work. 
Then if we don't, he'll never forgive us. Huh? Uh, Marjorie, I think that's hardly fair. However, things being as they are, <laughs> I'll see you later. Oh. Supper. I'm half starved. We'll have it just as soon as Leroy arrives, Uncle Moore. Leroy? It's Leroy this and Leroy that. Who the dickens is Leroy? He's the kid that used to mow the lawn, remember? Uh, yeah, and he'll mow it again, too. Well, let's be nice to him when he gets home. All right. After all, it's his first week's work, and that's a pretty big milestone for a boy. Uh, Leroy working? Mm-hmm. He's been working for Mr. Peavy this week, Dan. Oh. Soda jerk? Well, something like that. No, Uncle Moore. I'll bet Leroy learns plenty in that drugstore. That's ridiculous. Oh, yes, he will. I'll bet you that when he... Everybody. Oh, thank goodness. Bertie! Uh, Bertie! I heard him too, Mr. Gilkey. All right. All right, folks. The toiler is home from his toil. Who's going to get my pipe and slippers? <laughs> Young man, I want you to get this through your head. You're no more important than anyone else in this house. Well, now, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Did I hear you say he wouldn't learn anything from Mr. TV? Yeah, I take it all back, my dear. I'm sorry I'm late, folks, but wait till you see what I've got. Here, Marge, don't say I never did anything for you. Why, Leroy, a present. You darling. Uh, here, up. Merry Christmas. What? Why, Leroy, you shouldn't have done this. Oh, look. It's a gadget to fix the runs and stockings. Oh. Guaranteed to fix nylon, silk, anything. Go to see the fella do it. What fella? The fella I bought it from. He had a whole suitcase full of them. Oh, Leroy, it's simply marvelous. It's just what I wanted. Well, I seem to have a pencil here. Uh Oh, but that's not all, Unc. It's got two different kinds of lead and a ruler down the side with genuine millimeters on it and a flashlight on the end. Uh. (laughs) What, no banjo? (laughs) Well, thank you, my boy. I I don't know what to say, really. Oh, that's okay, Unc. You're welcome. Uh. Hey, I'd better take Bertie her present. Oh, what'd you get for Bertie, Leroy? A bracelet with rubies in it. What? Well, it might be rubies. (laughs) He's really a very generous kid. He certainly is. Holly, he must have spent a pile of money on all that stuff. I'm afraid so. Thank you, Leroy. Ah, oh, forget it, Bertie. Well, it won't be long now, folks. Are you hungry? Am I? I didn't have time to make myself a soda the whole afternoon. Uh, Leroy, listen to me a moment. You've been very generous, and generosity is a fine trait. But I'm afraid you spent too much money on these presents. Oh, I don't worry, Unc. I've got plenty left. I figure I'll be able to get my drum in just 14 weeks. Uh, I want to explain something to you, my boy. You're making money now. Everyone in this country is making money. Yeah. But hardly anybody is making things to sell anymore. Most of the work is going into making bullets and such for the war. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is everybody ought to spend their money on war bonds and stamps instead of things they don't need. That's the way to fight inflation. Well, you mean I shouldn't get the draw? Oh, I didn't say that. It'd be a very good thing if we all thought more about the war and less about ourselves. Oh, gosh, Unc, I can't be thinking about the war all the time. Would it be easier if you knew somebody who was in it? Yeah, sure, I suppose so. But I don't. Yes, you do, Leroy. Oh, no, I don't, Marge. Honest. Ben, can I tell? Huh? Oh, sure, I guess so. All right. Leroy, this morning Ben got his commission in the Navy. He'll be leaving very soon to join a ship. Gosh, the Navy. Well, I didn't know about this, Ben. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, sir. The Navy. Yeah, brings war a little closer, doesn't it, my boy? Yeah. I'm me worrying about a drum. Well, now that Ben's in the Navy, I'd better buy him some bullets. I'll buy bonds, Unc. Yeah, now you're talking like a grown-up man, Leroy, and I'm proud of you. Leroy, I hate to say it, but you're wonderful. Come here. Huh? Here. I haven't got a medal for you, but... (laughs) There. Oh, gosh. What's the idea of kissing people like that? No wonder Ben is joining the Navy. <laughs> well, little Leroy hasn't grown up as much as I thought he had. <laughs> sell grass. All you can do is mow it. Oh, these darn mosquitoes. 
Oh, brother, this has been one of my bad days. Throckmorton! Oh, that's you, Leela? I've been expecting you all afternoon, Throckmorton. What happened? Oh, nothing happened, Leela. I've been working here like a dog. But by George, enough is enough. I'm quitting right now. Eh, what is it you want me to do, Leela? Oh, well, it's too late now, Throckmorton. Oh, no, it's not, Leela. Oh, but it is. Leela, don't be like that. It's never too late. A man's got to have a little fun. Eh, what is it you were going to suggest that we do? Well, I thought if you got through with your lawn in time, maybe you'd help me with mine. Hmm. <laughs> That's all. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Heard on this program was under the direction of Bob Sweeten. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to listen in again next Sunday for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Lots of you ladies are having to use ingenuity these days to make the main dish hearty. Well, here's a very clever trick. Serve a small amount of meat or chicken or eggs or vegetables creamed in a licking good macaroni and cheese ring. And make that ring the fast way with Kraft Dinner in only seven minutes cooking time. The Kraft Dinner macaroni is a special kind that cooks fluffy tender just in boiling water. The Kraft grated in each Kraft Dinner box puts the cheese flavor through and through the macaroni in a jiffy. Press the delicious hot Kraft Dinner into a ring mold, let it set for a moment, and then serve with your creamed meat or vegetables. Or serve the Kraft Dinner macaroni and cheese all by itself. Either way, you have a real wartime special. For one Kraft Dinner box gives you macaroni and cheese for four people, and you give out just one single red ration point. Get some soon. Just ask for Kraft Dinner. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents the Great Gildersleeve. Yeah. <laughs> the Craft Cheese Company also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. At first, do the men in your family think flavor is the most important virtue of the food you serve? Well, you homemakers know that nutrition is equally important. And that's why Parquet, the quality margarine made by Kraft, is so popular with so many American families. For Parquet margarine is a wonderful red ration stamp value in both flavor and nutrition. It requires just five red ration points a pound, and it has a delicate, appetizing flavor that really satisfies. As a spread for bread and a seasoning for hot cooked vegetables, I think you'll agree that parquet flavor is just about top. Cakes and cookies taste better when made with parquet margarine, too, because it's a real flavor shortening, and you like it for pan frying because it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. What's more, parquet is highly nutritious. In fact, it's one of the best energy foods you can serve, and it's a reliable year-round source of vitamin A. So for flavor, for economy, and for good nutrition... Ask your dealer for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now, on to Summerfield in the Great Gildersleeve. It's the last day of May, just four weeks before his wedding day, and Gildersleeve is a busy, busy man. This morning, while others make preparations for the Memorial Day exercises, the great man is in his study, straightening out his affairs and clearing the decks for matrimony. So we find him now with pen in hand, laboring over the composition of a mighty document. I, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, being of sound mind and body, to hereby devise and bequeath... Uncle Mort, excuse me. Yes, Marjorie? Come out and see it. Come out and see what? The flag. We've got it up. Oh, well, a little while, my dear. Right now, I'm... Oh, come on. You aren't doing anything, and I'm not so pretty. Not doing anything? My dear young lady, I happen to be engaged in one of the most solemn duties of a man's lifetime. You know what I'm writing? Oh, fool. 
Everybody think it was your last will and testament. Now, come on. Uh, but, but, hey, hey, let go. Come on. Uh, well, let me put down my pen first. I don't know what there is such a rush about anyway. I've seen the flag before. But well, we found a new place for it, and we want you to see it. Oh, where? We hung it from the roof. How did you ever get it up there? Uh, Leroy climbed out the attic window. Come out in the yard and tell us if you like it. Well. We want the place to look nice when the parade goes by. Oh, and Leela's coming over, too. Good. So it's then. And Bertie's planned a wonderful lunch. There. Do you like the flag, Jack? How does it look to your artistic eye, Uncle? Well, it looks fine, Leroy. Only for heaven's sakes, be careful out there. Don't worry. Isn't it pretty? I think ours is the prettiest house on the street, don't you? Yeah, but I wish Leroy would get down off that road. Hey, I'm a tango walker. Look, everybody. A great con colino. Leroy! Leroy, get off of that railing. Young man, you get in off that roof before I come up there after you. Are you kidding? <laughs> Leroy, you heard me. Okay, I'll down. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> Be careful now, my boy. Oh. Uh, that crazy kid. Honestly, what comes over, boy? I don't know. It's a wonder to me he's lived as long as he has. <laughs> oh, that reminds me. i got to get back to work. Hey, call me when it's time for the parade. Oh, we won't be along for an hour yet. Uh, parades. Tightrope walkers, more interruptions. People just let me alone till I get this will finished. Will. <laughs> Leroy's the one who should make the will. The great Con Calino. Oh, brother. Let me see now. I, Throckmorton P. Gildersley, being of sound mind and body, do hereby devise and bequeath to my lawfully wedded wife. No. To my dearly beloved wife. Mm-hmm. My dearly beloved wife. <laughs> Come in, beloved. Hi, Gildy. Yep. Hooker. <laughs> what do you want? What on earth are you dressed up for? An admiral? I'm leading the parade today. Grand Marshal. Just stopped over to ask if you wouldn't join us. In the parade? Yeah. You mean march? Yes. On foot? Well, I suppose you could go on your hands and knees. <laughs> oh, no, Judge. I'm not much on marching. <laughs> My feet. You've got to, Gildy. All the younger men are gone this year, and we want them to have a nice turnout. Well, I guess I can certainly keep up with you, you old goat. I'll tell you, I'll do it on one condition. What's that? If you'll help me with my will. You're drawing up a will? Sure. Got a little start on it right here. It's here. I thought Morton T. Gildersleeve, being a sound mind and body. Gildy, you mind if I ask a question? What? What makes you think you're of sound mind? Huh? <laughs> and look at that body. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind the priceless wit, Booker. You don't want to help me, don't. Now, Gildy, I should be delighted to draw up your will for you at any other time. Right now, I've got to get down to City Hall. How about this afternoon? Well, all right, then. See you down at the parade. Oh, uh, Gildy, there's one thing that just occurred to me. Yes? On second thought, you might prefer to have another attorney handle your will for you. Why, Judge? Well, I don't like to bring this up, but we're old friends, aren't we, Gildy? Yes, we are. We've been through a lot together, haven't we? Yes, yes, we've been through all that before, too. What's on your mind? You may not be aware of this, but under the law, it is illegal for persons witnessing or drawing up a will to be beneficiaries. I merely mention this. Why? Well, we're such old friends, and we've been through so much together, I just thought, if you should want to leave me some slight remembrance. (laughs) (laughs) Judge, I'm going to leave you a lock of my hair. Keep your shirt on, my boy. Parades never start on time. Isn't that right, Ben? I don't know, Mr. Gildersleeve. I thought we were just going to watch it go by the house here. Well, you are, but I'm going to march in it. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, what war were you in? Uh, I was in World War I, Ben. Oh, sure. Uh, did you get to France, Mr. Gildersleeve? I should say I did, my boy. Paris. Uh, I wonder if you'll get over there. I suppose I might. Yes. Well, if you do, I wonder if... Uh, Leroy, will you go help your sister for a minute? Help her what? She ain't doing anything. She's not doing anything. Well, that's what I said. Never mind. Go away. Go up. Uh, go upstairs and bring down that picture of me in my uniform so I can show Ben. Okay. Uh, and tell Marjorie to hurry down here. Ben will walk out of it. Yeah, fat chance. Uh, uh, <laughs> what was I saying, Ben? Uh, something about 
France, I think. Oh, yes, yes. If you should get to Paris, my boy, I want you to go to a certain number on a certain street and ask a certain party if she remembers Monsieur Gildersleeve. Bo Yanks, she used to call me. Uh, will you look her up, Ben? Sure, Mr. Gildersleeve, only I can't speak any French to speak of. Well, when I first met her, I couldn't either. But inside of a week, comme ça va, parlez-vous français, le mot toujours le mot. You get the idea? Uh, oui, oui. <laughs> She was a lovely creature, Ben. And her mother. Oh, boy, how she could cook. I think you'll like her, Ben. Oh, sure. She's a blonde, just 28 years old in 1918. <laughs> Let me see. That would make her uh, 53. <laughs> it's not possible. <laughs> oh, my goodness, how time flies. Here's a picture, Unc. The boy commando in person. Uh, I don't care to see it now, Leroy. Fifty-three. Poor Mimi. I can't believe it. Oh, gosh, Uncle, what's the matter? Nothing. Go help Marjorie. For Pete's sake, aren't you through talking about Paris? Uh, Leroy, you're getting too fresh. Well, uh, that's Mrs. Ransom. We have a little signal. Mm-hmm. Uh, in here, Leela. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, sweetheart. I'll, I'll take the flag out in front. Looks just beautiful. Uh, Leela, I've got a surprise for you. I'm going to march in the parade. Why, truth, Martin, how exciting. Would you like to see his picture in uniform, Mrs. Ransom? Leroy, give me that. Oh, now, Shrock, Martin, I want to see him. Oh, why, you were cute in your uniform. Uh, Cute? (laughs) Wasn't he bad? Well, just let it go, my boy. Stand the insignia on your uniform, Frock Martin. Boat, a dog used to have leechy on the shoulder. Have Oh, well, I didn't go into the army at the top. I went in as a private and won my promotion the hard way. How'd you come out, Uncle? Corporal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to get started if I'm going to be in the parade. The boys are assembling behind the courthouse at 11. Goodbye, Leela. I'm off to the war. Oh, uh, wait a minute, Rock Martin. What's the matter? You're not going to march in the parade in just that little old business suit, are you? Well, uh, for what else? Well, your uniform, Shirley. Oh, I couldn't, Leela. Oh, but you'd look so distinguished. It would look out of date, Leela. The uniforms today are entirely different. Oh, Frog Martin, you ne- never do anything I ask you. I do, too, Leela. I just, uh, I just don't know where my uniform is. I know, Uncle. It's up in the attic. Leroy. <laughs> Oh, it's good for you, Leroy. Please, Rock Martin, for Leela. Uh, all right. <laughs> Leroy, you come with me, little sharp eyes. <laughs> Trunk is it in, Leroy? This one over here, Uncle. Uh, that one? I haven't got the key to that. I guess we'll just have to let the uniform go. Don't worry, Uncle. It's open. Uh, <laughs> Mothballs. Come on, Leroy. Fish it out of there. I haven't got all day. Here, here's the pants. Gosh, they look a little small, Uncle. Uh, yeah, well, this stuff shrinks, you know. Yeah? Yeah. Besides, mothballs will shrink anything, Leroy. <laughs> well, I don't find any puttees in here. Maybe we'd just better let the pants go. Okay, here's the coat. Yeah, blouse, Leroy, blouse. Oh, blouse. Funny how it looks as if the morph balls cut that down, too. <laughs> what did I tell you? Yeah, well, I think maybe I can get into it, though. <clears throat> Here, hold my coat. Okay. Yeah, probably be a little tight, but it'll sort of give a military effect. See? <laughs> See? I got it on. Yeah. Yeah, but can you button it? Oh, of course. Uh, you ought to remember that when I was in France, I weighed several pounds less than I do today. Are you kidding? I <laughs> uh, it just feels good to get back in the old uniform. Come on, Leroy, let's show the ladies. <laughs> uh, well, folks, what do you think of it? What in the world happened to the trousers? They were shot off. <laughs> Leroy, quiet. Uh, no patees, Leela. 
can't wear them without puttees. Oh, well, the coat looks awfully military. Uh, I think you'll be the handsomest man in the whole parade. I honestly do. Oh, well, that's all I wanted to know, Leela. Well, I'm off. Uh, I kiss your hand, fair lady. Oh, don't bend over. <laughs> well, I'm glad I didn't try to wear the pants. <laughs> Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. Meanwhile, instead of saying more about parquet, the quality margin made by Kraft, I'd like to say right here and now, hats off to the man who sells parquet, your neighborhood grocer. If point rationing is causing you occasional headaches, remember that rationing is a major problem for your grocer hundreds of times each day. In fact, he deserves real credit if his disposition isn't tattered and worn. What with getting to work so early in the morning to arrange his stock for you and working far into the night every night to sort his stamps and plan his ordering. He has endless records and reports to fill out, too. Yes, your food dealer is an important workman on the home front, and he merits the help and the cooperation of all of us. You see, most of the foods he buys and sells are rationed to him, too. He has to budget his ration stamps in order to buy many of the things you buy from him. So why not help yourself and help him at the same time by planning family menus several days in advance? and by shopping early in the week and early in the day. Your friend the grocer will appreciate it. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. Prior to the conservative business suit, he's marched valiantly in the hot sun, and now he's arriving at his home to claim the soldier's reward. In this case, a share of the delicious lunch with Bertie's promise. But our hero's a little late, and the house seems strangely quiet. Marjorie? Leroy? Where is everybody? Is that you, Mr. Gillespie? Of course it's me, Bertie. Where is everybody? Well, they're waiting for you, Mr. Gillespie. They waited about two hours before they had lunch. You've been marching all the time? Oh, yes, Bertie. I marched so far, my feet are killing me. When I'm so hungry, I don't care. Well, you just sit down and take your shoes off, Mr. Gillespie, and I'll warm up a nice lunch for you right away. Uh, thank you, Bertie. Yeah. Well, you marched so well, Mr. Gillespie. Well, it wasn't all marching, Bertie. We stood there in the park for a couple of hours listening to the speeches. But it certainly was impressive. Makes a man think, Bertie. Yes, sir. I'd like to be remembered by everyone. There's a man who did something for the city. Well, sir, you the head man at the Waterworks. Well, I'm Summerfield's 16th Water Commissioner, yes. But a few years from now, who'll know it? That's what I've been thinking about some sort of a monument for, Bertie. You mean like a statue? Well, I don't know. You think that'd be good? Oh, no, sir. I don't care much for statues. Huh? Now you take them two statues in the park. Every time I walk past Abraham Lincoln standing there, I feel sorry for him. Why? Because he's been standing there so long. Yes. <laughs> well, what about the statue of General Fremont? Don't you like that? No, sir. Every time I go past that, I get mad. But why? Because he's got a horse and I'm walking. <laughs> and he ain't even going nowhere. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'm afraid you just don't like sculpture, though, Bertie. Oh, yes, I do, Mr. Gillespie. You know what I like? What? That fountain in front of the courthouse with the water spraying down and the goldfish swimming around down below. I like that. So do I. By George, a fountain, Bertie. For a water commissioner, what could be better? With a little bronze plaque on it. Not too little. Let's see. Uh, this fountain presented to the city by uh, Summerfield's 16th Water Commissioner, Throckmorton P. Gillisley. Then maybe some short, dignified statement like, uh, he served his fellow townsmen well. Sounds mighty like pretty, Mr. Gillisley. Yes, yeah, sir. I can hear the water splashing in the fountain right now. So can I. Oh, my goodness, the gravy is boiling over. Yes. Yeah. Gravy? Mmm, Bertie, I'm starving. <laughs> well, hang on, Mr. Gillisley. You can't stop to death till you get that monument. Yeah, you're right, Bertie. I'm going to have Judge Hooker put in that fountain in my will right now. Dr. Morton, let me ask you something. Why are you suddenly in such a sweat to make a will after letting it go all this time? Well, for one thing, I think it's a man's duty to make a will, for one thing. Yeah? What else? Well, uh... Leela mentioned it once or twice. Oh. And anyhow, I think it's a man's duty. You can't tell. Things can happen. 
Here I am about to get married. Gildy, it strikes me that you're preparing for marriage as if you were preparing for the next world. Now, see here, Hooker, that's not true. All right. Sorry. Sorry. That's true, but I shouldn't have said it. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Time to draw up this will. I'm going to require certain information. Such as what? Well, to begin with, how much money have you got? (laughs) Don't you wish you knew? Well, I've got to know. What for? Gildy, if you want me to help you with your will, you've got to take me into your confidence. Well, all right, Judge. What do you want to know? I ask you, how much money have you got? None of your business. If I tell you, you'll tell everybody in town. Gildy, what passes between a lawyer and his client is strictly confidential. Yeah. You know that. Come on, now. How much have you got? Cash. Cash. Well, in the neighborhood of the $500. In the neighborhood? Yes. (laughs) Small neighborhood, isn't it? (laughs) It's all right, Gildy. We're neighbors. Oh, you too? I'd be lucky if I could put my hands on $300 right now. Well, to be perfectly frank with you, Judge, I've got just $275. And that's not counting the bills that will be pouring in tomorrow. Isn't it terrible? Terrible, the way things are. A man's lucky if he can stay out of jail. Now, let's see. The insurance. Now, what about the rest? What about Leela? Of course, she has her own money. Yes. I'll tell you what I thought, Horace. I thought it'd be nice to endow a small memorial. A memorial? Yeah, a fountain, perhaps. A memorial fountain. Memorial to what? Well, uh, to the two of us. Me being water commissioner, I think a fountain would be kind of appropriate, don't you? You know, with the water coming out. Rockmorton, may I ask what you propose to endow this fountain with? Well, with my residuary estate. With the, well, the $275. Don't you think you could buy a fountain for that? Wouldn't be any Niagara. I think you'd be lucky to get a bird bath. Oh. You do, huh? Well, you know, Judge, you may think you're joking, but a bird bath isn't such a bad idea. Oh, now, Gil. I mean it. I've always been fond of birds. Birds like me, too. They come right up to me sometimes. Leela, Leela's crazy about birds. She's got a little bitty wren that's building a nest in her front porch right now. Every morning she goes out and peeks at it. Yes, sir, a man could do worse than have the birds remember him. Birds are man's truest friend. I thought dogs were man's truest friend. I'm not building any dog bath. <laughs> Horace, how soon could you get this will drawn up? Well, that shouldn't take much time. Of course, we need witnesses. I guess I'd get my secretary for one. Oh, and Peavy. Peavy, do it. I know he's open this afternoon because Leroy's working for us. Hey, do you think you could get it ready? What's the rush? Well, I'd just like to have it, Judge. I'm going over to Leela's tonight, and I'd sort of like to surprise her with it. <laughs> You'd surprise her, all right. Hi, Unc. Hi, Judge. Uh, hello, Leroy. How's the drug business? Pretty quiet. The chief is out in the prescription room, and you know what that means. What? (laughs) Leroy, that's no way to talk about Mr. Peavy. I'd like to see him for a moment, please. Oh, gosh, Ron, can't I wait on you? I never get a chance to sell medicine. But with you, it wouldn't matter if I made a mistake. (laughs) I disagree, my boy. Oh, just try me, Unc. I can find you anything in the store, practically. Then find Mr. Peavy. Uh, honest, Unc, the chief doesn't like it if I bother him about something I can handle myself. Leroy. What? Wake up, the chief. Oh, all right. Maybe we shouldn't bother Peavy if he wants to sleep. What nonsense. Peavy sleeps 24 hours a day anyway. Oh, hello, Peavy. I hope we didn't interrupt anything important. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, I'll just take care of you, gentlemen, and then I can get right back to it. <laughs> How are you, Judge? Fine, thank you, Peavy. I saw you, gentlemen, in the parade this morning. Thought you both looked very dashing. Well, glad to do our bit, Peavy. It, how does it happen you weren't marching? Someone told me you were an ex-soldier. Yes, sir, I was in the artillery. 49th Field Artillery, USA. Well, I'll be darned. Were you a gunner? No, I wasn't a gunner. I, I was in what you might call the transportation end of the artillery. Oh, what's that? I commanded a platoon of mules. Yeah. <laughs> you? That's hard to believe, Peavy. Why, the mule is the stubbornest animal known to man. Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Although a mule has a mind of his own, I'll admit. But they're hard workers. They are? Yes, they're hard workers. And they're loyal. 
Every mule in my platoon was just as loyal as a jackass could be. <laughs> Gildersleeve, can't we get down to business here? I haven't time to listen to Peavy's military experience. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Johnny. I'm just running on. What can I do for you? Well, you won't make a penny on it, Peavy. We just want you to witness Mr. Gildersleeve's will, if you don't mind. Oh, glad to, Johnny. Glad to be of service. Oh, Leroy. Yes, Chief? This is the type of service I was telling you about yesterday. Institutional type. Oh, yeah. Have you uh, got the document with you, Mr. Gilbert, please? Right here, Petey. Get away, Leroy. This is none of your business. Aunt, did you leave me anything? You've been amply provided for. Uh, sign right here, Petey. Aunt, will you leave me your pistol that's in your bureau drawer? No. Oh, please, huh? Now, Leroy, remember lesson one. The customer is always right. Oh, sorry, Chief. I forgot. No, I... Now, here, John. That's it. Richard. Peavy. There you are, Mr. Gildersleeve, and I hope your will gives you the same lasting satisfaction as mine is giving me. Well, I hope so, too. <laughs> I executed my will in 1913, naming my wife as sole beneficiary, and I never wanted to change a syllable of it. Neither has Mrs. Peavy. <laughs> well, I can imagine... Well, much obliged, Petey. we got to be running along now. Well, I'm going to close it up here myself in a minute. Leroy, you want to go along now with your uncle? Are you sure you can spare me? Mm-hmm, I think so. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. Good night, Chief. <laughs> Good night, little beaver. <laughs> Just be two of us. Soon you and I will borrow the moon. For just the two of us, sweetly and so discreetly, we'll be completely alone. No other world, only our own. sings it under your window every morning. Oh, Dickie Bird. I call him Dickie Bird. Yeah, Dickie Bird. Uh, Dickie Bird has been provided for, Lena. It's all right here in the will. Oh, Strathmore, that's just like you to remember little bird. Uh, see? It's all written out right here. Oh, darling, you have to explain it to me. I don't understand about wills and complicated things like that. Oh, well, sweetheart, in memory of both of us, I'm leaving money for a municipal bird bath. Oh, really, Throckmorton? You're the most thoughtful man. Now, I... did you say bird bath? Uh, yes, yes. You're leaving your money for a bird bath? That's right, honey. All of it? Uh, well, not all of it. Uh, all that's left after taking care of the children. You mean to sign my and tell me you've made a bird to residuary legacy? <laughs> Leela, I thought you didn't know anything about wills. Well, I wasn't married to a lawyer seven years for nothing. <laughs> but, sweetheart, I thought you liked birds. I do, Throckmorton, but you're nothing but a cuckoo. Cuckoo. 
Leela. Yes, yeah, all upset over a bird. Leela, can't you take a little joke? You mean you were joking? Uh, of course, darling. <laughs> I'm not going to build any bird bath. Uh, tell me, how would you invest the money? Well, when I'm in doubt about a financial problem, I always ask myself, what would Beauregard do? Beauregard? Well, if you asked Beauregard what I should do about this? Uh, no, but I think I know what he'd say. What? He'd say, Leela, child, you'd look lovely in a mink coat. Hmm. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> On this program was under the direction of Claude Sweet. And this is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to listen in again next Sunday for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. You women are looking for extender recipes these days and all kinds of ways to make the less plentiful foods go further. Well, do you know about the product called Kraft Dinner? All by itself, a package of Kraft Dinner gives you a swell macaroni and cheese main dish fast. Enough macaroni and cheese for four people. And for it, you put out just one single red ration point. Now, if you have a little meat or some leftover chicken or seafood, you can extend it by adding it to the Kraft Dinner macaroni and cheese. Or you can mold the hot Kraft Dinner into a ring and in the center serve your small amount of meat or what have you, creamed. Each package of Kraft Dinner holds a quick cooking macaroni and some Kraft grated to put cheese flavor through and through the fluffy macaroni in a jiffy. Get some soon so that you can cook a macaroni and cheese dish in seven minutes or use it as an extender of less plentiful food. Remember, it's Kraft Dinner. This program will reach you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, with food shoppers everywhere thinking in terms of ration stamps as well as money, let me suggest a way to economize with both. Yes, and supply mealtime variety that will really make your family sit up and take notice. Here's the secret. The next time you plan a shopping trip, include on your list Tab Step, the delicious nourishing cheese food. For just three red ration points and surprisingly few pennies, you buy a generous package of cheese goodness that's a real help in preparing wartime meals. The tantalizing cheddar cheese flavor of Pabstet is grand with economical rice or macaroni dishes. And Pabstet toasts and slices to perfection. Or you can melt it to a smooth golden cheese sauce that does wonders with leftovers of meat or fish or vegetables. Pabstet is a fine source of important milk nutrients, too. Milk protein, milk minerals, food energy, vitamin A, and vitamin G that's also called riboflavin. So remember the name... Tab Step, the economical red stamp value. In the diary of Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, a monumental work as yet unpublished, we find in the Spencerian hand of the great man himself this entry. Dear diary, today I made a vow. I'll never speak to Judge Horace Hooker again. As long as I live, I'll never speak to him. Even if he comes crawling to me on his hands and knees, I'll never speak to him. Even on my deathbed. There are some things a man cannot forgive a friend, and one of them is stabbing him in the back when he isn't looking. And thereby hangs a tale. It was on the morning of Friday, April 9th. The time, 8.30. Thank you. Our friend Gildersleeve was glancing through the paper while awaiting the arrival of Judge Hooker, with whom he was to share a ride to the office. Uncle Mort, if you have to be at the office by nine, you better get going. Oh, my goodness. Is that clock right? As far as I know. Uh, Bertie, call up and find out what time it is, will you? Yes, sir. They won't give you the time anymore, Uncle Mort. Well, I'd like to know why not. Must be a military secret. Yes. Then by George, you can call them up and tell them they can come and take their phone out of here. Oh, Uncle Mort, cool off. I mean it. Tell them to take it out today. I don't want it around. Yes, sir. Can't give us the time. What good is a telephone if you can't? 
Leroy, turn on the radio. See if you can get a time signal. Okay, Unc. Not a clock in the whole house you can depend on. Can't depend on clocks. Can't depend on the phone company. Can't depend on the judge. He gods and I have to be at the mayor's office at 9 o'clock. Oh, Leroy, turn off that radio. You told me to turn it on. What is this, a madhouse? Are you asking me? Yeah. Never mind. I can't wait for the judge any longer. I'll just have to take my own car. If you're in a hurry, Uncle, I'll back it out for you. You'll do nothing of the kind. You can go and open the garage for me, though. Okay. Got the keys? Uh, keys? If, where are they? If Judge Hooker's got my keys now... Judge Hooker hasn't got your keys. Bertie, have you seen my... Oh, somebody put them in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the brownies. Yes. And don't be fresh. Here. Now my coat. Mr. Gilfrey, what about that coffee? It's about ready. I'm sorry, I haven't got time for it now. Better take an umbrella, Uncle Mort. Looks like rain. I haven't got time for rain. Mr. Gilfrey, we can't throw out coffee. You like coffee jelly? Don't bother me now about coffee jelly. I have to see the mayor. Oh, where's Leroy? He went out to the garage. Uh, if Judge Hooker turns up, don't forget to tell him. Tell him what? What did you say? What shall I tell him? Don't ask me. I'm late already. <laughs> oh, this is going to be one of his bad days. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Gilfrey? Be sure and have whipped cream on it. Whipped cream on what? The coffee jelly. You want me to stop the car, Unc? I'll warm it up for you. No. I thought you were in a hurry. I am in a hurry. Now, don't keep asking me that. I don't want you fooling around with the car. You'll wreck it. This, oh, uh, stick in your shirt tail, Leroy. What is it? Well, get off the running board. Okay. Give it a little toe, huh? Out of the way, Leroy. Uh, this is Friday, young man. Don't forget the ash can. I can't hear you. I said don't forget the ash can. Oh, watch out. What? Oh! Hey. Where do you think you're... Booker. Gildersleeve. This is a fine time to show up. What's the idea of backing into me? Who backed into you? It's a wonder some people wouldn't look where they're going. Well, I had the right of way. I was coming... It's my driveway, isn't it? Well, it's not your street. Oh, you all right? I'm all right, but look at that rear fender. Yeah, look at my bumper. How'd I know you were coming out of there? Are you deaf? I blew my horn. Yeah, after you crashed into me. <laughs> Leroy, didn't I blow my horn? You saw it happen. Yes, you saw it happen, Leroy. He backed into me, didn't he? Backed into him. He was going a good 40 miles an hour in a residential district with children all around and inadequate brakes. You saw it, didn't you, Leroy? Sorry, I didn't see a thing. Leroy! Honest, I was tying my shoes. Your shoes are untied right now, both of them. Yeah, that's funny. Yes. Oh, my land, what happened? Judge, are you all right? Is he all right? What about me? I had a narrow escape, Bertie, but fate spared me this time. By the way, you witnessed the crime, didn't you? Crime? Well, all I know is I was looking out the kitchen window. Good. Now tell me if this isn't the way it happened. I was coming down the street, well over to the right, looking in both directions and going not over eight or nine miles an hour, when this wild man came charging up. Bertie, don't you get mixed up in this. You go into the house. Yes, sir. You can't do that, Gildersleeve. She's my witness. Well, she's my cook. By golly, if I have to, I'll subpoena her. Oh, you hear that, Bertie? He's going to subpoena you. That's all, brother. This is getting too hot here for me. <laughs> Gildersleeve, I charge you with intimidating a witness. You intimidated her, you and your subpoenas. You go racing around town in that juggernaut of yours, that death car, that Rio. Just a minute, Gildersleeve. <laughs> What's your license number, Hooker? You can read, can't you? It's right there on the plate. Write it down, Leroy, before he gets away. Why, George, I'll see my lawyer about this. Go right ahead. I'm your lawyer. I can tell you you haven't got a leg to stand on. No? Well, I haven't got a lawyer either. I just fired him. Uh, listen to that fender. It's hanging by a thread. What are we stopping here for, huh? I've got to see a man about my insurance. See Harvey Diggs, real estate and insurance. I want to show him the damage while it's fresh. See Harvey Diggs. Just be kidding. Pop out, Leroy. You better run for it. You'll be late to school. Okay. So long, Uncle. Goodbye, and watch out for cars. Never know what maniac is be driving these days. Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, well, well. Come in. Uh, hello, Diggs. I heard you and Judge Hooker had a little run-in this morning. How did you hear that? It didn't happen 20 minutes ago. Oh, news travels in this town, you know. 
Glad there wasn't any damage. No damage. You ought to see my automobile. Whole rear fender smashed to a pulp. Well, these little things will happen. That's why we have insurance companies. <laughs> uh, sit down. Sit down. Uh, I can't. I've got to see the mayor, Diggs. Say, you know that policy you sold me? On your automobile, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Well, I have... You know, I've always been sorry I couldn't interest you in that little life insurance plan I drew up for you, life. I'd like to see you have that protection, Gildersleeve. Right now, I'm interested in the automobile. I know, it's only human. We keep putting it off, but it's something we all have to face sooner or later. Now, only the other day, I had a man come to me. He uh, happened to be a very important executive here in town. Uh... You'd know him at once if I were to tell you his name. Uh... I'd been after that man for five years, and only the other day, he said to me, Diggs, he said... I don't know how to thank you for what you've done for me. Good. I'm glad he's taken care of. Now let's talk about me. I have this policy yes, on my... Yes, just what I was getting to. Now that's a very fine policy you've got there, as far as it goes. Uh, but it doesn't go far enough. You sold it to me. Mr. Gildersleeve, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever considered what would become of your loved ones in the event that you were suddenly to pass on? Mr. Diggs, I'm going to give you an answer. I'm likely to pass on right now. To the next insurance man, if you won't listen to me. Huh? All I'm interested in is collecting on the policy I've got. Well, you're the doctor, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes, sir, that's what we're here for, to service our customers. Good. I've got the policy right here. I can't make head or tails out of it. Well, well, now, we'll, uh, we'll just have a look. Now, let's see. Uh, bodily injury, uh, property damage, collision or upset, comprehensive. What does it say? Uh... Mr. Gildersleeve, that's a very fine piece of protection you've got there. My advice to you would be to hold on to it. What do you mean? Providential Mutual Fire and Loss, that's one of the biggest insurance companies in the state of Rhode Island. And Rhode Island is one of the smallest states in the Union. Well, we can't always judge by size, you know. Uh, the Providential Mutual has been serving the public now for 48 years. I had the pleasure of visiting the home office back there in 1923. In fact, I had the pleasure of dining with one of the vice presidents. Oh, he has a lovely home there, just outside of Providence. Well, I'm glad he's living well. You didn't happen to ask him about that busted rear fender on my automobile. Fender? Yes, I had a little accident this morning, remember? I ran into Judge Hooker. I mean, Hooker ran into me. Smashed my fender. I'd like to collect. Mr. Gildersleeve, that's one thing I'll say for the Providential Mutual. They settle promptly. Good. No argument, no waiting around. They pay us. Great. However, the type of policy you have here doesn't happen to cover this particular type of accident. It's what? No, don't misunderstand me. It's a very fine policy and it has some very fine features. But for this kind of coverage, I'd suggest a different type of policy. Now, if Dick, you... uh, tell me something. Do you carry insurance? Why, of course. I wouldn't be without it. Well, I hope it covers a punch in the nose. got your allowance Monday, Leroy, in advance. I know. I'm just all going to hang up your coat. Yeah, there's something more to this. How did it go today, Uncle Moore? <sighs> oh, like that? Yeah, like that. Get this machine gun out of here, Leroy. A man can't even sit down in his own chair. Sorry, Uncle. How did you come out on the insurance? Oh, dandy. What do you mean? Well, it seems I have a policy, but no insurance. <laughs> if I want to collect, I'll have to collect from Hooker. And if Hooker wanted to sue me, I wouldn't have an ounce of protection. Oh, he wouldn't sue you. He's a friend of yours. He was a friend of mine. That old gink would sue his own mother. Be wrong. I'm inclined to believe you're right, my boy. I don't think you ought to talk that way about Judge Hooker. You ought to hear what he says about you. Yes. Hey, Marge, when's dinner? I'm starved. I don't know. You'll have to ask Bertie. But I'm dying. Well, go outside and die. <laughs> Uncle Mort, I think you and the judge are acting like a couple of schoolboys. Huh? You had a little accident, and you were both in the wrong. Now, why don't you admit it? Who was in the wrong? I was backing out of my own driveway, watching very carefully, and the first thing I know... Uh, Ale, come here. Uh, what do you want? Shh, come with me. Out to the kitchen. Huh? What for, Leroy? What's up? Never mind. Just be quiet. What's all the mystery about? No, no, no. Don't open the door. Just listen. Young man, I've told you what I thought of eavesdropping. I told you I never... Now, Bertie, yes? you said you were looking out the kitchen window at the time the accident occurred. Hooker. No, Judge, I didn't say that. That is not exactly. Now, buddy, remember, nothing you say here is going to be used against you. You're not against her, maybe. Well, I don't know if I'll say anything, Judge. Mr. Gilsley might not like it. Well, don't you worry about Mr. Gildersleeve, Bertie. 
he has anything to say, you always know where you can get a job. Oh! <laughs> well, Hooker, if there's anything lower than a man who would run down a friend when he wasn't looking, it's a man who would sneak in his back door and steal his cook. I have not been sneaking in any back doors. Oh, no? No. Well, he happened to be taking a shortcut across the lot here. And, and dropped in for a handout, I suppose. <laughs> Bertie. I didn't want to say nothing, Mr. Gillespie's honor. Well, I'm not blaming you, Bertie. I just didn't want no help with coppers, that's all. <laughs> it just happens, Gildersleeve, that Bertie is a legal witness, and I have a legal right to question her. Well, you go take a legal walk for yourself. <laughs> You're trespassing on private property here, Judge. I'll have you charged with breaking and entering, as well as coaching a witness. Don't quote the law at me, my friend. Don't you call me your friend. As far as I'm concerned, I'll never speak to you again. And kindly have the decency not to address me. Now get out of here. I shall be delighted. And put back that cupcake. The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. Meanwhile, here's a tip for homemakers. The way to spend red ration stamps to best advantage is to plan family meals several days in advance, using a list of point values as your guide. That way you can make sure that meals are good-tasting and well-balanced and provide the variety your family likes. And as you plan, be sure to include quality foods like Fabstep, the delicious cheese food that's good in such a wide variety of ways. You'll find that Fabstep is a grand help for your wartime budget, because it costs only a few cents and just three red ration points per package. And whether you melt or toast or slice it, the whole family will go for its grand cheddar cheese flavor. What's more, Pabstet's a fine source of important milk nutrients and is highly digestible. Now, your dealer may not have Pabstet the very first time you try to buy it, because so much cheese and other dairy foods are going to war. But everything is being done to keep dealers supplied. So ask for Pabstet, P-A-B-S-T hyphen E-T-T, Pabstet. The delicious, nourishing cheese food. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. About 24 hours have passed since his epic crash with Judge Hooker, so we find him once more about to set out for the office, a trifle earlier than usual, though, since he knows that today he'll have to walk to work. Is there any more oatmeal, Bertie? I'm sorry, Mr. Gillsleeve, but we is oatless. Uh, some more toast, then, I guess. Or are we breadless? No, sir, not quite. Leroy. Yeah? Finish your oatmeal. Oh, gee, you're hungry, so I gotta eat. I'm not hungry. I simply wish to store up energy. Well, gosh, I don't have to walk to the city hall. That will do, young man. Answer that, please, and stick your shirt tail in. Okay. You Good morning. It's your girl, Uncle. <laughs> My fiancé, young man. In here, Leela. Oh, Throckmorton, you poor darling. Are you all right? What? What are you... What am I... What? Well, I heard about your accident. Oh, my poor baby, my precious lamb. <laughs> well, I... Oh, for corn's sake. Go away. <laughs> get up. Never mind your oatmeal. Go to school. It's Saturday. Then go to... Just get out of here. <laughs> Scat. Okay. Uh, Rock Martin, are you sure you're all safe and sound? Uh, of course I'm safe and sound. Oh, but it must have been such a frightful crash. Judge Hooker says... Judge Hooker? Yes. He says you were going 40 miles an hour. Leela, I was going backwards. Oh, that's what makes it so hideous. <laughs> Leela, did Judge Hooker tell you this? No, Throckmorton. He told Sarah Pettibone and Sarah told me. Uh, what else did she say that he said, the big faker? Well, just that you wrecked his car completely and that he was lucky to live to tell the tale. <laughs> Leela, he almost wrecked my car. He was tearing down the street like he was drunk or crazy. What's more, it never even scratched him. Oh, well, I imagine Sarah got it mixed up. I'm glad you're feeling all right anyhow, Throckmorton. Well, glad you're glad, Leela. Uh, Hooker's going to pay me damages, too. He'll pay me if I have to sue him. Well, will they cost quite a bit, Throckmorton? Well, so far, only $2 for my fender. But uh, I imagine there'll be internal injuries. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> there always are. 
Well, you take good care of yourself now, Throckmorton, because I want you to do something for me this evening. Uh, what is it, Leela? Well, I want you to come to a meeting of my Red Cross committee tonight. Red Cross committee? Mm-hmm. I can't roll bandages. I can't even roll a cigarette. Uh, oh, no, silly. This is to raise money. Oh. Oh, well, I can't say no to that, can I? Mm. What time? Well, I told everybody 8 o'clock, but I think it would be nice if you came over a little early. <laughs> Could you? For you, I could. Oh, you cute boy, you. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Leela. Hooker isn't on this committee, is he? If he's on it, I won't have anything to do with it. Oh, of course, Throckmorton. I mean, of course not. Oh, well, I've got to be getting back to my housework. Oh, my goodness. I've got to get down to the office. Yes, dear. Oh, I'm glad nothing happened to my precious fiancé. Goodbye, darling. I'll see you this evening. Yeah, goodbye, Leela. Got to get going. Goodbye. Bye. Bertie. Here's your toast, Mr. Gilfleet. Oh, thank you, Bertie. Why, this toast is cold. Well, sir, I didn't want to interrupt anything. <laughs> There's nothing to interrupt. Bertie, we might have supper a little early this evening, so I'll be able to finish by seven. Yes, sir. Yeah, then I'll have time to... Hey, come to the window, quick. The window? What's the matter, Leroy? Wait till you see what's going past the house. Here, out this window. This better be good, young man, or I won't like it. <laughs> good, but you won't like it. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> I can't believe it. What is it, Miss Gilsey? Judge Hooker on crutches. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter with him? He didn't have no crutches last night. Of course not. He's just faking. Well, gosh, Uncle, if he isn't hurt, what's the idea of the crutches? Oh, he wants to impress his lawyer. He wants to impress everybody. Well, if that's his game, I can do better than that. How? What you gonna do, Unc? I'm going down to Peavy's drugstore and get me a wheelchair. (laughs) Well, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, hello. (laughs) Hello, Peavy. You weren't in yesterday. Yes, I've been pretty busy. Lawsuits and whatnot. Uh, say, PB, you rent crutches, don't you? Yes, I do maintain a pair of crutches here. Uh, that's what I thought. Well, uh, more as a service to my customers than anything else. Uh, not much profit in it. Oh, uh, I suppose not. Well, Most what of I the time they just lie there in the back room eating up the overhead. Uh, well, what I wanted to know every time I go to make up a prescription, I fall over them. Very annoying. Uh, I can imagine. Very monotonous too. What I wanted to ask you, Pete... I'm thinking of giving them up altogether. (laughs) I wish you would. I wish you'd forget them, too. What I want to know is, Peavy, did you rent those crutches to Judge Hooker? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did, just just this morning. I knew it. Now tell me, Peavy, just between you and me, when Judge Hooker came in here for him, was he limping? I wouldn't say he was limping exactly, no. Good. In other words... You're prepared to testify that up to the time he rented those crutches, he appeared to be in just as good shape as you or I. No, no, I wouldn't say that. (laughs) Well, as good shape as you, anyway. Well, uh... I mean no limp or anything, just his normal slouch. You'll, uh... (laughs) You'll testify to that, won't you, Peavy? I don't know that I'd care to testify to anything. Now, don't get scared, Peavy. I'm not going to drag you into court. I'm just trying to line up a few facts and witnesses, uh, just in case. I know, but a man can't be too careful, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, Circumstantial evidence, you know. What's circumstantial about it? Well, uh, take yourself. Now, you'd say you were in good health, wouldn't you? Never better. You look well, too. Thank you. But do we know, Mr. Gildersleeve? Do we know? (laughs) <laughs> what do you mean? You might drop dead any minute. <laughs> what? It's a fact. I had a man come in here one day perfectly well. Just felt a little funny, that's all. And all of a sudden, he dropped dead right where you're standing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't move. It was just a heart attack. Oh, just a little heart attack, eh? Peavy, will you tell me what all this has got to do with whether Hooker needs crutches or not? That's what I'm trying to find out. I'm afraid I couldn't express an opinion on that. Professional ethics, you know. After all, I'm a pharmacist. I'm not asking your opinion as a pharmacist. I'm asking your opinion as a crutch renter. Well, I will say this, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes? Crutches never hurt anybody. Yes. Oh, Peavy, you make me tired. Why don't you ever answer us? Give anybody a straight answer. All you can say is, well, now, I wouldn't say that. Well, now, I wouldn't say that. Goodbye! Goodbye! <laughs> Oh, 
Rock Martin. I'm glad you got here early. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> you look beautiful in that dress, Leela. Oh, do I? Yeah, much too good for a committee meeting. Uh, couldn't we go out? And... Now, Rock Martin. I've got things to do before the others get here. Yeah, so I. Trot. <laughs> Rock Martin. Well, please, Leela. Just one little kiss for the Red Cross. Well, just one. What's that? You told me the others weren't coming till 8 o'clock. I thought I'd have a chance to... Well, I thought I'd have a... Who the devil is it anyway? Well, I think... Well, Judge Hook always knocks like that. Hooker, I thought you said he wasn't coming. Well, no, I didn't, Throckmorton. I said he wasn't on the committee. Well, what's the idea of him hanging around here with secret knocks on my fiancé's door? By George, if I lay my hands Strock, on him... Throckmorton, please, go in the dining room and wait. I'll think of some excuse to send him home. Well, all right. But make it quick, Leela. I'm liable to lose my temper. Hush. You can listen to everything I say. I will anyway. Well, Horace Hooker, what a surprise to see you. Come right in, won't you? Thank you, Leela. Well, aren't you going to ask me why I'm on crutches? Oh, are you? Oh, why, goodness gracious, so you are. Horace, it's your lumbago again, and you shouldn't be out in this weather. You go right home, you hear? It's not my lumbago, Leela. Now, Horace, don't be vain. You said it wasn't lumbago last time, and you had to go to bed for a week. Leela, I am not suffering from any organic complaint. Walking on crutches because of your fiancé. Really, Horace? Yeah, he drives his car around this town like a murderer. Who's a murderer? Oh, is that Mr. Gildersleeve in the dining room, Leela? Yes, Judge. I wouldn't have come here if I'd known he'd be here. Neither would I. Oh, please, Judge. Uh, let me talk to him for just a minute. Perhaps it you wait here. Well, please. Yeah, all right. Rock Martin, I asked you to be quiet while I talk to Horace. You want me to stand there like a wooden Indian while he calls me a murderer? Oh. Now, honey, he didn't call you a murderer exactly. He was just telling me about his injury. His injury? There's nothing the matter with him. Try, Martin. He's on crutches, and it's your fault. He doesn't need those crutches. If you don't quit calling me a murderer, he will. Eli, I didn't know you allowed criminals in your house. Who's calling people criminals? I've been doing it for 20 years, and I've never missed yet. Leela, I swore yesterday I'd never speak to that old goat again. But, Shrock Martin... I'll never speak to that fat windbag. Horace, please! <laughs> Tell him this, Leela. There's nothing lower than an ambulance chaser. Tell him I'll sue him for that. Yes. All he can think of is suing people, pushing innocent people through the knot holes in the law. Rock Martin. Tell the big coward to shut up. Who's a coward? Tell him to lay down his crutches, Leela, and I'll knock his block off. <laughs> Tell him to come ahead. Boy, uh, stop. Stop. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh Leela. Leela, what's the matter? What is it, Leela? You're going to spoil my whole committee meeting. Now look what you did, Hooker. Me? I'm sorry, Leela. I'm sorry, too, Leela. I don't believe you, either one of you. Leela, I've been a bad boy. I have, too, Leela. Oh, you've both been awful. Now, you've got to promise me you won't fight anymore. Uh, well... Oh, I knew you weren't sorry. Oh! Well, I won't fight anymore. No, neither will I, Leela. We won't fight anymore, Leela. Honestly? On my honor as a judge. On my honor as a gentleman. <laughs> That's not the way I like to hear you boys talk. Now shake hands. Yeah. Hmm, that's fine. Now you stay friends. I've got to get a clean house. I don't mean a word of this, Gildersleeve. <laughs> I've been seriously injured, and I'm going to sue you tomorrow for $100,000. I'm not even surprised to hear it, Hooker. But I'll tell you right now, I'll fight you all the way up to the Supreme Court, and if I lose there, I won't pay. Oh, is that so? <laughs> yes. <laughs> You don't need those crutches, and you know it. Prove it. Prove it, I'll... Oh, that's the way I like to see my two boys. As friendly as two clams in a stew. <laughs> <laughs> well, what were y'all talking about? Uh, post-war planning. Oh. My, that's... That's awfully interesting. Uh, why don't we all sit down for a minute? Uh, sit down, all right. Thank you. I, I think post-war planning is just as important as rationing, don't you? I do indeed. In fact, I was... Oh, oh uh, I'll go, Leela. No, let me go. Don't forget, Gildersleeve. None but the quick deserve the fair. Oh, is that so, Judge? <laughs> what are you laughing at? At you, you old goat. You forgot your crutches. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's splendid, my boy. What is the job? It's a cinch. All I have to do is deliver things. I got one here for you. Well, a messenger, huh? Oh, what's a summons? Leroy. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> Music on this program was under the direction of Claude Sweet. And this is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Right now, which is the most important economy in your food budget? Money or red ration points? Well, most likely the answer is both. So there's no better time to get acquainted with foods like Parquet, the quality margarine made by Kraft. For Parquet costs just five red ration stamps and so little money. And yet it has a delicate appetizing flavor that really satisfies. Yes, you'll like the taste of parquet spread on bread and toast and rolls, and you'll like it as a seasoning for hot cooked vegetables, too. If you bake your own cakes and cookies, you'll find parquet is a real flavor shortening. And it's grand for pan frying. What's more, parquet is a highly nutritious energy food, and it contains important vitamin A. If your dealer doesn't have parquet margarine the first time you ask, it's because of wartime shortages and because parquet is growing more popular every day. But Kraft is doing everything possible to keep all dealers supplied. So watch for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine made by Kraft. The program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. <laughs> the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, have you homemakers learned how to stretch red ration stamps? Well, it's an art in itself, but a simple one if you use products like Pabstet, the delicious, nourishing cheese food. For Pabstet is inexpensive. It costs only a few cents and just three red ration points per package. And it's a wonderfully good-tasting extender for a host of plain but satisfying foods. One good example of the way Pabstet turns an ordinary dish into a real family treat is macaroni with Pabstet. Or serve it melted into a smooth cheese sauce with leftovers of meat or fish or vegetables. And see how that unique cheddar cheese flavor satisfies family appetites. Yes, Pabstet melts and toasts and slices in a variety of tempting ways. And every way you serve it, you're helping to supply many milk nutrients your family needs. Milk protein, milk minerals, food energy, vitamin A and vitamin G that's also called riboflavin. Ask your dealer for Pabstet, the delicious, highly digestible cheese food. Pabstet is an economical red stamp value. Now for the great Gildersleeve. Gildersleeve has a problem, and the problem is his nephew, Leroy. There have been signs of trouble, a certain lack of respect at times. Complaints now and then from the neighbors, and then suddenly... Hey, you! The time has come to face it. Look here, Gildersleeve, this time I caught him. Out! Hooker, I thought I told you never to darken my door. I didn't come here to darken your door, Gildersleeve. I've come here as a representative of the law. Oh, I go, I didn't mean to do it. Piggy dared me. Unhand the boy, Hooker. He's my nephew and I'll handle this. I'll see that you do, because the law has ways of dealing with vandalism, you know. Vandalism? It was nothing but a boy's prank. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was just a boy's prank. Be quiet, you. In my opinion, Gildersleeve, you're nurturing a first-class case of juvenile delinquency there. Yeah, that's all it was, just juvenile delinquency. <laughs> quiet, you. And it's no wonder. Anybody who goes tearing around the way you do, backing into people and smacking their cars... That's neither here nor there, and I did not back into you. And don't try to take it out on the boy. I'll pay for the broken window hooker. When it comes to the care and feeding of children, I don't need any advice from you. You owe me a buffer. You owe me a fender. Good day. 
That's telling a monk. Boy, you certainly told him. Young man, come into my study. But, Unc, I didn't mean to do it. Piggy dared me. He made me do it, honest. It was nothing but a boyish prank, Unc, like you said. Close the door. Now. Yes, sir. Do you know what happens to boys who go around destroying property? Do you? Yes, sir. I mean, no, sir. They start out with little things like this. And they go from bad to worse. They start hanging around drugstores. They fall into bad company. The first thing you know, they're smoking cigarettes. Oh, I wouldn't ever smoke, Unc. I hope not. But that's only the beginning. Piggy tried to get me to once, but I wouldn't. I told him it wouldn't be right. I'm glad to hear it, because once you... Smoking's bad for you. It stunts your growth. That's right. It's very bad. Then why do you smoke, Unc? We're not talking about me, Leroy. We're talking about you. Yes, sir. I'm trying to impress upon you, Leroy, the seriousness of what you've done. A broken window may seem a small thing in itself, but it could be the first step in a life of crime. You're right, Unc. I'm sorry. I'll try to do better. Well, I certainly hope you will, my boy. I guess I'm just no good. Oh, well, I guess we're both a little to blame. That's right. You don't have to agree with me. <laughs> But I, I realize now I haven't spent as much time with you as perhaps I should. You know, I, I think we ought to try to get to understand each other a little bit, Leroy, don't you? How do you mean, Uncle? Well, I mean, do things together, read things together, go places together. Go where? Well, I don't know. We might go on hikes together. You mean it? Would you like that? Can Piggy go? Piggy? Well, I guess so, if it's all right with his mother. Oh, boy, wait till I tell him. Yeah, wait a minute. I didn't say right this minute. Have a lunch, Freddy. I'm Piggy. I guess we're going on a hike. Well, we're all set, Unc, aren't we, Piggy? Oh, boy, we sure are. Let's go, Unc. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, Bertie, how many hard-boiled eggs did you put in the lunch basket? Six, Miss Gill, please. Six? Let me see. There's Leroy and Piggy and myself. Yes, sir. One egg for each of the boys and four for you. Oh, uh, that's how it goes, huh? Well, I guess that's all right. Can we start now, Unc? Yes. Oh, boy, come on, Piggy. Yeah, wait a minute. There's one thing that must be understood clearly before we leave. Leroy? Yes, sir? Piggy? Yes, Mr. Gildersleeve? We're going on this hike as if we were all in the Army. Did you rent a jeep? <laughs> <laughs> don't be smart, young man, and don't you encourage him, Piggy. We're going to run this hike along military lines, and I'm going to be the commanding officer. You boys are the men in my squad. Now tell me, Piggy... What's the first thing a man learns in the Army? Uh, how to make his bed. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Leroy, what's the first thing a man learns in the Army? How to spit through his teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Young man, this hike can stop right here. Oh, gee, I'm, please, I'm sorry. Well, all right. The first thing you learn in the Army is to obey orders. Now, when I give an order on this hike, I want it obeyed. And I want it obeyed promptly without an argument. Is that clear? Yes, Mr. Gildersleeve. I get it. All right, then we can start. Forward! Oh, for heaven's sake. You, Throckmorton. Oh, hello, Leela. Uh, we were just going off for a little hike, trying to get Leroy interested in nature. Well, now that's just the thing. My sister's little boy, Michael, is with me for the day, and I know he'd just love to go on the hike with you, wouldn't you, Michael? I'm perfectly willing to go, Aunt Leela, if you think best. Oh, for corn's sake. <laughs> Leroy, uh, well, we'd be glad to take Michael, Leela, but uh, uh, don't you think he's a little young for a long hike? Uh, we're going up to Shroom Point, and that's quite a long way. Yeah, it's a heck of a long way, Mrs. Ransom. I almost get tired myself going there. Oh, boy, me too. Oh, well, I won't worry about that. I'm sure you boys will be able to figure out some way to take care of little Michael if he gets too worn out. Can't you, Throckmorton? Well, I... I knew it. Now, you boys just go on and hike your heads off, you hear? Michael, be sure and have a nice time, and don't strain yourself, and don't forget to thank Mr. Gildersleeve and the boys when you get home. Goodbye, everybody, Bob. Uh, but, but Leela... Oh, Leela, uh, Michael. Well, forward, march. Uh, uh, here, here's a beautiful spot, fellas. Uh, suppose we stop for a minute and give some of our soldiers a chance to rest. I imagine you're a little tired, aren't you, Piggy? I should say not, Mr. Gildersleeve. 
Well, I'm as fresh as a daisy. Yeah, daisy, yeah. Well, I'm sure the other boys are tired, the way we've been tearing along. Leroy? Heck no, there's nothing the matter with me. I was hoping you older boys be more thoughtful and give little Michael a chance to get his breath. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'm not a bit winded. You see, Unc, we don't have to stop now. Nobody's tired. Nevertheless, as your commanding officer, I order a halt. <laughs> You're all tired, only you don't realize it. But gosh, Unc... Leroy, you heard my order. Possibly this would be a good time to have lunch, too. Lunch now, Mr. Gildersleeve? It's only 11 o'clock. 11, Piggy? Oh, so it is. I would have guessed around 1.30. <laughs> but there's an old saying, an army travels on its stomach. That's what we got to do. I'd like to watch you. It, never mind. <laughs> Please, Unc, there's a place just a little ways ahead that's swell for lunch. It has a brook. A brook? Oh, that sounds nice. Is that what you other boys would like, too? Oh, boy, me for the brook. Yes, by all means. Well, all right, we'll go on to the brook. Forward! Oh, Leroy. Young? Yeah. How far is it to the brook? About two miles. <laughs> Forward, march. <laughs> you boys to get too far ahead of me. I'm responsible for your safety, you know. We can't help getting ahead of you, Unc. You keep sitting down all the time. <laughs> well, my feet are bothering me. Another thing, Leroy, we've gone a lot more than two miles, and I haven't seen anything that looks like a brook. We'll be there soon, Unc. Well, I can't wait. Uh, I mean, I'm worried about little Michael. Yeah, we better stop here and eat. Oh. Leroy, that's an order. I'll just sit right down here in this rock and uh, uh, divide up the... Oh, my goodness. What's the matter, Unc? You didn't lose the basket. Oh, boy, if he lost that basket. Uh, uh, take it easy, Piggy. Uh, I just remembered. There are four of us, and Bertie fixed lunch for three. Gosh. Ah, nuts. Awkward, isn't it? Yep, yeah, awkward. It's... <laughs> what are we going to do? Well, uh, I don't like to say anything, Unc, but he's your fiancé's nephew. Yes, he's going to be your cousin, Leroy. And we'll all share and share life. Now, who doesn't like ham? <laughs> who doesn't like jelly? Is there anybody here who doesn't like hard-boiled eggs? Well, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Gee, I'm hungry, Mr. Gildersleeve. So am I, Uncle. Me too. Listen, I'm hungrier than all of you put together. <laughs> well, what can we do about it? Yeah, what can we... Say, up. I just remembered something. There's a little country store right up this road where we could get something to eat. There is? How far is it, Leroy? Only about half a mile. Yeah, half a mile. Uh, well, forward march. Oh, gosh, Unc. Now that we've eaten, do we have to sit here for the rest of the day? My feet are killing me, Leroy. Besides, we, we haven't had any nature study on this whole hike. Yes, we'll have it now. Nature study? Oh, it's very valuable for any boy. Now, for instance, this tree we're sitting under. I doubt if any of you boys know what it is. Oh! Yeah, oh. <laughs> Quite right. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, that one over there. Maple! Uh, you sure it isn't an elm? Oh, no, Mr. Gildersleeve. The elm is unmistakable on account of its serrated leaves. Yes, serrated? Oh. Where did you learn that, Michael? I had a special course in nature study at camp last summer. Oh, well, that takes care of the botany. <laughs> uh, let me see now. There must be some more nature around here someplace. Uh, is that? By George, it is. What is it, Uncle? One of nature's masterpieces, boys. An Oriole's nest. Where? Right there. That long gray thing. He has to stand on his head to make it. Are you sure that's an Oriole's nest, Mr. Gildersleeve? It looks like best as Crippetown's to me. Yeah, nonsense, my boy. <laughs> now, I'll show you the little baby Oreos if you'll all be quiet. Now, now, if I grab this branch... I'll jump for it, Uncle. Here. Here. Now, quiet, everybody, so you won't scare the itty-bitty birdies. Ugh, can't seem to find the opening in this nest. I'm sure that's a best as Crippetown's, Mr. Gildersleeve. Do you know what that is? Oh, of course I do. And this is nothing like it, Michael. I'll show you. Hey, what the dickens is a Vespa's crappy dance? A hornet! Oh, forward march! The great 
Dick Eldersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. Meanwhile, perhaps you remember the advice in the old saying, waste not, want not. It certainly applies these days. And that's the reason, I suppose, that so many smart homemakers are economizing with red ration points and cash by planning menus ahead and are so ingeniously putting every bit of food to work so that nothing is wasted. One especially useful trick of practical magic that'll make leftovers really sing is to combine them with Pabstet, the delicious golden cheese food. For Pabstet melts and toasts and slices to perfection, and the whole family will go for its grand cheddar cheese flavor. What's more, Pabstet is a fine source of valuable milk nutrients, and it's highly digestible. Of importance, too, it costs only a few cents per package and just three red ration points. Now, your dealer may not have Pabstet the very first time you ask for it because so much dairy food is going to war. But everything is being done to keep dealers supplied. So watch for Pabstet, P-A-B-S-T-E-T-T, Pabstet, the delicious, nourishing cheese food. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve, or what's left of him. He's had a good supper, and we find him now entering his den, his shoes in his hand, preparing to relax on the couch. But uh, what's this he sees? So, Leroy, Leroy. What's the matter, Ron? This junk, young man. I believe I've mentioned before that I do not like to find these confounded little comic books all over my desk. Uh, hey, don't throw those away. They're valuable. Don't be silly. They're nothing but trash. No, they're not, Unc. You ought to read one. I've got no time for such stuff. Oh, be fair, Unc. I did what you wanted to do. I went on a hike. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> my feet are killing me right now. Well, I suppose I should be open-minded, Leroy. And what's this one here? Is this a good one? Captain Wonder Man. Is it? He's so good, he's on the radio every night. In about five minutes, he'll be on. Never mind. Now, what's it about? Oh, gee, Unc, this is the best comic there is. Captain Wonder Man is the strongest man in the world. He has secret muscles. You, huh? Yeah, here. Look at the story of Captain Wonder Man and the Nazi saboteurs. Uh, where does it begin? Well, here. You see, this kid, Jackie Crumb, is a newsboy, and all of a sudden, this Nazi spy grabs him, Dr. Von Denk. Why? Well, because he thinks Jackie knows something about Captain Wonder Man. Well, uh, does he? Does he? Jackie Crumb is Captain Wonder Man. Yes, sir. Uh... You begin to like it now, Unc? Not yet. Oh, you will. But that's a secret about Jackie being Wonder Man. Nobody knows it but bona fide members of the club. What club? The Captain Wonder Man Club. You sent ten cents. Never and... mind. I don't have to join the club. What happened to the newsboy? Well, as soon as he's tied up, he's helpless unless he changes himself to Captain Wonder Man. How does he do that? That's another secret. Nobody knows but the club members. How many members are there? Twenty million. <laughs> None of them would tell? Oh, no. You have to send ten cents. No, and... I'll join no club. Well, well, then I'll tell you. Jackie says the mystic word, Alagazam. Alagazam? Alagazam. And then he becomes the strongest man in the world and the most patriotic. Look at him. I see him. Why does he wear a cape? The members know. They send ten cents. Never cents mind the ten cents. <laughs> Leroy, I forbid you to read any more of this junk. And if I find it lying around, I'll burn it. Gosh, Unc, don't you want me to learn to read? Not in order to read drivel about muscle-bound men with capes. And get away from that radio. Learn to read from something good, Leroy. Here, I'll find you something up here. The makers of Toasted Popsies present Captain Wonder Man. Leroy! Oh! Turn off that radio. Turn off, you don't have to listen. Turn it off, I say. I told you, young man, I'm trying to find something decent for you to read. Captain Wonder Man. I'll be quiet for a minute. Okay, um. Looking for something, Uncle Moore? Yes, I'm looking for a book. What one? Oh, I don't know. A good book. Looking for something to read to Leroy. Well, here's David Copperfield. No, I tried to read that. Oh, here's a wonderful book. I've always just loved this one. Oh? What is it? Little Women. Is she kidding? <laughs> don't sneer at Little Women, my boy. My mother read it to me when I was younger than you are. It's a wonderful book. Oh, I love it. I just love it. I've read it so many times, I almost know it by heart. Please, Uncle Mort, read us, Little Women. Oh, why don't you read it, my dear? I'm tired. I'll just stretch out here on the couch while you read, huh? Well, if you want me to. Uh, I'll make yourself comfortable, Leroy, because I want you to sit still and listen to this. Okay. Well, there's no use really starting it tonight, so I'd just like to read you my favorite part. Do you mind? No, go ahead, my dear. It's where Beth dies. 
You see, it's about all these sisters, Leroy, and one is Joe. She's sort of a tomboy. That's the one I always wanted to be. And then there's Beth. She isn't very strong. Well, I'll, I'll read it to you. All right. <clears throat> the pleasantest room in the house was set apart for Beth, and in it was gathered everything that she most loved. Flowers, pictures, her piano, the little work table, and the beloved kitten. Father's best books found their way there. Mother's easy chair, Joe's desk, Amy's finest sketches. And every day Meg brought her babies on a loving pilgrimage to make sunshine for Auntie Beth. John quietly set apart a little sum that he might enjoy the pleasure of keeping the invalid supplied with the fruit she loved and longed for. Old Hannah never wearied of concocting dainty dishes to tempt a capricious appetite, dropping tears as she worked. And from across the sea came little gifts and cheerful letters, seeming to bring breaths of warmth and fragrance from lands that knew no winter. Here, cherished like a household saint in its shrine, sat Beth, tranquil and busy as ever. But nothing could change the sweet, unselfish nature. And even while preparing to leave life, she tried to make it happier for those who... We should remain behind. I'm sorry. Marge. I'm sorry, but it always gets me. Oh, here, give it to me, my dear. I'll go on with it. Where are we now? Oh, yes. Uh, Joe never left her for an hour since Beth had said, I feel stronger when you're here. She slept on a couch in the room, waking often to renew the fire, to feed, lift, or wait upon the patient creature who seldom asked for anything and tried not to be a trouble. Often when she woke, Joe found Beth reading in her well-worn little book, heard her singing softly to beguile the sleepless night, or saw her lean her face upon her hands while slow tears dropped through her transparent fingers. Aunt, what's the matter? But it's so sad, Leroy. I think if you don't mind, I'll go for a little walk. <laughs> Yes, I need the exercise. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Just about to close up there. How are you today? On my last legs, Peavy. Have you got anything you can recommend for sore feet? Sore feet? You've been having a little trouble? Yes, Kids walk me way out to Shroon Point and back, and my feet are killing me. I'd like to know what's good for them. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve, have you uh, uh, tried sitting down? <laughs> Peavy, this is no joke. Well, I believe I have got a preparation here. Pretty good, too. I, I often use it myself after a hard day. So does Mrs. Peavy. Oh, uh, well, let's have a look at it. Just a minute. I'll get my other glasses on here. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. It. Uh, Goes under the name of Kogan's Foot Balm. Nice for the feet. Uh? It says here, prepare a tub of hot water, pouring contents of bottles, so on and so on. Would you mind if I looked at it? Immerse aching members. Uh, you stick your feet in it. <laughs> uh, bottle sells for 15 cents. You say you tried this thing yourself. Oh, yes. Yeah, so has Mrs. Peavy. In fact, we sometimes spend an evening that way. In the same tub? Uh, well, we use the wash water. Yeah. It works out nicely, too. We pull up two chairs, and she sits at one end, and I sit at the other. Well, sounds very clubby. Sometimes we even work in a game of Chinese checkers. Uh, you could have a nice game of footy-footy there, too. <laughs> well, I'll take a chance on the stuff, P.B. Well, you're taking no chances, Mr. Gildersleeve. They're not exaggerating when they say on the bottle that this balm is the key to true foot joy. One treatment with this and you'll come out feeling like a regular Captain Wonder Man. Captain Wonder Man. Don't tell me you waste your time on those comics. Well, I guess I carry as complete a stock of them as anybody in town. Uh, so this is where they come from. P.B., you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> if you ask me, there are a lot of trash. There's absolutely nothing in them. Well, no, I wouldn't say that either. <laughs> Have you ever looked at one carefully? No, but I hear all I want to from Leroy about them. Well, it's just possible that Leroy has overlooked something. 
Have you ever examined the uh, young ladies in these drawings? Uh, 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 the young ladies? I'll show you. I usually happen to have a copy under the counter here. And on page 13, you will find the tasty item. There. Quite, uh... <laughs> Don't you think so? <laughs> well, I'm beginning to see your point. <laughs> Laura, her name is. Laura? Lady Laura. That's Captain Wonder Man's lady friend. Oh. Uh, you, you'll find others, too. Uh, care to take a copy along? Uh, no. No, Peavy, I'm really not interested. I've got to be getting along with this thing. Dog tired. Got to get home and get some sleep. Well, good night, Mr. Gilbert. Uh, good night, Peavy. Alakazam. Alakazam. Mr. Gilsleeve, I've got the wash ball all ready. You fixing to get in hot water again? <laughs> Very good, Bertie. Uncle Mort, you're not starting anything now. It's bedtime. Yeah, don't you worry about me. I'll just take my shoes off and soak my tootsies for a while, and I'll be right up to bed. <laughs> I guess I'll go along mm. that if you don't mind. Good night. Yeah. Good night, my dear. Good night, Bertie. Good night, Mr. Gilsey. Uh, let's see now. Uh, water seems about right. Well, we'll put Peavy's magic potion in it now. And I'll pull up a chair. Uh, uh, nice and comfy. <laughs> Hi, George. I haven't gone waiting since I was a kid. Uh, Nice and warm and relaxing. Uh, I don't know if I can hold out, though. Uh, hope PV was right. Alakazam. Alaka. Zam. Makers of Toasted Popsies present Captain Gildersleeve. Captain Gildersleeve! Captain Gildersleeve! Don't disturb me now, Junior. I'm conducting an experiment which, if successful, will bring to naught all the plans of the Axis. But Captain Gildersleeve is Lady Laura. Even now she is being held captive in an ancient temple on a deserted island by your old enemy. Dr. Von Hooker. There's not a moment to lose. Alakazam. We got a nice day for it, too. <laughs> Look, there's Lady Lura, bound hand and foot. Where, Junior? Right ahead there, about 1,750 miles. Your eyes are better than mine. <laughs> and if you're right, there's not a moment to lose. Al Kazam! <laughs> oh, hmm. Almost knocked my superhuman wind out. Ah, <laughs> uh, here's Lady Lura, bound and gagged. But if you work of only a moment to free her... There. Why, Captain Gildersleeve. <laughs> I declare you're just so strong. Strongest mortal on earth. Don't move a muscle, Gildersleeve. <gasps> With my x-ray nose, I smell an old goat. <laughs> so, we meet again, Von Hooker. I have you surrounded. There's a machine gun in every nook and cranny. When I give the order... Oh, what can we do, Captain? Have no fear. I've got not a worse scrapes than this, though I can't remember when. I can count ten. One. All I have to do is say the magic word. Two. Oh, for goodness sake, say it. Three. Still a boot. No, oh, no, that's not it. Four. I can't remember. Hey, junior, where is that boy? Five. Hocus pocus. Oh, darn it, I can't remember the word. Six. Think, Captain, think. How can I think with him standing there counting? Seven. Razzmatazz. No, no, no. Eight. Rumpelstiltskin. Uh, Walla Walla. You're cold. Nine. Oh, I can't remember the confounded word. We'll have to run for it, Laura. Oh, 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 oh. Goodness, look at my kitchen. Look at my pants. Oh, what happened? Hunk fell asleep and kicked over the wash boiler. Oh, I had the most horrible dream. What was it? What were you dreaming about? Yes, what in the world were you dreaming about? Why, uh, uh, little women. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs>
music on this program was under the direction of Claude Sweet. And this is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. I guess you'll agree that it's not only smart to be thrifty these wartime days, but it's absolutely necessary if you want to keep your two food budgets under control. That's a mighty good reason why you should know about Parquet, the quality margarine made by Kraft. For parquet margarine costs a little cash and just five red ration points per pound. But economy is only one reason why parquet is popular the country over. People everywhere like its delicate appetizing flavor for many uses. You see, parquet is a grand-tasting spread for bread and a delicious seasoning for hot vegetables. It's a real flavor shortening for baking and just about perfect for pan frying. Parquet is a real energy food, too, and contains vitamin A. If your dealer doesn't have it the first time you ask, it's due to wartime shortages and the fact that Parquet's popularity is growing very fast. But Kraft is doing everything possible to keep dealers supplied. So watch for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, Parquet Margarine made by Kraft. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. presents the great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company will also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night. Present each week at this time, Harold Perry as the great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, if you've noticed that family favorites like Pabstet, the delicious golden cheese food, are sometimes missing from your dealer's shelves, remember there's a very good reason. Literally millions of pounds of dairy foods are being shipped abroad to help supply energy and the important milk nutrients our fighting men need. But dealers will usually have Pabstet in stock. And smart homemakers have learned what a wonderful extender it is for a host of wartime foods. Melted into a smooth cheese sauce, the grand cheddar cheese flavor of Pabstet gives real personality to leftovers of meat and fish and vegetables fixed in dozens of different ways. Pabstet is a tasty filling for the children's sandwiches, too, and it slices perfectly for serving with dessert or just by itself. Yes, for a delicious, nourishing, and economical help in preparing meals that'll give family appetites a real lift, ask your dealer for Pabstet in the round, flat package. Spelled P-A-B-S-T-E-T-T. Pabstet. Only three red ration points for a generous package. Well, it's Easter weekend, and Saturday afternoon finds Gildersleeve out in the side lot surveying his victory garden and wondering whether to pull the weeds now or let them grow a little bigger so they'll be easier to get hold of. It looks as if they grow a little bigger, for from the window of the kitchen nearby comes the smell of good things in the oven. Let's follow him in and see what's cooking. B five full fum. I smell something good. What's pretty making there, Marjorie? Frosting for the Easter cake. Frosting? Yes, sir, and I guess it's about done. It, Bertie, uh, 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 uh. Mr. Gill, please. You aren't going to put that delicious egg beater in the sink. Oh, no, sir. I'm saving it for Leroy. Leroy can lick the bowl. Give it here. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm, 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 mm. Uncle Mort, you're looking cross-eyed. I don't want to miss any of it. <laughs> <laughs> Kitchen door. Uh, I'll go, Bertie. Well, wipe off your chin. Go to slave? Yes. Express, sign here. Wait a minute, what is it? Crate, sign here. I didn't order any crate. Name Gildersleeve? Yes. Sign here. Yes. <laughs> well, hold the egg beater. And hold it, too. I don't know what I'm signing this for. Yeah, there. All right, one side, bud. Wait a minute. One side, We one don't si- want that great big thing here in the kitchen. Well, where do you want it? Make up your mind. I haven't got all day. Listen, I've got a good mind to report you to your superior. Brother, in two hours, I report to my drive board. <laughs> now, where do you want it? Yeah, all right, set it right down here. So is your pretty place. Hey! Yeah, careful! Don't you know we got a cake in the oven? <laughs> That's the kind of service you get these days. What do you suppose is in the crate, Uncle Moore? I don't know, but we'll soon find out. 
Uh, Bertie, do you know where the hammer is? Right there in the vegetable bin, Mr. Gilsleeve. Oh, uh, just the place for it, too. <laughs> well, let's see now. Careful, Uncle Mort. It might be something breakable. Uh, maybe I can pry the top up. Hey, Uncle, that's the express man. Uh-huh. Uh, and now it's coming. Now, wait a minute. Uh, there. Look out! Oh, oh, my goodness, rabbits! Rabbits! Rabbit. Leroy! Never get them. They're under the refrigerator. Maybe if we had some food, we could get them to come out. Yeah, try some popsies. Rabbits don't eat popsies. I don't know, my dear. Popsies always tasted like rabbit food to me. <laughs> well, I could poke under there with a broom, maybe. Oh, no, you might hurt them. Those are very valuable rabbits. They cost me over two bucks. Remind me to ask you, Leroy, where you got the two bucks. Here, Bunny, here, Bunny, here, Bunny, here, Bunny. No, oh, no, you'll never get them that way. Uncle, you have to get down on your hands and knees. And they can just stay under there. <laughs> We've got to get them out. They might get stuck under there. Those are Flemish giants. They grow fast. Yes. All right. It'll teach them a lesson, then. Oh, there he goes. I got him. I got one of them. Oh, look. Isn't he darling? Bring him over here, Leroy. Let me see. Oh, he's frightened. Look, he's shivering. Let me hold him, Leroy. No, let me hold him. Sure, I'm here. Don't let him get away. That's a valuable rabbit. Oh, isn't he cunning? <laughs> yeah, feel him, Marjorie. Feel how soft he is. Ah. Uh... <laughs> there, there, little bunny. Now, don't you be frightened. Look, Marjorie, look how he wrinkles up his little nose. Would you, would you, would you, would you, would you? <laughs> Uncle Mort, you're doing it, too. I can't help it. He's making faces at me, the little rascal. <laughs> Like him, Monk? Oh, he's as cute as the Dickens, Leroy. How did you get him? Well, from an ad in Wonder Man Comics. Uh? I sent for them. Only two seventeen express prepaid. Where did you get the two seventeen? Oh, I got it. It's a great investment, Monk. It says in the ad. Boys make big money raising rabbits. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't count on it, my boy. As pets, rabbits may be fine, but who said anything about pets? I'm raising these rabbits to eat. To eat? Eat a little fuzzy, cunning, helpless little thing like that? Leroy, I think you're horrible. Marjorie, take this rabbit and put him somewhere. I want to get to the bottom of this. I got the other one, Miss Gilsey. Well, give him to Marjorie, Bertie. There, now. Flopsy and Mopsy. Come on, we'll find a nice, safe, warm place for you, away from that awful Leroy. Yes. Now, young man, why was I not consulted before you bought those rabbits? Well, I, I wanted to surprise you, Aunt, for Easter. You surprised me, all right. Where'd you get the money? All of it? Of yeah, course. All of it. Well, uh, the 17 cents I had. <laughs> All right, but what about the $2? Well, uh, you know those old rusty, no-good old roller skates I got Christmas before last? They were very excellent skates when I gave them to you. I thought Santa Claus gave them to me. Uh, uh, we won't argue about that, young man. <laughs> All right. Anyway, they were always getting in your way, and anyway, I outgrew them, and anyway, one wheel was busted... So I traded them with Piggy. Did you tell him the wheel was busted, uh, broken? Well, he doesn't need all the wheels. He just wants to make a push wheel. Yes. Nevertheless, that was not a very honest thing to do, Leroy, was it? Well, he swapped it for a spark coil that wouldn't spark. I'm glad to hear you didn't get the best of it. Now, stop beating around the bush and tell me, where did you get those two dollars? Well, you know, the spark coil. You just told me about it. It wouldn't spark. Yeah, so I traded it. Who'd you trade it to? Michael. Mrs. Ransom's little niece? I mean, nephew? Well, he wanted it, Unc. He kept pestering me for it. Did you tell him it wouldn't work? Did you? Well, gosh, Unc, you wouldn't want me to give him a spark coil that works. They're dangerous. He might get a shock. He might get it. <laughs> All right, you charlatan. What did you trade the spark coil for? Come on, what did you trade it for? Two bucks. That's what we call selling, Leroy, not trading. And you sold that spark coil under false pretenses, with deliberate intent to defraud. Oh, no, I didn't, Dunk Honest. Then what was your intention? To get the two bucks. Mm. <laughs> Leroy, I honestly believe you don't know the simple difference between right and wrong. Yeah, that's all it is, Dunk. I don't know any better. Gosh, if I knew... That's better... enough, Leroy. <laughs> Go help Marjorie find a place for those rabbits. And see that it's not in my study. I'll take this thing up with you later. Yeah, sure, I will. I'll find a good place for them. 
Uh, Bertie, I don't know what I'm going to do about that boy. I swear I don't. Oh, now, Leroy ain't a bad boy, Mr. Gillsleeve. He's just a boy, that's all. Well, he needs something. I don't know what, though. <laughs> well, if you ask me, Mr. Gillsleeve, what Leroy needs is a mother. Yes, I'm afraid you're right, Bertie. There's not much I can do about that. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Huh? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you're young, Mr. Gillsleeve. You got your health. You even got a fiancé. And if you don't mind me asking, uh, what is you waiting for? By George, Bertie, that's what I'm going to ask her. And I'm going to ask her right now, too. The Easter Bunny. <laughs> Stop, Ma, and I'll be right down. Don't go away, you hear? Uh, I shouldn't have said that. I got to be tough with her. This time, by George, she's going to give me an answer. I'm not like some people. You can twist them around your little finger. When I... Leela, when are we going to get married? Uh, what did you say? You heard me. Oh, gracious, Throckmorton. You're so impetuous. Impetuous? We've been engaged now for four months. What's so impetuous about that? I want to know when we're going to get married. Well, come in, won't you? No, you come out. Oh. <laughs> Very well, Throckmorton, if you wish. Yes. Now, I'm going to sit down here on the veranda and settle this once and for all. Yes, let's. You know, Throckmorton, you are so masterful. I hardly know you when you're like this. Well, it's my other side. <laughs> now, let's get down to business. When do we get married? Name the date, Leela. Well, tell me first. Why do you want me to marry you, Throckmorton? Well, because... Uh, well, just because. Uh, because what? Because I... Go on, say it. Because you what? Well, I think Leroy needs a mother. <laughs> a mother? Is that all I am to you? A mother for Leroy? Now, Leela, I didn't say that. Well, I guess I know what you were thinking, and I can give you your answer right now. Now, Leela, don't fly off the handle. Let's be reasonable about this thing. Rock Martin, I am the soul of reason, I assure you. I've thought it all over, and I've decided that we have no business getting married till after the war. After the war? But, Leela, that may be a long time. Well, you ask me for my decision, and that's it. I'll marry you the day the war is won. That settles it. What? I demand a second front. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to interrupt here for just a moment in order to present a very charming and courageous lady who has something to say to you. That she is charming is no secret to her thousands of admirers, and the proof of her courage is her four months' expedition across the Atlantic this past winter to entertain our troops in England, Ireland, Scotland, and North Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Kay Francis. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask your attention for one minute. One minute isn't very long, but in this very brief minute that you hear my voice, men are dying for you, dying on distant battlefields, in strange waters. Men from Nebraska, Illinois, Texas, boys from across the street, boys that you know. Right now, while I speak to you, 60 seconds in a minute, how many times 60 men are dying for you? And as they die, they are remembering home, remembering us, wanting to come home, knowing they never will. Are we worth remembering? Are we worth coming home to? No. Not unless we do all we possibly can to win this war. And our possible all is so little compared to what they give. We are not asked to give, but to lend our dollars to our government, to carry our share of the $13 billion needed in the second war loan. Lend your dollars right now, right this minute, while those men are giving their lives for you. You'll get your dollars back. Thank you, Miss Francis. Now, 
let's get back to Summerfield and the great Gildersleeve. It's Easter morning, and the great man has started the day in a constructive and beneficent mood. He's intending, before donning his finery for the Easter parade, to build a rabbit hutch, but a brief inspection of the garage shows him that something is missing, namely the rabbits. Leroy, where are your little pets? You mean Mr. and Mrs. Rabbit? Yes, you don't have to be so formal either. Oh, well, they're in a perfectly safe place, Unc. Where are they? Don't worry about them. Oh, Leroy! What is it, Bertie? Did you put those rabbits in the fireplace? Fireplace? There's no fire in it. Yep. That's their new home, Bertie. They love it there. Well, maybe so, but they moved out. It's... What? They did. Young man, you'll have to find those rabbits before we go to church. So get busy. Oh, gosh, Hunk, won't you help? Well, that depends. If I... Say, here comes Judge Hooker over by the back fence. Judge Hooker, huh? What's he doing around here? Gildersleeve. Oh, Gildersleeve. Just stay on the other side of that fence, Hooker. You owe me a fender. You owe me a bumper. Uh You happen to be the owner of two oversized, overaged gray rabbits? Oh, my goodness. Go get them, Leroy. Those rabbits belong to my nephew, Judge Hooker. See that you don't do anything that injures them. Injures them? Look here, I just caught him finishing up the last head of lettuce in my victory garden. <laughs> I'm beginning to like those rabbits. <laughs> well, if I catch them over here again, I'll give them to the city pound. Here, take them, Leroy. Thanks. So just remember, Gildersleeve, you not only owe me a bumper, but you owe me one dozen heads of lettuce. You owe me a fender, and you can take a dozen heads of lettuce from my victory garden. <laughs> What are you laughing at, you old nanny goat? The rabbits ate your lettuce first. Oh! Yeah, now let's see. Handkerchief for the breast pocket. Need a flower for my buttonhole. Better put on the silk hat just to see how the whole thing looks. <laughs> there. Ooh. Hi, <laughs> George Gildersleeve. You're a handsome fellow in a cutaway. Yes, sir. Uh, come in. Hey, Aunt, come on down. Mrs. Ransom is here, and Marjorie wants to take everybody's picture. Oh, good idea. I'll come right now. Leroy, I wonder if you could find me a flower somewhere for my buttonhole. Okay, what do you want? An Easter lily? No. Leroy, just something small and suitable. Oh, hello, Leela. Mm-hmm. Oh, happy Easter. Well, happy Easter to you, too, Throckmorton. Oh, that's a beautiful costume, my dear. Everyone will be saying, lucky Gildersleeve. Oh, now, Throckmorton. But you look simply angelic in your gray trousers and cutaway, doesn't he, Marjorie? Well, he always does. He looks all ready for a wedding. Let's not go into that. <laughs> Come on out, Joyce, everybody, and we'll take your picture. Ben's got the camera out there. Well, are you sure there's time, Audrey? Your uncle and I are going to church. Oh, we all are. Of course, Leela. Come on. Well, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Happy Easter. Oh, thanks, my boy. The same to you, Ben. Now, uh, where do you want us to stand? Oh, right there inside the lilacs would be all right. Oh, fine. I'll put some lilac in my buttonhole. And just stand anywhere, really. Uh, is isn't too much trouble. <laughs> Now, if you could just smile, please. How's this? Mm-hmm. Oh, I got you. <laughs> that one ought to be fine. Now, who's going to take our picture? I'll do it, Marge. Yeah, I'll do it. Oh, I take better pictures than anyone in the family. He has been lucky. All right, Leroy. Uh, where shall I stand, Marge? Well, right beside me. Here? Well, that's where I am already. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you get a little closer? Oh, I guess so. <laughs> All right, now look at her, you big goof. Uh, <laughs> oh, I am looking at her. Uh, ben, honey, why don't you put your arm around her waist? Oh, gosh, right here in front of everybody? <laughs> why not? Well, all right. Say, this is quite comfortable. <laughs> so in love. Don't they look beautiful together? Yes, they do, Leela. They just look like an Easter magazine cover, I declare. Yes, so do you, Leela. Got it! Thank you, Leroy. Yeah, much obliged. Gee, I never enjoyed having my picture taken before. <laughs> Bye, 
Why, George, I'm glad we decided to walk, Leela. Mm, it is nice. Yes, sir. Oh, good morning, Dr. Pettibone. Happy Easter. Good morning, Doctor. He goes to a different church. Mm, I know. Here comes old Mrs. Carrington. Don't tell me she's walking to church. Yeah, but you'll stop for a long conversation. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Carrington. Oh, happy Easter to you. Happy Easter to you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Happy Easter, Mrs. Carrington, and what a lovely shawl you're wearing. Thank you, Mrs. Ransom. I'm glad you had the sense not to call it a fascinator. Yes, you're, uh, you're looking awfully well, Mrs. Carrington. Did you have a good winter? Pretty cold, pretty cold. Uh, yes, but now it's spring. <laughs> um, what do you hear from your grandson? Is he still with the... Uh, uh, uh... Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Uh, Gildersleeve. Uh... Uh, they made him a vice president this year, and next year they're going to raise his salary. Uh, well. <laughs> well, he's coming along nicely. <laughs> Uh, oh, mercy, I'm afraid we'll all be late for church. Oh, we must all hurry, but I'm glad to see you young people still dress up for Easter. You'll make a very handsome couple. Well. Oh, now, Mrs. Carrington. I haven't had a chance to congratulate you formally. Uh, when is the wedding to be? Well, it depends a little on the war. Oh, don't wait too long. Uh. After all, we're only young ones. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Ransom. Goodbye, Mr. Gildersleeve. Goodbye. Hey, goodbye, Mrs. Carrington. <laughs> oh, she's a wonderful old lady. Uh, I always enjoy seeing her. She makes me feel so young. Yeah. Come on, Throckmorton, let's run. Run? Uh, Leela? Hey, wait. <laughs> There's nothing like the feeling when you've been to church on Easter. Plus, I always feel like a new man after church. But on Easter, I feel even happier. Mm, I feel the same way, Throckmorton. I don't know what it is, the Easter hymns or something. But when the collection basket came around this morning, I put in twice as much as I'd planned. Oh, really? Yeah, should have planned that much in the first place, though. Oh, here comes Peavy. Uh, happy Easter, Peavy. Happy Easter, Mr. Peavy. Well, yeah, joyous Easter to you, Mrs. Ransom, and to you too, Mr. Gillespie. <laughs> Just uh, coming from church, Mr. Peavy? Yes, I am, Mrs. Ransom. Mrs. Peavy and I attended the services together, and then I went by the shop to get this little surprise for her. Uh, surprise, eh? What is it, a plant? A begonia. I've given her a potted begonia every Easter since we've been married. Uh, listen, Peavy, if you've given her a begonia every Easter, she couldn't possibly be surprised when you walk in with this one. Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but you've already given her 20 or 30 begonias for Easter. 31. I know, because Mrs. Peavy saves the pots. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's nice. Yes, and... When I give her this one, I know just exactly what she'll say. What, Mr. Peavy? <laughs> she'll say, Richard Peavy, don't you know it's wicked to be extravagant? Yes, but that's not extravagant, Richard. Well, I know that, Mr. Gildersleeve. So does Mrs. Peavy. That's just her little way of acting surprised. <laughs> I think it's a very sweet way, too. I do myself. Anyhow, she always says it, and then she gives me my surprise. Oh, uh, you get a surprise, too, huh? What's your surprise, Peavy? A box of crystallized ginger. Yeah, crystallized? <laughs> crystallized ginger? That's pretty strong stuff, isn't it? Yes, but I've got a taste for it. Yes. Uh... And is that your surprise every year, Mr. Peavy? Every year. It's a wonder you don't faint from excitement. <laughs> well, I don't faint, Mr. Gildersleeve, but I give a pretty good imitation. Yeah, good enough to fool Mrs. Peavy. Well, I wouldn't say that. Yes. <laughs> but when you folks have been married as long as I have, you you know that our kind of surprise is more fun than a real one. Yes, you may be right. Well, so long, P.V. Happy Easter to you and Mrs. P.V. Well, the same to you and Mrs. Uh, uh, Ransom. Good day. <laughs> Throckmorton? Yes, Leela? Was there uh, any war news today? Huh? Uh, well, apparently the Allied forces made substantial gains in El Milang region. Mm. Throckmorton? Yes, Leela? Isn't it wonderful that Mr. and Mrs. Peavy are so happy after all these years? Yeah, I guess so. Of course, he's rather a strange fellow. Uh, uh Throckmorton? Yeah. 
We're uh, neither of us getting any younger, are we? Of course not, Leela. Uh, Throckmorton. What is it, Leela? How would you like to come to my house this evening for chicken fricassee? There'll just be the two of us. Chicken fricassee? Oh, brother, I'll be there. <laughs> <sighs> that was a wonderful dinner, Leela. Oh, I'm glad you liked it, darling. Maybe I overindulged a little. Oh, I didn't notice. That's because I didn't overindulge any more than usual. <laughs> <laughs> you were so cute sitting at the head of my table serving my dinner and all. It looked natural somehow. Mm-hmm. Guess I'll smoke a cigar. Um, you know something, Throckmorton? I've been nervous in this house the last few days. What on earth is there to be nervous about? Oh, nothing in particular. Sometimes I think I hear strange noises in the night. But, you know, with you here, I don't feel nervous a bit. Fine, fine, fine. But when you're not here, I do feel nervous. And maybe you ought to see Dr. Pettibone. Get some vitamins. Oh, fish. What did you say, Leela? Nothing. Throckmorton, I've been thinking. Yes, Leela? Maybe Leroy shouldn't wait till after the war to have a mother. Oh. Huh? <laughs> Leela, will you? What do you mean, Throckmorton? Could you marry me before the war is over? Well, for Leroy's sake, I might consider it. How about next week? Now, Throckmorton, don't be so impetuous. Well, June's a nice month for wedding. Yes, it is. June 1st. Well, that's awfully soon. June 1st. Well, I think we might say the first week in June. Oh, uh, darling, you know, this is the happiest Easter of my life. Really, honey? Sure. Why, everybody ought to be married. It's a law of nature. Two by two. Male and female. A girl for every boy in the world. Hey, um, what do you think? Leroy, what? Mr. and Mrs. Robert just had quintuplets. Hmm. <laughs> Easter, like all important holidays, is a time for families and old friends to get together, or if they can't do that, at least to get in touch with one another. And so this Easter, we of the Kraft family bring you the greetings of our sponsor through its president, Mr. J.L. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. I'm glad of this opportunity to bring Easter greetings to Kraft men and women everywhere and to the families of our boys and girls who are now in the service of their country. When we think of Easter, we naturally think of the resurrection. The two words are eternally linked together. In every Christian land today, the celebration of Easter will bring its age-old message of hope to a war-darkened world. The fact of the resurrection and the faith which it symbolizes have never been so significant to so many nations and to so many peoples in the world's history. In itself, the word resurrection is one of the most beautiful in our language. It means bringing back to life the conquest of death, the return of hope. At this springtime of the year, all nature tells the story of resurrection. We read its meaning in the budding trees and in the miracle of nature's reawakening to vibrant life. There is still another significance to the word resurrection, to bring back to memory that which was forgotten or lost. And it is upon this meaning of resurrection that I have been reflecting on this Easter Sunday. While our boys are away fighting for freedom around the world, enduring hardships, loneliness, weariness, we on the home front have a high responsibility toward them. While they are absent, our virtues grow in their minds and our shortcomings are forgotten. Let us so live our lives that their ideals will not be shattered when they return. Let us make them as proud of us as we are proud of them. And so it seems particularly fitting to me that each of us at this Easter time should resurrect and strengthen our faith in God and in the ideals of our forefathers. That faith and those ideals on which this nation was founded and by which it grew strong and great. As youngsters, our mothers taught us to say when we pray, Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. I have just had a letter from one of our own boys in North Africa in which he says that eight men of his group kneel at their bunks every night and speak this prayer as they go to sleep. It means something to them. It meant something to us as children. Let us then, as we think of these simple prayers, 
resurrect the trusting faith of our childhood and approach God understandingly. Let us resurrect and renew our strength in the God-given pioneer virtues. Let us at home in our daily lives have the courage, the strength, and the fortitude of those who fight for freedom, that we and our children and they and their children may live in peace. They are counting on us, depending on us, to maintain their ideals of home and family until they join us again. And in this we cannot fail them. program has come to you from Chicago and Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.